Nostalgia is a wonderful emotion. It encompasses what we discovered and came to love when we were kids, the stories and experiences that helped us learn who we are. Most gamers became gamers when they were young, and the games you grew up with have an indelible impact on how you appreciate this art form. But nostalgia, especially childhood nostalgia, can also diminish critique. I think it's important, as an adult, to take another look at the things that you used to love and not just speak from the perspective of what you thought when you were six. Now despite that, you're still gonna have a biased perspective. I can see the shortcomings in these things that I've always loved. I can explain them and admit them and accept them, but I'm still biased. And I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with being biased, as long as you can be upfront about it. We're all fans of different things for different reasons, and that's okay. But Metroid was never something I considered myself a fan of, which is weird because I just always felt like I should have been. But I've tried and tried over the years to get into this series, and even though they're fun enough while I'm playing them, I've never been able to stick to them. It's like there's nothing that keeps me coming back. There was one exception where a Metroid game did get its hooks in me, but that was a long time ago, and I couldn't get invested in anything else. And I think I know why. It's kind of a dumb reason. The series' core gameplay doesn't fall in line with the skill curve that made me a gamer. Longtime viewers might remember that Sonic 2 taught me that a video game becomes more fun the more skilled you as a player become. Metroid games, from what I've played, rely more on the fun of exploration, and I know some people love that, but it's never been very engaging to me. Your avatar grows powerful through upgrades, which you find by putting time into exploring an interconnected world, but most of my favorite games tend to rely less on avatar strength and more on the player's skill mastery. Games that take that more arcadey approach are just more inherently gripping for me. And don't get me wrong, I think this industry can and should be a lot more than just games of skill, and many of my favorite titles don't follow this pattern. But it is, I think, why I could never stick with Metroid. Until lately. Lately, apropos of nothing, I've been engaging with some of the most highly regarded games in the series. All of a sudden, I do feel myself, perhaps, starting to want to dig into this series and learn more about it. All of a sudden, I might just end up being a fan after all. And whether I am or not, might be fun to critique the experience. When it comes to Metroid, there is no nostalgia for me. But that means that each game I'm playing here has the chance to rise or fall on its own merits. Because nostalgia or not, when I do like something, I love it. I want to learn and absorb and know everything I can about it. That's part of what it means to be a geek, right? Let's see if it's worth it to be a geek about Metroid. In the far-off year of 2000, representatives from across the galaxy established the Galactic Federation, bringing about an age of prosperity as thousands of spaceships ferry materials between planets. But crime always finds a way, and space pirates began ransacking the ships with their showy powers. The Federation police called in specialized warriors to do battle with the pirates, and paid them large rewards for successful captures, enabling courageous souls to make a living as space bounty hunters. It is now 20 XD5, and space pirates have attacked a deep space research ship and seized a capsule containing a newly discovered life form from planet SR388. It's suspected that the entire civilization of SR388 was destroyed by, quote, some unknown person or thing, and that the new life form may have been responsible. The Federation researchers captured it, named it Metroid for some reason, and were bringing it back to Earth when it was stolen by the space pirates. If Metroid is multiplied and weaponized, the galactic civilization will be destroyed. The Federation has found the pirate headquarters, planet Zebus, but have been unable to break past their fortifications. As a last resort, the Federation police have decided to send a lone bounty hunter to infiltrate the fortress and destroy Mother Brain, Samus Aran. He, he, he is the greatest of all the space hunters. His entire body has been surgically strengthened with robotics, giving him superpowers. Even the space pirates fear his space suit, which can absorb any enemy's power? Well, that would have been a rockin' idea, but nope, that's not in this game. Regardless, Zebus is a natural fortress, its interior is a complicated maze, and the pirates have planted booby traps throughout. Those ain't the only booby traps in this game. Samus has penetrated Zebus, but time is running out. Will he be able to save the Metroid and thus save the galaxy? I've played a little bit of this game before, but I never knew the story and lore went that deep, even here at the start of the series. The manual is a bit of an excessively literal translation, like it refers to the Morph Ball as the Maru Mari, which allows Samus to grow small and round, but it's still way above average for the era. 
And I love the way it obfuscates Samus's gender. The manual exclusively refers to her with male pronouns. Female protagonists in games are hard to come by even 30 years later, but in 1986, in a sci-fi game about a character in an armored power suit? Forget about it. This was unprecedented, and it was one of many things that made Metroid unique. A tradition in the series started here. The faster you beat the game, the more that power suit comes off. Beating it in 3 to 5 hours gets you this ending, but come on, it was the 80s. That could totally be a dude. <laughs> Long hair on a man, how outdated. Everyone knows it now, but Generation NES always talks about how surprised they were to find out that Samus was a girl. I can see why. It really is the kind of thing that your friend at school might tell you and you'd swear they were just making it up. Here's the map of Zebus! The manual screams and then gives you this... thing. That's, uh... that's not a map. It explicitly states you'll have more luck if you just make a map of your own, and yeah, that's 80s adventure games for you. God, I miss instruction manuals. This one's 42 pages in full color, there's tons of illustrations, and it does so much to explain and prepare the player for what's to come. It brings me back to those car rides home from the mall when I'd just gotten a new video game, and I was so anxious to play it that I'd open the box and pour over the manual. Oh, just reading through it gets me hyped to experience this game, but nothing will get you hyped quite like this. NES games were known for their bright aesthetics, and so once again bucking the trend, Metroid's developers chose to go the other direction, emphasizing a darker, moodier palette. Donkey Kong Country would similarly stand out with atmosphere and ambience a generation later, but here in 8-bit, the use of blacks and muted colors is striking. The music is just as critical in setting the mood. The song starts out by evoking a feeling of trepidation and uncertainty. Then it breaks into more of a tune, which evokes the sort of bittersweet valor it takes to push forward, when every tiny step forward seems so arduous and monumental, when you're persevering against all hope. It finally hits an understated but very heroic crescendo. This theme is just a perfect capstone for the series. Oh, and because these things are awesome, I'll be playing the Japan-exclusive Famicom Disk System version of Metroid, which features nicer music, a save system that's almost literally Zelda, some more complex enemy behavior, and less slowdown. We explored the backstory, we looked at the aesthetic, it's finally time to get critiquing. One of the most wonderful things about video games is the way that sequels can iteratively improve on the foundation. So in that light, I'm going to try not to dock this game based on what comes later. This is the first Metroid, and I'm trying to approach it that way. Nonetheless, the first thing I notice is that Samus starts out feeling incredibly weak. Your only weapon is this little pea shooter, which you can fire directly above or straight forward. No diagonals, no crowd shooting. And that's not me comparing it, no, you'll notice this immediately. Right from the first room, you'll find these enemies that are exactly too short to be hit. You also start out with only 30 health, even though you can collect energy to raise that to 99. I can't think of another game that intentionally starts you so far below max health. Even if you do grind up your hit points, getting hit by anything packs such a wallop that it often seems like the better option to just avoid enemies rather than trying to engage them. All of this is by design. Later games start out with Samus feeling fairly capable right from the start, and the 3D ones even give you some of your strongest abilities in the prologue to give the player a taste of how powerful Samus will be. Metroid 1 goes the opposite direction. Right from the start, you as a player feel like you're deep in enemy territory, completely outmatched, and completely lost. I'm serious, here's how my first session went. I got the Morph Ball, climbed up this long shaft, went down a dangerous hallway that led to a locked door, backtracked to another, even more dangerous hallway that led to another locked door, found some missiles, took an elevator, hit more powerful enemies, headed back the way I came, used all five missiles to open a door, made my pea shooter into a longer range pea shooter, went to the other locked door, discovered I never picked up more missiles, grinded until I got them, discovered this room, got stuck in a little nook, and had no choice but to commit suicide. Yeah. Metroid's freaking brutal. There's no in-game map! There's no indication of where I'm supposed to go! It's so frustrating and convoluted and... You know, it's kind of fun? I don't quite get why the Space Pirates would fear Samus so much the way she starts out, but the fact is she's infiltrating the homeworld of the most elite, dangerous group of pirates in the galaxy. And despite what I said earlier about Metroid being about your avatar growing stronger, the game here is doing an excellent job of making me as a player feel very alone and helpless. I can appreciate the complete lack of handholding. I was allowed to proceed onward to challenges I'd have no chance of overcoming, just because they were there. The whole point of this opening sequence is to train the player not to blindly push ahead. Doing that gets you nowhere. 
The game gives you the missiles, then punishes you if you don't go back the way you came and use that upgrade to explore more areas. If I wasn't aware of at least some of Metroid's conventions regarding how missiles unlock doors, I can only imagine how lost I'd be. Okay, so according to the manual, those are statues that are representative of the mini-bosses, and I'll need to take them down to build a bridge in that room. That's why all I could do in there was die. Alright, back to it. All that work the game did making me feel like the odds were stacked against me paid off when I reached this. Just something as simple as collecting that first health upgrade was such a relief, and it's what kept me exploring Brinstar. I'm surprised at the quick sense of progression you get through here. Only about 20 minutes of adventuring and I had the Morph Ball Bombs, the Ice Beam, and two energy tanks. I had also managed to keep a hold on my sense of direction. These rooms all look pretty samey, and I did cover the same ground more than I probably needed to, but as long as I stuck to the corridors, I always had at least a relative sense of where I was. But that doesn't hold true for the many vertical shafts, and this is where it's easy to get lost. All in all, though, it hasn't been as perplexing as I thought it'd be. It's actually pretty endearing when things get a little weird. Like, after I got the Ice Beam, I figured I was supposed to use it to climb up this series of rippers by freezing them, but I was having trouble finding them again. So I headed down this corridor, got a missile upgrade, came to what looked like a dead end, but I noticed I could shoot up the ceiling and hop up there. This led to another energy tank, and then I emerged at the top of the very chasm I was looking for. Was I supposed to be able to do that? Am I supposed to get stuck behind the Chozo statues? Am I supposed to escape here by getting stuck in the ground? Are Zoomers supposed to do that when they don't have a block to stand on? I don't know, and I love the fact that I don't know. Little moments like this are all over the place, and I just keep thinking. Like, was I supposed to get the Varia suit like this? Was that an exploit? Or was it a little of both? I keep coming across things and feeling like I'm kind of outsmarting the game or breaking it in a way that I'm not supposed to. And again, I think that's all part of the design, because in-universe, Samus is supposed to be doing the same thing. On the other hand, why did it take so freaking long to get missile drops? Why does everything look the same? I'm doing my very best to take this game as a product of its time, but it is a product of its time and it does wear on you after a while. So, enough floundering around. Let's see how deep I can actually get before I hit that wall. There's a criticism that gamers a little younger than me often bring up with a game I consider nearly perfect. Donkey Kong Country 2's save system. Specifically, that you have to pay two banana coins at Wrinkly Schoolhouse in order to save your game. Here's the thing, when DKC2 came out, even having a save game was still a bit of a luxury. Needing to grab a few banana coins was no big deal, and I never addressed it in my own video on that game because it never bothered me. But I can see why, if the games you grew up playing weren't so stingy with when and how you got to save, it might be a problem. I never saw it that way because 16-bit was my era. 8-bit was not my era, and I think I'm getting muddled by a similar set of circumstances. I played Melee. I know this song. I know Kraid will be somewhere in the Brinstar Depths. But it's more like Brinstar Deaths, am I right? Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, but seriously, even though I have two energy tanks now, Samus still respawns with only 30 health. The enemies down here are much, much tougher. They take more hits and hit a lot harder. And remember, this is despite the fact that I picked up the Varia suit early, which boosts Samus' defense. The only thing I can see to do is to head back up to Brinstar, farm for energy, and come back here with full tanks. This isn't challenging. This isn't frustrating. This is just busy work. And there's nothing I hate more than when a game wants me to do busy work. I promised myself that I would stop playing whenever one of these games stopped being fun and became a chore, and in any other instance, this would be that wall. But I also expected a game that would be Nintendo hard. And come on, I haven't even fought the first boss yet. This is just how 8-bit conventions worked. Things that seem unfair to me now would have just been accepted by players in 1986. So... Nearly 15 minutes. That's how long it took me to fill up two energy tanks, just mindlessly running back and forth and shooting enemies. This is what I'm expected to do every single time I die. Forget about not having a map, forget about a lack of conveyance, the fact that you have to do this to even have a chance to get lost in this world is the biggest problem I have with Metroid. That said, hopefully the worst is over. Well, it didn't take long for all that health to get whittled down by the demons of the Brinstar Depths. 
Uh, mostly because of pure free-range BS like this. Like, come on, what was I even supposed to do about that? And why can enemies attack me as I load into a room? For that matter, why can they damage and even kill me during a screen transition? This is also why I really started having trouble keeping track of my location. Literally, just about every connecting room in this area has the exact same layout, and again, it's not like it's frustrating in that good kind of overcoming the odds style. On the contrary, it just feels cheap and lazy. But eventually, eventually, I did make it to what was clearly marked as an endpoint. There's even an easy enemy spawner there that you can exploit to fill up your energy. Mind you, it still takes a few minutes due to how stingy the game is with drops, but still, that's accommodating. Suspiciously accommodating. I wonder why... WHAT?! WHAT?! OH GOD! OH NO, WHAT DO I DO?! OH GOD! Hey, an energy tank. YES! GIMME GIMME! I CAN WIN! I FEEL GREAT! I CAN DO THE- oh. I think I might be too little to play this game. At this point, I did go ahead and look up a guide. I beat Kraid by spamming Morph Ball bombs at him. Apparently what I should have done was head over to Norfair and get more upgrades before fighting Kraid to have an easier time here, but honestly, I've hit the wall. I could keep going, but I don't see that I'd be having much fun if I did. Especially because I know for a fact that a return trip to this same mission is in the cards. I'm comfortable saying I've seen enough of the original Metroid. Or so I thought. Much, much later in the production of this season, I found a modification of this game called Metroid Mother. It sadly does not give Samus a striped shirt, but it does update the graphics and give you a mini-map. I only intended to look over it, but I actually ended up playing the entire thing in one go. When you play it like this, what's really stunning is just how short the game really is. Plenty of those repeated rooms are literally just there to pad out the game. When you boil it down, Metroid is a giant maze where you find power-ups, fight two underwhelming bosses, and then gain access to a really frustrating one. The very best games in the series would figure out how to gently, almost invisibly, guide the player through these objectives, while never cutting them off from the larger world. Metroid 1 doesn't do that, it doesn't have any sense of order, and it isn't designed for the player. But it does have a sense of progression. Those short enemies really make you appreciate the wave beam in a way no other game has. And by the end, you can become so powerful that it's comparatively a chore to lose, a chore to get to that save screen. You get to feel that spectrum of power, and especially with the map, I have to admit I had a pretty good time. I've compared this game quite a few times to Donkey Kong Country, and I think there's a reason my mind kept going there. Metroid was a game that was ahead of its time in atmosphere and world building. A game more challenging than most others of the era. A game meant for mature players. And I don't mean mature by the ESRB standards. Where games like Mario or Kirby are easy for anyone to pick up and play, Metroid and DKC are a much steeper challenge, but their deeper mechanics, lore, and the sheer breadth of their worlds give that more experienced, more mature gamer a lot of depth to sink their teeth into. It's kind of funny to notice these parallels, considering that 25 years later, such an awful rift would develop between their fan bases. But it also kind of makes sense that both series would end up almost competing for that necessary level of focus and care. But in stark contrast to DKC's characters and community, Metroid 1 has an incredible sense of isolation, loneliness, and even at times hopelessness. All of its systems coalesce to make you, the player, feel overwhelmed and outmatched. Part of that is just a side effect of how clunky and outdated those systems are, but even that seems largely intentional. I can see why players in 1986 would have loved this game. There was nothing else out there quite so... esoteric. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean the game holds up 30 years later. Next time, though, I'll be looking at a game I know even less about. Metroid 2 Return of Samus. You can watch it right now with a $1 donation on my Patreon. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. You keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing. Thanks for watching. The original Metroid was relatively uncharted territory for me before I started the series, but at least I knew what to expect. Metroid 2 Return of Samus is a game I'm almost oblivious about. I know the ending of the game dovetails into the beginning of Super Metroid, I'm aware of the fan remake that came out a while back, and I'm definitely aware of the controversy that arose when Nintendo forced that fan to take it down. And you know what? That was kind of the catalyst that led to me trying more Metroid games and ultimately starting the series. So what really interests me here is why a remake of a Game Boy game of all things inspired so much dedication and kicked up so much enthusiasm. And that's not me being condemnatory, by the way. I'm genuinely excited to try to dig into what it is about this game that made it worth the remake. 
because, like I said, I'm oblivious. Which is a little weird, because this was my first exposure to the series. The first time I ever remember seeing a Metroid game was when this one was used to showcase the Super Game Boy, a fantastic accessory that let you play DB games on the big screen through the Super NES. I might not have known who this colorful robot thing was, but it was on the box. Then one morning in elementary school, a kid named Jason brought Metroid 2 to morning assembly. This was the first time I'd ever played a Metroid game, and I only played it that one time. But it made a potent impression. More than 20 years later, I still remember being impressed by the quality of the graphics and how nicely it controlled. It didn't feel like a Game Boy game. Suffice to say, I'm pumped to try this. Let's see if those memories hold up. After Samus shut down Mother Brain and put the kibosh on a space pirate's plans to weaponize Metroids, the Galactic Federation decided to send a research ship to the Metroid homeworld, SR-388, to make sure the leeches really were put out to pasture. They lost contact with the crew. So, the Federation tried again, assembling a combat team of armed soldiers from Federation police. As soon as the team landed, they were never heard from again. So with pressure mounting, the Federation finally decided to do what they really should have done in the first place send Samus Aran to the Metroid homeworld and let her finish the fight. Thus, the stage is set. The first half of the story as written is almost a word-for-word -word retelling of Metroid 1's, just with a slightly worse translation. But I can see why they did that. It's a neat touch at just how directly this game's plot picks up from its predecessor. A few other noteworthy things from the manual. One, this map is pretty, but I get the feeling that it'll be even more useless than whatever this thing was trying to be. Two, this looks familiar. And three, they went to the trouble of labeling Samus's left hand. Just so she doesn't lose it. But I guess that could be read as a good thing, that it goes into that level of detail. It provides so much information and depth that I'm... Sorry if I sound like a broken record, but god, I miss instruction manuals. But enough rooting around in the lore. It's time to take the fight to SR-388 and wipe out the Metroids once and for all. <laughs> sure it is. I read an interview saying that the same team that made this game was involved in the Game Boy Color's development, and they programmed a suitable palette for it into the hardware. After comparing some footage, I think that's the way I'm gonna play it. I see what the Super Game Boy Colors are going for, but these darker backgrounds are much more evocative of the series. And wow, what a first impression. Especially playing it right after the original game like this, my memories weren't lying. This game looks fantastic for a Game Boy game. Not many portable games, heck, not many 8-bit games in general, used such large, detailed sprites. And where that hurt visibility in something like Donkey Kong Land, Metroid's slower pace lets it get away with this level of fidelity. Better yet, it controls a million times better than its predecessor. Samus's jump is incredibly floaty, but it feels much more precise. She can finally fire from a crouch, aim downward in midair, and now comes equipped with a full set of energy and missiles. Compared to the NES game, your avatar is so much more capable right from the start. Which makes sense from a story perspective, sure, but outside of the game, a lot had changed since 1986. Remember how back in Metroid 1, I spent the first session wandering around aimlessly and getting stuck in a death trap? It put the screws to you immediately, and thrust you into its convoluted chaos from the word go. But Metroid 2 actually wants the player to like it. It's satisfying as you traverse a linear path from the gunship into the caverns of SR-388, blasting some enemies and getting a handle on the controls. The save system's a lot nicer too. Just hop on these podiums and hit start. These save points are comprehensive. They keep track of your energy and missiles, so you'll only ever restart with as much as you had. I hit a fork in the map, went right, and got stuck, so I doubled back down the other amazingly easy-to-navigate tunnel and hit this. The game did a great job building up to this moment, and even the sight of it gave me pause. Yeah, even I'm not so oblivious that I don't know what that is. But what I didn't know is that they can do this. Yep, Metroids mutate. And that is their first post-larval stage, an Alpha Metroid. It's a pretty quick fight once you figure out how to switch to missiles. And then the Metroid counter in the lower right starts going crazy, attracting your eye and making a big spectacle of itself as it decreases by one. Hunting down each and every Metroid is Samus's mission, to the point that it's front and center at all times. Continuing on past the fight reveals a clever new feature, energy and missile recharge points. <laughs> Do I look like some kind of casual gamer? No thanks, Nintendo. I would just much rather grind out item pickups for another 20 minutes. And it just keeps building from there. You notice how Metroid husks always indicate another alpha nearby? You tumble down a long chasm and get the new spider ball, then use it to climb back out and find another Metroid. You even get a primer on the idea that missiles open doors. You know, just in case. Bosses and power-ups keep things moving, and everything just feels so brisk and smooth and above all, playable. 
the first 30 minutes of this game are designed for the player, in a way that the original Metroid simply wasn't, because the bar had been raised so much in that time. Remember, in the same five years it took Metroid to go from 1 to 2, Mario went from this to this. Gaming had evolved, and Metroid 2 is a fantastic example of how far we've come. It should almost go without saying, considering you've been hearing it, but the music fits with this theme perfectly. It's filled with bravado and excitement and, dare I say it, swagger. You're Samus Aran, the universe's savior, and you're here to take no prisoners! Yeah, okay, maybe I just had a thing for Game Boy music. But eventually, you end up going to a different part of the map, and... Later Metroid games do a good job of building up tension with sound effects like this, but it gets extensive here. I spent about half of this first session listening to those bleeps and bloops, and it got real grating after a while. But it still wasn't as grating as the Ruins music. It plods along and honestly gave me a headache after a while. It sounds like something out of Wario Land if you chopped it in half and slowed it down. And the lack of quality here stands in sharp contrast to the excellence of the main song. I also have some reservations about the Spider Ball. It's one of the big innovations for Metroid 2, and it is a neat idea, allowing Samus to climb walls and ceilings. We'll start with what's plain to see. It is slow, much slower than Samus' regular Morph Ball. Especially when you need to use it for a long duration, it is so dull. What's a little harder to explain if you're not playing it is the controls. See, if you're on the ground and hold right, Samus will continue going forward relative to her position. So you might end up on the ceiling going left but holding right, unless you stop. Now you have to hit left to get Samus going that way, and the same holds true for any direction. And if you activate it while you're at an intersection, you might just get stuck, or at least have to move back so the programming can get a clear idea of where the train is. It's not broken by any means, it's just clunky. The rooms did start blurring together after a while. I mean, not literally like in the first game where they just reuse the same layout, but there's only so much you can do to delineate locations with only four colors. Despite these early quibbles, the biggest example I can show of how much better Metroid 2 is at making a first impression than its predecessor is just by comparing my first sessions. I played Metroid 1 for about 20 minutes, and then I kind of wanted to stop and write about it. But I played Metroid 2 for an hour, and I only stopped because I was worried that if I didn't, I'd start forgetting the finer points of the script. But what I wanted to do was keep playing, and that is the greatest improvement. So let's see how deep SR388 goes. <laughs> well, that didn't take as long. I did hop right back in, and I chose to leave whatever that thing is for later. Not to take away from my earlier criticisms, but I'm really seeing how the spider ball changes the way a player approaches terrain. There are little aha moments as you dig deeper into these tunnels. Remember how I praise Metroid 1 for letting the player feel like they were outsmarting the program? This is a very appropriate extension to that. I unearthed the Varia suit buried in these balls for some reason. Oh, I bet it wouldn't have been so obvious on the original Game Boy's viridescent screen. That reminds me, here's something that used to keep me away from this series. I felt compelled to try to find everything. I felt compelled to bomb every obvious surface and search out every room and, in the later games, scan everything. Because I knew that's what you were supposed to do to 100% the game. What I eventually had to realize about me as a player is that by doing that, I was choosing to let the flow of discovery and combat and skill, the things I actually enjoyed about the game, be constantly interrupted with aimless wandering about and waiting on progress bars to fill up, the things that I don't enjoy. I still hate when the path forward is overly obtuse, but making that mental shift to focusing on what's fun is a huge part of why I'm finding it easier to stay invested in these games. The fact that the Varia suit is buried in all these balls isn't an egregious example because the Varia suit isn't a critical item. It just boosts your defense. But getting it was still an awesome moment, as Samus' entire animation set changes. This was a delineation made due to the game's lack of color, but it would happily become a series mainstay. The Varia suit in this game is like the majority of the missile upgrades and energy tanks. It's a bonus, and it rewards players for thinking outside the box and going off the obvious route. That's fine, and that approach is exactly what hardcore fans of the series often adore about it. I don't mind it either, as long as your main path through the game isn't so convoluted. I like finding things off the beaten path, I just don't want to feel like I have to. I am a little concerned about that though. The whole game is centered around tracking down every single Metroid, and I can assume you have to beat them all to win. That raises a problem. Even this early in the game, my progression is starting to feel kind of... staggered? Kind of repetitive? Every single Metroid fight has been almost literally the same thing. 
The Metroid shows up, flies right at me, gets pushed back by missiles, and dies. It starts to lose any excitement after the dozenth time. So I was excited to see a more powerful Gamma Metroid show up, but it's really nothing different. It just fires lightning bolts, takes more hits, and has a weak spot. It's a little harder, but it's no more interesting. And I mean, this isn't bad, I'm still enjoying the game. I just question the ability of the central thrust of Metroid 2 to carry it through to the end. I stuck around this area, and I'm glad I did. Ten minutes of exploration, and I found the wave beam, an energy tank, the spring ball, the high jump boots, and a bunch of missile upgrades. What made this even cooler was the build-up to some of this stuff. There was a room where my low jump and lack of firepower was making things frustrating, and I was ready to call it out as an example of bad design. But when I came back through after getting the wave beam and high jump, it's a piece of cake. Feeling decked out and ready to take on the world, I proceeded deeper underground. Samus's beams don't stack in this game. Getting the wave beam removed my ice beam, and the same was true of the spacer and plasma beams. I actually don't mind this bit of strategizing though. Each beam has different strengths, like the spacer has a wider arc, but the plasma is much stronger. Unfortunately, Samus can only maintain one kind of beam at a time. You'll have to go back to the upgrade room again in order to switch. And that does seem like an unnecessary complication. Why couldn't you just put a beam switch on the pause menu? Speaking of though, I noticed the pause menu does actually tell you how many Metroids are left in your current level. Now, there's nothing that seems to delineate which level you're on, but still, that's something. This isn't something a lot of people will praise a Metroid game for, but I'm really enjoying this game's linearity, at least relative to some other games in the series. Because you know more game is always located deeper underground, you always have a general sense of where you're supposed to be, but not so much that you know exactly where you're supposed to look. That's one of the positives to not having a map. The negative, though, is that as similar as these rooms are starting to look, it's easy to miss a turn and not know if you've been down that path before or not. The layout is starting to get a lot more esoteric. There was a moment where I saw the path split, so I jumped up here, but couldn't get back down. So I went all the way back around so I could explore this crisscross section, but it led to a dead end. Why? <laughs> but nothing was as esoteric as this. I defeated a bunch of Metroids, got the Tremors, which at this point I'd figured out indicated that I defeated all the Metroids in an area, causing acid somewhere else to lower, allowing me to move on. Ran back past some acid and out of the area, and then there was this great build-up. There was only one Metroid in the area. I traversed a long series of tunnels filled with enemies that recharged all of my energy. I was ready for a fight. Then, a single Gamma Metroid, just like all the others I'd already faced. Hooray. More Tremors! So I headed all the way back out of the caves, through the cramped tunnel, and down that first pit which was now clear of acid. There was a split in the path, and down each fork I fought a Metroid. Then, I had to head back out of the cramped tunnels again and down the other pit to find a new area, and what was the point of all this? Alright, fine, it's time to get a map. But hey, 13 Metroids left. I just don't know if I'm going to be able to hold up that long. Oh no... The boss encounters leave a lot to be desired, but I'm still impressed by the sense of progression in this game. Every time fighting yet another Metroid starts feeling like a chore, you start running into the next evolution. Right when all that time using the sloggy spider ball really starts wearing on you, you get the space jump. I mean, I'm bad at it, but hypothetically you could use it to get around faster. The next area is full of Zeta Metroids, which take way more missiles. It's also full of long, vertical shafts. I did start using a map here, and I don't regret that one bit. I was already enjoying the game, and it became a lot more fun when I stopped wasting time wandering around. There's a reason every Metroid game after this featured better navigation. There's also a section where you can swap to any beam type you like, which is a nice touch, but all these cool weapon choices are wasted here. The main enemies you're tracking down can still only be damaged with missiles, and at this point in the game, Samus is hardy enough that nothing besides the Metroids poses any sort of threat. But I enjoyed this section a lot. It requires the spider ball more than I like, but it's also more open and less claustrophobic than what's come before. The Zeta Metroids are a steeper challenge, and so it just feels better to take them down. Mind you, like the other bosses to this point, you're basically just spamming missiles at them and tanking their attacks, but that may be more inherent to how Metroid games do bosses. In something like, say, Mega Man, you can similarly tank a lot of hits. But unless you brought the weapon that boss is weak to, and sometimes even then, you can't just tank hits and expect to win. You need to know what the enemy can do and what their pattern is. In Metroid, what seems to be more important than your skill as a player is Samus's power and abilities. 
If you have enough tanks and weapons, the damage you take is almost incidental. You'll be able to survive long enough to win. That's not a condemnation of Metroid. Rather, it's more down to how much importance the series places on exploration. Take your time and find the power-ups and you'll have a much easier fight, that makes sense. It just doesn't really go along with my personal preferences, and I wouldn't mind the series leaning into more of that skill curve. All of this really became apparent when I started running into Omega Metroids in the next section. Man, they took a lot of firepower, and they dished out just as much. Omega and Zeta both like to track Samus down and dive bomber, and there's very little warning. They're still not hard fights, but they take their toll on Samus, and after taking down a few, I was low on energy. Here's the problem. There's almost nothing in this penultimate section of the game. Very few enemies to resupply with, absolutely no item upgrades, and no recharge stations. The Omega Metroids take so many hits, it's unreasonable to think that a player would be able to do this without heading all the way back to the last recharge. And that is a lengthy expedition. It took 15 minutes round trip. On one hand, this was the same amount of time it took me to resupply two energy tanks in Metroid 1, and at least in this case I wasn't just mindlessly running across one room. But on the other, this is still padding. It's busy work, and it's unnecessary. I don't mind having my health or supplies restricted for a final boss fight, but when you give the player the option to resupply, then make the fights hard enough that it'll be a necessity, and then make the trek back that far to even get to the resupply point, uh, you better be glad you're cute, Metroid 2. I beat the last of the Omegas, and the counter dropped to one. What followed was a long, long series of tunnels, and I found myself considering the journey to this point. A lot of the reason I struggled with Metroid 1 was due to the state of what was acceptable in gaming in 1986. The fact that this game came out so much closer to the time I started playing video games, similarly, probably has a lot to do with why I've been able to stick with it. But from slightly clunky mechanics, to more than esoteric progression, to very awkward and repetitive boss battles, Metroid 2 is hardly perfect. But take it in context. The fact is, this was a Game Boy game in 1991. And I don't use this word lightly, it was an epic in its own time. Despite running on 8-bit hardware, it did the same thing as the great 16-bit games of its era. It obliterated the boundaries set by its predecessor, and evolved the concept far beyond even the best games of the previous era. There are few Game Boy games that even approach it. It's surprising, then. I wonder why I never heard about how awesome it was. Oh yeah, everything about it was superannuated just three years later. And that is why it needed to be remade. This game reveals the life cycle of the series namesake, hints at the protagonist's origins, and tells the story of Samus' first visit to the Metroid homeworld. It suffers from being on the Game Boy, with a lack of visual differentiation and some clunky, repetitive bosses. And indicative of games of its era, it sometimes punishes the player with unfair design. But it was still a fantastic game, and it is still a pivotal title in the evolution of this franchise. If that remake brings it up to code, or even manages to surpass the level of quality I know is coming, well then, it's no wonder people say Milton Guasti made a better Metroid game than Nintendo. I cannot wait to get to it, and I think I'm gonna appreciate it even more having experienced the original. At the very end, the Metroid counter goes up. Seems the Queen's laid some eggs. I fought off larval Metroids in their most iconic state, I tricked down one last hallway, I heard a cry that's very familiar. The final boss was the Metroid Queen, and it was the most challenging, well-designed boss in the game. I guess that's not saying much, but even the way you beat her is just incredibly satisfying, and it's a real showcase that the Game Boy is even capable of this. Then, there's no countdown, no explosion, nothing else to fight, just a Metroid hatchling, the last Metroid, who imprints on Samus and helps her return to her ship, victorious. Would've been cool if the counter had gone back up when it hatched. But that's such a minor thing. And it doesn't take away from a beautiful ending, an ending which sets up the events of the next game in this series, where that Metroid is in captivity and the galaxy is at peace. Next time, it's the longest, most detailed episode I've ever produced, Super Metroid. And you can watch it right now if you support my work on Patreon. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. You keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing. Thanks for watching. Metroid was a game that I barely played. Metroid 2 was a game that I'd never played, but Super Metroid is different. 
I picked it up when it hit the Wii's Virtual Console in 2007, and I didn't put it down for a while. It's the only game in the entire series that I had completed before I started this season. But 2007 was nine years ago, and those memories have gotten hazy. Plus, now that I've played its predecessors, I'm excited to see how it follows up on them. So, let's ask Dan. Dan, how are things? The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. Super Metroid starts off with one of the most iconic intro sequences of its era. That slightly off-putting digitized voice, which was so rare in games of 1994, was etched into my memory the first time I heard it. What follows is told through simple story scenes, interspersed with a first-person account of Samus's arc to this point. We see her fighting Mother Brain on Zebus. We see her meeting the Metroid Hatchling at the end of the last game, and we learn what's happened since then. Samus delivered the Hatchling to the research station Ceres. The scientists on board made promising discoveries that the Metroid's power could be harnessed to benefit humankind, neat, and that they may have originally been created for peaceful purposes. Huh? Satisfied with their progress, Samus leaves the research station to hunt her next bounty, but she's barely gotten out the door when she receives a distress signal from Ceres. She floors it back to the station, and the game begins. This intro may be hard to criticize. Like I said, it's one of the most iconic of the era. But I've got a few thoughts. For one, it's an unskippable cutscene. I hate it when games do this now, and it's really no big deal since it's just the intro, but it's still been a bit of a bore whenever I've tried to pick it up again. More importantly though, I just don't know how effective it is for those not already invested in the lore. Zebes, Ceres, Mother Brain, the Larva, this is all pretty deep and jargony, and I'm not sure if someone new to Metroid would get pulled in from this alone. I know it didn't do it for me back in 07. Watching it now though, I think this entire intro, from the moment you turn the game on, would have been thrilling for diehard Metroid fans. You know that's the Laravel Metroid on the title screen. You know it's making the same noises as the penultimate tunnel in the previous game. You know why this gets to take the title of Metroid 3, and you know exactly who shows up once you get to series. And if this story failed to grip a new player, the developers hedged their bets that the gameplay would. Samus lands, and you begin play with nothing but an ambient noise of a distant alarm. It eventually fades to your ears, but it only accentuates the chilling absence of life on the station. I found the area depicted in the title screen, but the systems are offline, and the Metroid is gone. Did it break free? Who or what did this? Beyond setting up the arc of the story, this also serves as a basic tutorial for Samus' controls, and the first thing I noticed was how much sharper she is. She feels better than ever, and it's not just because of the new run button. The Super NES allows for much faster, more kinetic gameplay, and it keeps the unusual floaty jump. And that's not a bad thing at all. Quick platforming is not the focus here, and it's still easy to navigate Samus exactly where you want her to be. The biggest change is that Samus can finally fire in eight directions, both by holding the directions diagonally or with L and R. The player character is immediately much more versatile and yet more controllable. My increased familiarity with the material did bring one question to mind. This doesn't seem to be taking place too long after Metroid 2, so how come Samus is back to square one? Where's the spider ball, the screw attack, even the morph ball itself? I guess I could accept that Samus saw fit to power down her suit in lieu of all that galaxy at peace stuff, but given that the story is so closely connected to the previous one, I wish it had been addressed. That's ultimately a minor complaint, and I completely forgot about it when this happened. A room devoid of anything except the last Metroid, and then... Ridley shows up again, almost kills Samus, and makes off with a larva. That sprite scaling, so iconic of the Super Nintendo, helps to drive home just how outmatched Samus is. Ridley leaves her to die because the station is set to explode. I don't really know why that's happening. Was it a failsafe? Are the space pirates responsible? It doesn't really matter. Countdowns are ultimately just a Metroid trope, and they are always awesome. All that quite trepidation of the simple tutorial rooms you just went through, juxtaposed with what's happening now as they rock back and forth violently, rubble falling and pipes bursting. It's a wonderful sequence, and this is the point the game got its hooks in me back in 2007, because it was still that impressive. Importantly though, it's not at all difficult to escape. This is not meant to challenge the player, not yet. Instead, it's to wow the player and get them invested. The next thing you see is Samus's ship heading to Zebus. And when I first played this, I had no idea why exactly she was going there. Was she crash landing? But I do think that shoehorning another story scene in would have broken the flow at this point. Even if you didn't recognize Ridley as one of the space pirates, you'd figure it out soon enough. But why are the space pirates even on Zebus again? Didn't we wipe them out in Metroid? 
Yeah, the manual throws in that it's a rebuilt planet Zebus, but in my personal headcanon, Samus got irritated by antiquated controls and enemies killing her during room transitions, and decided to just let the space pirates be. But seriously, I love the implication of this quick transition. Samus doesn't wait for orders, doesn't hesitate, doesn't even lick her wounds. Despite the fact that she just got her butt kicked, she immediately takes the fight to the space pirate homeworld because the threat of Metroid weaponization is that severe, and she's that crazy brave. Zebus feels dilapidated and antiquated, a thick fog hanging over a familiar chasm. The only signs of life are these small insects and vermin, which scatter as Samus passes through. She eventually emerges into the same chamber you might have taken her through eight years previous. It's rare even now that a later game lets you return to a place like this, but when they do, it's usually to cater to nostalgia. This isn't about nostalgia, quite the opposite. This is about emphasizing how much time has passed. Zebus seems to have been untouched since the original game, but when I touch down here, at the very spot where Metroid began, <laughs> even in 2007 I knew what to do. You go left, you get the morph ball. And then... Whoa, that's disconcerting. These lights are the first signs of any higher intelligence on Zebus. Yet despite the volume and intensity of this effect, nothing else happens. But hey, I've got the morph ball now. Better head back up and oh, they know. Only now do the space pirates reveal themselves, wildly outnumbering Samus. Learning to make Metroid crawl leads to the morph ball bombs, and then the door slams shut. This is the first proper boss battle, as the Chozo statue springs to life. The manual has a section for every other boss, but it doesn't spoil this one. Those sparkly new bombs aren't really effective, but the way the statue breaks down throughout the fight is a great effect. This series has finally gotten its signature save rooms. They still don't restore your items and energy, but enemies in this game are a lot friendlier with restorative drops. Super Metroid is no longer interested in wasting the player's time. Spots that could have been a chance for tedium are instead used to surprise the player with quicker ways around. And the one time I actually was thinking of grinding my health back, a hidden passage above just led to a recharge station. But far and away, the most critical change to the Metroid formula is the addition of the map. It'll fill in automatically as you explore, but each area also has a map computer that fills in most of the rest. It'll show you the main paths, but it still doesn't spoil many of the ancillary areas and secrets. It marks save points, recharge stations, and the location of the area boss. And critically, it fills in with a different color as Samus explores, which tells the player where they haven't been yet. You might be saying to yourself, it doesn't look like much. It's very boxy and grid-based. But believe me, it is exactly as informative as it needs to be. If it was any less detailed, it wouldn't serve the player's needs so well and you'd risk getting lost. But if it was more detailed, it would risk encroaching on the player's own exploration. Later games tended to show you your next objective on the map, and we'll get to those when we get to them. But it's a testament to how insanely well-designed Super Metroid is that I don't think it needs to tell you where to go. I never got lost. I could always intuit where I needed to be next. And remember, I'm a twitchy action gamer who is normally real bad at this stuff. A little further on, you run into stronger space pirates who can only be defeated with missiles, and since you have them equipped anyway, come on, the devs knew you'd go in here. This enormous monolith represents the bosses of the game, and just like in Metroid, Samus will need to beat them all to progress to the final area. What, did they not feel like putting a suicide pit in here? Pfft. Gamers of 1994 had gone soft. Speaking of suicide, how about Samus's death animation? We're certainly not worried about hiding her gender anymore, are we, Nintendo? Honestly, this would have raised my parents' eyebrows if I'd played it when I was little. The first sub-boss never stuck with me the way the Chozo statue did. The music is delightfully creepy, but it always feels like it's building up to something that never comes. You just spend a lot of time waiting while the spore spawn wriggles around. But even it shows a difficulty progression, and that's something that all bosses in this game do well. Plenty of other games' bosses just tended to go through the same patterns, but Super Metroid's ramp up the tension as the fight progresses. You can tell the enemy is getting weaker and more desperate and dangerous. Their colors become muted as they start to die. And even if he is a bit of a bore, Spore Spawn is a real breath of fresh air after slogging through 30-some Metroids in the last game. Plus, he reminds me of Barbos from off of Donkey Kong Country 3. Anyone? No? Moving on. The prologue set up the story and made Samus feel insignificant versus the might of Ridley and the Space Pirates. Conversely, this first section of the game is all dedicated to making the player feel awesome and powerful, but it accomplishes this in a very different way from most other games. Just letting you curb stomp your way to victory wouldn't be consistent with what had come before, so instead, Super Metroid presents you with challenges that feel monumental, but aren't nearly as daunting as they seem. Take the Jozo statue. He towers over Samus, attacks in a wide radius, and spews projectiles. But if a wayward shot collides with those projectiles, and it will, boom! 
you get a ton of pickups. I think every time I've ever fought this thing, I've survived with about a quarter of health. It feels like I barely scraped by, even though I was never really in much danger. Same thing with the space pirates, who crawl along the walls and vastly outnumber you but die in one hit. Same thing with Sporespawn, who cheerfully provides you with resupplies while you wait for it to expose its weak point. The area really opens up once Samus defeats not Barbos and gets the super missiles. I particularly like how you emerge backwards into a familiar area, which might clue a new player into just how far off the beaten path they can go. And if you want to talk about finding secrets, this was the point where I remembered a very significant addition to Samus's arsenal. The wall jump. Your timing has to be just right, but Samus can gain height off of walls. Combined with her already floaty jump, a skilled player can scale any flat vertical surface. And an even more skilled player… well… I heaped a lot of praise on Metroid for giving the player the freedom to feel like they were breaking the game and outsmarting the developers. And while Metroid 2 was largely lacking in such moments, Super Metroid brings them back with aplomb. Right here, what's supposed to happen is that you take the elevator down into Norfair, learn that there are areas that Samus can't take the heat down there, collect a few upgrades, including the high jump boots, then head back up and use those boots to access this area, behind the wall in the elevator room. Those upgrades will serve you well when you fight Kraid, who ends up being a literally massive showcase for the Super NES. When you take him down, you get the Varia suit, which buffs your defense and finally allows Samus to take the heat. I am positive that this sequence of events is exactly what I did when I first played this. And even if you so happen to come back here first, without that higher jump, that ledge is just too high up. The wall jump just doesn't give you enough horizontal momentum. But this time, I decided to try something. Now, I'm no genius. That's a real obvious trick that I'm positive was caught in development. And it would have been easy to just make the ledge higher, or even lock the door. But nope, Super Metroid just lets you proceed onward, all the way to Crate. And I had a much rougher go of it without the upgrades. Developers who didn't respect their players so much might have scoffed at the idea of allowing them to even do this. They'd have seen it as something to be fixed. The fact that you can break this sequence is an example of how mature Super Metroid is. The developers give you so much leniency, with the expectation that you'll be able to handle the consequences. And that responsibility continues to grow in Norfair. To this point, there's been a map computer near the beginning of every area, but Norfair locks it behind a door I couldn't open. So I had to circumnavigate these tunnels and fill out the map myself. Norfair is also where Samus picks up the speed booster, and it's my favorite ability in her entire arsenal. I'm gonna give you guys a moment to process this. Me liking a speed upgrade. I know you're astonished, but we'll get through this. Given a wide enough stretch of land, the run button now enables Samus to bolt directly through every single thing in her path. Heck, the name kind of undersells it, unless the team had a premonition of what boost would mean in about 14 more years. The speed booster also enables a more advanced technique. Press down during a boost to store power, then within a few seconds, Samus can dart off in any upward or horizontal direction at the cost of health. I've uh, never been particularly good at aiming anywhere but up, but man, it makes Samus out to be so much more powerful that she's capable of stuff like this. It's an ability that would become integral to speedruns, and speaking of which, I just found another cool thing. Look, backtracking is a necessary evil in games like this, and while it's never been my favorite thing, I accept it comes with the territory. In Norfair, you're meant to get the speed booster, use it to collect the ice beam, then backtrack all the way to Brinstar to get the power bombs. Then you head all the way back to Norfair and use the power bombs to reveal a hidden tunnel in the ice beam room that leads to the next boss. And if you're not sick of going through the same sequence over and over and over again, you still need to back out for a fourth time. And that's all fine for your first time through. It'll help a new player keep a good handle on where they're supposed to be going. But guess what? A well-timed wall jump can get you the wave beam early. It lets you shoot through walls, which lets you hit a switch from the wrong side, which lets you proceed without ever leaving Norfair. And again, they freaking knew! The way the game constantly makes allowances for experienced players like this is, I believe, where so much of its replayability and appeal lies, especially for people like me who might not normally get a lot out of this genre. Backtracking can almost always be circumvented, and thus it isn't just a device to artificially lengthen the game. Of course, the fewer upgrades you have, the tougher these bosses will be. There's a reason Super Metroid was so critical in raising speedrunning to an art form, you know? It's versatile enough that you can even beat the bosses in reverse order, but all that openness never comes at the expense of the experience. Croco Meyer is another easy boss, but he's a neat one, tanking hits infinitely until Samus can back him up into the lava. Hmm, you think the DKC3 team might have been fans of this game? He dies a real gruesome death that looks like something out of Mortal Kombat, and then, just when you think you've won, he bursts through the wall and promptly falls to pieces. You thought right. Oh, uh, and I'd never noticed before, but look at the lava! You can actually see the bubbles when his remains move to the other side. Oh, the details! 
For a long time now, the game's been teasing the player by putting blocks over pits, and here's where it pays off. The grapple beam. Honestly, I've always found it just a little clunky. It's not nearly as bad as the spider ball from the last game, but it still feels a bit unnatural and unpredictable where Samus will end up, and I think the animation on her swing could have been smoother. And while we're talking about him, let's hit the final HUD ability, the X-Ray Scanner. It uses a neat graphical beam trick to uncover hidden passages and special blocks. I kinda thought it was just good for completionists, but I found myself using it a lot to help solve the more esoteric puzzles deep into the game. And it's partly why, like I said earlier, I never got lost. And I have no idea how exactly they nailed such perfect, indirect conveyance. Following the main path, you'd be sure to see this distinct room in Criteria that leads to the next section ages before you ever get the grapple beam, and you'd remember to check it. As for me, I went to this room before leaving Norfair. Well, I might not know how to get to Ridley yet, but I know where he's hiding. At this point, I decided to check out this little unexplored section on the map, and that turned into a half an hour detour back to the surface. I was surprised by how enjoyable it was to dig into Brinstar, or I guess up out of it, because I'd acquired so many abilities since the first time through. Super Metroid almost never forces you to backtrack, and I think that's why I enjoyed doing it. I chose to take the long way, and I was rewarded for it. On this detour, I ran into the few creatures who are actually friendly. They show off how to do the advanced techniques, especially the wall jump. There's a save point in this pit, and if you use it, you literally can't escape until you get good enough at wall jumping. And think about it, it makes sense. They really wanted to ensure that a player would be able to break the game on their second playthrough. But this next section is where all my attempts since 2007 have tapered off. Let's figure out why. The wrecked ship crash landed on Zebus a long time ago, and upon your arrival, it's dark, ambient, filled with scattering vermin, and feels lost to time. Which is cool and all, but this is the third time now that Super Metroid has pulled this trick, and it's starting to lose its edge. The reason why it's all dark is more interesting, and it's actually a contrast to Metroid's usual sci-fi themes. Samus is accosted by ghosts, and she soon finds their big boo, a boss called Fantoon. He may not be as flashy as Kraid or as memorable as Krokomire, but he is the first real challenge I've faced in this game, and that was fun. I especially like how unfair and unavoidable this attack seemed until I remembered to use my head and just jump through it. It's very appropriately Metroid. Defeating Fantoon turns the power back on, and I don't know. I get that it's supposed to be a wrecked vessel, but it feels convoluted and cramped. And worse yet, the game seems to suddenly be a little more okay with wasting time. Like, why does this room want me to defeat all the enemies to open the doors every single time I come through it? Ugh, and it keeps wanting to drop me back toward the water. Water is not fun to be in in this game, although it does have an unusually accurate depiction of water physics. But I think at least that part is intentional. It makes it all the more satisfying when a Chozo statue literally delivers Samus by hand to her final form the gravity suit. The way that Samus gains and loses and regains power-ups throughout this series is typically something that can be hand-waved as a consequence of it being a game first and a sensible, logical story second. But the way this Chozo is highlighted calls attention to it and raises some questions. Unless my osmosis knowledge is wrong, I think Samus was raised by the Chozo, and it's their tech that gives her her abilities. So the fact that a ship just so happened to be carrying this statue, which only springs to life and uncovers a hidden path beneath a bed of spikes where a morph ball is inserted, just raises some questions. Questions that I don't think there are any answers to. It's an ancient, unsolvable mystery within the lore of the game, and I really like that. Now the game dunks you in the water and lets you experience the freedom the gravity suit brings. Ah. The wrecked ship feels a bit tacked on. It's still not at all bad, and the boss in particular is one of my favorites. It just doesn't quite meet the same standard of quality we've had up till now. It is ultimately a very short section of the game, but I was happy to leave it. Samus is gonna need that gravity suit, because what comes next is Metroid's first stab at a water level. Now the fact that she controls exactly the same way regardless could have made that distinction moot, but Meridia stands out as an apt depiction of the deep sea. In real life, the deeper under the sea you go, the more strange and almost alien the creatures become. Super Metroid manages to capture that difference. Near the top of the map, things don't seem so weird, but as you explore deeper, the entire tone changes. Meridia's use of a screen filter, the enemies and creatures you'll find down here, the way bubbles constantly emerge from Samus's helmet, and especially that music, all make it memorable and distinct. This extends to the terrain, too. There are deep, wide trenches that the water is hollowed out, which really sets it apart from the earlier bricky corridors. There's this huge vertical water pipe early in the map, and did you see that? Was that a Metroid? Further on, I came across undersea space pirates. <laughs> what are you guys doing down here, and why are you invincible? Well, they're here because at the center of Meridia lies the space pirate lab, where they seem to be trying to clone the last Metroid. 
These things are called Noctroids. They don't quite look the part, and they definitely don't live up to what they're trying to emulate. They're just a poor imitation of the real thing. I'm hilarious. Okay, seriously, Noctroids are probably the one bit of the lore that doesn't quite come through on its own. I love, love, love this game's approach to story. Aside from the intro, it's all subtext. But unless I had read about Noctroids in the manual, I don't think I'd have picked up on what's going on here. The sub-boss here is Batwoon, and he's... eh? I literally had no memory of him at all. He's fine, he's just like a lot of other 16-bit bosses. Fortunately, Dragon more than makes up for him. He has a great design and is just powerful to the point of being intimidating. I remember really struggling with this guy my first time through. He has a fantastic exploit if you think outside the box. You destroy one of the laser cannons, let him grab you, then use your grapple beam on the exposed wreckage. God, that's satisfying. It was here that I noticed that Samus's power scaling had slowed down. Meridia doesn't throw many new upgrades at you. In fact, the only one you have to get, the space jump, is almost ancillary at this point. Being able to jump infinitely just doesn't matter much when you can wall jump and shine spark. So instead of focusing on upgrades, Meridia becomes far more open, obtuse, and difficult to navigate. Even when you get the map data, it leaves out interconnecting tunnels to critical areas. But that's all entirely appropriate. By now, the player shouldn't need a continuous supply of power-ups to encourage them. So, by opening up like this, Meridia allows you to put everything you've learned, and everything you've earned, to good use. And it's only if you do take the time to clear out the whole map, that you'll find Samus' final arm cannon power-up, the Plasma Beam. It cuts through those scuba pirates with ease, and getting something so powerful incentivized me to check the other side of the map, where after a complex series of tunnels, I got... the Spring Ball. Yay! But hey, there's only one boss left, and I know just where he's cowering. It's finally time to strike back at Ridley. Forget everything I said about the space jump being ancillary. You need it just to get in here. Meridia was a challenge due to its wide open navigation and puzzles, but it was eerie in its tranquility. Lower Norfair is a powerful contrast. It's a linear shot that's challenging not because it's obtuse, but because it's hard. Enemies take tons of hits and send you hurtling. There's lava everywhere, and rooms where you have to skillfully navigate with time jumps, and enemies who red hot kick and become weak for a few seconds, they all whittle away at your health. It's tense and exciting and frustrating, and I'm having so much fun! I thought another fake Chozo statue, but where the first time was about making you feel like you'd overcome something, now you get a real fight on your hands. He takes tons of hits and has so many attacks, and freaking catches your missiles and throws them back at you. Then you get the iconic screw attack and you're gonna freaking need it, because Lower Norfair, well, it's freaking brutal. It reminds me a lot of the original Metroid actually, but all the challenge here is fair and punishing. Seriously, I was all ready to count off on Super Metroid for being a little too easy for my tastes. But that was only because I'd forgotten about this. Because I'd forgotten about Ridley, who you finally confront, and who just starts wailing on you. You remember how last time, I complained that the Metroid's style might not make for the kind of skill-based boss battles I like? Eh eh, I was wrong. To this point in the game, the only time I had died was when I did it on purpose to get footage, and I was hoping to keep it that way. And with only a sliver of health left, Ridley caught me. And I knew that was it. I'd lost my little self-imposed challenge. I... I didn't remember that Ridley grabs you and then he dies. Super Metroid gave me a steep enough challenge that by the end my heart was racing, and I... I never would have expected that out of this series. I went to the next room only to find... Oh... The last Metroid is no longer in captivity. In Metroid 2, the road to the finale was a bunch of boring tunnels with nothing in them. In Super Metroid, Ridley is almost on the complete opposite side of the map, but the journey is not boring. Same as my detour earlier, I was moving through areas I hadn't been in a very long time, and the powers I'd earned since uncovered a lot of secrets. But at last, it's time to shatter this statue and break into Torian, the Space Pirates Command Center and home of Mother Brain. Mother Brain is an artificial intelligence created by the ancient Chozo. The AI turned rogue when Zebus was invaded by the space pirates, deciding that with their help, she could, quote, reset the universe back to zero. She is the mad operator behind all of Zebus' defenses, and appropriately enough, the brains behind the space pirates' every move. Samus destroyed her and the old Torian command center back in Metroid, but the space pirates must have performed a system restore when they came back. And it looks like Mother Brain has figured out how to clone the real thing. Just as they have near the end of every game so far, the series' namesake finally show up for a fight. And they're as easy to take down as ever, which drives the point home. Samus is the one thing they fear. 
then I ran into the strongest drones in the entire game. The only way to beat these guys is with five super missiles, and still they go down. But then I came to this room, and... Oh. There used to be a boss fight here. Enemies all around crumble to dust. Then... God, could this even stronger sidehopper be what's causing all this? Nothing I do affects him until... That right there is Super Metroid's namesake. That is THE Super Metroid. It sucks the sidehopper dry, killing this creature that I couldn't even damage. Then it turns its attention to Samus. Not even the screw attack can save her. And I felt like I was missing something. I felt like there had to be some way to fight this thing. But then, Samus's low health alarm kicks in. And the Metroid is reminded of something. Reminded of where it heard that sound before. Because this Super Metroid is the very same one that imprinted on Samus back on SR388. Taken by Ridley and mutated into this abomination. It flies around crying, confused and conflicted, and leaves Samus alone. But while Samus catches her breath, I guess this is my last chance to air a few general nitpicks. I wouldn't call any of these flaws per se, but no game is perfect. First, it would be really nice if you could see your completion percentage without having to beat the game. Second, screen transitions take a little too long, especially after they were so snappy back in Metroid 2. And I know this last one's gonna be controversial, but there's one other thing I think I might enjoy more in the earlier games. The music. There's just nothing here that sticks with me, like Brinstar Depths or Metroid 2's overworld theme. But that is really more down to how Super Metroid uses its music to complement its ambience. I just prefer my game soundtracks to be more upbeat and melodic to complement the gameplay. But that's just me. And Super Metroid's more cinematic approach is to its benefit. But then we come to this room. This is the final save point in the entire game, and it is, in my opinion, the one and only thing that is outright flawed about Super Metroid. Because if you save here, you can never go back. This door, for some arbitrary reason, just never opens once the Super Metroid shows up. Meaning that unless you already have everything, you'll never be able to get 100% completion on that save file if you use this thing. I'm not a completionist myself, but even I know, this was the wrong decision on the part of the developers. And there's no defending it. The only reason I can think they would do this would be so new players would have to play through the whole thing again, and maybe then they'd discover all those cool sequence breaks. That might explain it, but it still doesn't excuse it. But hey, if a wayward save point is the one blemish on what is otherwise a tour de force of game design, even that's nitpicking. So you just don't use the save point and move on. One more time, the game leverages fans' expectations by repeating the mother brain fight from the first game. Oh, she goes down real easy, but is that it? So, I guess they did more than just a system restore. Mother Brain has a mechanized body that kicks in as soon as she's knocked off life support. She howls with this terrible mechanical roar and just lays into Samus. I'm unloading everything I have and she doesn't bat an eye. Instead, she closes that eye and charges this. I can't control Samus anymore. She's too weak, and she definitely won't be able to take another blast like that. That's when, in an act of redemption, the Super Metroid absorbs the laser and sucks Mother Brain dry. It starts restoring Samus's energy, but you might notice the boss music is still playing through all this, and the first sign of trouble you'll see is a breath. Mother Brain wakes up. Now, all through the game, every boss I've fought has gone from vibrant colors to more muted tones as I've taken them down. So. I knew exactly what was happening. The Super Metroid is dying as it tries to protect Samus. It charges at Mother Brain and... Way back at the start, it was hinted that the researchers at Ceres had found a way to use Metroids for good. Chekhov's gun fires here, because the Metroid absorbed Mother Brain's laser. And when it dies, that energy is transferred to Samus's power suit. There may be no other final boss in gaming that is such a curb stomp. Mother Brain can't even do anything unless you just decide to stop firing. And if you do, you'll see she's in a terrified panic. Every shot you take sends her reeling. You can feel the impact. And it doesn't take long for the leader of the space pirates to be torn to shreds. This fight is not difficult if you found even a few extra energy tanks. I don't think I've ever even died here. Ridley was way more challenging. But here's the thing. I had forgotten all about Ridley in the past nine years. This sequence is not a challenge. It's a spectacle of perfectly balanced game design that both teaches and speaks through subtext, culminating in one of the most poignant, satisfying moments in the history of this medium. And I remembered every last detail of this. 
It's even more touching to me now because I rescued this Metroid. Mother Brain's death triggers a chain reaction all the way to the core of Zetus. The game is bookended by explosive escape sequences, but this one is on a planetary scale. It's bittersweet to see such a cohesive and complete world on the verge of meeting its demise. Throughout the game, you can find places where the map connects to another section where it doesn't really need to, just because. The development team invigorated the world with details, even when they were unlikely to be noticed or appreciated. If you're low on health, you can use your weapon rations to heal yourself. You can disable upgrades from a menu, even though there's absolutely no reason to do that. But if you do, every single beam type has a supercharge. You can actually save the animals who taught you the advanced techniques if you decide to take a detour while the planet's exploding. The only difference that makes is a teeny little pixel that escapes Zebus during the ending. Wait, did the animals escape on the wrecked ship? Ah, it's stuff like that. There is no reason for these accoutrements to be there. Most players are never even going to see this stuff, but the fact that they are there just adds to how complete this world is. And that cohesion follows through the entire experience from the gameplay to the graphics to the level design just... Ugh! At the beginning of this series, I said that some of my favorite games don't follow the formula I laid out back when I started this channel. Super Metroid is one of those games. I didn't just like it, I loved it. And coming back to it now, I have loved it even more. Metroid 1 and 2 were games I had to think of in context of their time in order to appreciate. Super Metroid needs no such qualifiers. Because technology was no longer an obstacle for these developers. Quite the opposite, Super Metroid is where technology finally caught up with what Metroid was trying to be this whole time. Nothing, nothing about this game has been superannuated in the 22 years since its release. That a game from 1994 could not only hold up, but actually still be the definitive example of its genre is indicative of just how mind-bogglingly ahead of its time it was. Whether you played it when it was new, or have discovered it in the decades since, nostalgia is a non-issue. Super Metroid is a masterpiece. It had taken Metroid eight years to get here, to make that masterpiece. It would be another eight years before any new game in the series was released. But if gamers could hold out that long, they would bear witness to the most lucrative and active years this franchise ever had. And by the way, I checked my Wii U Virtual Console version of Super Metroid, and it turns out, I actually did make it all the way to the beginning of Lower Norfair back in July of 2013. I was trying to figure out why I stopped there, and then it hit me. It was because I started this channel, and that ate up all my free time. That makes me feel oddly sentimental. Thank you guys for being here. Next time, Metroid Fusion. You can see it, as well as the entire rest of this season, for just a dollar on Patreon. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. You keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing. Thanks for watching. Eight years since Super Metroid, and gaming had changed. The evolution of 3D graphics, the rise of new hardware manufacturers, the fall of Sega, the ubiquity of the internet, and Metroid missed all of it. Aside from a few cameos, Samus made herself scarce. Eight years is a long time, but on November 17, 2002, Metroid fans finally saw their franchise resurrected. Two new Metroid games would be released that day. One was approached with caution at best, and blind hatred at worst. After all, how could this unproven team at Retro Studios possibly capture what made Metroid Metroid? Especially with a first-person shooter of all things! It is ironic, then, that the other game, the 2D side-scroller, the one that was developed by the same team who made the previous entry, that game, Metroid Fusion, would be the one that truly shattered the Metroid formula. But both of these titles are prime examples, pun intended, of my failure to engage with this series before I began this project. In Fusion's case, I tried to play it in 07 after I fell in love with Super Metroid, I tried again when it came out for 3DS Ambassadors, I picked it up, started it, and dropped it over and over and over again. And I don't think I ever even made it out of the first section, until a few months ago when I casually picked it up and just tore through it in a handful of settings. Remember, this project began when I suddenly found myself invested in Metroid, and the Game Boy Advance games were the catalyst. In Fusion, we learned the catalyst for the creation of this universe's greatest threat. Turns out the Chozo race created the Metroids as the perfect predator of the X-Parasites, transmutational beings that threatened to overwhelm the ecosystem of SR388. The word Metroid in the Chozo language even translates to Ultimate Warrior. Of course, just like in this universe, that little experiment backfired. But now that Samus has caused the genocide of the Metroid species, the X-Parasites have begun to propagate once again. 
Following the destruction of Zebus, the Galactic Federation hires Samus to assist in an excavation of SR-388. The story really stresses how much Samus hates this place, and she's gonna end up despising it even more because it's there that she's infected by the X-Parasite. But it must not have seemed like a big deal, because rather than taking any precautions, Samus gets right back to work. The X invades her central nervous system, and she loses consciousness at the most inopportune time. Her iconic gunship explodes in an asteroid field, but a comatose Samus is saved by the auto-eject. Unfortunately, the X has burrowed its way even into her power suit. The surgeons amputate parts of the infected suit, dramatically altering her appearance, but it's not enough. Samus is on the verge of death, until a surgeon proposes injecting her with cells they'd harvested from the last Metroid. Instantly, the infection is cleared, and Samus wakes up. I like this bit of characterization in the intro. One life ended, but I was reborn as something different. Pondering this fact, I realize. I owe the Metroid hatchling my life twice over. Samus is not the kind of character to show overt sentimentality. Like the series itself, she tends more towards subtlety. Just how much of a connection, if any, did she feel with the Metroid hatchling? This is as close as we come to an answer, at least for now, and I'd say it's all we need. It was a bold move to so alter the appearance of the series' protagonist. You know how people new to the series often think that this character is named Metroid? Well, it's a little more appropriate now, as not only does she more look the part, her very biology has changed. No sooner does Samus wake up than a distress signal is received from the nearby Biologic Labs research station, which has been running tests on the creatures of SR-388. There was an explosion on board, and despite her state, there's only one bounty hunter the Federation trusts to check it out. Samus claims that the explosion awakes a nameless fear in her heart, showing a vulnerability that she never has before, because without that iconic armor, she is vulnerable. No matter how much energy you get in this game, Samus can never tank hits like she used to, and thanks to her Metroid DNA, she's now incredibly weak to the cold. She looks sleeker and more alien, and I don't like it, but I don't think I'm supposed to. There's something unsettling about seeing her in this state. Getting rid of her gunship is meant to invoke a similar effect. The things you've taken for granted are changing. Nowadays, it'd be a near certainty that after an eight-year hiatus, a series would be rebooted or at least go back to basics. It would have been sensible, maybe even profitable, to just boil Metroid down to its most famous components and make it accessible to that next generation. Instead, Fusion picks right up where Super Metroid left off, acknowledges itself as Metroid 4, and promptly corrupts the franchise's most iconic elements. Say what you will, but it was a bold decision. Even the title screen is distorted. It uses a similar arrangement to the original games, but every time it's about to get to that more heroically introspective melody, it instead hints at something more sinister. The Federation provides Samus with a ship, but due to her condition and the sensitive nature of their research, she'll be following the orders of the onboard AI. The situation reminds her of the only other time she took direct orders while serving under her former commanding officer, Adam Malkovich. She privately names the AI in his honor. Oh, and just like Super Metroid, there's no way to skip this intro. But here's the difference. Everything Super Metroid needed to communicate after that was done through subtext. In Fusion, there is a buttload of on-screen dialogue and exposition throughout the entire game. This is the most controversial thing about Metroid Fusion, because more than just blowing up Samus's ship or changing her look, the most corrupted thing about it is the Metroid formula itself, the way it seeps down even into the gameplay. Not only is the story dictated to you through dialogue, your progression through the game is as well. It's not uncommon for doors to arbitrarily lock behind you when you're not supposed to go back. The computer will always tell you exactly where to go and what you're looking for. It's highlighted on your map, and even reiterated when you load a save. Planet Zebus was an interconnected world, but the BSL station is man-made, laid out in a far more logical and linear fashion. The bulk of the game takes place in six simulated breeding environments. Each one begins with a navigation room, a save room, and a recharge room. You'll hit the navigation panel, receive your orders, head into the environment to carry them out, then report back for more orders. The breeding grounds are a way to give the game a sense of place distinct from the previous games in the series without compromising creativity in varied environments. A game that released around the same time, Super Mario Sunshine, had a distinct theme, but its levels ended up feeling way too similar. Fusion doesn't suffer from that. This is theming done right. The game never lets you forget that the environment is artificial, the same way your progression is artificial, your CO is artificial. Put it this way, Super Metroid has Meridia, the deep sea. Fusion's water section is a fish tank. Samus feels as solid as ever, maybe even more so. She's a little slower, likely a consequence of smaller screen size, and her jump isn't as floaty as it used to be. 
The Game Boy Advance's lack of buttons forced a remap of her controls, and you now activate missiles and power bombs by holding the R button while firing, and aim diagonally with L. The speed booster, when you get it, kicks in automatically just by running for long enough. And that's one change I don't really like. With no run button, there's no way to tweak Samus's jump trajectory. It's no big deal, especially with the blocky level design. But, you know, I'll always prefer more momentum-based gameplay. Other than that, though, I actually prefer this control scheme to Super Metroid's. It's a lot more natural to hold R to ult fire instead of mashing select to cycle through a bunch of options. Samus has lost all of those options thanks to the X Parasites, but without that bulky armor, she's gained the ability to grab ledges and climb ladders. Her wall jump has been nerfed, and now casts her much further away, meaning she can't scale a single wall. That ability was critical in sequence breaking the previous game. In fact, sequence breaks of any kind are almost entirely absent. In Super Metroid, with enough skill, you could face the bosses in any order you wanted to. Metroid Fusion barely has any of that. You will go where the game tells you to go, and that's that. The reason for this decision comes down to two factors. For one, at its core, Fusion is about the loss of Samus' agency. The linear nature allows it to weave a more complex story. If the team wanted to make Super Metroid 2, they would have. Divorcing it from so much of what people loved about its predecessor was the direction they chose, and they stuck to it. More importantly though, this mission-based structure makes it much better suited for the short bursts of play demanded by a portable game. Restore the atmospheric stabilizers. Locate and disable the security doors. Find the computer room! I mean, within the first 10 minutes I played, I ran into three save points. That's no accident. Telling the player where to go might diminish the exploration, but it ensures that even if you've only got a few minutes to kill, you'll still be able to get something done. But that's not to say that it's totally linear. More often than not, the map shows you where to go, but not necessarily how to get there. In fact, the map now draws in different colors, depending on whether a section is what the navigation room gives you, or something you have to discover on your own. Most of these sectors are a lot larger than they initially seem, so the path from A to B is never as obvious as it looks. But progression still never feels as graceful as it did in Super Metroid. Much more often, I just felt like I was firing in random directions to uncover the way around. Like here, where I was trying to find a way past this thing. I noticed the pipe below and figured maybe I could go around it. I noticed this log gate and figured that's how I'd make my way back out. But nope, the solution is just to fall down behind it. But part of the difference might be that by the time Super Metroid started throwing out more complicated puzzles, I had the X-ray scope. Fusion doesn't have anything like this, so it's more trial and error than perception. It's never very complicated or challenging, but it's not conveyed well either. I rarely got any of those aha moments. Progress isn't directly linked to power-ups like it used to be, but combing through areas and using those power-ups in creative ways is still rewarding. And while they're not the norm, there are still some really creative solutions. You do still have to use your head to get through the game, but it never lets you feel like you're outsmarting it or breaking it. It seems like a decision that was made very early on, to make Fusion more linear. Then they worked within those restrictions and focused on the positive aspects of linear design. A far more integrate storyline, a much more comprehensive look at Samus' character, and oh yeah, a steep, steep skill curve. The more open you make the world, the more the player will be able to discover the game's secrets and challenges at their own pace. It suits an adventure game. But Metroid has always been action-adventure, and the reason Fusion is controversial is because it puts way more emphasis on action. A linear design means that the progression through the game can be much more designed. If the developer knows exactly what path the player will take, the challenge is progression itself, the obstacles that are in your way, and the skills that you as a player have to sharpen. This is what Fusion does best. Samus cannot tank damage anymore. Enemies hit harder than they ever have, scale their damage as I get more health, and never drop as much as they take away. Coming off of Super, I was constantly flummoxed over how low my energy was even after a few hits. Enemy drones can even respawn and group into more dangerous alterations. That's the nature of the X-Parasites. They infest every environment on the ship and copy the creatures that were living there. But they're not just a mindless virus. They can also absorb the knowledge and memories of their victims. Fortunately, thanks to her Metroid DNA, Samus is immune to their influence, and in fact she can absorb them to restore her energy and weapons. That's a cool in-universe explanation for a very gamey mechanic. The X have a very distinct effect that's really Game Boy Advance-esque. The graphics in general are just fantastic. One standout sequence is when a reactor core is overheating, navigating through all these twisted, melting walkways. It's beautiful pixel-based sprite work combined with unmistakable, if flashy, effects. I think it just adds to the excess significance. Even when they are perfectly mimicking their counterparts, there's just something not quite right about them. The bosses in particular are horrifying amalgamations, representative of Samus' own lost abilities. Their unsettling nature is unique and more importantly in line with the theme. 
because Metroid Fusion is, at times, a horror game. The idiots at the Federation decided to send Samus' amputated armor to the BSL station. And, well, the X learned to mimic her too. This is the SAX. And look, it can even screw attack and use super missiles. Oh sure, the one time Samus doesn't immediately uninstall her power-ups after a mission, and of course this happens. Even more than the bosses, the SAX represents Samus at the height of her power, and that makes it so much more terrifying than a traditional antagonist. And if you decide to make a mistake and show yourself, it just obliterates you. Particular praise has to go to the sound design, as the SAX's heavy footsteps echo long after it goes off screen, serving as an indicator of when it might be safe to come out of hiding. About three fourths of the way in, the mission based structure of Go Here, Find This is starting to wear a bit thin. The game even highlights this, forcing you to stop and watch as it shows you where a place you've already been is located. But the spotlight is intentional because Metroid Fusion is about to go off the rails. The SAX disables the station's power, and the whole tone shifts. There's an extremely tense sequence where you hear the SAX beneath you, monitoring the area, and you know you're going to have to drop down and engage it. Despite how much Samus has recovered by this point, she still can't lay even a scratch on her doppelganger. I didn't notice the first time I played, but the only reason Samus is even able to escape is because the SAX can't hang from ledges. As a player, you were that character. You earned those powers. You know what it felt like, and now it's trying to kill you. It's a dark mirror of what Samus was, put in direct comparison with how powerless she is now. On a more thematic level, the SAX personifies Fusion's twisted corruption of the Metroid formula. It can sequence break with impunity. It takes no orders. It is what Samus has lost. Even once you restore power to the station, things are never quite the same. The computer keeps barking orders, but circumstances continuously force Samus to go off script, reacquiring her most powerful abilities in the process. But these breaches of protocol are without the Federation's authorization, and Adam criticizes Samus for it. This too is intentional. Samus is taking back her agency. Throughout the game, there have been very few instances where I've been allowed to get too far out of bounds. But whenever I did happen to wander a bit, there were times when I could see things I wasn't sure I was supposed to. Like the remains of Ridley in cryogenic storage. Later, when the power's knocked out, I saw the X-Parasites harvest those remains. And later still, the X used Samus' greatest rival against her, reborn stronger than ever. The game has done a wonderful job throughout building to things like that, foreshadowing future events. I saw this shadow streak by so many times I started accepting it as part of the detail in this room, only to finally encounter the Nightmare Boss hours later. I dare say its approach to build-up is even better than its predecessor. Eventually, I broke into a restricted area and discovered... Metroids? Oh, there are even incubation tanks housing their mutations for Metroid 2. The SAX has tracked Samus here, but it's powerless against the Metroids, and Adam is forced to jettison the whole section, bringing an end to the Federation's Metroid breeding program. Which, Adam assures us, was only being done for peaceful purposes. Of course. Now that I've played the rest of the series, I appreciate this twist so much more than when I first went through Fusion. There are tons of things I'm noticing that I never picked up on the first time. After all, the game foreshadowed this twist at the very beginning. Why exactly would the Federation need a replica of a Metroid's natural habitat? And making my way back through it, their discarded shells now litter the ground. I've seen this before. It's really impressive how the Metroid series always manages to include elements like this without them coming across as pandering fan service. Not that there's anything wrong with fan service, but these things only happen because the plot demands them. It doesn't feel like anything is being forced or shoehorned in for the sake of nostalgia. But one thing has been bothering me. Considering the X pose such a threat, once all life signs have been snuffed out on the station, why wouldn't the Federation just get Samus out of there and blow it up? Well, here's why. The X reproduce asexually, meaning that the SAX that got jettisoned was not acting alone. By now, there are at least 10 on board the station, and the Federation intends to confine Samus until they can capture the SAX and weaponize them for their own militaristic gain. I love this twist. It's very in line with the shoot first, ask questions later attitude that Samus, that this series, stands in opposition to. A military would see an opportunity to harvest and duplicate the lost technology of the galaxy's greatest warrior. But Samus knows better. The soldiers will be killed, the X will steal their knowledge, steal their ships, and wreak turmoil on the galaxy. Her plan, then, is to initiate the station to self-destruct. One problem, though, she's still confined to this room. Samus tries to reason with the AI, finally calling it Adam in exasperation. And it seems to recognize that name? 
it suddenly takes on the characteristics and mannerisms of Samus's deceased former CEO, and in a great character beat, criticizes her plan to sacrifice herself to kill the X, because, duh, the X would live on on the planet's surface. Instead, Adam recommends they detonate the station only after crashing it into the planet, destroying the Metroid homeworld and the X all at once. Presumably overcoming his programming, he lets Samus out of confinement. I'm conflicted on this. On the one hand, it's a poignant moment that grows from character interaction, but I think it would have been more thematically appropriate if Samus's escape had been based more on her agency, on her own restored self-confidence, instead of just accidentally triggering the AI to come up with a better solution. When Samus arrives at the control room, of course, the SAX is waiting. And still the battle is one of attrition. Still I had to be careful and skillful, because this mirror is still better than Samus in raw power. As she puts it, the SAX is me, only heartless. Near the end, facing its own demise, the SAX mutates to an abomination, somewhat similar to what they had done to Ridley. But it must have already expended too much energy, because it goes down fast, and I'm okay with that. The mirror match is a much more interesting, dynamic fight. Samus initiates the plan, leading to, of course, the countdown. But when she gets to her ship, she discovers an enormous Metroid shell. And then, boom, an Omega Metroid, their most powerful form. And again, this was set up in advance, as Adam told us that they had found a method to force a Metroid through its development in mere days. It almost kills Samus in a single blow, and then... The SAX shows up. Its Ice Beam can hurt the Omega, but it's way too weak from the earlier fight. So, perhaps in an act of self-defense, it allows Samus to absorb it, finally restoring her to full power. Even then, this battle was no curb stomp, especially with the impact still looming. In fact, I ran out of time at the last possible moment. But when you do defeat it in time, Samus's ship comes rising up from the background, pulling her out of the station just as it enters the atmosphere, and destroys SR-388 once and for all. I like how Samus's suit still isn't back to normal. It merely takes on more iconic colors. She might be back to full power, but this experience has irrevocably changed our protagonist. The ending from here is honestly kinda hokey. There's a bit about how Samus had no idea that the minds of deceased leaders were uploaded to the Federation systems, and that's why the AI suddenly started acting like Adam Malkovich. That's the kind of thing you can get away with better if you set it up in advance, but here it just feels like a contrived explanation. Also, how exactly did the Omega Metroid escape the restricted zone? Was it just done for the sake of a final boss fight? What isn't hokey, though, are the motivations of the SAX. I was ready to complain that any sort of good nature had never once been hinted at, it was always a heartless killing machine. But at the point it protects Samus, this intelligence may recognize that its only chance at any kind of survival is, however reluctantly, to give up its agency and merge with Samus. At least that's how the subtext reads to me. The final twist does work, though. Samus's ship could only be activated manually, but it was not done via the magical ethereal ghost of Adam Malkovich. No, it was thanks to the creature Samus saved from Zebus all the way back in Super Metroid, whom she had once again let out of confinement midway through this adventure. You, uh, you did save the animals back in 94, right? That moment showcases the difference between this game and its predecessor. If I had to describe Fusion in one word, it would be streamlined. Streamlined, with all the benefits and consequences that go along with it. It lacks so much of the polish and detail that its predecessor had. There are no seemingly innocuous choices to make. There's no way to turn off the upgrades once you get them. The little accoutrements that gave Super so much charm are gone. The adventure itself is linear to the point that it treats that design choice as a plot point. But it also fixes a lot of the nitpicks I had with Super Metroid. It allows a second playthrough on the same save file, and on that second playthrough, it shows how many upgrades you have left to find. Rooms transition faster. And more than anything, it ramps up the difficulty more than anything else in this series. Put it this way, I never died a single time in Super Metroid, despite the fact that I hadn't played through it in nine years. But in Fusion, a game that I beat just two months ago, I died more than 20 times! But it never felt cheap, I just wasn't good enough. Most importantly, Metroid Fusion does not try to replicate the success the franchise had in the past. This pre-release material shows that at one time, the game was even more of a break from series traditions. But what Fusion ultimately became is something much more tightly wound to its predecessor. In its plot, in its gameplay, in the protagonist herself, Metroid Fusion is distinct, and it achieves that quality as a corruption of a masterpiece, as a perversion of Super Metroid. In conclusion, this game sucks and you should hate it. The end? Wait, that's not what I wrote. No, your script was all wrong. I fixed it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Kovar. 
He's the guy who proofreads my scripts, and I always appreciate it, but this is the first time you've ever used your powers for personal gain. Does your opinion diverge that heavily from mine? Metroid Fusion is an insult. Not just to the franchise's roots, not just to the fans, but to game design in general, and to me personally. The previous games put the mechanics first, and built the lore around that. The animals you save in Super Metroid, for example, they were there to teach you some moves. Fusion, on the other hand, takes a very story-first approach, and this wreaks all sorts of havoc with the game's design. This is really obvious when grinding X for health. There's a perfectly good in-story reason for using X Parasite drops instead of the standard health and missile drops from before, but this doesn't actually make the game more fun or more challenging, just more tedious. That would be annoying for a console game, but for a handheld game it's downright inexcusable. But not all gameplay is dictated by the story. Nintendo went back and forth seemingly at random on this one. Some power-ups are gained by defeating bosses and absorbing parasites, but others are downloaded in data rooms. It's inconsistent, and it brings up a whole different set of questions. If the data is stored off-site, why does Samus have to go to specific rooms for specific upgrades? Is the Federation trying to keep Samus too weak to succeed? Did I seriously just download missiles? Oh, and super missiles are an upgrade to regular missiles. A digital upgrade that changes the physical properties of my ammunition. Yeah, that makes sense. If SAX is supposed to be a mimicry of Samus at her most powerful, why can it do all sorts of things that Samus could never do before? Remember when she was able to completely decimate all of Zebus with super missiles, leaving a trail of debris and collapsed platforms everywhere? And here I thought blowing up that pipe in Meridia with the power bomb was a big deal. There's something really backwards about how the world is laid out. So-called secrets are stored away in the most obvious places. Energy tanks are just lying on the floor waiting to be collected. But critical paths? No, those are hidden without any environmental clues at all to guide the player onto them. Yeah, that's right. Secrets are easier to find than mandatory routes. The constant barrage not only of plot, but of introspection from Samus isn't just a change for the franchise. It's a major change for the character. We don't just see her physically weakened. We see a distinct lack of stoicism, a sort of emotional weakness that fans hated eight years later, but totally ignored in this entry. After all her near-death experiences, I'd think she'd be used to it by now. Speaking of plot, I can't make heads or tails of what Adam even is. A guy trapped in a computer? An AI based on him? Does it have Adam's memories? His consciousness? How did the Federation get any of that after he sacrificed himself? I guess we're not supposed to think too hard about this. This game has a serious identity crisis. For every change Nintendo made to the structure, they stuck firmly to choices that were made for the Super Metroid way of doing things. Choices that didn't work nearly as well with these changes. If they were so dead set on stacking save rooms, nav rooms, and recharge rooms together, why on earth didn't they just combine them into one room Castlevania style? This convention worked with Super Metroid's more open, exploration-based nature, but not here. I spent all my time with Metroid Fusion feeling condescended to, as if the game was treating me like I'm stupid. It pretends to be less linear than it is, and hopes I won't notice the difference. It marks out waypoints on paths that are so linear I would have found them anyway. It uses lore as an excuse for annoying mechanics, but only when it's convenient, assuming I'm not paying enough attention to call it out. And that's ultimately my biggest problem with this game. It's not just a flawed game. It's a flawed game with the audacity to put band-aids over a few of its biggest cracks and say, see, there are no cracks. It's a game that made me feel like my intelligence is being personally attacked. Like I said before, Metroid Fusion is an insult. Not just to the franchise's roots, and not just to the fans, but to game design in general, and to me personally. Kovar, do you even have a YouTube channel? But okay, I see where he's coming from. My biggest problem with Fusion is how the story never stops interrupting the gameplay. All the tough bosses and action-focused design end up coming into direct conflict with how often the game forces the player to stop and read. Even on that vaunted second playthrough, you still can't skip the cutscenes. I mean, I get that the story was at least half the point of making it linear, and that's fine once. But when you know the player has seen it before, don't make them set through it. Maybe it's just because I'm like a billion years old, but I always preferred how the games of my youth kept the backstory in the manual and elegantly told the rest through gameplay and subtext. But that preference, much like the aspects that kept me away from Metroid for all these years, was set by my childhood experiences. The choices that Fusion makes are intentional, 
And what it achieves by casting away those elements not only works as a different take on Metroid, not only allows for a deeper story that reveals the character of Samus Aran, it also allows the gameplay to fall way more in line with why I fell in love with video games in the first place. But the team did have one more really good reason to make it linear. Open world adventure games tend to thrive in a 3D environment, and Metroid Fusion had to stand out, because remember, it wasn't the only game coming out on November 17th. But next time, this season will conclude with the final 2D Metroid game, Zero Mission. You can watch it right now on Patreon, and it'll be on YouTube in one week. Until then, you keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing. Thanks for watching. The approach to a video game remake is one of those special things about this medium. In movies or TV, a remake is more often a reboot, with new actors and a different take on the material. Video games aren't bound to such restrictions. Now at their worst, a game remake can come across as a cheap cash grab, and a shoddy remaster might ruin what made a game so beloved in the first place. More often though, remakes take a middling approach. They might bring a console exclusive to handhelds, or, especially lately, adapt a relatively recent game to current consoles and improve the graphics and frame rate while maintaining the same core gameplay. These are common. They may not be cash grabs, but they are still cash ends. It's a lot easier to improve on an existing game than to make a whole new one. But that doesn't at all invalidate them. A better frame rate and modernized controls can effectively make a remake like this the definitive version of a game. But the most interesting remakes are also the rarest when a developer remakes a game that's a few generations old and takes the opportunity to rebuild it from the ground up. These blend the best elements of film with the flexibility this industry provides. They're not merely the same game you've played before. No, it's a game rebooted to raise it to modern standards. The graphics, the design, often even the engine and physics. Everything is scrutinized. Everything old is new again. Now there's a big risk to that. Modernizing a game without a careful hand could effectively remove the heart of the experience, resulting in a product that's in some ways more insulting than those cheap cash grabs. But when such a complete remake goes well, when a developer understands what made the original work and keeps that heart intact, a remake could effectively replace its clunky, outdated predecessor. And few games are as clunky and outdated as the original Metroid. Oh, it was groundbreaking in its own time, but we've seen before, such ambition tends to make a game that ages terribly. The NES just wasn't quite capable of what the devs were trying to do. By the time technology caught up with them, Metroid looked like some kind of glorified proof of concept for what the series would become. But there are still little flashes of brilliance within it. It's the origin point for a franchise that's defined by its world building and consistency. The fact that it was so aged 20 years later meant that it was prime... Prime, I gotta stop doing that. <sighs> prime for a remake. Actually, you know, maybe that pun is appropriate. The fact that it actually got remade speaks to the heights Metroid soared to in the mid-2000s. Built off the massive success of Retro Studios' Metroid Prime, the series entered a renaissance. From 2002 to 2007, the number of games starring Samus Aran more than doubled. Metroid was more popular and more important than it had ever been, so it made sense to bring the original game up to modern standards. The story is the same. The Galactic Federation brings an Age of Peace, space pirates steal Metroids, Samus is hired to take them down. It makes no effort whatsoever to hide Samus' gender this time, but eh, that was no secret by 2004. But the intro does throw in the fact that Samus was raised on Zebus, which hints that this will turn out to be a far more personal tale than we knew. I'm back where the season began, and everything old is new again. Well, okay, the pea shooter is still old. But don't think Samus is anywhere near as weak as she was back in 86. She can fire from a crouch, aim in eight directions, and even her wall jump is back to its former glory. And I'm really glad they didn't restrict any of this. But I know how this goes. Go left, get the morph ball. And now whenever you get an upgrade, you're taken to the equipment menu to learn all about it. It's super quick, and it's made even more snappy since you can mash A to skip the item fanfare now. I don't mind this at all. And in fact, it only makes me appreciate more how this series avoided turning into a mind-numbing tutorial slog, as too many other Nintendo franchises have. It feels great to be back in more familiar, Metroid-esque territory after the previous game was such a departure. I loved the X-Parasites and the Fusion Suit and all, but from the enemies to the pickups to the map design to Samus herself, this is so much more iconic. And maybe that's why it's only now hitting me just how different Samus controls compared to Super Metroid. Most of her floatiness is gone, and that impacts movement, yes, but it also affects combat. 
Samus is sharper and faster, and holding R to hold fire instead of cycling through a menu is still so much more natural. Much as I liked the moon jump, I might prefer this leaner or crunchier Samus. But Zero Mission isn't just modernizing the core. Samus has learned a lot of new tricks since 1986, and almost all of her most famous abilities have been implemented, and only those famous abilities. See, Metroid Fusion was distinct, for better and worse. It boldly took the franchise where it had never gone before, but Zero Mission hasn't really done anything new with Samus's power set. These are the same abilities I've seen before. Well, okay, I guess the power grip is new as an upgrade, and it's cool that they made it into an upgrade. It prevents a sort of sticky timeline wicket, considering the only reason Samus could climb in the last game was because the Fusion suit was so much lighter. But all the old upgrades are put to use in new ways. The speed booster in particular is greatly expanded here. It's a piece of cake to aim the shine spark where you want it to be, and even the morph ball can be sparked. Honestly, these might be the most fun secrets in the whole series. Seriously, I am loving the puzzles in this game, and the degree of outside-the-box thinking it takes to crack them. Often I know something is hidden, and I have an idea of how to get to it, but it's still a matter of skill to actually get there. That speaks to the balance that Zero Mission strikes between Super Metroid's open world and Fusion's linear, skill-focused design. The story strikes the same balance, and it's a return to form for the series. The intro is the shortest we've seen, and there are no more lengthy text box conversations constantly getting in the way of the fun. Instead, there are brief but very effective cutscenes that speak through subtext. And speaking of subtext, Chozo statues aren't just for power-ups anymore. I ran into this standing statue, and when I hopped in, the game wordlessly indicated where I needed to go. Even just having a map here is a massive change from the NES version, and I don't mind at all that it points you in the right direction. Plus, same as Fusion, it's a portable game, and wandering around aimlessly wouldn't be appropriate. Unlike Fusion, though, you're not so directly... directed from place to place. There's no Adam here on Zebus, and no direct instruction on what exactly you're supposed to be doing. I was often being shown only a general area I needed to be in, and the deeper I got, the further off the obvious route I needed to go to reach those points. But conveyance is still achieved through a sometimes radical redesign of individual rooms, and the frequent addition of completely new locations. No longer did I spend the first half hour zigzagging through the same hallways over and over. Now I needed the long beam to move to the second half of the map, and before I could do that, I was shown the roadblock tutorial, which is finally not a suicide pit. As for new areas, I was pleasantly surprised when I popped up into Criteria, which was shown to exist up here back in Super Metroid. The fact that Zero Mission adds it here is indicative of how seriously it takes maintaining consistency with what had come before. Or, I guess, what will come after. Super Metroid Zebus will be a desolate planet out of time, but Zero Mission has to characterize the world at an earlier point, when it was far more alive. To that end, the graphics are made colorful and vibrant to a greater degree than ever before. That impacts the tone of the game, and it fits this design perfectly. It reminds me more than a little of Metroid 2's swashbuckling adventure. This is not about isolation or loneliness. This is about fun. But it's also about presenting a vast, interconnected, and believable world. And once again, Zero Mission styles itself after the best of its predecessors. Flora and fauna teem through every corner of Zebus, and I really got the impression that this ecosystem was alive to a degree that not even Super Metroid could match. The graphical style is my favorite in the whole series, but the music? Eh. I've never been a fan of the Game Boy Advance's sound hardware, or its relative lack of sound hardware to be more exact. See, sound mixing had to be done using CPU cycles, meaning that higher quality music would come at the direct cost of the GBA's power. Fusion wasn't too badly affected by this, thanks to its lower key ambient soundtrack, but Zero Mission has to remix some of the more upbeat melodies of the NES game. Brinstar is particularly grating, and it sucks because the composition itself is fantastic. It just comes out sounding so tinny and distorted. Uh, this isn't a deal breaker, of course. I kind of got used to it after a while, and most of the new music doesn't really suffer too bad, being more clearly composed with the GBA in mind. The game design really started diverging from the original once I got to Kraid, where once the Brinstar depths were a massive labyrinth of repeated rooms and wasted time, Zero Mission adds so much that the structure is unrecognizable. New puzzles and features and gimmicks make finding Kraid an absolute blast. Where the original was designed to seem like it had more depth than it really did, Zero Mission is just designed. But with that more modern design may come a little less player agency. A lot of those little tricks I found back on the NES don't seem to apply here. Near the start, I decided to ignore the map and go up through these tunnels, same as I had in Metroid. But this time I was dunked in acid for trying. Later, after I got the Ice Beam, I came through here again, but I was actually blocked by the Chozo statue. So I headed to the opposite side of the chasm, skillfully climbed the Ripper Ladder, and still I couldn't break this sequence. In fact, by the time I did get up there, it was in the middle of quite the backtracking slog. This was one of the only times I felt Zero Mission was held back by its adherence to the original map. 
I had to go from Kraid to Norfair for the high jump, then all the way back to Brinstar for the Varia suit, and then all the way back down to Norfair to use it. And it's just because the top of Brinstar is where the Varia suit was in the original game. Even so, there has got to be a faster way to do this. I keep noticing speed blocks in suspicious places. Remember, speedrunning culture was alive and well by 2004, and Super Metroid was one of the biggest reasons it got there. So Zero Mission is clearly built with speedrunning in mind, way more than any of its predecessors. The Shine Spark is put to better use than it ever has been, not just for item upgrades, but to bolt through rooms you've been through before. It can turn a meandering backtrack into more of a skill spectacle if you know where to use it. But I don't. A game built on Metroid structure just might not be able to achieve player conveyance with as much finesse as Super Metroid, but it did at least railroad me less and less as I got further, and near the end, Chozo indicators stopped showing up at all. And I do love the way it eases off on the handholding as you get deeper. For one, most of the Chozo indicators are entirely optional if you want to hop into them, but I was actually allowed to fall completely off the quote-unquote correct route, and I didn't even know it at the time. See, I think I was supposed to beat this boss, head down to Lower Norfair, and get stuck in this little series of hallways since I didn't have super missiles. So I should have gone back up, and discovered that something had cleared the way into this tunnel. Then I'd have fought this boss named Imago, who hilariously crashes through the scenery and clears the way to the super missiles when you beat him. Down in Lower Norfair, you can even see this thing wriggling around. But I have a problem. I'm really, really bad at adventure games. And I guess I lacked the spatial awareness to notice that this wriggling bug was right below the tunnel. So instead, I just shot out a ceiling tile and ended up circumnavigating Lower Norfair in a completely different path. I diverged from the main route, but I never knew I'd even done it until I played the game again. And oh yeah, I'm playing the game again. More on that later. The fact that I was allowed to do this, but that I didn't even notice anything wrong about it, speaks to just how evolved the team's approach to map design had become. There wasn't much at all to Kraid or Ridley in the original game. They're a lot more impressive here, but they honestly just feel like easier retreads of Super Metroid's renditions. Which I guess makes sense from a story perspective, but it was still disappointing to see the exact same strategies working. Don't get me wrong, Kraid and Ridley are still great. They just come across as one of the few things that's a little too remakey about this remake. Fortunately, there are also a slew of new bosses, and they more than make up for it. Like Fusion, some of these guys are built up and escalated long before you ever fight them. And there's always more strategy to them than just tanking hits and spamming missiles. They use the layout of their rooms and the gimmicks of their layers to great effect. But there's still nothing here that got my heart racing the way Ridley did in Super Metroid. And nothing even came close to the insane difficulty of most of the bosses in Fusion. Instead of building a bridge, creating Ridley's enormous visages open to reveal the path to Mother Brain. The Metroids down here are, amazingly, an actual threat! They've broken out and killed the space pirates who had captured them. They swarm from the background, they're larger than before, and most importantly, they don't stay frozen for nearly as long. The Mother Brain fight itself is still frustrating, but the faster, twitchier controls at least make it a fun sort of frustrating. And hey, look, she actually kinda fights back now, that's cute! Whoops. This is the first time Zero Mission has managed to kill me, which speaks again to how much easier it is than Fusion. By the end of Fusion, I had died more than 20 times. Zero Mission got me once, but I was a little more careful on the second attempt and managed to take her down. Mother Brain just can't die without triggering an explosive countdown. One more trip up and out of that familiar chasm, but the game doesn't just end on an elevator this time. Samus emerges onto the Criterion surface to make her escape. It could have been a little more challenging, and it could have done more new, but taken on its own merits. Zero Mission is a fantastic game, and uh... wait. Oh, Zero Mission ain't done! The Space Pirates shoot Samus down while she's just trying to do the usual Metroid ending reveal. She crash lands back on Zebus, with nothing on hand aside from her <laughs> rather useless emergency pistol. And it's all she'll be able to rely on as she attempts to infiltrate the Space Pirate mothership. Commandeering one of their ships seems to be her only option for escape. Samus still has her acrobatic abilities. She can climb and wall jump, but she really is almost defenseless. With virtually no protection, Samus takes even more damage than she did in Fusion, and she can't fight back at all. The best that pistol can do is paralyze a pirate for a few seconds. This means that Zero Mission suddenly shifts hard into a genre change. The adventure till now has been a triumphant, action-packed romp. Now, out of nowhere, it's all about stealth. When the space pirates catch me, the music changes and alarm blares and they just swarm me. The only option is to run and hide, and this, alongside a steep difficulty spike, really sets this apart from what's come before. I died plenty of times through here. 
It's a more developed take on those heart-rending moments in Fusion, where Samus would cower from the SAX. But where those were largely interactive cutscenes as long as you did what you were supposed to, Zero Mission Stealth is an actual game, with multiple options to get through. The pirates eventually backed me up into the Chozo ruins, and here it got even tougher, as I had to avoid searchlights and crumbling terrain that would often put me directly into their line of sight. It's so exhilarating to just barely scrape through like this. Actually, it's reminiscent of that feeling I got at the start of the original game, where Samus was alone, outnumbered, and underpowered. Deep in the ruins, I found a mural that depicted a familiar suit of armor. This triggers a flashback. Samus has been here before. And so the series has finally confirmed that Samus really was raised here. Raised by the Chozo. And it looks like they've got one more test for her. This is the only boss that you ever have to fight from such a weak position, and it reflects Samus' self back at her when she passes that test. When you pass that test. Well. Through the whole game, I had been finding these unknown items that were incompatible with the power suit. Passing this test does more than restore what Samus had before. It also decodes those latent abilities, ascending her to the height of her potential. To put it less dramatically, I gain the gravity suit, the space jump, and the freaking plasma beam, all at the same time. An even more triumphant rendition of the Brinstar theme kicked in, and the space pirates had absolutely no chance. Rooms that moments before I had to carefully and quietly sneak through were now just torn apart. In fact, the space pirates are hiding from Samus now. I think the space pirates became the arbiters of their own undoing. They should have just let Samus go, because by bringing her back, they have unwittingly created their most powerful enemy. This juxtaposition is powerful and exciting, and most importantly, earned. But even now, the game's not backing off the difficulty. Space pirates still hit hard and never drop restorative pickups. And back toward the mothership, a single elite can rip you apart if you're not careful. There's no more guidance from here on. It's up to you to climb to the bridge of the mothership and retrieve the power bombs. I actually spent a lot of time just wandering around here, but this close to the end, a little esoteric design is more than justified. It feels now like with all this power, I'm pushing against the game design, and it is fantastic. One more of those wonderful skill-based puzzles netted me an extra tank, and I knew I'd need it. Because surely, this entire tough-as-nail sequence was building to an incredible final boss. I made my way to the top of the ship, where... Ridley built a robot of himself! Oh, he looks so cool! Oh man, he's gonna whittle away with me, I'm gonna die so many times, and it'll feel so good when I finally... beat... him. Uh, that's it. The final boss is one of the easiest bosses in Zero Mission, and it's not like it has the poignant story to fall back on like Super Metroid. It's just a Ridley robot, and it comes almost entirely out of left field. I have read that it's a lot more of a challenge if you've gotten all the items. I'm sure that would have been awesome, but I'm no completionist, and I wish they had maybe scaled it with how many energy tanks you have or something. I guess they didn't want people getting stuck so close to the end, but compared to what I've already overcome, eh, this was a bit of an anticlimax. Either that, or the Ridley robot is just a massive coward, and decides to just self-destruct instead of fighting me. Regardless, Samus has mere minutes to get out of here. This is the final escape sequence in 2D Metroid, and just with the sheer number of options you've got here, it is definitely one of the best. Heck, Metroid fans have argued for years whether Zero Mission is the best in the series, that it may be better than Super Metroid, and in a lot of ways I see where they're coming from. The hunt for upgrades is the most well-developed in this franchise, finally nailing that balance between using your head and using your skill. It also doesn't arbitrarily lock you into the endgame. A power bomb can shatter this tunnel and get you back to the main map. And since I thought it could have been more challenging, there's a hard mode that unlocks once you beat the game. I died in the first minute! Oh, I am gonna be playing this again. Screen transitions are a snap, upgrade completion is shown on a second playthrough, and the tone has so much more levity, without sacrificing anything in the way of mythos or lore. It reveals more about Samus Aran than anything has to this point and by confirming her origins, finally provides the reason for these statues to help her and guide her throughout the galaxy. One of the final shots returns to the mural, where it's revealed that a very young Samus added a personal touch. God, the feels! If you were curious about how far we'd come, beating the game even unlocks the original Metroid. And before I started Zero Mission, I did beat that game one more time, no mods, just to compare. It was still interesting as a time capsule of gaming in 1986, but man, it was a chore to get through. This is not even a remotely fair comparison. Zero Mission doesn't just superannuate Metroid, it replaces it. That historical curiosity is the only reason left to play the NES version. Zero Mission is the definitive way to experience the series' origins. 
and it might just be the definitive Metroid experience, period. Super Metroid is an epic and a masterpiece. It sticks with you, but a lot of the reason it sticks with you has to do with its scope and pacing. It has incredible highs, but spends just as much time being more introspective and low-key. And I loved Fusion when I could actually play it, but all that story focus was only really going to be engaging once. It'd be hard to slog through all that again. But Zero Mission is not Super Metroid, and it's definitely not Fusion. It's less sprawling than the former, more playable than the latter, and more replayable than both of them. I've actually beaten it again just since I started writing this script, and on what is now my third playthrough, I'm finding so many ways to blaze through it faster and faster. Zero Mission is all rise. It's the sort of evergreen game I can see myself playing regularly, because Zero Mission is 2D Metroid at its most evolved. It combines and refines the very best aspects of the series, and then surprises you with something brand new. I don't think it's as great an experience as Super Metroid, but I do think it's every bit its equal as a video game. It's the gold standard of what a remake in this medium can be, and it is the perfect capstone to the series. And now that I have completed all of the side-scrolling games, I don't think I was being fair to the Metroid series. Metroid and I might have gotten off on the wrong foot. The first game I really played is often considered a masterpiece in its own right, but, well, you know how Fusion played well to my tastes? I think the direction this first game I played went played against my tastes, and when I was 14, I wasn't mature enough to see past that. I let that first impression color my judgment of this franchise. Even as much as I loved Super Metroid, because of its reputation, I assumed that it was an outlier, and I didn't really give the other 2D games a chance. But now that I have, what's the verdict? Am I, in fact, a geek about Metroid? abso freaking lootly At the very least, I am for the 2D games. Contrary to what I expected going in, there's so much more to them than just wandering around and finding upgrades. So much more skill to be earned beyond just increasing your avatar strength. Metroid has surprised me, it has impressed me, and on a few occasions, it has humbled me. Rather than the adventure interfering with the gameplay, this series uses its gameplay to create and inform a cohesive world, and the way every single adventure builds directly off the last makes Metroid worth geeking over. But that's not the only reason I've been able to stick with them. Creating these episodes and having you guys to hold me to a high standard has forced me to engage with Metroid on a level I never had before, and I want to thank each and every one of you for this opportunity. I found so, so much more to love about these games than I even expected to, and it is a damn shame that the 2D series ended in 2004. At least that's where it officially ended. If my Patreon has hit a milestone for a bonus episode, the next time on TGC, I'll be covering the game that indirectly started this entire project, another Metroid 2 remake. And if it hasn't, then I'll see you guys next season. Until then, you keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing. Thank you so much for watching. When I started the Metroid season, I set a Patreon milestone for a bonus episode. The milestone was literally twice as much as I was getting, and I didn't really know if it would happen. But to go back even further, three years ago now, I started working really, really hard on making good content. Because I had a dream. So to be here actually doing this bonus episode, to hit 10,000 subscribers and then to double that with 20,000 before I could even finish this script, to still be here, still trying to make this dream come true, and to finally, finally feel like everything I've done over the past three years is paying off, I have all of you to thank for that. Without you, I'm just a dork babbling into a microphone. You make all the time that I've put into this worthwhile. So from the bottom of my heart, to everyone who has ever taken the time to watch this channel, thank you. Every one of us on YouTube, and for that matter, every video game series out there, lives or dies by the support and passion of its fans. It's just too bad that Nintendo doesn't see it that way. August 6th, 2016 was the 30th anniversary of the Metroid franchise. 30 years of Samus Aran, the Space Pirates, of cohesive worlds, commitment to continuity, and stellar, groundbreaking games. Nintendo celebrated this milestone the only way they knew how. With Styx the Badger! You know, everyone's favorite character from Sonic Boom! Oh, and a few weeks later, here's the first Metroid game in six years. It's a chibi go-op action game that literally nobody wanted. 
In 2017, it is safe to say that the Metroid franchise has settled into its second Dark Age, one that's now lasted nearly as long as the first. For the past seven years, cameos and spin-offs are all Samus has had. It's been almost 13 years since the last 2D Metroid. It's been nine years since the last game that anyone actually liked. And seven years ago, this game seemed to tear the heart out of not only the series, but its fandom as well. But I know from experience, fandoms have a funny way of surviving, and even thriving, through times like this, and Metroid's is no exception. The fans have never stopped believing in this franchise. I've read countless articles begging Nintendo to make a real Metroid game. I've seen reviewers get death threats for daring to give Donkey Kong Country positive coverage, because Retro Studios had the audacity to make that instead of more Metroid games. <laughs> Despite that, I'm proud to count myself as a new member of this fandom. But long before I came to appreciate Metroid, there was a fan by the name of Milton Gwasti, who went by the alias Dr. M64. After Zero Mission's success, there were a ton of projects seeking to remake Metroid 2 and give it the same treatment that Zero Mission had for the original. So when Gwasti started working on his own fan game in 2006, he chose a rather tongue-in-cheek title, another Metroid 2 remake. Of course, all those other projects would end up like most fan games and be abandoned. But even when AM2R was the only one left, the name stuck. As the project grew, a small team of dedicated artists, programmers, and musicians came together. It took them 10 years, but on August 6, 2016, all their effort paid off. AM2R was released in honor of Metroid's 30th anniversary as a free download for PC, and it hit mainstream gaming hard. Gamers who weren't even Metroid fans were captivated by the story of a game 10 years in the making and blown away by just how complete it was. Some even said that it was a better Metroid game than Nintendo itself had ever made. I remember seeing this outpouring of passion, all the work that had gone into it, and I thought to myself, you know, maybe I should give Metroid another chance. Less than 24 hours after the game was released, Nintendo issued a DMCA claim to the sites hosting it, forcing them to take it down. Of course, by then it was already on the internet, so no copyright law in the universe can stop it now. But the team did intend to keep working on it, and even released a patch that fixed a few bugs and nerfed Omega Metroids. But about a month later, Milton Gwasti received a DMCA addressed to him personally, and all further development was suspended. After 10 years in development, another Metroid 2 remake ended at version 1.1. Despite that, and maybe it's because I'm a fan, but I was all ready to give Nintendo the benefit of the doubt on this one. I was all ready to excuse their decision and say something like, well, if they didn't want it released, why didn't they shut it down at any point while it was in development? I mean, they had 10 years. You know what? I bet they knew about AM2R, but they wanted it to get released and they only shut it down afterward to appease their legal department. That's what I was going to say. But then Nintendo threatened to pull their sponsorship of the Game Awards unless the two fan games based on their properties were disqualified from being nominated. Suddenly, I couldn't make that argument anymore. Nintendo just doesn't want people to know about this. Look, Nintendo clearly had every legal right to do this. I'm not arguing that. What I am arguing is that doing so was still the wrong move from a business perspective. Worse yet, it made very little difference in actually protecting their intellectual property. Because believe it or not, there is precedent here. I only recently became a Metroid fan, but there's another fandom that I have always been a part of, for better and worse. Critics to this day say that 2006 was the point that Sonic the Hedgehog should have died, but he didn't. Right when there were no real Sonic games worth playing, the fan gaming and modding scene exploded. And Sega, which remember at this time was one of the most backwards, incompetent, directionless game studios this side of Konami, despite that Sega decided to turn a blind eye and let this scene thrive. Here's a particularly impressive fan game that I played back in those dark ages, Retro Sonic, by a guy called Taxman. Taxman would eventually pitch his work to Sega, who brought him on board. He'd spend the next few years proving himself by porting a few of the classics, and now this very same Retro Sonic engine is being used to build Sonic's 25th anniversary game. So how's that for contrast? Nintendo flexes their legal muscle to get fan projects taken down and threatens anyone who dares to acknowledge them. Sega, on the other hand, hires the fans who made those games to create their official Sonic titles. Sega still does what Nintendo don't. 
I asked Milton Guasti if, on the extremely unlikely chance that Nintendo were to have a King of Heart and offer him a similar opportunity, would he be willing to bring AM2R to Nintendo's platforms in an official capacity? Despite what Nintendo has done, Guasti said it would be an honor. Sadly, I really don't think there's any chance of that happening, because Sega understands something that Nintendo doesn't. A game like AM2R like any other piece of fan-created content, whether it be artwork, fiction, or even this video series, does such negligible damage to Nintendo's intellectual property that the pros of trying to scrape it out of existence are vastly outweighed by the cons. Because what was damaged was Nintendo's reputation, and their goodwill with not just Nintendo fans, but the entire gaming community. I owe this season to AM2R, and that means I owe a lot of my recent success to it. I would not be a Metroid fan if it wasn't for this game, and I intend to give it the critique it deserves. That means I won't be giving it any leeway just because it's a fan game. I'm going to allow AM2R to stand on its own merits, and judge it just as I would any other game in the series. So let's get critiquing. Alright, there's an intro sequence. Metroids are a threat. The Federation wants them exterminated. I was the best candidate for- wait, who- who's um- oh! Oh, it's Samus talking. Okay, you see, the past games established a first-person voice, but, ah, whatever. There's our girl in her adorable little left hand. And okay, okay, that's better. I love the cinematic flyby of the gunship as we get our first look at the in-game engine. But this intro sequence feels unfinished. It fails to communicate the name of the planet the game takes place on, says nothing of why Samus is a suitable candidate for the mission, and doesn't even mention the research and rescue teams that were sent in, which is particularly silly, since this remake, unlike the original, is going to reveal what happened to them. Yes, I know, that's all spelled out in the logbook, but why even have an intro if it's going to omit mission-critical details like this? Where Super Metroid's intro was perhaps a bit convoluted for newcomers, AM2R's has the opposite problem. It omits too much to engage a new player, and it lacks the depth to excite a dedicated fan. A snappy intro worked really well for Zero Mission, and something more akin to that would have been preferable to this. I bet you can't even skip it. Oh. Oh, you can. Oh, I was wrong. AM2R's intro is pretty much perfect. <laughs> for real, though. Like I said, I'm not going easy on this just because it's a fan game. But even though it's a missed opportunity, it is just the intro. Creating specialized art like this takes time, and this is the kind of thing that likely would have been put off to focus on more important things like, you know, the actual gameplay. Just like in the original, Samus arrives on SR388 with the Morph Ball and missiles. Unlike the original, all of her movement abilities from the later games are also available. Wall jumping, octo-directional aiming, and a brand new mechanic where she vaults over small ledges. The physics are even more snappy and precise than Zero Missions, and enhanced with new animations and movement effects. But if you prefer a different control scheme, she's never been so customizable either. This commitment to player customization is one thing that fan games tend to get very, very right. You can change Samus's aiming controls and weapon loadout to a Super Metroid style, and even turn the new enhancements off if you'd like. And uh, hey, Samus can hang from ledges. That's just like in the GBA games. When I noticed that though, I put on my dorkiest pair of glasses and said, well, that's cool for the game design, but it's incongruent with my headcanon about the fusion suit being lightweight, and that's why the power grip had to be an upgrade. But no! No, the power grip is listed along with all of Samus's other default power-ups, which, just like in Super, can be triggered on and off for no real reason at your discretion. Ah, the details! No, seriously, the details. Water drips from the cave ceilings and dissipates when it hits Samus. Subtle lighting effects are implemented for atmosphere, and guys, you can see the Morph Ball turn around. The fact that I experienced the adventure when it looked like this makes me appreciate all the more just how complete the art overhaul really is. It's such a spectacle to see SR388 brought up to these standards, and in a world where so many retro-styled games are 8-bit, it just, it just hits me right here to see such a gorgeous 16-bit aesthetic. Which is why those realistic stock explosion effects all the enemies keep making hit me right in the uncanny valley if you get my drift. And the same kind of applies to the music. I mean, it's a beautiful interpretation of the overworld theme, but it lacks the upbeat energy of the original composition. So, uh, now is a good time to talk about personal, personal preference, preference and, interpretation and interpretation in old school video games. Metroid 2 is a Game Boy game. 
So the graphics, the aesthetic, and what little story could be conveyed were all very open to interpretation. When I described it back in that episode, I used the word swashbuckling. Because of a few key elements, most notably the initial avatar strength of the player character, the ease with which her primary targets are dispatched, and the upbeat overworld theme, I interpreted this game as an action-focused caper to the Metroid homeworld, taking down the universe's greatest threat as its greatest warrior. And what a blast it was! What wasn't a blast was how barren the final area got, and I critiqued the complete lack of enemies because it meant you had to backtrack way too far to refill your health. I focused on how that decision impacted the game design, and then I got this comment, which rightfully pointed out that I had completely missed the point. Upon Samus's arrival, SR388 is teeming with life. But the deeper you go, the closer you get to the Metroid Queen, the smaller and weaker the other enemies get. By the end, the Metroids are all that's left. This 8-bit game is subtly communicating what happens to a planet overrun with Metroids and letting the player experience it firsthand illustrating through its design why they're the universe's greatest threat. This was one of my favorite comments this season, for the same reason I always seek out analysis from people who don't focus on the things that I do. It enlightened me to details that I never would have picked up on, because I really don't tend to think about games like this. I think about them as games above all else. Nothing else matters to me if it isn't fun to play. It's why I preferred the upbeat music of the original Metroid to the solemn ambience of Super. But Metroid isn't really known for such a cheery aesthetic. And regardless, Metroid 2 can be read so much more somber than I initially noticed. Which is not to say that AM2R is drowning in ambience. It's not nearly as lonely as Super Metroid, or as realistic as Prime. Of course, the central thrust of the whole game is to exterminate the Metroids. So at some point, I guess I should stop babbling about aesthetic interpretation and actually fight one of them. And whoa, these are not the same alphas from 1991. Back then, the Metroids were squishy and went down fast. Even as they evolved, they only really presented a challenge near the end. What AM2R does makes a lot of sense. The Metroid fights have been made more dynamic and challenging by limiting their weak points and giving them more complicated and competent AI, even within the same evolution. For instance, the alphas now can only be hit from below, and as you progress, they'll start to dodge your attacks and rush you. The repetitive Metroid fights were one of the biggest problems with the original, and this really is the obvious solution. I'm just not sure if the obvious solution was the best one. Oh, they're more interesting now, for sure, and they're much more challenging, but that second point is kind of the problem. In Metroid 2, the real challenge was just finding the things. Once you did that, it was really just a simple matter of spamming missiles. In AM2R, each individual Metroid fight is much more of a real fight, but it's a fight you'll experience over and over and over again. And because individual battles take so much more time, they're way more of a chore especially because of some frustrating design decisions, like when your missile bounces off a weak spot just because the Metroid is programmed to dodge. But it failed to dodge, yet the game still didn't count it. Even if they were balanced perfectly, the fact of the matter is this. No matter how well designed a boss may be, having to fight it dozens of times is gonna get old. However, this critique only really applies to the Metroids you find most frequently, the Alphas and Gammas. Common as they are, they still only take up a fraction of the game's runtime, but the point stands. AM2R's well-reasoned decision to make the fights more dynamic doesn't solve the problem, it makes it worse. In the 8-bit original, these acid pits blocked you from moving ahead. When I played it, I was embarrassingly deep into the game before it really clicked that killing all the Metroids in each area was what caused the acid to lower. I still don't know why Metroids being alive directly controls that, but regardless, this critical part of the game's progression wasn't conveyed well. Well, AM2R conveys it perfectly. You see it happening right after you kill the first Alpha. And in case it still didn't click, Samus's scanners automatically kick in and bring up new information. This is an adaptation of Samus's scan visor from the Metroid Prime series. What I enjoy about AM2R's implementation is how optional it is. If you want more background information and hints, it's all about button press away. The scan happens automatically when you enter a relevant area, so it never forces you out of the game. And if you really don't like the scanner, you can even just turn it off. For the most part, I found it enhanced the experience. The interface in general is just snappy. It doesn't waste the player's time. Fades are quick, transitions are crisp, navigation is simple, and you can even skip item and upgrade jingles and draw in power-ups with a charge beam. And all these little quality of life improvements add up to a superb player experience. When I hit the Chozo Ruins, the first thing I noticed was the music. The Game Boy game only had four real songs, and this grating number was its worst. AM2R takes that melody and mixes it into an introspectively ancient tune. 
As a remake, AM2R was tasked with finally having to bring back the Spider Ball. And wow, it controls so much better. With a little practice, you can now do tricks like this to get stuck where you need to. And that agility feels good. I was a little surprised that it was still so sluggish, but considering the scope of Samus' arsenal this time around, its steady speed doesn't detract what it used to. What was so cool about the Spider Ball was how perfectly it complemented Metroid's usual exploration and outside-the-box thinking. It was a natural fit for the series that never came back, at least not in 2D. Where Metroid 2 left plenty of its upgrades just setting out in the open, AM2R has a range of new challenges. They're very well implemented, but I do wish more of these early puzzles put the Spider Ball to use. There's there's just a lot of untapped potential. This was the first section where I started looking at the map, which is, duh, one of the biggest game changers in AM2R. In contrast to all of its previous appearances, there are no map stations that fill out the area, which makes sense. The whole structure of SR388 is a linear path down that branches out, and knowing exactly where the Metroids are would kind of erode the point. Instead of revealing the path, it helps you keep track of where you are, where you've been, and where to look. By this point in the original game, you'd seen pretty much everything you were ever gonna see till the last section. There were caves, there were temples, there were more caves, there was a never-ending cavalcade of Metroids. Well, AM2R is just about to break the mold, and it all starts in this corridor. This is the Ancient Guardian. He serves as a sort of tutorial boss, making sure the player is familiar with all the ways that Samus can dodge attacks. This boss wasn't here before. And this first golden temple is the only temple. All of the others have been reimagined as some kind of functional system within Chozo society, each with their own gimmicks, challenges, and boss fights. I asked Dr. M about this decision, and he confirmed that all of these changes and additions were very much the reason that the game spent a decade in development. But that's not a bad thing. The benefits of all that work are obvious, and it allows AM2R to achieve things that a Game Boy game never could. So back then, this next section was just another temple, but AM2R has recast it as a water treatment facility for SR388, complete with whirring machinery and geysers that blast Samus through the compound. Pushing through these cramped aqueducts reminds me of a summer job I once had installing heating systems beneath houses. Like, the architects really didn't give much thought to who might have to squeeze through here. Though it continues to tick on, the facility has been abandoned for decades. Look at the way seaweed is breaking through the walls. Oh, and that music! What you've been hearing is the main section of the hydro station. But check out what happens when you venture underneath the compound. The soundtrack smoothly transitions into a deadlier remix of the original theme. These transitions have been happening every time I've moved from one section to another, but it was so subtle and well integrated that I hadn't even noticed it until now. The way the music, graphics, and gimmicks within a larger section vary around a theme like this reminds me of the act transitions from Sonic 3, and you ought to know what incredibly high praise that is coming from me. In the Game Boy game, this section featured Arachnus. <laughs> no, that's not Arachnus. I mean, I know it sounds like a spider, but I, yeah, yeah, that's it. Now, back then, he was little more than a forced morph ball bomb tutorial, <laughs> but that was enough to take me down on my first go. He reappeared as the first boss in Metroid Fusion, and AM2R has integrated and improved on that battle, adding a slew of powerful attacks and incorporating an inspired gimmick where you have to bounce him into electrified nodes to take him down. He's a much more significant threat here, meaning it's all the more rewarding when you finally blast. Passed him up there and... Oh. Or, uh, maybe he took me down. Again. While I don't think it's skewed as high as Fusion, AM2R is proving itself a bit tougher than the average Metroid. Of course, it probably would have helped if I had remembered to get the Varia suit at the start of this section instead of waiting till the end. Check this out. For just a moment, Samus goes grayscale, just like the Game Boy original. And stuff like that is one of the coolest elements of the Metroid series. The way that power-ups, tropes, and especially bosses get reused and reimagined throughout. Like, I didn't know it back when I played Super Metroid, but these hostile Chozo statues are actually called Terizo. And I've always thought that's a neat concept, taking what's normally such a welcome sight for the player and surprising them with a boss fight. So, in AM2R, when I got the space jump... Whoa, that's cool. The Terizo has been roboticized. It wailed on me until I learned to dodge, but it wasn't too hard to take down. Now, if this was all there was to it, it'd still be a pretty cool reimagining. But no, this right here is where AM2R takes an old concept and takes it to the limit! Yeah! <laughs> 
Yes! I can see where some people might think that a Torizo statue with freaking jet propulsion is a little too over the top, but I love it. The Torizo dive bombs you, streaking across the screen, and uh, and then it releases eggs that hatch and home in on you. Ooh, I've seen that somewhere before. I don't know if Dr. M made a better Metroid than Nintendo, but he definitely made a better Reploid than Ridley. More practically, this high-altitude boss serves as a tutorial for that new space jump. The space jump was also in the original game, but back then it required some really awkward, inconsistent timing, and as soon as you screwed up, you'd fall all the way down. It was a lot safer, albeit a lot more boring, to just mosey upward with the spider ball. Not so here. Just like in the GBA games, Samus can start spin jumping in midair, and combining a usable space jump with her modern snappy movement, she has never felt more controllable and agile. By this point in the original, you had almost every power-up you were gonna get, but one of the strongest aspects of this franchise is to always let the player feel like they were evolving, that Samus was always growing stronger and more capable. So when I bombed away these blocks and saw that symbol, oh, I couldn't help but smile. Just like Zero Mission, AM2R incorporates all of Samus' most famous upgrades. And lucky me, the first is the Speed Booster. God, I love this thing! And it's put to use in so many wonderful ways, both for solving puzzles and making backtracking a breeze. And this level design is just so clever. Like, Metroid never had a place like this before, this industrial complex. Conveyor belts are used in conjunction with the speed booster, and I love the way these robotic enemies break apart as they take damage. The industrial theme is put to use when Samus takes direct control of one of those robot guards, and it's just such a unique concept. The second half of the industrial complex, or what I've taken to thinking of as the Act 2, this is my least favorite section in the entire game. Look, Metroid games in the past experimented with lighting effects, but they were kept to single rooms or little puzzles. This is an entire section based around fireflies and darkness, and wandering around in the dark for that long just isn't fun. I don't get me wrong, it's an impressive effect, it's just overdone. Plus, besides resembling the graphics from the original game, I don't even see how this theme relates to the industrial complex above. The previous section had a clear divide in nature encroaching on civilization, yeah? You still felt like you were on the outskirts of a water plant, and you were seeing SR 388 break it down. Aside from one brief respite back into the facility, there's almost none of that here. The Game Boy original had a ton of convoluted backtracking at this point, requiring Samus to zigzag back and forth through this tunnel, over and over. Back when I played it, I thought to myself that if there was anything AM2R would fix, it would be this. So I was a little let down and a little surprised to discover that nope, it was doing the same thing. I thought that was a little peculiar, but then I came to... a door? Metroid 2 didn't have these doors like most of the games did. What was... Oh. Oh. This is what remains of the research group. The original instruction manual said that they'd lost contact, but the game itself never made mention of it, and it really serves as a reminder of how dangerous this species is because two Alpha Metroids did this to the entire crew. While I generally liked the logbook entries, this was one time I wish I'd turned them off. Finding the crew quarters, seeing their remains, and especially that minimal soundtrack had me putting the pieces together, and the logbook coming up and giving away exactly what had happened took away from that eerie atmosphere. Metroid is real good at telling story through subtext, and this section would have been stronger without it. Nonetheless, finding what's left of the research team was a brilliant resolution to the manual's plot thread. The next area was my absolute favorite in the original, the part where I really started appreciating it for what it was. AM2R has reimagined it with the ominous name of The Tower. Deep trenches are hollowed out around this massive structure, atop which sets a monument to the Chozo themselves, holding the entire planet in their hands. One thing I didn't talk about when I covered the Game Boy game was this. Even though you might have fought the same sort of Metroids over and over, the location and hazards did keep things at least a little varied. I bring this up because AM2R expands this to its fullest potential. By this point, Gamma Metroids are becoming pushovers as long as I've got enough super missiles, but... <laughs> well, this sucks. But the Gammas should be pushovers by now, because here's where we start encountering the Zeta Metroids. I love these guys. I think it helps that they don't fly anymore, so they can't just home in on you. It feels so much more tactical than what came before, and since there's only a few of them, the fight doesn't get stale. Although, this one really shouldn't be able to knock you completely out of the room. Still, the way these Metroid fights get so much more interesting and fun as the game goes on makes me wonder if they were designed in order. I feel like the game is getting better as it progresses. Given its 10-year development cycle, that may well be the result of the team itself getting more skilled. To unravel the mystery of what the tower is, AM2R implements another new area, 
It seems the lower half of the tower has been buried. Progression downward is almost agonizingly slow. We're getting closer, yet the game is making us wait, building up that anticipation. Finally, an elevator! Another iconic element that wasn't in Metroid 2. Ah, and even it's slow! But it takes Samus down to the lowest point on the entire map, the geothermal plant. In contrast to the research team's demise, this is an excellent use of the scanning function, being used to explain something that really couldn't be communicated through subtext. This area's proximity to SR-388's core allows it to channel that heat, and turbines powered by the hydro station generate energy for the entire planet. The logbook notes that one of those power cells has lost structural integrity, and that a change in temperature could overload it. And, oh look! Power bombs just so happen to be down here. I'm not questioning the happenstance of Samus' upgrades being found in convenient places. Uh, stuff like that is just part of game design. But here's what I do take issue with. Overloading this cell is going to lead to a signature of the Metroid series, a countdown escape sequence. So let's see what caused those iconic explosions up till now. Both of Samus' missions on Zebus required her to take down Mother Brain, and she may not have known that the AI would trigger a self-destruct. In Super Metroid, it's unclear what caused Cirrus to blow, but Samus was responding to a distress signal and caught off guard by the space pirates, who got what they came for and probably rigged the station. In Fusion, Samus chose to crash the BSL station in order to wipe out the X. And in Zero Mission, again, she had no way of knowing that the Ridley robot was rigged with a bomb. What I'm getting at is that Samus always had a reason for finding herself in these situations, whether due to her mission or her own goals. But why in the world would she think it was a good idea to overload a geothermal power cell, especially when she's standing right in front of it? Why? Because apropos of nothing, the door locks behind her when she picks up the power bombs. That's just, that's so un-Metroid. It doesn't follow from anything. It happens just to set up the escape. And I'm not usually the kind of gamer who even thinks about this stuff. I mean, I might not have even noticed if I wasn't critiquing, but it stands out in a game that otherwise has its finger on the pulse of what makes this franchise special. However, while I may be overthinking the setup, I have no qualms at all with the execution. AM2R sets itself apart from all those other escape sequences. Where others had boss fights before the escape, this one has a fight during it. And where others had a somewhat logic-defying countdown timer, this one has a temperature gauge. That long, slow route down here now has to be frantically navigated in reverse. And it's set up in such a way that you are guaranteed to make it to these blast doors with literally no time left to spare. And then... Yeah, okay, it's a bit of a cutscene. The gauge goes up regardless of how quick you are, and there's no way to avoid that explosion. But it's so well executed that I don't even care. Metroid can make an impact on you with stuff like this. And that feeling I had when the second blast door just barely didn't open in time, ugh, I'm gonna remember that. Now that I've got the power bombs, I can actually blast open this door into the tower and bring it back to life. Again, the logbook is put to good use, as it can now detect that this was the Chozo's weapons research and development lab. And at the heart of it all is the boss of this area, the Tester. A bit on the nose there, another Metroid 2 remake? The Tester is another fantastic boss though, unlike anything Metroid's ever done before. It's a computerized drone used in 360 degree fire tests, and it pulls off a weirdly impressive thing in boss design. Its challenge feels totally artificial. It neither knows nor cares that Samus is there, it's just doing what it's programmed to. And its variety of weaponry and defenses means it's a steep difficulty spike, not to mention a bullet hell, but it is so much fun. Afterward, I noticed that most of these rooms can be burrowed into with morph ball bombs, and they feed down to a hidden entrance into the power grid. I think I missed the path split, and I could have actually gotten in here before I went down to the geothermal plant. It's a nice touch to give the player a choice like that, especially in what's otherwise one of the most linear Metroids. At this point on the Game Boy, that line would have been pointing toward the penultimate area. But AM2R has already broken from that path, and it's about to do so even more significantly. Instead of breaking into the Metroid Hive, the path diverts to a brand new section, complete with its own upgrades, gimmicks, and Metroids. The Distribution Center. The purpose of this operation is to store and wire energy from the core through the rest of the planet, which sounds great, but upon your arrival it's unexpectedly, uh, damp. Super Metroid's Meridia was naturalistic, Fusion's undersea area was a fish tank, and AM2R has its own spin. Something has caused an underground pipe to burst, and water has partially submerged the distribution center. 
It's an artificial structure that's not supposed to be flooded. I love the contrast between the wide open caves outside and the flooded chamber still under guard inside. Once again, your enemies are largely mechanical, but I don't think AM2R is just lazily repeating itself. I didn't see it before, but a technological motif runs through the entire game. This is where AM2R achieves something the original simply couldn't. In the same way that Super Metroid brilliantly built a cohesive natural world, AM2R shows the remnants of a cohesive society. Every redesigned area informs the function of the others, letting the player experience firsthand the scope of the Chozo race's technological prowess. So it's kind of appropriate that this brand new area would feature gimmicks and graphical effects that couldn't have been done on the less capable tech that 2D Metroids of the past have been on. These Don Maku bots splatter the screen with projectiles when they're disturbed. Man, I thought the tester was a bullet hell. And these little round power cells have to be bounced into conduits to re-energize the facility. But like the bots, they'll overload if you hit them with beam weapons, which results in this awesome explosion that disables enemies. It also disables Samus's weapons as long as she's in the vicinity of it. And I love that static effect showcasing the interference. All of these functions are taught to the player in simple, direct scenarios then combined and jumbled and just designed in increasingly complex and satisfying ways. It's indistinguishable from the skill curve, the professional design of the very best official titles. The distribution center, true to its name, outputs all over the planet, and so it functions as AM2R's fast travel system. These conduits shoot Samus back to earlier sections, but I'm surprised to find that power cells have been deployed in places I had already explored. I can't remember any other instance of a Metroid game so directly incentivizing a backtrack like this. Given how linear the map is, SR388 needed fast travel. It is a little clunky though, that this room full of conduits that lead back to earlier areas also happens to feature the one conduit you need to move forward. I didn't take that one first, and it took me a while to check it, because I had already categorized the room as a sort of level select or a central hub, but when I did figure it out, it led to the gravity suit, and... Heh, <laughs> I see what they did there. Then I found this ominously large, empty room, and just past that, the Ice Beam. But to get out with the Ice Beam, I had to pass through that room again. And... Ceres? Ceres is in this game! He was that tough, speedy snake boss from Fusion. And he was the one who burst the pipe and flooded the whole center. Oh, the fan service! But once again, AM2R gets it! Metroid doesn't do fan service haphazardly, it has to make sense. And remember, all the enemies from Fusion were the X's imitation of species from SR388, so it does make perfect sense that Ceres would be here. But the fight itself is no throwback. It's like a particularly brutal variation on Bot's wound, as you free sections of the beast and shatter its armor. Aesthetically, it ends up looking a little too gamey since the platforms all show themselves as missile blocks. It's not as tough as Fusion Ceres, but it is probably more fair. And man, the reward was worth it! Back on the Game Boy, the Ice Beam was the first beam upgrade you'd find, but in a game where your beams didn't stack, its usefulness was limited. AM2R let Samus's multitude of beam types stay equipped over each other, and so the Ice Beam is now her final power-up. It has never been so satisfying. Enemies don't just freeze in place and hang in midair. They fall to the ground and shatter, or just die and float upward. Oh, it's awesome and a little unsettling at the same time. It's no coincidence that such satisfying power-ups are in the same area that lets you zip back to the top of the map. AM2R subtly nudges you toward giving the planet another tour, and it's ridiculous just how overpowered Samus feels by now. And if you do go back, you just might discover one more new area, and this one is entirely optional. Clearing this gap near the research site reactivates an elevator, <laughs> but I ain't gonna be lazy. <laughs> Seriously, I love that the game just lets you do this if for some reason you want to. It's another great detail, and hey, look, it's the surface, and hey, look, the sun is setting, and, uh, oh, huh. This area is the landing site of the GFS Throth, the starship that brought the research team to SR388. It's... it's enormous, but it's desolate. There are no Metroids, and enemies are sparse. Even the music is bleak, so it's appropriate that this area is kind of a tribute to the darkest game in the series, Metroid Fusion. This cave is the same one where the X will infect Samus, a little further down the timeline. And I got that cool, fan y feeling when I found this fusion-style save point on the Federation ship, right where you'd expect it to be. Trekking to the top deck of the ship reveals the boss of the area. It's called Genesis, and how appropriate is that in a game that is the modern-day epitome of what Nintendo don't? Actually, Genesis is an adaptation of a pretty minor enemy from Fusion, reimagined into something much more dangerous. The logbook claims that these are biologically the oldest creatures on SR388, 
but aside from some surprisingly flashy attacks, it's not very hard. The only other thing of interest is the rescue team's vessel, hanging out back there via a very nice parallax scrolling effect. Actually, huh, I found a scientist, but I wonder whatever happened to their rescue team. That the area is so wide open and desolate, I mean, there's no other place like this in the series, and I think it's evoking exactly what the team meant for it to. This is the research team that the Federation failed to save, and so it has the aura of a graveyard. Experienced here, it's a poignant reminder of what Samus is up against. Unfortunately, on my initial playthrough, I didn't actually find it until after everything else in the game, and in that context, it was more of an unsatisfying coda. I mean, I really do see what they were going for, and I do think they pulled it off, but it might have been better served to open up more obviously after you find the research team. After all that creativity though, it is kind of nice to get back to Metroid 2 as usual. Yeah, yeah, I know how this goes. We find one alpha, take it down, then head down to discover that oh no, the tunnel's collapsed, and I'll like super surprised when I climb back up here to discover what? <laughs> well, there's the rescue team, but there's no way to rescue them, as the Metroid reveals its final form and slaughters them. It sucks for them that Samus just barely got here too late, but the way they're used to put over the final evolution of the Metroids is brilliant. But on the downside, have you noticed a problem yet? The Omega Metroid has some pretty cool attacks, and it's a neat touch the way its armor opens up when it lunges. But I'm not really struggling here. It's kind of just taking a while to whittle it down. But when it finally did go down, the path opened to the penultimate area, the Metroid Hive. Originally, this place featured nothing more than a boss rush against three of the toughest Metroids in the game. Of course, you could refill your health and weapons if you didn't mind backtracking for 15 minutes, and that you would need to do so was pretty much a given. In AM2R, the music is appropriately tense, and the graphics are repetitive and evocative of the mindless instinct that built this hive. This is where I might have really appreciated that save points now double as recharge stations. Unfortunately, I probably could have done without the recharge this time. This just crystallized it for me. Omega Metroids are way too easy. Either you aim the super missiles well and they go down in no time flat, or you're left with regular missiles and the fight is just boring. I see in the patch notes that AM2R's one and only update nerfed Omega Metroids, but I think they overdid it. Getting through the nest is the last obstacle before the end. It should be challenging, but I breezed through it in about five minutes and was left feeling weirdly unfulfilled. Maybe I should try playing on hard next time because, oh yeah, AM2R adds that too. Same as in the original. It's a winding climb upward toward the final area, supplanted this time with some gorgeous waterfalls and tranquil backdrops. You know, I think this section would have felt better without music. The music from the hive keeps playing, same as on the Game Boy, but if it just had the ambience of the waterfalls, it would have made a better contrast. A moment of silence before the end. At the top of those waterfalls, you come to the Genetics Laboratory, the origin point of the series' namesake, the place the Metroids themselves were born. The larvae swarm from the background, and I was impressed at just how fast they drain you if they catch you. I'd like them to be a threat. Finally, you drop down and discover the Metroid Queen. The final boss was already a real impressive technical achievement for the Game Boy, and it starts out pretty much the same. But after a few rounds, she starts blowing holes through the walls and pushing you back into the lab. The Metroid Queen is just about perfect, even if it does get a little repetitive with how often she pulls back to fire projectiles. It might be nice if she had another attack, but even as it is, it's probably the best final boss in the 2D series from a gameplay perspective. Eventually Samus is cornered, and the Queen clamps down, looking to finish her off. But I've been here before. I remember how this goes, and committing genocide has rarely been so satisfying. Gorgeous. Just gorgeous. One more time, Samus watches the last Metroid hatch. AM2R ends the same way its 25-year-old predecessor did, not with an explosive countdown, but with an earnest, peaceful trip back to the surface. Although this is the end of the game, we now know that this is just the beginning of the series' most famous arc, and the final screen AM2R shows you is this one. The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. AM2R is not perfect, but most of its imperfections rise directly as a result of the fact that it's remaking Metroid 2, an epic game for its time, but one that was even then flawed at the core. Most of Metroid 2's flaws are circumvented to some degree in this remake, but a few are exacerbated. 
There's a reason the series didn't move toward this more linear style as it went forward. There's a reason Samus never again had to hunt down the same sort of thing over and over and over again. That stuff only came about because of the Game Boy's limitations, and as a remake, AM2R can't get around it. But let me clarify what I said. AM2R's flaws arise directly because AM2R is a remake of Metroid 2, and that is incredible because this is a fan-made video game. The flaws don't come from engine problems, consistency issues, bizarre difficulty spikes, or even gratuitous fan service. And same as I had to think of the early Metroids in context to their time, I've had to think of every other fan game I have ever played in that context, as something made by a hobbyist. But AM2R is on a whole other level. It doesn't really matter if Milton Guasti and his team made a better Metroid than Nintendo. What matters is that they made a real Metroid game. Because this is a real Metroid game. It deserves its spot in this season, and more than that, it deserves to be held in the same regard as the very series that inspired it. Dr. M and his team created the definitive celebration of Metroid's anniversary, incorporating callbacks to just about every other mainline title, taking the best aspects of what worked in all of them, expanding on those aspects, and forging ahead with their own distinct style. And best of all, the team was committed to continuing development on this game, building on to what was already a complete experience. They planned to add a new game plus mode where the whole map would be open from the start, and beam combos that would allow you to fight Metroids with more than just missiles. And look, the distribution center even has this pipe that you can't enter. Could more areas be added? Yes, AM2R was a modern game that could be upgraded, changed, made even better. Milton Gwosti never even asked for donations for AM2R. In fact, he outright refused them, but his team, through thousands of hours of work across an entire decade, transformed a 25-year-old Game Boy game into a playable representation of their love for this series. They gave one of the most important games in the canon the remake it needed, and built a game that could satisfy 12 years of longing for anyone who had ever been a fan. On the 30th anniversary of one of gaming's most revered franchises, Dr. M and his team gave Metroid the celebration it deserved. It's too bad Nintendo didn't see it that way. What is it that makes Metroid, Metroid? No really, what would you say are those critical elements that make a Metroid game real? I think the answer, much like the series, is more complex than it seems. But no matter where you stood, the day that Metroid Prime was announced, one thing seemed beyond certain. This is not my Metroid! <laughs> Seriously, Prime was treated with caution at best, and blind rage at worst. Fans were worried, and you know what? They had every reason to be. Super Metroid came out in 1994, now let's hammer that home. This was the newest game in the series for eight years. And a lot had changed in eight years. Nintendo's rivals were no longer scrappy fellow video game companies, they were global corporations with gaming divisions. Where in 1994, three-dimensional games were sort of swirling in this primordial soup both graphically and mechanically, the industry had spent those eight years trying to figure out how to make a game work in 3D. And the exploration-focused Metroid series seemed like such a natural fit, it was almost ridiculous that it had taken this long. So with so much anticipation, and so much writing on this, how could Nintendo relinquish Samus's long-awaited return to an outside company that had never so much as released a video game? All Retro Studios had ever accomplished was canceling titles and laying off its staff. How could they hope to possibly capture what made Metroid Metroid? Definitely not by turning it into one of those filthy, casual, first-person shooters. Uh, keep in mind, we were less than a decade out from Doom, and the FPS genre was still pretty much dominated by twitchy action games, uh, especially on consoles. Nintendo could crow all they wanted about how, no, no guys, this is a first-person adventure, but nothing they said could shape this collective worry that all of Metroid's subtleties would be brushed aside for some uninspired, formulaic hallway shooter. I bet some of you have never heard this part of the story before, of Metroid Prime's, eh, troubled announcement. But the reason that that became a historical footnote is because, well, you do know how this story ends. Metroid Prime would turn out to be the most critically acclaimed game in the entire franchise. It was a killer app for the GameCube, hitting at the perfect time, when gamers were super worried that if we seemed too kiddy, nobody would take us seriously. 
Nintendo, with its stupid toy box console full of stupid cartoon games, was being torn apart for not being mature enough. Yet here was a title with depth and substance that Nintendo fans could use to silence those critics. Yeah, the industry was kind of going through this edgy adolescent phase. So, when an edgy adolescent named Josh headed to the old blockbuster video on November 17th, 2002, he had seen the hype, he had already read the reviews, and you better believe that he rented Metroid Prime. And also Animal Crossing. Look, I had already gotten a GameCube instead of a PS2. I could regularly be seen in public at the time, playing a fluorescent pink GBA. I was never going to be cool anyway. I still remember how it felt to see that stylized intro. God, even the menu of this game was electrifying. This was my first Metroid game, but I had spent pretty much my whole life hearing amazing things about this series. Those reviews claimed that Metroid Prime seemed as though it was at least a generation ahead of its time. As I finally stepped into the role of Samus Aran for the first time, I was hyped. I, uh, I, uh, I ended up putting more time into Animal Crossing. Yep. But I kept hearing that this was one of the best games ever made, so I was sure I was just missing something. I got it for Christmas the next year, and the same thing happened. Years later, I got the Trilogy version on Wii. It had these pointer controls that replicated the precision of a mouse and keyboard, which is normally the only way I can really get into FPS games, and for a while I felt like I was finally into Metroid Prime. But no, eventually, the same thing happened again. No matter how many times I'd try to pick it up over the years, I would always just lose interest and stop playing. This puts me into a bit of an awkward position. To be honest, I'm kind of nervous. I know a ton of you guys found me because of Metroid. I know you are probably huge Metroid fans, and yet... I really didn't care for one of the most beloved games in the series, at least when I first played it, but that was 14 years ago. Maybe now that I've become a fan of the 2D games, I'll find more to appreciate, because I did absolutely love that series. And to tell you the truth, I am even more hyped to play Prime now than I was the first time. But I do want to give myself the best possible shot at finding a lot to love about this game, and I know what I like, so I'll be playing the trilogy version, but with mouse and keyboard controls via Dolphin. It took a little tweaking, but the entire game did control just fine like this. I will be getting into a few of the differences between this and the GameCube original, but the important thing is, for a standard playthrough, Prime is Prime regardless of how you play it. This is my ideal, and heading in, I was nothing but optimistic that I would finally fall in love with Metroid Prime. Once more under the breach, let's get critiquing. In decades past, a deeply spiritual group of Chozo swore off the technology their species had become so dependent on and built a natural refuge on a planet called Talon IV. But the Chozo hippies were forced out of their sanctuary when a meteor impacted the planet, and in the aftermath, strange elements poisoned and mutated the flora and fauna. Years later, following their humiliating defeat by a lone warrior on Zebus, the space pirates happened upon Talon IV. They realized the potential of this energy, which they called Phazon, and they set up mining operations and laboratories throughout the planet. So the space pirates were intentionally mutating life forms with Phazon some of which ended up in orbit on board a frigate ship above the planet. Hmm, yeah, seems solid enough. What could go wrong with that? Oh, who could have seen that coming? Yes, the space pirates are once again hoist by their own petard. As <laughs> Samus Aran responds to a distress signal from their ship. Oh man, this intro. God, I can only imagine how it felt if you'd been waiting for eight years. It's only been a couple of months since I finished the 2D series, but God, this build-up, the camera cuts, that music. Yeah, it's still getting me. Retro Studios didn't just shoehorn Metroid into an FPS. It would have been all too easy to make the player feel like a floating gun, but Samus is anchored in this world. That signature floaty jump makes more sense than ever when you're jumping around in 3D. Her movement speed is a lot slower, which, you know, disappoints me, but a speedy pace wasn't at all what Retro set out to do. True to Nintendo's promise of a first-person adventure, twitchy aiming is never the focus, thanks to a simple and accurate lock-on feature that just snaps to enemies. The other reason aiming is automatic is to sort of free up the player to focus on maneuvering Samus in 3D space during combat. You can dodge around enemies you're locked onto. Narrowly avoiding a charging attack is always cool, but the mechanic still feels a little bit clunkier than it should be. The button you dodge with is the same one you jump with. I don't know, I guess I'd find combat more engaging without the lock-on, but more than anything, it was there to mitigate the need for dual analog aiming. See, the GameCube original had very... 
uh, let's say traditional first-person console controls. You move forward and backward and turn with the left stick, and have to hold R to aim up and down. This hasn't been the standard in a long time, but every console FPS I'd ever played before this controlled a whole lot like it. The important thing is, all of your weapons and abilities are designed with lock-on in mind. Typical video game firearms, especially back then, operated on a principle called hitscan. That means that as soon as you fire, the game performs an instant calculation to check whether or not you hit your target. It's simple math, easy on the CPU, and works well enough for something that flies as fast as a bullet. But Samus ain't firing bullets. Her attacks are all projectile-based, and they all have their own distinct cadence and rhythm, made manifest through exceptional sound design and effects. The crunchiest among them is that clear, consistent timing of a charge shot. I've always loved that warping effect, and when you release that blast, boom, you can almost feel the kickback. The interface, from the menu on down, is just slick in a way that Nintendo games usually aren't. All of the HUD elements are justified in-universe as part of Samus' literal heads-up display. This speaks to Metroid Prime's greatest ambition, to immerse the player in the role of Samus Aran. You see the edges of that helmet in your peripheral vision. Steam, slime, and water can coat the visor, and electromagnetic enemies interfere directly with your sensors. Occasionally, a blast of light will even illuminate Samus' visage against her visor. This even extends to her upgrades. Controlling Samus underwater without the gravity suit was always meant to feel a little frustrating, to make the moment you actually got it even sweeter. So, Prime's underwater sections feature terrible visibility in addition to the movement constraints. At least until you get that gravity suit and things clear up. Prime is absolutely full of minor details like this, but they add up and they speak to just how much thought went into translating Metroid to this perspective. While there are a couple of different ways you'll find to see the world, the most critical one is the one you start with, the Scan Visor. The 2D series communicated a lot of functionality via these gamey blocks, but those would have killed believability in a 3D world. So instead, you now see these information nodes when you activate the Scan Visor. It's a fantastic tool for sussing out hints when you get stuck, and so it changes your relationship with the environment itself. Hidden items make this low, droning noise to clue you in now, and there's never a case where you'll need to just aimlessly bomb random walls anymore. No, instead you'll have to spam your whole arsenal at them because you can't remember the difference between Cordite and Vendesium. <laughs> but maybe that's just me. I'm not as big a fan of how often the scan visor is used to activate mechanisms or disable force fields. Like, Samus has so many ways to do stuff like that, and scanning them is by far the least interesting. But for the most part, the scan visor was a worthy addition to the formula. However, I want to make a distinction between the scan visor, as it's used for environmental intel, and the logbook that it fills up, which allows Samus to gather information on the flora, fauna, and hazards of Talon 4. Uh, my problem is not believability. Uh, this thing feels right at home in-universe, even if it sometimes seems like a bit of a stretch that it could intuit things so relevant to Samus's specific situation. But no, my real problem is just how harshly it pulls me out of the gameplay. One of my favorite things about the 2D Metroids was their approach to storytelling. The way they would convey not just important beats, but their backstory and lore via nothing but subtext. And don't get me wrong, Prime is still doing some of that, but I'm sorry, I just don't find it interesting to stop what I'm doing in a video game, point my reticle at a node, wait for a loading bar to fill up, and have the plot explained to me. Delivered in this way, it feels way too much like supplementary material. It's the kind of thing I'd rather delve into when I'm not playing the game. The logbook's at its best when you use it to scan enemies and pick up info on their weak points. But even then, it'd be a lot more fun and immersive if I could use design clues to intuit those strategies, instead of just being told, Okay, you scan this thing, so you'll auto-lock here now. Situations where you need the scan visor are always well conveyed thanks to those differently colored nodes, but I kind of wish they'd taken it a step further, and just use different symbols to convey environmental info without needing a scan. I mean, sometimes the simpler solution is better. Just show me a picture of a missile. Fortunately, filling up the logbook is optional. Well, for the most part. Unfortunately, I didn't see it that way when I was first playing Prime. I've never been a completionist, but I didn't really understand that about myself at the time. I went into it with this mentality that I might miss something, and I'm sure that trying to scan everything was at least partly to blame for why I ran out of Steam so early back then. But hey, if this is what you want out of Metroid, I fully acknowledge that the extensive amount of prose in the logbook allows the lore to be a lot richer than it ever could have been otherwise. I'm just glad it's optional.
The Morph Ball has been reimagined so perfectly, it feels like becoming small and round was made for 3D. It's intuitive just the way you move it. Unlike the 2D games, it holds momentum and reacts to slopes now. Huh, you know, I feel like there's some other series that, like, shied away from realistic pinball physics when it made the jump to 3D. Weird. Uh, whatever I'm thinking of, it's probably because back in this era, pre-made physics engines weren't really a thing yet. Which makes it all the more impressive that Retro made it work. I always got a kick out of the fact that these technology-averse Chozo were apparently Big Tony Hawk fans. The abundance of half-pipes is the most 2002 thing about Prime. Unlike Super Metroid, Samus's arm cannon upgrades no longer stack. Instead, they're held as separate modes. This could have gone horribly wrong if you still had to screw around in the menu to swap weapons, but this was a new era, and we developed a little something called real-time weapon change. Each beam has a much more distinct set of characteristics and abilities, and so each one is integrated into combat strategy and puzzle solving alike. But since the Wiimote lacks a few buttons compared to the GameCube pad, your real-time weapon and visor changes aren't nearly as snappy in the trilogy version. Instead of just flicking the C-Stick, you have to select an icon. I can't fault the game for that, and it still works, but it made what might have been a nitpick on the GameCube into a genuine frustrating issue for me. The Metroid series has always had these missile doors, and so does Prime. But Prime also features a bunch of doors that can only be opened with a specific beam. Uh, that's fine, but I really wish they'd made them more like those missile doors, and let you open them with any weapon once you blast them open once. The Space Pirate Station serves as a tutorial area. I have always loved how capable and varied your arsenal is right from the start. It's a linear shot toward the heart of the station, and the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay beats feel like something out of Half-Life, polished and orchestrated with the player in mind. Now, Prime takes a lot of cues from Super Metroid, especially early on. A space colony, a Ridley encounter, an explosive escape followed by a rain-soaked arrival on a planet, an unsettling plant boss. But where I eventually got a little frazzled by the 2D series repeating itself, the very advent of 3D invigorates these sequences, and Retro took great pains to use those advances to make those nostalgic elements pop. Like in this escape, you're not just traversing the same rooms you already did, you're winding your way through the inner workings of the colony, and the rooms you do revisit show structural changes. It's frantic and exciting and immersive to a degree that a 2D game never could be. Then this happens. Yes, right after so expertly introducing all those cool abilities to you, a minor explosion somehow butchers Samus's power suit, leaving you with no Morph Ball, no Charge Beam, nothing except this spammy pea shooter. How retro of you, retro. This is the point where Prime stops so directly guiding the player, strips away most of your power, maroons you on a non-linear world, and starts, you know, being a Metroid game. And this, this right here, is when I stopped playing Metroid Prime in 2002. I finally understand why. The prologue made such a perfect first impression. It's linear and exciting, full of awesome set pieces and fun abilities. Then all of a sudden, the game takes all of that away, plucks you out of that gripping sci-fi setting, and expects you to wander around these boring brown ruins with no particular objective. It went from being an action game to a Metroid game. And it was 100% intentional. The contrast of all this action with the somber ruins of the Chozo is fantastic, but I had no context for it back then. I didn't know who the Chozo were, I didn't care who Ridley was, I didn't know that by the end of that very first section, you'd regain almost every one of those abilities. This prologue gets so much praise, and most of it is well earned. But here's my critique. The intro failed to convey to me what a Metroid game was or how it worked, so when Prime flipped the switch on me and asked me to explore, I didn't just get lost, I lost interest. I got bored and I decided to go collect NES games instead. What I missed out on was a game full of contrasting elements. The daunting pressure of the Magmore Caverns, and the crisp tundra of the Fendrana Drifts, the natural beauty of the overworld, and the mechanical precision of the Space Pirate Labs the spectacle of the boss battles, and the tragedy of Talon 4. One of the scan nodes in those labs notes that Phazon will kill all life on Talon 4 within 25 years, and that somber ambience of a world hanging on by a thread is exactly how it feels. 
Metroid Prime, quite frankly, realizes and articulates its world better than any game ever had before. And finally, getting to play through it now, there has been so much more that I missed out on. There have been times throughout this adventure when I have adored Metroid Prime, when it's all felt like exactly what I expect and want out of a 3D Metroid. <sighs> but there have been way too many times when it hasn't. Let me see if I can show you what I mean. I discover this awesome underwater section in the Talon Overworld, only to be told that I had to turn around, go all the way across the map back to the Fendrana Drifts, go through its water section to get the gravity suit, and then do I get to keep going? Do these two areas maybe link together? Nope, I just had to go all the way back again. This is not an isolated incident. The entire game is set up like this. You'll be in the drifts and you'll find the speedball, and the game will be like, Hey, there's a half pipe you could use way back here! Is there an elevator directly connecting to that place? Nope! You just have to push through Magmore, get back to the overworld, get the space jump, traverse back through the ruins, back through Magmore, back to the drifts, and now, NOW, you can jump up here and see something new. The 2D games kept this to a minimum for the most part. You'd find the gravity suit, then you'd proceed, if you chose to, into a larger water section. Even when they did want you to zigzag between areas to get power-ups, there was often a way around it. Even when there wasn't, it certainly never took this long to get where you were going. Unless, of course, you chose to take that time to explore. But Prime makes you meander back and forth through the world so much, it has to be an intentional design choice. Where Prime has an unprecedented amount of cohesion in its setting and themes, its approach to progression lacks cohesion. Wildlife on Talon 4 is way more aggressive than the 2D games, and while in-universe we can justify that as an effect of the phase-on, the game also needs to delay a player long enough for the next room to load. On the one hand, it's really impressive that the game never cuts to a loading screen, but getting ambushed yet again on your dozenth time through the same hallway makes me wonder if it was worth it. Eventually, I just started ignoring fights, tanking hits, and waiting for the doors to load. When the player is incentivized to just ignore aggressive enemies like this, something's gone wrong. By the time Prime sent me on a half-hour romp down the Phazon Mines with no save points, what should have been a tense, exciting difficulty spike only highlighted how repetitive and, quite frankly, boring the combat had become. Now let me be clear, the puzzles were wonderful! Excellent use of mechanisms in 3D space. The upgrades were fun, too. I had no idea this game even had power bombs, but I'd done it so much that the combat had become a chore. Oh look, it's another group of space pirates that glow purple. Wow, the wave beam killed them. How about that? When I finally reached the bottom of those mines, I found an Omega Pirate, who was finally like a proper challenge with a cool gimmick. I had to figure out to blast his armor off, and then use audio cues or the x-ray visor to suss out where he was cloaked. So when he finally went down, it actually felt like I had accomplished something. He collapses on Samus, and her suit gets corrupted with Phazon. It warps the very air around it, and we're gonna take it down into that impact crater and finally find out what went wrong on Talon 4. This is the climax! This is the end! This is what it's all been building toward! <laughs> no, it's not! Instead, the game is like, Hey, uh, go wander around some more and, like, pick up all 12 of these symbols, and, uh, then we'll let you in. Yes, you have to pick up all of the Chozo artifacts. Now, you can scan these statues outside the crater to get pretty obvious hints as to where they're hidden, but they're scattered throughout the entire map. Now you might say, ah, but you could scan those hints right near the start of the game, and then look for them as you go. Well, okay, but most of them require items that you don't even get until the late game. There's usually nothing even special about the way they're hidden either. Not any more than the standard missile upgrades. They don't even make sense within the lore. If the Chozo sealed away whatever's down here with these 12 keys before they left, then how did they hide them inside of the mines that the Space Pirates built? Make no mistake, padding is all this is, and it padded my playtime by more than two hours. It is such a blatant fetch quest, tacked on and incredibly tedious. If they were that committed to doing this, okay, but don't require it. Maybe instead of unlocking the impact crater, collecting the artifacts could have made the final boss easier, or given you an extra upgrade. The point is, it's important to give the player that choice between progression and exploration. But that fantastic Omega Pirate fight 
followed immediately by that awful artifact quest, it's kind of a microcosm of how I felt the whole game. Like, I didn't get a choice. A really fun and interesting new area would be revealed, and I'd press in there and find an awesome new power-up, only to be told that I'd need to once again trek across the entire world in order to actually put it to use. Something as simple as making all the elevators connect to a central hub could have saved a lot of this. And look, I recognize that backtracking is part of the formula, and I don't mind it when it's done well, like when it's been half the game since you've been through an area, and you've got tons of new abilities to put to use. But the way Prime does it is just overbearing. If they'd cut down all the four zigzagging, the slower pace of the gameplay wouldn't have had the chance to wear on me so bad. But after a while, every time I'd shut the game off, I just felt drained. Like I'd been playing it for hours when less than one had really passed. I didn't fully understand why until I went back and played a 2D Metroid game. There, defeating enemies came down to your reflexes. You as a player grew more skillful alongside Samus' own powers and abilities. In Prime, instead of becoming stronger, you get more options. It's more about strategy, knowing which weapon and visor to equip. But it's not freaking interesting because you fight the same spongy enemies with the same obvious solutions over and over! Aside from Super, I had never beaten any of the 2D games, but none of them took me more than about four hours on my first playthrough. In Prime, it took me half that time just to find all the artifacts. I hate feeling like this. I wanted real bad to love it, and I want to emphasize, I did find plenty to love about it. I love the music, which strikes this great, almost David Wise-like balance between ambience and melody. I love all those little details in the design, the world building, the confidence with which Retro took this franchise and brought it seemingly into the future. I love how much more developed and animated the space pirates are. Uh, by the way, those idiots are growing Metroids and injecting them with Phazon. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? I love how Prime takes place after the original Metroid, but before its sequel. In fact, the whole trilogy fits here, and it's such a bold move that could potentially lend so much more context to the entire series. I love how much more integrated into the world the puzzles are, and how fantastically they take advantage of 3D space. I especially love the hint system. I need it in a game like this. But I can't help but think that a more sensible approach to progression wouldn't have needed one, and the previous game in this very series is evidence of it. I love what happens when you finally return all those artifacts and Ridley ambushes Samus. Just seeing him, just hearing that theme got my adrenaline pumping. He starts breaking all the stupid artifact statues and instantly becomes my new favorite character. Yeah! Ridley for Smash Brothers! Ah, the fight is fantastic too. Just full of awesome attacks and dodging and timing our hits and yes! Even then, like most things in Prime, it overstays its welcome. Look, if a player has figured out how to effectively counter a boss's attack pattern, it's time for a new one. Stop testing me on these same things over and over. I love the game's namesake, the final boss, Metroid Prime. This is what has been producing all that phase on. The first part of the fight is about using the beam combo it's weak to, but it's a lot more dynamic than the static enemies, since Prime can switch between them, barraging you with so many different attacks. I pursued it deeper and deeper underground as the tension built, and when I finally busted its exoskeleton, the core was revealed. Now, instead of swapping beams, I was swapping visors to find it. The corrupted power suit can change into a hyper mode when Samus stands in pure phase on, which invites a final comparison to Super Metroid, giving you an ultra powerful weapon in the final boss fight. But as usual, Prime takes the idea from the series past, but uses player expectations to surprise you. My jaw dropped when I saw just how little damage I was doing. As Metroid Prime and I whittled away at each other's health, it was intense. I really thought I might lose this one, but I didn't. Metroid Prime was taken down. I literally fist pumped when I saw those words. Epic escape scene, here we go. Or, uh, I'll just appear back outside and watch the ending. That, that, that's fine. There is a game within Metroid Prime that I really enjoyed, but for every interesting new area I got to explore, for every exciting new enemy, for every power-up I found, for every solitary second that I got to enjoy playing it, I had to navigate dozens of rooms I've already seen and blow away the same boring enemies hundreds of times. I don't want to understate this. The backtracking, the lack of cohesion to player progression, ruined Metroid Prime for me. 
I enjoyed every single 2D Metroid, even the first one, substantially more than I enjoyed this one. I had hoped that being a fan of those 2D games would make a difference, and it did, but instead of letting me enjoy it more, it gave me something similar that I liked better to compare to. For the first time, the ending you get is not dependent on how quickly you beat the game. No, it's dependent on how many items you found, and how much of that logbook you filled up. And that kind of says it all. When the trilogy version came out, they bumped the default difficulty way down without being clear that they even did that. The original game's difficulty was bizarrely called Veteran, instead of, I don't know, original? What really kills it is that Trilogy fixes a lot of the sequence-breaking tricks that had been discovered on the GameCube. They didn't want you to think outside the box and accidentally do something dangerous outside the boundaries of the developer's intent. The world feels more real, sure, but your progression through it is so much more structured. Decisions like this are antithetical to what I've come to love about Metroid. For all these reasons, Metroid Prime was the worst possible introduction I could have had to this series. It avoided or obfuscated the very elements that could have, and eventually did, make me a fan of Metroid. So. Did Retro Studios fail? Are all the people who adore this game just blinded by nostalgia? Is Metroid Prime nothing more than an overrated insult to game design in general and to me personally? Is this, as it turns out, just not a real Metroid game? No. What Metroid Prime is, is a Metroid game that's not for me. And aside from that artifact quest, Retro Studios miraculously made the right call in nearly every single decision they made. Also, calling a game overrated is stupid. Stop it. The 2D Metroids were made at the pinnacle of an era before immersion as a goal of design was technically feasible. Storytelling could only be done via text boxes or subtext. So unless it was like an RPG or a visual novel, some kind of skill-based gameplay was almost always the core focus of the design because it had to be. I've often heard it said that Metroid Prime is, and I quote, basically Super Metroid but in 3D. Now more than ever I just have to say, what? No it isn't. It takes a lot of inspiration from Super, certainly, but the focus on what it sets out to achieve is very different. I'm sure some people enjoy both games for similar reasons, but, well, that kind of brings us full circle. What is Metroid? The truth is, that's a real subjective question with no right answer. Whatever you say, what you're really answering is a different question. Why are you a fan of this series? And your answer to that may reveal a whole lot about why you're a gamer in the first place. I answered that one for myself a long time ago. Video games are about gameplay, first and foremost. Thus, you can choose to become more skillful. Your skill will be rewarded. For me, a video game can certainly be about storytelling, world building, and immersion. And I appreciated all of those elements in 2D Metroid. But I only got to appreciate them because the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay stayed engaging. The industry had evolved in eight years. By 2002, games could be more than just games. They could be experiences. If you do get immersed in the world of Talon 4, you'll revel in the chance to uncover everything that you can. If it were designed and paced more like Super Metroid, then all the work that went into this world would have had less chance to shine. More significantly, the game would have been a lot shorter. Where replayability was often the focus in 1994, a Metroid Prime that only took four hours to beat would have been raked over the coals by 2002. What I see as padding, I understand that Prime's fans see as more of an opportunity to spend time here, immersed in the role of Samus. This commitment to immersion is exactly what set Metroid Prime apart from other games at the time, and sets it apart even now from the gameplay centrism that Nintendo often prioritizes. It had its finger on the pulse of where AAA game development was going. You know what's funny? Things might have been a lot different if I'd played Metroid Fusion first. Aside from all the unskippable story scenes, it went in the opposite direction of Prime, and I think it did so on purpose. Where Prime catered toward adventurers and completionists, Fusion was a much more linear, challenging, action-focused game that got to be that way because it dialed back on the esoteric stuff. There's an alternate universe out there where I spent the last 15 years as a fan of this series, instead of just the last few months. But in this timeline, I spent all those years thinking that I wouldn't be a fan of Metroid, judging the series based on what I gleaned here, when in truth, 
I just wouldn't be a fan of Metroid Prime. But I can still respect it. The cohesion, the continuity, the tone that set the Metroid franchise apart from other games in previous generations were so spectacularly realized. It deserves every accolade it's ever gotten for brazenly reimagining the formula without losing the soul of Metroid. So many people doubted them. But if the true ending is anything to go by, Retro Studios never doubted themselves. The return of Samus was made manifest, and the explosive success of Metroid Prime would catapult the franchise into its golden age. The geek critique for that game, Metroid Prime 2, is available right now for anyone who supports this channel on Patreon, and it'll be up on YouTube next week. I've also got a Patreon-exclusive bonus episode for the game that ended that golden age, Metroid Other M. Thanks for watching, see you next week, and until then, you keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing. Metroid Prime 2 Echoes interesting right off the bat is the fact that it's a sequel to a game that without hyperbole defined its era. Say what you will about Prime 1, and I have, but I can't argue that it was an astoundingly avant-garde title, a killer app that single-handedly turned Metroid from a well-regarded cult series into one of Nintendo's biggest franchises. By 2004, AAA franchises like this were becoming increasingly reliant on consistent, like bi-yearly or even yearly releases. Previous Metroid games were released generations apart on increasingly more powerful hardware. Therefore, no two games had ever been especially similar. The series reinvented itself with each release, not just iterating, but evolving. Metroid Prime 2, on the other hand, was coming out only two years after the original, on the same hardware, in the same engine. But unlike movies or TV spin-offs, video game sequels have a pretty positive track record. Sequels often give developers the opportunity to iron out the kinks, refining and polishing an excellent predecessor into an even better sequel. Metroid itself had already done this earlier in the year, using the same engine from Metroid Fusion to make an excellent remake of the NES original. And given that Prime 1 was so well received, that much of a system seller, that important of a game, imagine what Retro Studios would be able to achieve with one more iteration. The anticipation was off the charts! Or so you'd think. But when I think of the weeks before Metroid Prime 2's release, I don't remember a lot of hype. What I remember is a short span of time where the consoles the GameCube competed with received some of the most highly anticipated sequels I had ever seen. I remember my friends talking about Halo 2 for months on end, and even skipping school the day it came out. I remember them lavishing praise on how astounding the expanse of San Andreas was, sharing stories of their criminal escapades. And when Metroid Prime 2 came out, well, probably just read that Nintendojo liked it. This lack of hype was even stranger considering that the only contemporary console I had at the time was the GameCube. And even though the first game had failed to make me a Metroid fan, I did my due diligence as a Nintendo fan. I rented Echoes, played it for an hour or two, and lost interest. Second verse, same as the first, I thought. All I really recall about it was that it was very brown. <laughs> Which was ironic, because Prime 2 failed to kick up any dust. <sighs> But what happened? Was the long shadow cast by Prime 1 that impossible to overcome? Did the fact that it was on the GameCube cause it to be ignored, since by this time the system's sort of kiddie reputation was solidified? Perhaps I, as a high school student at the time, was in the wrong environment to encounter appreciation for it. Eh, maybe that is a piece of it, but even now I don't hear much about Echoes. It's like it's got middle child syndrome. The first one is legendary, the third one is controversial, but Metroid Prime 2 shares a similar fate to the other game in this series with a 2 in the title. It has often been overlooked in favor of its contemporaries, and I cannot wait to find out why. Let's get critiquing. Okay, well, that's weird. I guess multiplayer must be the primary mode of this game, since it is highlighted first in the main menu. God, what is even going on with this interface? Prime 1 was slick, but this is trying so hard to be futuristic that it crosses over into being impractical. Whatever. It's been a long time, but I remember how to do multiplayer games on this channel. Kaylin, how many great memories do you have of playing the multiplayer mode of this game with all of your friends? Zero. Shut you down. I got you this. Did you just uppercut me? All right, Kalen, that was Metroid Prime 2 multiplayer. What's your critique? It's all right. It's like playing Goldeneye, but without slappers. 
Which makes it to where it's not like playing Goldeneye. <laughs> playing Goldeneye, but without slappers. <laughs> you know, there's probably a reason Let's Plays didn't work out for us back in the day. It's odd to see the Isolationist Metroid series even try multiplayer, but it turned out to be a lot more fun than I was expecting. Problem was, 2004 was kind of this origin point for online shooters on consoles. Prime 2's split-screen exclusive couch gaming was never going to have much staying power, and so it comes across like Nintendo was just trying to keep up appearances. Regardless of what the menu implies, the real game is still the single player. Metroid Prime 2 immediately drives a hard distinction between itself and its predecessor. That game began with Samus responding to a distress call and led into a half hour long action packed prologue that made an incredible first impression, but it wasn't really germane to what the rest of the game would be about. Prime 2 starts with a mystery. Samus is tasked with locating a squad of Galactic Federation Marines. Their last point of contract was the planet Aether, and on her descent through the atmosphere, Samus's gunship is struck down, crashing through the wall of the cave. That's as much action as you'll see for a little while. Instead of being explosive and cinematic, Echo's prologue is quiet. Too quiet. There's a sense of trepidation as you push deeper into these twisting tunnels. As is tradition, the Federation Marines never stood a chance. Their armored corpses strewn throughout the caves. Maybe it was this sense of danger the game was instilling, but I found myself inclined to do something I almost never do in games. I was taking my time. I was being careful. I was, and I'm almost ashamed to say it, scanning everything. The scan visor has been substantially improved. For starters, the HUD directly communicates what percentage of stuff you've scanned by categories, which is a lot nicer than fiddling with the menu. It's dumb, but it's fun to watch those numbers go up. More importantly though, instead of scannable stuff appearing as nodes, entire polygonal objects are highlighted. They're color-coded between critical stuff, items and bonus info, and things you've scanned already. This change might not seem like much, but it makes the visor so much more useful. It's so much more clear just what you're scanning, and it makes it a sense to see exactly what's important as soon as you walk into a room. But there was probably another reason I was inclined to use the scan visor. I played Prime 1 with a mouse and keyboard via the trilogy version, and I know I'll have to play Prime 3 with a Wii remote thanks to the more involved motion controls. So for Prime 2, I decided to go old school and play the GameCube original complete with the GameCube controller. And I was not at all expecting this, but I found it to be more immersive. Mostly that came down to this. I no longer had to deal with this clunky cursor movement to change visors and beam types. The trilogy controls do have a ton of benefits, but they kept awkwardly pulling me out of the game because of how often I had to interact with the interface. With a GameCube pad, those commands are only a button press or a flick of the C-stick away. The outmoded movement controls of the GameCube version are sure to be an issue for some people, but like I said last time, every console FPS I played when I was a kid controlled a lot like this, so it was like riding a bike to me. And as I played, I noticed that the game was very much designed around this controller. The gaming, the lock-on, the enemies, and the mechanics are all built to function optimally within the framework of the GameCube layout. But hey, that's just my preference. I prefer easy swapping over modern FPS controls, but I'd prefer them both if I could have them. Not being able to look up and move at the same time did become a problem in a few spots, so it'd be nice to get the best of both worlds. Nonetheless, I always did think that one of my big issues with Prime was the lack of free aim controls. But apparently not! The GameCube pad was always one of my favorites, and it's won me over again. But there was one more reason I found myself getting immersed right from the start. It's one thing to deal with a spectacular disaster that's unfolding while you're in the middle of it, but I think it's inherently more interesting and more evocative of Metroid to ask the player to figure out what's gone wrong after the fact. In one scenario, your adrenaline is pumping, but in the other, you're using your head. And of course, the ingredients of a great Metroid game feature plenty of both, but by kicking off with a mystery, Prime 2 is able to instill both its tone and what it expects from the player in a more immediate way. That apprehension gets kicked up another notch, when the dead marines get infected by some kind of particle effect and shamble at Samus like zombies. Then Prime 2 delivers on the promise of the previous game's cliffhanger ending, as Samus runs into a dark shadow of herself. She follows her doppelganger through a portal of sinister purple clouds, and then... Uh, what? Well, Samus will strap on a water jetpack later, so maybe Nintendo was just going through a phase. But no, Samus comes through the portal and confronts her shadow. This dark Samus shoots out a crystal in a nicely cinematic moment, causing our heroine to choke in the very atmosphere of this place. Warped, twisted enemies vastly outnumber her, and she barely escapes back through the portal, only to find that the creatures harvested a bunch of her suit upgrades. Hey, that sure beats them getting knocked out by a dinky explosion. You still keep the morph ball and charge beam, so you're never down to that basic pea shooter. 
Samus soon discovers that the Marines were engaged in a battle with our old buddies, the Space Pirates. Both of them were caught in that same atmospheric storm. Both of them crash-landed, and the early part of the game nicely contrasts the Marines' experience with the Space Pirates as you discover the remains of both camps. The Marines were overpowered by swarms of splinters, the same that attacked Samus. It wasn't long before I fought an even larger splinter, and right when I had it on the ropes, it was corrupted by that dark energy and became even stronger. But I kept my wits about me, dodged its attacks with all my finesse, refined through decades of playing video games, and... I died? Well, I never died a single time in Prime 1, but I just died to the first mini-boss in Echoes! This game is awesome! God, I love a challenge, and I love overcoming it even more. Then I picked up a thing, rode an elevator, and encountered... a non-player character that's friendly? Like, we're just gonna have a conversation in a Metroid game? Okay. This is a member of an alien race called the Chozo? Wait, we're also introducing a sentient species that's not a Chozo? No, this is a Luminoth, and his name is Umas. Umas? Umas. He's gonna exposit the rest of the backstory. So, 50 years ago, Aether collided with some kind of celestial object, spreading a strange energy across the planet. Does, uh, does any of that sound familiar? But in this case, the world was split into two. East and w I mean, uh, light and dark. The Dark World manifested a new race, which the Luminoth called the Ing. Virus-like creatures capable of infecting Aether species with their malice, turning even the peaceful Luminoth into hosts for the Ing. For decades, they waged war on each other, the Ing successfully stealing away most of Light Aether's planetary energy. Now the light side is on the verge of ruin. But that thing Samus picked up from the Dark Splinter was the Luminoth's energy transfer module. It's become integrated into her suit, meaning she is now the only one who can travel into the Dark World, recover the planetary energy, and bring the light back to Aether. Whew, yeah, we've come a long way from just shattering boss statues. The first area to set out to is the Agon Wastes. And, uh, are you, are you sure I've even gone anywhere? The entire prologue is set in these dusty caves, and going out of those and into this drab wasteland means the opening hours of Echoes are way too aesthetically similar. Keeping you in this same kind of locale for so long means that for a while, Echoes lacks both the memorable contrast and the immediate breadth of its predecessor. But maybe Retro hoped that that contrast would instead come from Echoes' overarching gimmick. The Dark World. The world is filled with portals that let you go back and forth between these two realities of Aether. Dark Aether is aesthetically fantastic, contrasting this dark palette with sinister purple highlights. While the overall geometry of most rooms stays the same across dimensions, the enemies and mechanisms that inhabit them tend to be completely different. It can be unnerving seeing these familiar areas corrupted. It does an excellent job instilling the feel that you're on enemy territory, exemplified by the fact that the atmosphere itself is corrosive. Samus burns off a ton of health any time you leave these bubbles. The Dark World is not, however, all-inclusive. The Dark World maps tend to be dwarfed in size by the main maps, and sometimes you'll go ages without even going there. This keeps it from seeming like it's there to artificially lengthen the game by reusing the same geometry. It's implemented smartly and in a way that makes sense. It's also used for puzzle solving, activating a mechanism in one world to affect another, or even to travel to places that you can't get to yet on the other map. These lead to some really fun, unique puzzles that inspire outside-the-box thinking, but it can get a little ridiculous how many times you'll have to sit through the same loading transition. I don't think the tech was there to make it any snappier than this, though. We were still a few years away from thinking with portals. I was surprised when I found myself up against Dark Samus already, this early in the game. I was even more surprised at how, uh, pitiful she was to dispatch. I mean, seriously, after all that buildup, have I beaten her already? Uh, of course not. She'll show up throughout the game, let out this chilling, over-the-top laugh, and do something to inconvenience the player. Oh, wait a minute. A doppelganger with similar powers to our hero, who keeps coming out of nowhere to screw up our progress? I love the concept, but haven't I seen this somewhere before? Oh yeah, duh. <laughs> they even chuckle the same way. After kicking Dark Samus to the curb, you find the Dark Beam, and not too long after that, it's opposite in the Light Beam. If the Dark World is Echo's most distinctive thematic element, then its most distinctive gameplay element comes right here. Combat in Prime 1 was defined by the different beam types, and while they felt excellent, their actual implementation was too often based around repetitive color matching. The Dark and Light Beams, in contrast, are the only beam weapons you'll be getting for a long time, and introducing them so early was no accident. Like Prime's beams, they each have properties that give them unique utility, and the sound effects and timing on them are just as well designed, giving both of them a distinct kick. 
What makes the difference though is not Samus' abilities, but how much more dynamically designed and challenging her enemies are. Some of them may be weak to one beam or the other, but there's almost nothing in the game that can only be damaged by a particular beam. At most they might have some kind of shield you'll need to bust through with either type, but even that's pretty rare. That means there's no more boring color matching, and so defeating enemies comes down to executing skill. And for the first time, these two beam weapons require ammo. That sounds like a risky concept, but in practice I found this to be a non-issue. Killing enemies and resupply crates alike will always net you the opposite ammo, and aside from a few boss fights, I never ran out. But it does change how you think about your weapons, now that there's a greater cost associated with using them. But it is still well thought out. If you need to open a particular door, you can still use an empty beam with a charge shot. And of course, you've still got the tried and true power beam, which works exactly as it did in Prime 1. Perhaps because of this change though, enemies tank less hits, and fights become less spammy. What it adds up to is that combat has more stakes and more variety. In addition to better designed drones, Prime 2 also features many bosses called Guardians that have taken on the characteristics of Samus' stolen weapons. So to recover the boost ball, you'll have to beat the boost Guardian. Uh, wait a sec, I was trying to remember something a minute ago. We got an evil clone of our hero, in a game that's more challenging than its predecessor, with a stronger focus on narrative, featuring boss battles where corrupted enemies use the protagonist's own powers against them. Ah, yeah, now I remember. Don't worry, little buddy, I got you! Alright, alright, alright. Just like Prime 1 appropriated a lot of Super's defining elements, Prime 2 is more than a little reminiscent of, of course, Metroid Fusion. It's kinda surprising that Nintendo was okay with Retro putting their own spin on such a similar concept, given how much more recent Fusion was, but for all the same reasons that I didn't mind it in Prime, I don't mind it now. Retro injects more than enough creativity to justify it, and in fact they seemed even more confident adding new elements to the series with Echoes than they did before. But this is still a Metroid game, and I am still the kind of player who needs a lot of help in finding his way through a game like this. The Dark Agon Temple is sealed by three keys hidden throughout the Dark World. This was as far as I made it when I rented the game back in 04, and I'm not really surprised. Here's the thing, if you tell me the keys are in the Dark World, that's where I'm gonna look. Even after I wandered around for 30 minutes until the hint came up, I still had no idea how to actually get over there. And I feel I was actually punished for taking my time and scanning the environment. I knew I needed to get through that door, but scanning it told me I'd be able to break this gate. I thought there was an upgrade I needed to find. But no, as it turns out, the actual solution was just to jump up here and notice this brownish entrance blending into this brownish wall. Should, uh, should, should that have been more obvious? I didn't talk about this much last time, but the map in the Prime games is something I really have trouble wrapping my head around. I spend a lot of time just poring over the map screen, trying to sort out where to go. Echoes is an improvement over the first games, given that you can finally see doors in rooms you're not highlighting. That drove me crazy last time. But it's still easy to get lost in a convoluted mess of geometric shapes, especially when multiple sections are placed over top of each other. It's like if I look at it wrong, my perception of the unshaded translucent 3D causes me to see the map upside down, and I wind up just spinning it in circles while my brain tries to recalibrate itself. That said, because rooms are designed so realistically, because of that third axis, I really don't know how much better it could get, especially in 2004. I think directly giving the player an adventure line to follow would be a step too far, but it might be nice if the player could set their own waypoints, or even color a series of rooms that they intend to follow. Geometry was never my strong suit, and I'm willing to concede that a lot of this might just be a me problem, but I always found myself willing to push through it with this game. Why? Well, largely because it's so much tougher than its predecessor. There's more to engage with, more to sink my teeth into, more to feel frustrated by, more to overcome. And when I overcame the first major boss, I was really surprised when this happened. This is a new upgrade for Echoes, the Dark Suit. I knew about Dark Samus as a separate character, but it's a testament to how little of a mark Echoes made that I had no idea this thing was even here. But I love the style of it. It's rustic and reminds me a bit of an old-timey robot. It's an example of Retro's willingness to introduce distinct elements to the series, and it fits this game to a T. Gameplay-wise, the Dark Suit makes the damage you get from the corrosiveness of the Dark World negligible. You'll still be on your toes there, but it's a lot more manageable now. From the dark to the light, it's a bit of a chore to hit this temple in both dimensions, but I return the energy to Light Aether. While the Agon Wastes might fail to make an impression with its looks, it achieves distinction by introducing all 
of Echo's important recurring elements. By the end of this first section, I was intimately familiar with the Dark World, I had both the light and dark beams, I understood how temple keys work, and after defeating this first boss, I even had the suit that Samus would turn out to wear for the majority of the game. And that kind of sets the stage. Samus did it once and she'll do it twice more. Go to a new area, find the light temple, update translation files to open new doors, fight a mini boss or two to recover some powers, collect keys in the dark world, fight the main boss, and restore the light to Aether. This approach could run the risk of being too linear or repetitive, but I rather believe the execution proves the opposite. Linearity is not inherently a bad thing. All Metroid games are linear to some degree. They all have a path that developers intend you to follow, and Echo's approach turns out to be much more in line with how progression was done in the 2D series. It's handled on a smaller scale, letting you traverse the ins and outs of one ecosystem before moving on to the next, giving you the opportunity to backtrack and seek out secrets, but not forcing you to do so. The first game impressed me with an immediate breadth by introducing its environments early and doled out new beam types as it went on. Prime 2, in contrast, gave me my combat options up front, but it kept me in a dull wasteland for about five hours. I don't really think that was necessary, but it paid off in a big way when I finally got to the Torvis Bog. It was so refreshing to see rain and water and an atmosphere and new enemy types and... Oh, I love this. Yet it still got that same DNA, that same commitment to player immersion, that same avant-garde style, and, uh, and, and some of the same enemies. Elements of Echoes get perhaps a bit too derivative of Prime 1. Even the bog itself, as much as I'd love to see it, was very evocative of the Talon 4 overworld. The Dark World influences still give it its own vibe, of course, and I guess it's not too different from the 2D series having similar enemies across planets. Uh, maybe it'll ultimately make sense. Speaking of, though, here's something cool I didn't really give Prime enough credit for. Enemies in 3D games need to be more aggressive toward the player, since otherwise you can just go around them. How much does it say about Retro Studios that they went to the trouble of coming up with Phazon to justify that in-universe? Even against these guys, which keep disappearing on me. They jump into dimensional rifts and it's just irritating. Ah, uh, but even that's done for a reason. I always get a kick out of it when a Metroid game endeavors to frustrate me just so it can make an upgrade more satisfying. And it's done here when you get the Dark Visor. Now you can track those guys and also see platforms and switches hiding between dimensions. Same as the Beams, it is kind of replicating a similar function from the first game, but putting a completely different and thematically appropriate spin on it. And it's about to get even better, but before we get into that, we need to talk about the boss of the bog, the Alpha Blog. To be more specific, the Alpha Blog highlights one of the more questionable things about Metroid Prime 2. In the first game, I was tripping over save points all the time, maybe even a little too frequently. Prime 2 tends to be much stingier with them, and here's an example of how this can land on the bad side of frustrating. You have to unlock these security gates to clear the way to the boss room, and you have to go through a lengthy set of dimension-hopping puzzles to do so. But once you solve this puzzle, there's no way to get back to the top of this chasm. That means you can't get back to the save room. The Alpha Blog is the toughest fight to this point, and bosses in this game tend to get even tougher near the end of their life. I died here, and it was disheartening to lose half an hour of progress. Now, it only took me about 10 minutes to get another shot since I knew what to do now, but the point stands. Echoes will cut you off from a save room before a tough fight, and that combined with how much harder it is in general is at least a piece of the reason that it had less appeal than its predecessor. The reason you can't get up here is because you need an upgrade the Alpha Blog is guarding, the Gravity Boost. Where the Gravity Suit always let you move normally in water, the Gravity Boost is that aforementioned water jetpack. Honestly though, its uses are kind of limited, since you'll have already been through the bulk of Echo's water sections by the time you get it, but still, points for creativity. Speaking of creativity, it seemed like all too often in Prime 1, you'd hear that droning noise indicating a hidden item, you'd scan for a node, and you'd be told that it was time to spam all your weapons in order to hopefully eke out that upgrade. Prime 2 largely limits these physical blocks to blocking off progression, and its upgrade puzzles are way more integrated. They'll imaginatively use the environment, feature the gimmicks of the area you're in, and even test you on skills that you don't necessarily need anywhere else. I was praising Gwasti for this stuff in AM2R, and now I'm seeing where he got the idea. But alas, here's where I was once again brought to a dead stop. Here's where I again had to wait for a hint, and then still didn't know what to do. The objective was behind this yellow door, so I thought I needed to find power bombs. I spent over an hour trying to figure this out, and you know what? This one was my fault. What I needed to do was think with portals, and use the Dark World to get where I needed to be. Honestly, in both the situations where this happened, it probably would have helped if I was on the trilogy version, where I'd have been way more likely to look up. The Bog's main boss, Chika. Ch Chika. 
Chika? The bog's main boss, Chika, proved to be the toughest and most absorbing fight yet. Echo's bosses use their stage gimmicks more effectively within the fight, they utilize recent upgrades in a more dynamic way, and they even play with your expectations. Like here I thought I got him, but I didn't. Chika sheds his skin and becomes completely different and way tougher. It's a standout Metroid boss, combining player skill with puzzle solving while keeping you on your toes. Chica took me over half an hour, but I never felt fatigued or bored because I was on edge and thinking and executing the whole time. Once I returned the Bog's energy to Umas, he told me the final destination was in... the cliffs. And my heart sank. Oh boy, here we go. Echoes is gonna limp to the finish and make me trudge through another naturalistic brown environment. But this time, high up. Oh goody, oh boy, oh... oh... Perhaps calling them cliffs was a misdirection. The Sanctuary Fortress turns out to be a high-tech temple, towering above a futuristic cityscape. Nothing in Prime, and heck, nothing in Metroid had ever looked like this. And I just adore this aesthetic. So much that I don't even care how oddly un-Metroid it feels to fall off a cliff and just reappear with ten less energy points. I mean, I don't know how else they'd do it in a place like this. The fortress is guarded by robotic defensive buddies, corrupted by the Ing. There are bots where you have to use the Morph Ball to break them down, and enormous guards that carry spectral shields, and itty-bitty drones capable of infecting Samus' system with a virus. Some of my favorite parts of Prime 1 were a few massive mechanical puzzles that utilize the full environment, and the fortress is just teeming with those. In conjunction with the light and dark worlds, combined with such a fantastically imaginative aesthetic, Echoes ain't limping home at all. On the contrary, Retro was really bringing out the full extent of their creativity, and this was the point where I was hooked. Another one of the most well-received parts of the first game was the Morph Ball, and Retro must have known it, because it too was expanded so much in Echoes. You get the boost ball a lot earlier this time, allowing Retro to build a lot more puzzles and set pieces around it, and put it to use in tons of creative ways. But you won't be fighting with the Morph Ball much, well, until suddenly you just are. The Spider Guardian kind of epitomizes all that's divisive about Echoes. When I first found him, I thought it was cool and clever, like it's about time we get to take down an entire boss as a Morph Ball. And it was unique. It's like a little diversion into a completely different kind of game, yet it fits perfectly within Echoes' framework. But then you get to the last room, and suddenly, you're expected to be able to perfectly position a ball on top of a hill and wait for your bomb to explode to bounce you up into a switch. Then you finally get that, and then you do it again, then hop up to another switch before the Spider Guardian loops around and deactivates all that work and just... Urgh! At no point before this has either Prime game required you to be so precise or quick with the Morph Ball. The physics usually work fine for what they've been used for, but balancing a ball on top of a hill and timing yourself to be in just the right place is an exercise in frustration, and one the game hasn't trained you for. This was one of the few times I missed the trilogy version. They added a Morph Ball bounce by flicking the Wii Remote in Prime 1 and 2. That would have made this fight so much more... reasonable. Even with this stuff working against it, it's still a completely unique method Metroid boss fight, and this late in the game, a boss should be tough. It should present new challenges. I could probably forgive the clunky physics and just enjoy the difficulty spike, if not for one other issue. Your last save point was a long way back, at least 20 minutes, and it was on the other side of an unskippable cutscene. And they freaking knew it! Once you jump down here, you can't get back up onto this ledge without the spider ball. So what could have been an interesting, memorable, and unique fight ends up feeling more like an excuse to pad out the game length. You aren't going to be good at this, you are almost certainly going to die here, and you're going to have to do it all again to get another shot. The weirdest thing is, after you beat the Spider Guardian, the game starts emphasizing combat and puzzle solving with the Morph Ball even more than before. There are other, much easier mini-bosses that use it. I mean, I know you get the Spider Ball from this fight, so it makes some sense. I just don't get why you put the hardest challenge first. And then, just as I was processing that, no. No. You want me to cross the whole map and go back to the lowest point of the bog? What? Why? I had assumed this guy was fired, but did Prime Scenario Designer sneak back into the office? But, okay. I was nervous, but Echoes had never asked me to do that before. And you know what? That alone makes a big difference. In doing this, I was moving through areas that I hadn't been to in ages, and because I hadn't been forced to do that over and over and over, I was inclined to uncover secrets that I couldn't have found before. But best of all, after I got down there and beat the Power Bomb Guardian, I was psyching myself up to traverse the entire map again when an elevator opened up that took me back to the sanctuary, back into the fortress, and right back where I needed to be. 
This is backtracking done right. And once I got back there, I finally got to confront Dark Samus again. And, uh, well, just like before, she's an anticlimactic fight. Her attacks are flashy, but it's not hard, it's just spammy. She tumbles down into the city, and I'm sure she's gone for good this time. This net Samus her other new vision upgrade, the Echo Visor. It lets Samus see the sound waves of the environment, and is used to take down oral security systems. It's a unique upgrade, but much like Prime's Thermal Visor, it's ultimately just another way to open doors. But hey, at least you can see where the switches are this time, since you can follow the waves. Where here the subtitle was just Echoes, the Japanese name was the decidedly grittier Dark Echoes, which gives the two visor upgrades more thematic cohesion. Hey, the screw attack finally makes the leap to 3D! While I had no idea about the dark suit, I weirdly did know about this, and I was still hyped to find it. I'd noticed these walls, and so I assumed that its use would be limited to those. But nope, those are just used for wall jumping once you've got the screw attack. It can be activated any time, and it even swaps to a third-person perspective. And unfortunately, it is quite a bit clunkier than the Morph Ball. It can only go straight, you can't really gain height with it, you're limited to five consecutive jumps, and, well, the window for timing those jumps is gonna take some practice. But I played Metroid 2. You think wonky timing on a jump is gonna scare me? It's nowhere near as bad as that. I think Retro did intentionally nerf the screw attack to make it more of a movement tool than, well, an attack. Yeah, okay, much like the gravity boost, maybe they should have called this something else. The Sanctuary Fortress boss fight was probably my favorite in the game. This colossal mech called Quadraxis is like an Ultra Zord and has just as many weapons and phases. It puts all the abilities you've been collecting to use, and man, you know, I didn't know Retro had it in him to make such awesome boss battles. I've always thought of that as a weakness of the company. Of course, it helps because of how tough they are, and I love that stuff. I feel like I was barely scraping through, recovering energy, then coming back down to the brink over and over again. Something I loved about the 2D Metroids was how overpowered Samus felt by the end of the game, with weapons that froze enemies and tore through walls, a speed booster that gave her a ton of movement options, a jump that just caused her foes to explode. But in Metroid Prime, the player got more options, more ways to deal with things, instead of becoming stronger directly. That's not necessarily bad, mind you, it's just the result of Prime having a different emphasis. Echoes, on the other hand, is determined to have its cake and eat it too because after thrashing Quadraxis, you get the Annihilator Beam. It's a combined shot of light and dark energy, carrying the properties of both. It even homes in on dark enemies, and can be used to power up the protective bubbles in the dark world, drawing the Aang into the light where they can't survive. When Samus returns that last bit of stolen energy, Umas presents her with a final upgrade, the Light Suit. It feels wonderfully, beautifully earned, more so than, honestly, anything else in the series to this point, because it's forged from the very energy you've spent the entire game gathering. This power is what Samus has been working toward this whole time. Its design even resembles Luminoth artwork you saw near the beginning of the game. The light suit takes absolutely no damage from the Dark World, not even from these highly concentrated pools of dark energy. The suit also lets Samus ride light rails? Okay, I guess skateboarding was still a big thing in 04. Samus can pop shove it on up there and... Wait, no? I can... I can, I can fast travel between temples? Why does nobody love this game? Okay, it's not that big of a deal. It'd be better if you could just engage it anywhere instead of only at each temple, and the fact that temples are always behind these doors does limit its usefulness. And that's unfortunate. See, there's one final bit of energy holding Dark Aether together, and it's inside of the Ing Sky Temple. A temple that is locked by nine keys. So, it's time to enjoy a hallmark of the GameCube. A fetch quest that must be completed to unlock the final part of the game. Seriously, did Nintendo have some mandate during this era that games just needed to be padded to an arbitrary length? I guess it'd take the industry a few more years to learn that a longer game isn't always a better one. Aether is a world that was torn asunder by a lost war, and one way it's consistently communicated this to the player was by, well, featuring corpses throughout its maps. It starts with the Marines early on, but strewn across its landscape are Luminoth warriors, civilians, and even families. Ten key bearers were dispatched to seek out the keys, storm the temple, and end the war. But only one of them made it. The rest were killed by the Ing, and their remains can be found throughout the entire adventure. Their keys were taken back to the Dark World and stored in these bizarre living containers. 
So, here's what you gotta do. You find the Luminoth Key Bearer. You find a portal. You go to the Dark World version of that same room the Luminoth Key Bearer died in, find the container with the Dark Visor, and destroy it to get the key. This quest is narratively justified, and it doesn't feel tacked on the way that Primes did. However, just because it's set up better doesn't make it any less obnoxious especially since it actually manages to do some things worse. Despite the fact that I had scanned every key bearer as I'd been going, there was no way for me to see them on the map, and the hints I'd picked up in their logs were a lot more obtuse than Prime's more obvious clues. It also didn't seem to keep track of how many or even which keys I'd gotten in the logbook, though maybe I'm just put off trying to dive back into this clunky interface. More egregiously, there weren't really enough new elements in each of these locations, It'd be a lot more justified if there were some challenges to overcome, some new enemies to fight, but it's all just stuff you've seen before. And because I had taken my time and cleared out areas as I went, it's not like there were a whole lot of upgrades I could find off the beaten path either. Worst of all, though, is that until you get the light suit, you can only pick up two of the nine keys. The light suit had seemed like such a fantastic upgrade that you earned, but its only real function is to dive into purple pools to pick up keys. Now, you're so overpowered with the Annihilator that it is a little more fun than Prime, but it's still ultimately a chore, and it still would have been better to make this optional. I'm not even going to pretend, there's no shame in using a guide to get you through stuff like this, and even with that, it took me an hour and a half. But hey, at least during the fetch quest, I found the Sonic Boom. No! Oh, enough with the references. Save that for next season. When at last I unlocked the Sky Temple, I was surprised to find that the Dark World version of the hub I'd been to so many times was... the same place upside down! That's hilarious. Imagine if the whole game was like this. The Dark World could have been so much more obnoxious. The first life form born along with Dark Aether, the Emperor Ing, ambushes Samus before she can even retrieve the energy. The first phase of the fight involves shooting away these tentacles in order to expose the eye in order to damage him. You may notice the problem here. I think Retro was a little too ambitious with their control scheme, expecting a player to be able to fire at things that are above them when they can't look up and move at the same time is asking too much, and I found it hard to keep track of where I was. One more case where the trilogy probably fared better. The second phase is all about the Morph Ball, and I really do appreciate how much Echoes has put it to use, though this is ridiculously still nowhere near as tough as the Spider Guardian. Then the final phase is when the Emperor reveals its true form, and you have to strike at its heart with whatever beam counters it. Or just go OP and use the Annihilator Beam. Why not? Really though, this is a long, difficult fight that'll put everything you've learned across both games to the test. Prime 2 really is, in terms of its difficulty, Metroid Prime for super players, but I wouldn't be having nearly as much fun if I wasn't being tested so hard. The Emperor Ying is killed, the last bit of energy is gathered, and... Whoops. With no more energy to hold it together, Dark Aether is on the brink, which means it's time to go to a cutscene of Samus escaping. Wait, no. No. It's time for an epic escape scene, complete with a remix of the song for the original NES game. Oh, this is amazing! but it's admittedly going to be more of an epic escape boss fight. Did you catch those purple particles when Samus soaked up the energy? Those have been used a few times throughout the game to signal the impending arrival of Dark Soul. You know, one of the good things about this game being so overlooked is that stuff like that hasn't been spoiled for me. Dark Samus has spent this whole game gathering Phazon, and it's corrupted her very form. If the Dark World is going down, she's determined to take Samus with it. And at long last, Dark Samus gives you a real fight. If she just barrages you with Kamehameha's of Phazon energy, forces you to track her movement through sonic waves, and eventually transitions into a being of pure Phazon. After spending so much of the game relying on the light and dark beams, the only way to strike back at her is to catch her blast with the tried and true power beam and hurdle it back. Dark Samus' form is overloaded, and much like the Metroid Prime that birthed her, she's no longer able to maintain cohesion. Dark Aether, along with the Ing, ceases to exist, and at long last, the light has been restored to Aether. The Luminoth survivors who've been locked in stasis chambers honor the savior of their world. But Samus requires no festivities, and wordlessly sets out for her next adventure. And having spent so long here, following their war, learning about their race, feeling a connection to this world and its people, it's a whole new kind of victory for this series. Up till now, Samus has vanquished things that threaten the universe, but it's always resulted in little more than wanton destruction. In Echoes, Samus finally gets to save people. At the start of this episode, I said that video game sequels have an unusually good track record of refining the kinks, of unshackling a developer's creative freedom, of being in many ways superior to their predecessors. I had always wondered why Metroid Prime 2 was, by just about every account, 
not a superior sequel. Well, I guess it's no secret by now. I think it absolutely was. It was ridiculous. I kept having this feeling like somebody at Retro traveled to the future, watched my last video, took a few notes, and made this game. I've got a level with you guys. I was dreading this game. I was putting it off. I had doubts that I would even be able to finish it, to the point that I considered combining Prime 2 and 3 into one video, which is why I was all the more blown away by just how much fun I was having. By giving you so much combat variety up front, and making the enemies that much more dynamic, it ensures that regardless of where you're going, the journey will be more mechanically interesting. By keeping your focus set to one place at a time, instead of spreading upgrades across the entire map, Echoes avoids the vast majority of the pointless zigzagging back and forth through the same boring hallways. In fact, all four of Aether's areas connect together, giving it the world cohesion that Talon 4 lacked. This effectively solves the fatal flaw of Metroid Prime. In all the ways that matter to me, Echoes is a superior sequel. In all the ways that matter to me. Despite the way that I've harped on about the game's progression, that really wasn't the make-or-break factor for most people when it came to Metroid Prime. The reason people loved it was because of how immersive it was, how varied and complete its world was, and even I can't deny that Prime 2 never reaches that same breadth. A lot of things that gave Prime such a solid, immersive world just aren't quite as strong here. Most of the music isn't nearly as memorable. The environment you'll be stuck in for the opening hours is so visually repetitive and boring. That combined with how much tougher the game was made it a lot less accessible, and many players, including me in 04, might have never made it anywhere close to the bog, let alone the sanctuary. Prime 2 is a game that hangs its hat on its challenge, and it gets more cohesive, expansive, and creative as it goes along. And once again, some of this just comes down to me and my preferences. A lot of this really might be, it was harder and had better combat and less wandering around, so Josh had more fun. When I played Metroid Prime, all I had to compare it to was what I liked about the 2D games, and it wasn't a favorable look. But because of Prime 1, I went into Echoes knowing what to expect, knowing to take my time, knowing how to approach a game like this. I've beaten Zero Mission more than a dozen times since its episode came out because it's made to be replayable. But Echoes is more contemporary. It focuses on an epic, lengthy campaign that the developers are expecting most players will experience one time. But the reason I grew so bored with Prime was not because it had a long campaign. I was frustrated with the methods it used to stretch out that playtime to such a ridiculous degree. Just to make sure, I even went back to it with the GameCube version and just couldn't stand to grind through all that tedium again. Prime to me ended up less than the sum of its parts, undermining what could have been a game I'd have loved. I never would have expected it, but Echoes is that game, and it has made me a fan of 3D Metroid. It's built on the same engine, the same approach, and even a lot of the same weaknesses, but the way it's executed plays to the strengths of what I love about this medium. The same as a lot of people could overlook Prime's flaws because it gave them what they wanted out of a game, I can overlook some of the sequel's flaws because of what I came to love about it. That's why I decided that Metroid Prime 2 deserves such an appropriately epic amount of coverage, because it's a sequel that spent too long lost in the shadow of what was, to my tastes, an inferior predecessor. It's my hope that by giving it this level of critique, I might be able to get more people to give it a shot, or at least get the conversation going. If you've never been able to get into 3D Metroid, and you've only tried the first Prime, maybe you're like me, and maybe you'll find that the sequel turns out to be more of what you're looking for. I don't know when I'll go back to Aether, but I know I will. And when I do, I will be faster. I will be better. I will sharpen my skill. And Metroid Prime 2 Echoes will be even more rewarding. Metroid Prime 3 came out, you'd have needed a lot of initiative and a little luck to even get your hands on the console it came out for. Nintendo's Wii, which had been out for almost a year, was still setting the world on fire, despite an exceptionally odd input device that looked more like a remote control than something you'd want to use for video games. But this was Nintendo's strategy from the outset. They'd let their competitors fight it out in the traditional console wars, while they set sail into the vast blue ocean of the uncontested market. The Wii was sending tremors through the industry by becoming not only successful, but successful because it was widely sought after by a demographic that had never self-identified as gamers. And who knows, hopefully some proportion of those millions of people who've never played a game before would seek out something a little more elaborate, and realize that games could be more than just bowling simulators. 
But Metroid Prime 3 wasn't supposed to be for them. This was for us. This was Nintendo's chance to prove that while there was nothing wrong with motion-controlled tennis, that we would still have plenty of room for the kind of substantial, complex, meaningful experiences that we knew this medium could offer. And few series had a more positive reputation for all of that than Metroid. Hopes were high. While Echoes was overlooked on a console that was a bit of a lame duck by 2004, its sequel would be released on the hottest console the industry had seen in some time. And Nintendo did its part by putting a ton of marketing muscle behind it. The company launched a campaign called The Month of Metroid. A free preview channel on the Wii screened new trailers every single week. There was this building, palpable hype and anticipation for Metroid Prime 3 that just wasn't there with Echoes. But while I remember that, it's not really what comes to mind first when I think about this game's pre-release period. No, what left by far the biggest impression on me was this. On August 20th, 2007, Nintendo released Super Metroid on the Virtual Console. For a pittance of 800 Wii points, I got to play it for the first time. And if you've been following the advice at the start of these episodes, you know how that went. One week later, August 27th, and what a day that was. I could not wait to play the new Metroid game, and it was all thanks to an old one. I finally understood why I had never heard a bad thing about this series. The depth of the gameplay that becomes more and more brilliant as the player uncovers more abilities. The isolation of a lone bounty hunter against a cohesive, believable world enriched by subtle storytelling. The mature blend of ambience, aesthetic, and yet optimism that set the whole series apart. I brought this brand new Metroid home from Blockbuster, I booted it up, and... I was greeted by a game that featured a seemingly endless cavalcade of immersion-breaking motion control puzzles framed by a heavy-handed narrative driven by unskippable cutscenes featuring creepily uncanny characters droning out a plot that I had no context to understand or care about. I didn't even make it out of the prologue. This was Metroid's biggest and best chance to convert me into a fan, and the game completely blew it. But that was ten years ago. It took a little longer, but in the course of making this very series, I would come to self-identify as a Metroid fan. And you know what? I was wrong about Metroid Prime 3. Let's get critiquing. An unknown vessel's status report gets a bad case of the B-Sods. The anomaly is coming from a storage room full of Phazon pods. And who should appear but... Dark Stamus survived? Then Stamus Aaron opens her eyes. This opening is very to the point. The game doesn't start with some kind of last time on Metroid Prime. No, it doesn't make it remotely clear what's even happening here. And you know what? That's okay. When I was first playing this, Super Metroid's intro had just recently thrown a lot of backstory at me, and without the context of the previous games, it was pretty baffling. But because I have now played Prime 1 and 2 and thus have context, it raises a lot of questions. How did Dark Samus survive? Where even is this? Prime 3 will eventually answer those questions, but we don't have any time for that. It's time for the motion control tutorial. Samus's power suit has always had this extended cannon coming out of her right arm. Say what you will about the Wii Remote, but there was one thing it was very, very good at acting as a pointing device. Because of that, Samus's arm cannon now has perfect one-to-one -one movement with the player's right hand. And I gotta come clean with you guys. In doing this series, I wanted the full spectrum of the Prime experience. To that end, I'm still happy I played the previous game with the GameCube pad. But honestly, I really should have just played Prime 1 with a Wii remote. I had good intentions! I was trying to give myself the best possible shot at enjoying the game by playing with mouse and keyboard. And it works surprisingly great for the most part, but you remember how much I complained about weapon and visor switching being clunky? That's because there's such a big difference between holding down a key and pushing your whole arm forward in order to move a cursor that's not meant to be controlled with a mouse, versus just holding down a button and flicking your wrist up. Metroid Prime 3 and by extension the other games in the Prime Trilogy, utilize the Wii Remote to achieve, bar none, the best FPS control scheme I've ever used on a console. It's natural, precise, immersive, and tuned to absolute perfection. And it better be, Retro Studios spent an entire year of development just to get this right. But the original Wii Remote was only really capable of precision like this when used as a pointing device. To work around this, motion controls that don't involve the pointer are held in clearly defined sequences that require wide, clear movements to open doors or start up generators. However well implemented they are though, they don't really add much to the experience. They don't detract from it either, mind you, but it's telling that from the tutorial to the very last door, these on-screen prompts that make it explicit exactly what you're supposed to be doing with the Wii Remote can never go away. Samus eventually stops flailing around and gets her gunship pointed at the Olympus, a Galactic Federation ship.
but the tutorial is just getting started. Please calibrate your weapon by shooting these targets. Whoa. To this point in the series, the only spoken dialogue was Super Metroid's iconic intro, and I guess the power suit system reports. The original Prime held to similar standards as the 2D games in this regard, but Prime 2 introduced a few friendly NPCs, and now Prime 3 is chock full of characters with full voice acting. Samus heads up to the ship's briefing room and is suddenly beside herself. No, wait, that's just a new character named... Gandreda? She can shapeshift, I guess? There's also a robot dude named Gore and a big bruiser of a guy named Vegeta. I mean Rundus. And look, Uncanny 2007 Human is here too. The human's name is Admiral Dane, and he activates Aurora Unit 242, an organic supercomputer. Together, they explain that the Galactic Federation's other organic supercomputers have been infected with an unknown virus from the Space Pirates. But not to worry, they've made a vaccine. A ship called the Valhalla went missing side after of the, the Space Bar Pirates Nebula. attacked it and stole its AU, then used that to hack the network. Now Samus and whoever these guys are are gonna travel around and upload the vaccine to all the AUs before the Space Pirates take advantage and mount an attack. And before you can even process that's what AU stands for, the Space Pirates Attack. Remember what I said about Super Metroid's intro being a little too intricate for players new to the series? Corruption's prologue is exponentially worse. It's also strange that for all the babbling going on around her, Samus is still a silent protagonist. Like, dialogue boxes are one thing, but characters actually speaking their lines make these concessions stand out a lot more. But hey, the voice acting itself is fine, and I don't mind a silent protagonist, it's just the degree of stuff they're trying to fit into this scene made it impossible to follow. And where Super Metroid intro was this amazing recap for people who were already familiar with the series, Prime 3 doesn't even have that excuse. Playing the previous two games in this trilogy does nothing to provide context for who these people are or what's even happening here. Literally, my only note was that the Federation's Aurora units reminded me a little bit of Mother Brain. And that is a cool detail. Look, the plot holds together and makes sense to me now, and this scene becomes a lot more endearing, but only because I had the whole game to understand what was happening. Without any context, it was just a convoluted exposition dump of an unskippable cutscene. And you know what? The whole prologue is kind of tedious. There's a boring gray spaceship full of uncanny NPCs. There's a holographic AI companion. And it all serves as a linear tutorial that's pretending to be difficult with flashy explosions. Come on, Retro, I'm sorry Echoes got overshadowed by Halo 2, but I don't think that meant anyone wanted Metroid to just be Halo. I may be overstating how I feel here, but by continuing past this point, I've already made it further than I did in 2007. The highlight here is one of Corruption's most substantial upgrades, the Grapple Lasso. It complements the control scheme extremely well. Your right hand is Samus' beam cannon, and now you thrust your left hand to whip the lasso. And while it feels a little gimmicky at first, it turns out to have all kinds of utility. You can use it to open doors, remove debris, rip enemy shields away, and eventually even to reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. It's the quintessential Metroid upgrade, full of creative potential in both combat and puzzle solving. This planet, called Norian... Norian? Norian. Oh yeah, voice acting. Norian isn't a place that you get to explore. Rather, it's the site of a Federation outpost. The game tells you exactly where to go, and arranges explosive set pieces and enemies for you to overcome before you get there. It's not very Metroid-y, but a linear action game is exactly the part of Prime 1 that I really liked, and there were admittedly some awesome moments here. I love how something just whooshes overhead without pulling you out of gameplay, letting you experience firsthand the moment that Ridley shows up. I love this ridiculously over-the-top boss fight, as Samus and her greatest enemy plummet down an energy shaft, taking shots at each other the whole way. I don't know how I feel about how Samus escapes that situation. At this point, I felt like the game was trying way too hard to make me go, Wow, he skates around on ice and look, a cool battle robot and ooh, shapeshifty girl is so aloof! Like, the game wanted me to think these characters were cool and powerful and worth caring about, but they're just kind of generic. The most important part of conveying what a game is comes in the first 30 minutes. I was well over an hour in by this point, and based on that, Metroid Prime 3 seemed for all the world to be a linear action game featuring a team of hunters going on a series of missions. And like, it's just weird, isn't it? To see Samus Aran working alongside and getting saved by other characters. It's weird that it's been this long, and the game still hasn't remotely felt like Metroid. But finally, Dark Samus shows up and flips the freaking switch. She effortlessly decimates the whole team with a single blast, and then just flies away. Ooh, mysterious. 
Samus is barely able to maintain consciousness long enough to bring Norian's defenses online. Then she slips into a month-long coma. When she wakes up, Samus learns that her doppelganger's phazon beam corrupted her and the rest of the crew. Their bodies now naturally produce phazon energy. And without even asking, the Federation has fit them all with phazon enhancement devices. From a visual sense, Samus has a new look. The PED suit is designed to enhance Samus' abilities using her body's natural phazon. It's a fusion <laughs> of Galactic Federation and Chozo Tech, and while I didn't really care for the clashing, busy design at first, it really grew on me. More specifically, it grew on me as the corruption grew within Samus, and the suit got darker in turn, taking on these neon blue highlights. It's a little extravagant, but it's neat. The other three hunters woke up weeks ago and were dispatched on other missions, but the Federation has lost contact with all of them. So from a story sense, Samus is finally on her own. And what do you know, there's a mystery to solve. From a gameplay standpoint, it's where it makes the biggest difference of all. At any time, you can hold down the plus button to channel an energy tank and enter hyper mode. Samus's beam cannon becomes this rapid fire blaster that vaporizes enemies. The missiles, morph ball, and even the grapple lasso also get upgraded throughout the game to do new things in hyper mode. The Federation thinks that the PED suits have no consequences, but as is so often the case, the Federation is very wrong. Staying hyper for too long causes Samus' body to start overloading with Phazon energy. The meter starts automatically rising, and taking damage just shoots it up even higher. If it maxes out, Samus' mind is corrupted, and she loses herself to Dark Samus' influence. There's a lot to love here. You can tell how much Retro wanted this to stand out, how visually distinct the Switch is. Hyper mode feels insanely powerful, but that's a double-edged sword. The problem comes in how the game has changed around it, and how these changes have affected the difficulty curve. Beam upgrades stack for the first time in the Prime series, and that's cool, but they've also lost their distinction. The plasma beam melts stuff, but it feels just like the Nova beam that shoots through things. There also aren't any super combos, and missiles are much weaker. As a result, outside of hyper mode, enemies are insanely spongy, requiring a ton of just mashing the fire button to take down. This is all to incentivize you to use hyper mode. But if you do, it's the opposite problem. Your foes get blasted apart so quickly, you don't even really need to come up with a strategy. Tying it in with your health was probably an attempt to balance this, but if you're fast enough, you can just exit hyper mode before corruption sets in, and maintain the health that you didn't use. I see a lot of potential in maintaining it under fire, letting yourself take hits to stay powered up longer, and I imagine that's exactly what you have to do on higher difficulties. But I feel like I'm not really overcoming anything, and the game is just letting me make progress by putting time into it. This really should have just been called easy mode, but I'm playing on normal, and where Echo's normal difficulty was satisfying for a first playthrough, Corruptions is just monotonous. Normal is what most players will play on their first time, and the presence of hyper mode forces you to choose between combat that's tedious or combat that's unsatisfying. Samus takes orders from, well, yes, a big blue head in a tube. Actually, this is the Olympus's onboard Aurora unit. I said earlier that Samus would be alone, but that's not quite the case. The Federation's AU network will be there to guide her through the rest of the game. And when I say guide, I mean guide. When I arrived on the closest phazon infested planet, I knew my mission. I had to find out what happened to Christopher Sabat and investigate the meteor that impacted the planet. And I would need to adventure through uncharted territory to do it. Finally, it's a Metroid game! Samus, the Leviathan Seed is protected by an energy shield. Or, yes, I guess an on-screen prompt could just tell me exactly where to go. Honestly, in a game like this, I'll take all the help I can get. But if you're a Metroid fan more for the discovery, this may be a deal-breaker. On the other hand, Metroid Fusion did the same thing, and it's largely done the same way. You might know where to go, but you won't necessarily know how to get there. In this case, it told me to go to a downed Federation ship, but that was the easy part. To actually get over there, I had to seek out a side path and find the grapple beam. But here's the difference. Fusion might have been a linear take on a Metroid game, but because of that. Because Fusion always knew exactly where you'd go and what path you would have to take, it could be a far more punishing experience, with a much sharper difficulty curve. In other words, it was able to evoke the strengths of a more traditional action game. Corruption, in contrast, 
hold to your hand for the same reason Hyper Mode has no significant consequences. For the same reason the default difficulty is so much easier than it was in Echoes. Nintendo is hoping that Prime 3 might appeal to people who'd only just started to play video games, so it's all done in the name of accessibility. Prime 3 is more directly linear than either of its prequels, but some of the changes it makes in that effort turn out to be half measures, as if the game is trying to maintain the illusion of non-linearity. Why else would you have shortcuts that only work from one side? Why else would the game rather pointlessly let me get ahead of where I need to be? In Fusion, you could occasionally do this to see something Samus wasn't supposed to know about yet, something that broke the fourth wall. In Prime 3, you just hit a brick wall. And look, I appreciate a lot of the quality of life changes, like being able to hop the Morph Ball with a flick of the Wii Remote. Corruption also no longer wastes your time by artificially cutting you off from save points. Now when you die, you'll just restart from a checkpoint. Point is, there's nothing wrong with making a game more accessible, and it could have been a lot worse. It's not like the AU pops up and reminds you, Samus, running into fire will hurt. But even if you disable the hint system, the game will still prompt you where to go. The only difference is that it doesn't leave markers on the map. Like I said, I'm bad enough at navigation that I kinda need the hint, so it doesn't affect me, but it is a ridiculous choice that there's no way to disable these on-screen prompts. You've got to give the player a choice. To that end, here's an example of accessibility done right. At about the midpoint of the game, I found an observatory that launches satellites and collects data on other planets. Launching these satellites will literally show you exactly where every single upgrade is located, and even denotes which ones you found from those you haven't. For many people, I'm sure, this is counter to what they enjoy about Metroid. For me, it's a tremendous incentive to actually bother with upgrades. What's fun for me is not finding where they are on a map, it's figuring out how to get them. And Prime 3 does have some fantastically intricate upgrade puzzles. But in spite of how I feel about it, how is something so disruptive to the Metroid formula an example of accessibility done right? Because it's totally optional. You have to power up the observatory, you have to send out the satellites, and you have every opportunity to ignore it and find everything yourself if that's what you want to do. And seriously, it was too 2007. It would have been simple to just hop on GameFAQs and find everything anyway. Putting it in the game as a convenience cuts out the middleman. So Hyper Mode disrupted the combat. The Observatory disrupted the adventure. The third piece of what makes Corruption such a disruptive take on the Metroid formula is in the cohesiveness of its world. Or to be more exact, the fact that it doesn't focus on a single cohesive world. Past games were largely set on a single map. A single planet, brimming with environments that wove in and out of each other. Prime 3, on the other hand, takes place across four planets, and rather than weaving between ecosystems, Samus is free to fly between them as the adventure progresses. Brio is the most traditionally metroid -y planet, featuring an unfamiliar race that blasted itself back to the Stone Age after a civil war. Despite the remnants of civilization, it's the most naturalistic world, with Samus using the flora and fauna to her advantage. But it also features the greatest environmental variety, spanning across cavernous fuel gel mines to a snowy area that was so out of left field my jaw dropped when I got here. Brio is also where I found out that Samus can pull herself up on ledges in this game. Let's see, let's look in the menu... Nope, the power grip isn't here. Well, I guess that cinches it. The Prime games really aren't part of the canon. Wait, these ledges are supposed to be magnetic. Mmm, you win this time, Retro. Seriously, there's a reason the game finally clicked with me when I got here. The other three planets all allow Retro to expand on the franchise's more familiar elements. I've already mentioned Norian. Despite my misgivings about the prologue, it's still neat to learn more about the Galactic Federation that's been hiring Samus for all these missions. The next planet is one of the- c c Cut that out! Stop playing that song! I mean, I love it, but it's too much of a good thing! This awesome little rift has been used throughout the series when Samus first appears on screen, both at the beginning of the game and when you first load a save file. It's consistent to the point that you get sort of conditioned. You hear this, and you know, here we go, it's Metroid time. But the reason it works this way is because it starts each session. Prime 3 misunderstands its meaning and plays it every single time Samus steps off her ship. It's no longer the kickoff of the adventure, it's just marking the end of a loading screen, and it loses a lot of charm in its repetition. That loading screen, by the way, lasts way longer than any of the earlier game's elevator scenes ever did. In those earlier games, you would occasionally have to wait a second or two for a room to load, but it was barely a hiccup. In Corruption, even when I'm taking my time, I found myself staring at a door. Staring at a door. Ah, finally! 
Chalk up another win for mini discs. This is only exacerbated by the way that you move between areas. Samus's gunship has been an iconic part of the series since the second game, and on the one hand, it's great to see it with so much more functionality this time around. It even gets its own upgrades. But like a lot of things in Prime 3, in taking so many steps forward, Retro makes a few stumbles. The process for moving between worlds lacks polish, as you always have to get in the ship, select this button, and choose your landing site. You cannot navigate from the identical map in your interface, and you can't back out once you hit one of those icons. Cutscenes can't be skipped until you've seen them once, and even when it's done loading, these flybys of the ship count as cutscenes. So if you need to fly somewhere new, and you have to summon your gunship, this process takes nearly two minutes, and you're just setting there. The first-person perspective of the ship doesn't even have any useful functionality outside of the tutorial. There's all kinds of gizmos and buttons to hit here, like triggering a red alert and raising defenses. Given that the game kept forcing me to be here, I figured it would eventually pay off with Samus actually fighting from the ship. But it never happens! It's cool for the sake of immersion that you get to set here, but the game could have streamlined things by letting you just pick a destination from this menu. With all that out of the way, hopefully I can finally talk about the planet Elysia. Is the song gone? Elysia is a lost Chozo outpost, though it's not an ancient ruin. It's just recently been lost. The Chozo built a self-aware robotic race to maintain Skytown, an absolutely gorgeous floating city. Yeah, Bioshock Infinite, eat your heart out! I found the screw attack here, coming much earlier than it did in Echoes, and so it gets a lot more chance to shine. If the Wii was often derided as being two GameCubes duct taped together, then Corruption is a testament to just how powerful duct tape can be. Skytown has a scale and a scope that the GameCube couldn't have pulled off, and the graphical fidelity on display throughout the game shows a level of detail and polish that still holds up today, especially when you run Dauphin in high definition. There's a sequence in Skytown where you build a nuke and drop it on the seed shield, and it all runs in real time! Samus barely makes it out on an escape pod and... Oh, come on! The final planet, or at least the final planet that's not alive, is the Space Pirate Homeworld. After two decades of battling these guys, Samus finally gets to take the fight to their front door, and it's cool to finally see how they operate. The Pirate Homeworld was a jumbled, chaotic mess of hallways, steeped in a torrential downpour of acid rain. I found these doors that I didn't have any way to open, and then I found the X-ray visor. Ah, uh, see, the Space Pirates are the galactic equivalent of people who keep their passwords on sticky notes attached to their monitors. Splitting the game into different planets comes with pros and cons, but I think Retro does a good job accentuating the positives. Every planet has its own themes, gimmicks, and backstory. That said, none of them are as cohesive or as complete as what's come before, but that's an acceptable trade-off given this game's greater narrative scope. This is a story that needs to be told across multiple planets. Why? Because each of these planets has been impacted by the same sort of meteor that narrowly avoided hitting Norian. The same sort of Phazon-based meteor that caused catastrophe on Aether and Talon IV. Hmm. Samsa's goal is to make her way into the seat of the meteor the same way she did in Prime 1's climax, and rip the phase on out of the planet. And what stands in her way? Well, remember those other hunters dispatched by the Federation? The whole point of showing us how powerful these guys were in the prologue, the whole reason the game had to establish them as being Samus's peers, of being people that she cared about, was because they all become corrupted by Dark Samus. They're not generic buddies you spend the game fighting alongside, they're corrupted comrades you spend it fighting against, and if our hero and doesn't get to the bottom of this soon, the same thing's going to happen to her. This gives the adventure a personal pathos, and given how little I cared about them before, it was surprising how much it tugged at my heartstrings to see them like this. Again, Rundus got the worst of it. After a brutal, dynamic fight, he appears for a second to regain his composure, only for Dark Samus to force him to commit suicide. That's the most ruthless death I've ever seen in a T-rated game. Corruption is thematically way less grounded than what's come before. It's a little more sci-fi and a lot more vibrant, but nothing is more surreal than these scenes, where Samus has to take down a monstrous abomination of Phazon. But as much as I was loving the scale of these bosses, only the first one was really a fight. After that, I had enough energy that I could just tank hits and blast them with hyper mode, and again it got a bit dull. Each time Samus takes down a seed, she absorbs the corruption, and so it spreads within her. The first time this happens, she pukes out liquid Phazon, the same as Metroid Prime itself did. To see Samus Aran show vulnerability like this, to see how badly it's getting to her, is both unsettling and effective. You see her face in the scan visor now, and while at first I thought that was just a cool detail, late in the game her eyes are changing color, and her blood vessels are coursing with corruption. At first I was worried that it would be overt and heavy-handed, but then the story backed off and became more personal. And because these elements stay out of the game for so long, by the time Admiral Dane and the GF soldiers 
Defenders meet up with Samus and storm the Space Pirate homeworld together, it's a climactic moment that the game set up and earned. But in contrast, here's something indicative of Prime 3's strange balance of strengths and weaknesses. About halfway through the game, an AU tells Samus that they've discovered the remains of this Federation battleship that was ransacked by the Space Pirates. When I got that message, I headed there immediately and discovered that I would need to use these big, battery-like energy cells to progress further. Scanning gave hints for where I might find more, and I assumed this was where I needed to be to progress, so I spent a rather long time trying to find more batteries, only to run into more brick walls. Why? Because this is not the next part of the adventure, this is Prime 3's game-ending fetch quest. Retro, to their credit, took the criticism that the previous two games received to heart. The menu makes it clear which batteries you still need to find, and most of them are easy enough to come by naturally. I had quite a few even the first time I came here. To find the ones that were more hidden, I was going back to planets I hadn't been on in ages and pushing into brand new, completely unexplored territory. Where Prime 2's world weirdly stayed the same regardless of how much light you brought back to Aether, Samus' actions are actually having an effect on Prime 3's planets, with GF soldiers making repairs on Norian or standing guard at the pirate homeworld. To get these batteries, I had to have a rematch with a few mini-bosses, but because Samus has so much more powerful weapons now, the techniques to defeat them are completely different and really satisfying. To put it mildly, I was surprised at how much I was enjoying myself. If you're gonna do a game-ending fetch quest, this is how to do it right. It was with a lot of confidence and excitement that I set out for that final energy cell. But what I didn't know is that in order to pick it up, I would have to do one of the most tedious things I've ever done in a video game. Thanks to the fact that I had already wasted a bunch of time earlier in the game, I knew I'd eventually need to pick up this big power cell with the gunship tractor beam. I did so, then I got to rotate one half of a bridge into place to connect these two areas. So far so good, right? But in order to actually get on the ship and go to the area where I needed that cargo, I had to drop the cargo. So I went to the other side and I found this giant golem I didn't know what to do with. Turns out I needed to push into yet another area and use my ship to pick up a giant golem head, then drop it down to open up this place. Now I could finally rotate the other half of the bridge into place and connect the two sides of the map. But wait, with that giant power cell back where it started, I could no longer get out of this underground tunnel. So I had to trek all the way back to my ship, go back where I started, get back to the power cell, tractor beam it up, cross the bridge, head to the generator I needed to power, and finally drop the power cell in so I could get the final battery. The other cells were actually fun and interesting to get, but in the time it took me to pick up this last one, I could have beaten Metroid Zero Mission. I said as much on Twitter, went to bed, and the next day I woke up to this. <sighs> there are a total of nine cells. I only needed five, but the Valhalla has so many extra places to put cells that lead to incidental upgrades, you can't pick them up once they're placed, and so there's no way to know where to go without experimenting. And don't get me wrong, this is still way better than the previous game's fetch quests, but it could have been perfect with just a little more conveyance. Even after all that unnecessary effort, I was still pretty hyped to see this pay off. On the other side of a wormhole, I discovered a planet called Phase. It's a sentient world where these enormous meteors called Leviathans are harvested within what are literally called wombs. When they reach maturity, they're sent out to impact with other planets. This is the source of all Phazon, the source of all the cataclysm that's afflicted the worlds in the Prime Trilogy. As the corruption spreads, the local life forms are used as hosts to protect the seed, and eventually, the doomed planet becomes a clone of Phaze. It's unexpected, imaginative, surreal, and really uncomfortable. As soon as Samus steps foot on Phase, her corruption surges. By venting her energy tanks, she's able to temporarily stave off its effects. There's no way to return to the ship from here, not because the game has created an artificial barrier, but because the gunship no longer recognizes her as Samus. That's how close she is to losing herself here. She's trapped in hyper mode. Samus has gotten a super-powered weapon in the finale before, but typical of the Prime series, this is an innovative, threatening take on a familiar concept. Samus makes her way into an inner chamber, tears the biological walls off of a Phazon womb, and performs an abortion on the infant Leviathan inside. I told you this was going to be uncomfortable. Only then does Dark Samus finally make an appearance. The fight here is way better designed and more dynamic than any of Dark Samus's battles in Echoes, owing partly to how much more varied her attacks are, but mostly to the same advantage that Corruption has enjoyed throughout. Pure and simple, superior FPS aiming controls. Eventually, Dark Samus merges with the corrupted AU that was stolen from the wrecked ship, and so the Metroid Prime trilogy ends the same way the first game in this series did two decades before. Samus Aaron beats up a giant brain. I love this. 
Dark Samus, the personification of Metroid Prime, finally kicks the bucket, and Planet Phase dies with her. With that, every bit of Phazon in Samus' body dries up, curing her corruption. The planet is on the brink. It's time for an epic escape scene! No, no it's not. We just cut to Admiral freaking Dane listening to a casualty report. He seems unfazed by how much of the fleet's been lost. He just wants to know if Samus is okay. Seriously, is he supposed to be her dad or something? But of course, Samus has gotten herself out. She gives a triumphant thumbs up directly toward the player and transmits two simple words. Mission complete. But you know what? I kind of glossed over that last section. And I guess it's because it just didn't leave much of an impression on me. This final boss fight, this was what it was all building toward. And I've got to be honest, it was kind of anticlimactic. Like, sure, if that meter filled up, I'd lose. But since I was always in hyper mode, and since it rose so slowly, there wasn't any real tension. It was flashy and impressive, but it was style over substance. That meant the ending, in turn, lacked any real triumph. It felt unearned. Yet, keep in mind this is a game full of climactic moments. There were plenty of times throughout this adventure when Metroid Prime 3 surprised me, when it all came together, where it just clicked, but there were just as many times that the game seemed to stumble on its own ambitions, seemed like it didn't have a handle on what kind of Metroid game it wanted to be, and failed to play to the strengths of what it was doing. There are a lot of trade-offs to this one, and of all the games I've covered on this channel, I don't think that one has ever made me feel such a juxtaposition of thrilling highs and frustrating lows. But if the game really did frustrate me to this degree, why was it that as the credits rolled, all I could think about was how much I wanted to play it again? The first Metroid Prime was the core of a game I'd have loved, marred by flaws that irrevocably ruined the experience for me. Knowing where to go wouldn't have fixed all the convoluted progression, and playing on a higher difficulty would have only made the combat more spammy. Metroid Prime 3, on the other hand, is a game that I often loved, marred by flaws that I now know how to overcome. I didn't even hesitate. I started a new game. This time I'd be able to skip all those cutscenes at the start, and I'd be able to skip every single repetitive scene where the ship takes off and lands and takes off and lands. The version on the Wii U eShop drastically improves the loading times, and the Dolphin emulator can be set to load even faster. With these two changes alone, the game wouldn't so constantly start and stop. It wouldn't lose flow between areas, and I could just play the game. This time, I won't have to go on that convoluted quest for a single energy cell. I can, if I choose to, only pick up the cells I need. I'll know how to avoid all those progressional brick walls. And most critically, I'm playing on the hardest difficulty, which has a very appropriate name. I can finally find out just how essential hyper mode can be. Now look, just because a player can learn to avoid pitfalls doesn't excuse them. But I'll put it like this. Super Metroid is my favorite game in this series to play through once, but Zero Mission has proven to be my favorite game to replay. In a similar manner, while I adored going through Prime 2, it's gonna be a while before I'm inclined to pick it up again. Whereas with Corruption, it's been a bit of a struggle to stay away from it long enough to complete this episode. When I get here again, when I see that thumbs up again, it will be triumphant because I'll have earned it. After everything I've experienced in this series, it's a bit of a shame that the first Prime tends to be the only one culturally considered a masterpiece. Because this is not the Metroid Prime collection, and this is not the Metroid Metroid Prime Compilation. This is the Metroid Prime Trilogy. These three games, released across two generations over a five-year period, may well be the pinnacle of a premeditated, cohesive series of video games. Each game individually sets itself apart, builds on its own themes, and excels at unique aspects of game design and storytelling, yet each game also enriches the experience of the other two. These five years were the golden age of the Metroid franchise, when the series achieved an unprecedented level of importance and consistency, and the core of all that was this Prime Trilogy. All these years later, I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to finally experience them. That being said, playing them all and critiquing them all over the course of a few months hasn't been easy, and that's why this season took so long to produce. I don't usually play these sort of games that focus more on a lengthy campaign than a replayable one, and I'm admittedly a little burnt out, but I'm sure that how I feel doesn't remotely compare to how Retro's development team must have felt. From the time Prime was conceived, they had done nothing but work on Metroid for seven years. There's a reason Corruption has so much finality to it. They knew this would be the end, and so it was. Prime 
2 came out on a console that was dead in the water. Prime 3 was released on the hottest console in the world, with a ton of promotion behind it, and yet it barely managed to outsell its predecessor. It seems that the first game in the trilogy, perhaps because it was so ahead of its time, was the only one to really capture a mainstream audience. But by 2007, the very elements that made it such a groundbreaking title had become the standards of AAA gaming, and Metroid had returned to cult status. Given that, and given that Retro was moving on, maybe it was time to go in a different direction. Maybe it was time to make a 3D Metroid game that reintegrated some of the efficacy of the 2D series. Or maybe decisions would be made that would stall the franchise for nearly a decade. The last Metroid is on clearance. The price is $5. I first critiqued Metroid one year ago. Before that time, I had for the most part only seen the series through the fandom of others, though I had never been able to count it among my own favorites. And yet, spurred on by the incredible passion surrounding a fan-made remake, my interest grew. Suddenly, I found myself up in the middle of the night, utterly enthralled in adventures which I hadn't given enough of a chance to in years past. This raised the question, would Metroid be a good series to cover for the Geek Critique? A show that despite my best efforts was still lost in relative obscurity. Still, I hesitated to commit to a franchise I wasn't sure I would have a lot to say about. It would take a catalyst to push me over the edge. And that catalyst would come in the year 2016 of the history of the cosmos, on the 13th of September. Was it a coincidence that I found myself there, in that Walmart, on that day? The newest Metroid was a relic even then, yet there it was wedged between two shovelware titles, and far less expensive than both of them. The opportunity to purchase what I knew was such a contentious game for such a pittance. I took its presence as a sign that I should take the leap, that I should critique Metroid. And so I did. I played eight legendary titles spanning the course of two decades. I charted the history of the Metroid franchise, and every title I played only gave me a deeper appreciation, a deeper admiration for a series I had spent my whole life only hearing great things about. And where I was once worried about running out of things to say, something I didn't expect happened. I became a fan of Metroid. At last, I have reached the plateau. This is the culmination of a year's journey. It's finally time to peel away this plastic, critique this catalyst, and see what has been wrought by Metroid Other M. A year and a half after Prime 3 came out, it was revealed that Nintendo had been working on a secret project via a partnership with another developer. As I've recounted countless times, I wasn't much of a Metroid fan back then, but if I had been, I expect it would have gone a little something like this. Holy crap, you guys! Team Ninja is making a Metroid game! You know, those guys who made that Tough as Nails Ninja Gaiden game that I never got to play because I didn't have an Xbox, but whatever. Oh man, look at this. It looks like old school Metroid, but in 3D. Remember me? No! Seriously, my fellow 2009 peeps, Metroid Prime 2 and 3 were great, but I have been dying for Metroid to bring some more of that 2D style into the third dimension. The sharp kinetic combat, the focus on action over adventure, the... the speed booster? Oh, 2010 cannot get here soon enough. That hypothetical version of me, the one that played Fusion in 2002 and got to call himself a Metroid fan from then on, oh, he would have been so hyped to see this, so hopeful, so optimistic. He would have made form posts defending the game while it was in development, and he would have countered the naysayers by saying, hey, this is exactly what you guys wanted back when they revealed Prime and it was a first-person adventure. Give it a chance. Of course, that's not who I actually was in 2010. When Other M came out, I... you know what? This is another one of those things I've said so many times, but this is the last time I'm ever going to get to say it, so sing along with me. I rented the new Metroid, played it for a while, and came to realize it wasn't my style. Just another game that was not for me, and so I found it odd the way fanboys screamed. To me, this was kind of just another Metroid. But if hypothetically I had staked such a claim on Other M being successful, I'd have died on that hill, and I'm pretty sure most of you know that. Other M is not a case where I'm capable of going in blindly. 
Other M is a game whose reputation precedes it. Other M is one of those infamously bad games, and I've only encountered more of that bitterness since getting involved with the fandom. The majority of the Metroid fans I know seem to have a visceral, negative reaction to any elements of this game even being referenced. They would much rather Nintendo just act like it never happened. As a result, I am going into Other M with an unusual amount of baggage, knowing way more than I really even want to. It's safe to say that without even playing it, I know more about this game's flaws than I knew going into any other Metroid game. It has parallels with something like Sonic 06 in that regard, where even if you don't know anything else about this series, you know about this one. But I'm not expecting Other M to be anywhere near as dire as that. One odd aspect that kind of muddies the waters is how well the game reviewed on release. But where professional reviewers seemed to enjoy it at the time, a majority of the fandom almost immediately rejected it. Metroid is a series that lives or dies by the support of its core. And without that, Other M was a bomb. Nintendo forecast that it would sell at least a million copies of Other M by the end of 2010. But the game didn't even make it halfway there. Despite all that, Other M does have its share of defenders. I've seen a lot of takes claiming that it's really not that bad. So I'll try to keep that in mind to balance my perspective, and I'll do my best to come at Other M with an open mind, because I do want to let the game rise or fall on its own merits. With all that in mind, let's get critiquing! Oh, <laughs> my bad, I uh, loaded up a Windows 95 screensaver. From there we go to a baby in the womb? Uh, uh, okay, the baby is Samus. And, oh, hey, it's Mother Brain, and, God, ah, it's the end of Super Metroid! Oh, seeing it rendered like this is awesome, and wow, this cinematic is gorgeous! Like, how much budget went into this? Time to go. Uh, Samus, did you inhale a bottle of Ambien before fighting Mother Brain? But it turns out maybe she did, because this was all just Samus dreaming about the fight with Mother Brain. Which seems like an odd way to get out of a flashback. Was she dreaming about herself as a fetus, too? It'd make a little more sense if some time had passed since Super Metroid, but this opening scene is taking place directly afterward, with Samus having been picked up and tended to on a Federation ship. I don't know, shoehorning it in here as a non-interactive dream sequence? The opening seems a little too convenient designed to play on nostalgia, and I'm gonna have a lot more to say about that. But this is just stuff I'm ruminating on now. In the moment I first fired up Other M, there was one single problem that was overwhelming any other criticism that I might have had. A dream. I had been reliving the tragic moments of my recent past. Thanks to the hyperbeam, which was given to me somehow by the baby, I laid Mother Brain to waste. Okay, I don't usually care to get into the details of the individuals who create these games. It's one thing for me to try to sort out what a development team was trying to accomplish, but it's usually a bridge too far to pin the blame for anything on any one person, especially when I can't source any first-hand accounts. The rare exception to this is when a game is the result of one person's vision. Smash Brothers has Masahiro Sakurai, and in the same vein, there's really no way to discuss Other M without also discussing the man who has carried the burden of fault among fans and critics alike since its release. This is Yoshio Sakamoto, the man who directed, produced, and wrote the plot for Metroid Other M. And while I do intend to judge the game on its own merits, those merits ultimately come down to his decisions. Sakamoto is one of the co-creators of this franchise, and he played a pivotal role in every Japan-developed Metroid game aside from this one. He served as both the scenario writer and the game director on both Super Metroid and Metroid Fusion. At the time Other M was greenlit for development, Sakamoto had spent several years leading Nintendo SPD-1 in the production of the WarioWare series, and it was this group that would work alongside Team Ninja with Sakamoto at the helm. Sakamoto was given free reign to make this game what he wanted it to be. And you know what? Given that he played such a key role in making this series the legend that it was, if Sakamoto wanted to take the reins to such an unprecedented degree, I think he had more than earned the opportunity. After all, who would have more history and more familiarity with this series than one of the people who created it in the first place? With all that in mind, it seems a little strange that he seems to have forgotten the tiny, minor detail where Samus is not a robot. Besides, they're extinct. The baby was the last of its kind. Other M at one time was meant to take 2D Metroid's usual narrative approach. It might have had a little dialogue in the intro and ending, but the overall story would be told mostly through environmental cues and subtext. 
but while the game was still in the planning stages, Nintendo came to the realization that partnering with Team Ninja would give them a direct line to a studio called D-Rockets, which had produced cinematic CG cutscenes for Dead or Alive and Ninja Gaiden. And cinematic really is the operative word there. D-Rockets' work was on par with what you'd find in a blockbuster movie. With that, the entire scope of the project was changed. D-Rockets doesn't seem to get enough credit, one way or the other, in just how much their presence changed the face of Other M. The problem, though, is that Sakamoto wasn't just in charge of the overall plot. He also had final say on the way cutscenes played out, he dictated every line of dialogue, and he even cast and directed the voice actors. And this is where the cracks form, because for as gorgeous as these cutscenes are, the way they're written and the way they're performed comes across with the uncanny awkwardness of high school theater. I'm a bounty hunter, and I know that something is after you. Please, you must believe me. It's almost like the person in charge of the production has no real experience. Because Sakamoto was just that, he was someone with no real experience. For all his accomplishments, Yoshio Sakamoto is not a movie director, he's a game designer. And that's not meant to disparage anything he's done, but writing the scenario and dialogue for something like Metroid Fusion takes a whole different skill set from writing and directing for a movie. And I think that's why these scenes play out so stiltedly. Of course, what compounds the problem is that Sakamoto, who doesn't speak English, was also directing the English voice cast when they dubbed the game. In Japanese culture, a character who is dry and unemotional in a dire situation will be seen as stoic and unflappable. But to the Western world, delivering lines with so little emotion makes someone seem robotic and inauthentic. And Samus stands out even more when most of the other characters have perfectly... Looks like this might take some time now. ...the passable delivery. It's only Samus's VA that was directed to be so wooden. It's a difference in cultural perception, and that happens all the time, but these are the kind of things that could have and should have been addressed in localization. As it is, it's the first thing anybody notices about Other M, and that in turn is only compounded by the script. Clunky, awkward, poorly translated dialogue in old school games could often hide behind the fact that it was all text-based. If you're just reading something and not hearing it, it's not as jarring. But in Other M, this kind of thing is laid bare, as the game relies on an excessively literal English translation that sometimes makes the NES game's manual look good in comparison. Becoming small and round was a certain maneuver I had done enough that it felt natural. But doing it knowing that Adam was watching, that certain maneuver became thrilling. Oh yeah, I guess that brings us to every Metroid fan's favorite character, Adam Malkovich. Adam was first introduced, in a sense, back in Fusion. Or, uh, is that forward in Fusion? Uh, Fusion in the game came out first, but the story happens later in the timeline. There. Okay, but in Fusion, Adam was the nickname that Samus privately gave to the Federation's AI. Taking direct orders was such an aberration that it reminded her of her former commanding officer, a man named Adam Malkovich. But Adam wasn't just her commander, he was also a mentor in her more formative years. At one point in the game, Samus reveals that Adam died saving her life. This was a critical piece of Samus's backstory, and although it would have been sensible to assume that Adam's death might have been the catalyst for Samus leaving the military and forging her own path, his presence here reveals that wasn't the case. Still, Other M was meant to fill in the details of that story. Given how reverential and respectful Samus would be of a mentor figure, I don't mind the concept of her volunteering to take orders, or even limiting her arsenal. Where it falls apart is the execution. Fusion portrayed Adam as a mentor figure to Samus. In Other M, she describes him like this. The closest thing to a father I had. Except, you know, remember, like, your other father who actually raised you? Your bird dad? Her bird dad? What the crap's a bird dad? You're here to be a parody of Samus. What are you doing? You, you remember Grey Voice? Yeah, yeah. And your bird. other bird dad? You had two of those, but, actually. Did anybody read you the manga? double the father figures uh -huh. who raised you to be a powerful bird warrior yeah, okay. who gave well, you bird DNA so you could use the exactly Chozo right. suit. They gave you all this awesome power that you have, but no, I guess they just mean nothing to you. Are you done? Guys, I'd like to apologize for- Oh, <laughs> You see what I mean about that visceral negative reaction? Seriously, Samus's line delivery is not the only reason she comes across so poorly. Samus's actions, her explanations, her decisions, and her characterization are all viewed through the prism of her relationship with Adam. 
And what's kind of skeevy about it is just how much of that is focused around Samus's role as a woman. And that's not me projecting anything, the game yes. says it. It touched me on some level that Adam would acknowledge that past by calling me something delicate, like Lady. This aspect of Samus's character has been treated as an almost incidental part of the Metroid universe. At only one point before had any character, whether in dialogue or in the manual stories, ever called attention to Samus being a woman. Not even in one of those defiant ways where, like Runda says, she's pretty good for a girl, and ends up having to put his giant ice-spewing foot in his mouth when she saves his life or something. It's just not a thing anybody seemed to care about. The lone exception to this was the Atom AI in Fusion, who, upon realizing that Samus was seeing it the same way that she had seen Adam, asked her this line. It seemed innocuous at the time, but I think it was meant to raise some questions and kind of hint at who exactly Adam was to Samus. Now, I do want to note that there's nothing at all wrong with a person or a character being stereotypically masculine or feminine, whether they're comfortable with who they are or struggling with the expectations. My point is that despite how significant it was here in the real world to have this ironclad heroine in 1986, Samus derived none of her in-universe significance from it. Even as the recent games became a little more plot focused. Samus's enemies don't mock her for it. Her allies aren't surprised by it. In the confines of the series lore, Samus's gender has absolutely no bearing on her character, her heroism, her role as this legendary bounty hunter. Until now, that is. Until the character herself has called attention to it. Even if Other M had pulled it off with a nuanced story that kept Samus as this strong character, that would still have been a risky, controversial road to go down. But nuance is lost here. Samus is emotionally compromised by the loss of the infant Metroid, which manifests in her droning on and on and on early in the game about the baby. When she receives a distress call, she describes it as a baby's cry, and then she meets up with Adam. Samus is not just respectful of her former CEO in a professional sense. She seems at once frightened and thrilled by the very idea of seeing him again. Adam, in contrast, is in no way irreverential of Samus or her accomplishments. He's biting and direct, and seems frustrated and dismissive of her mere presence, only tolerating her to the degree that she can further his goals. At its best, this character dynamic comes across pretty toxic. At worst, well... Having received mission orders from Adam, I felt confused and strangely exhilarated at the unexpected turn of events. Ugh. Alright. I'm not particularly interested or honestly well-versed enough to delve into it any more than this. As a rule, I don't see any reason to make statements on such contentious real-world problems on this channel, but the circumstances of Other M more or less demand that I at least bend that rule. But I'm also willing to bend it here because contrary to what you always hear about the horrors of YouTube, the comment sections on this channel tend to be unusually civil and respectful. As a group, you guys have never let me down before, and I know you won't here either. If you're going to debate this aspect of the game especially, please approach it with that kind of nuance, and make sure you're attacking the argument instead of the person. What I'm way more interested in though, is how this narrative decision filters down into the gameplay. There are always going to be aspects of games that we accept because they're games. In this series, it's stuff like, how come every place in the galaxy is teeming with magic icons that let someone wearing Chozo armor upgrade their suit? How does Samus's arm cannon hold or manufacture physical objects? Did I just download missiles? And really, why is it that Samus regularly sets out for dangerous missions without bothering to equip any of her upgrades from the previous game? How many times is she going to rediscover the Varia suit? It can be fun to come up with in-universe explanations for this stuff, but really, a Metroid game wouldn't be much of a Metroid game if you could just obliterate everything with your best stuff from the outset. But if this really is the kind of thing that keeps you up at night, then I've got good news. Samus has decided this time to keep almost all of her upgrades from Super Metroid. But also, as soon as Samus meets up with Adam and his crew of GFS soldiers, she decides that despite not being in the military herself, despite being someone who has saved the galaxy multiple times by this point, eh, she's just not gonna use any of that stuff until Adam says it's okay. Even the prompt that tells you this seems designed to be as irritating as possible. To be fair to the game though, this opening area does serve as a nice, natural tutorial section for learning Samus's core abilities. It's just... 
It's just a little undermined by the literal tutorial section that the game just made you play, where the most condescending character in the entire franchise so very helpfully goes to the trouble of teaching you how to use abilities that you might not have access to for hours. Seriously, I'm up for a debate on just how problematic Adam Malkovich is, but this tutorial dude is the worst! Heaven forbid you don't follow his instructions or have trouble with something. What are you doing? Unleash that thing. And even when you do get it... Sharp-looking charge beam. Just the way I like it. Other M, why do you think it's a good idea to start the game by talking down to the player? Where past Metroid games have featured some kind of roughly equal balance of action and exploration, Other M is much more decisively an action game, and it has the opportunity as an action game to take on the strengths of a more linear design. Where most games in the series take a naturalistic sci-fi setting on an alien planet, in Other M, which this game so totally is, Samus is gonna have to make her way through a series of numbered, artificial sectors which are each themed around a different biome, which she will access via a structured series of elevators. The entire game takes place on a Federation ship, the BSL Station. Wait, no, that can't be right. Hang on. Oh, uh, it takes place on a craft called the Bottle Ship. You see how it'd be easy to get that confused. Forget about being linked to Metroid Fusion from a story perspective. Other M leans on its structure the way that Star Fox Zero leans on 64. Even the title theme sounds similar. This does all seem pretty derivative. But, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, I guess. Given that it's the first attempt at a 3D game in this style, leaning on the structure that had already been built for a linear action-focused Metroid game, yeah, I can give it a pass. Let's just keep an eye on what it's gonna do differently. Samus meets up with the crew again, and it's only now that Adam expressly informs her that if she's going to help out on the mission, she's going to follow his orders. You don't move unless I say so, and you don't fire until I say so. <laughs> That is hilarious, Adam. Okay, okay, this is what we're gonna do, guys. What actually happens is a lot worse. This small crew is ambushed by a mysterious, twisted entity. Muno! You're right! He's calling friendly! From an aesthetic standpoint, Other M is a real mixed bag. The character models are rich and detailed, and although I'm gonna get raked over the coals for saying this, I definitely prefer this brighter, shinier Samus to her more realistically metallic appearance in Prime. <laughs> she does stick out terribly next to the GFS Marines, though. In Prime 3, Samus also had allies, but the designs of those characters still felt contingent with her design. In Other M, the soldier's sleek military efficiency stands in sharp contrast to this giant yellow and red Japanese mech suit from the 80s, and I suppose that contrast was intentional. But there is one thing I really take issue with when when it comes to Samus's armor. Late in the game, when the gravity suit comes online, yeah, you know what, let's compare. Here it is in Super Metroid. Awesome. Here it is in Fusion. It's a little ugly, but that was kind of the point. Now, here it is in Other End. It's... it's just this purple glow. How in the world did someone with Sakamoto's experience think that this was preferable to this? For the more minor characters and one-off mini-bosses, uh, graphics don't always hold up. This first boss, for instance, just doesn't fit at all with what Metroid creatures are kinda supposed to look like. It's an amalgamation of these little purple parasites, and I know the Wii wasn't a powerhouse or anything, but this texture just looks like it's made out of denim. In combat, the animations of Samus and her foes are fluid and impressive, helped immensely by Other M's commitment to a 60 FPS frame rate. Actually, moving Samus around is a lot more stiff and awkward, but we'll get to that. And the environmental graphics are like the swings and roundabouts core of these mixed bag aesthetics. The artificial environments hold up okay, incorporating the duress the ship's under and doing some cool lighting effects, but the more realistic the environment tries to be, the more the facade falls apart. Fusion's BSL station embraced the artificiality of its environments as part of its theme, and was way more cohesive for it. The bottle ship projects these holograms to simulate other worlds, and I swear, sometimes I think it's gotta be running on the Dreamcast GPU. What makes these simplistic, kinda generic environments stand out even more is that this was done on the same hardware. That makes it so much worse. Really just shows what a difference can be made by having strong, inspired art direction. Other M's environmental design does not even remotely compare to the careful and realistic attention to detail of any room in the Prime trilogy. By the way, do you notice anything missing? Metroid is a series that's known for wonderful music, the music that helps each area stand with distinction. In Other M, well, what's 
here is as good as ever, but so much of it is just this ambient noise. I'm having to pad out this video with music from other soundtracks and remixes. The lack of musical variety is all the more confounding when you consider the other M is far and away the most navel-gazing, fan service -y entry in the entire series. Uh, no, not that kind of fan service. What I'm talking about is how many enemies, bosses, and flat-out references there are to other games in the franchise. And look, I'm a Sonic fan. I really don't have a choice but to love nostalgic pandering at this point, and I do. But Metroid's approach to it has always been so careful to make sure that these illusions came with a reason, that it made sense within the story. It wasn't heavy-handed, it didn't feel like pandering. And I'm saying that as somebody who doesn't mind pandering, but it is yet another aspect of Other M that fails to feel like a Metroid game. Still, if you're gonna do it, go all in! This sequence where you're running through a tunnel getting flanked by enemies from the series past would have hit home so much more if this remix was playing. But no, it's just ambient ship noise. Hooey. With Best Genus defeated, at last! The dumb, heavy-handed story gets out of the way for a while, and we can finally just play our Metroid game! And look, I know the story is what everybody always makes a fuss about, but Other M really does have plenty of points like this where Samus is, well, she's alone as she can be with Adam watching her every move. As much as I've said about the story and its implications, the truth of it is that it doesn't really make much of an impact one way or the other on my enjoyment of a video game. Which is not to say that I don't appreciate a story, but it's never going to be why I play a game. Nah, my true love in this medium has always been gameplay, so let's get into it. And you know, maybe this is going to be the best part of Other M. Like, you never hear anything about this, so it can't be that bad, right? Right? I have quite frankly spent more time than I ever intended or wanted to just trying to write this script. I have a ton of notes, but until now, it's like every attempt I've made to try to form them into something more cohesive has just been this overwhelming task. But I think I've finally hammered down the reason. Metroid Other M is a game with this heavy-handed approach to storytelling, but it's a game where that narrative, for all of its faults, is the point. That's one reason these pre-rendered cutscenes flow seamlessly in and out of the game engine. It's why the game has a theater mode where instead of playing a game, you can just watch a movie. I didn't add that. It really does call itself the movie. But the reason I've had so much trouble trying to figure out how I wanted to structure this is that all of that story focus seems to come at the expense of the game part of the game. Let's start with one of the series defining elements, one of those things that you absolutely must get right if you want a good Metroid game. Map design. The map is linear. And not linear like in Echoes or Fusion, where the area you needed to be in was clear but your path through it wasn't. In Other M, it's very rare that a room will even feature more than just an entrance and an exit. You come in, you press through, you move on. With only a few exceptions, it's just a straight series of rooms and hallways that eventually loop back on themselves. But hey, I guess that makes sense, right? It's not like we're exploring a real planet or anything. We're on a man-made ship, of course it's going to be a little more artificial. I mean, Fusion might as well have been set in the same place for all intents and purposes, and they still managed to make the map resemble a Metroid game there, but whatever. I think there's a reason it's like this. Other M's focus is not supposed to be on that stuff. It's aimed squarely on action and storytelling. And look, I'm not inherently opposed to a more cinematic take on the franchise. One of my all-time favorite video game series is the stereotypical example for insanely long, overwritten cutscenes, but I enjoy that series. I come back to it because the gameplay at the core is so solid. Being so much more linear gives Other M the opportunity for more memorable set-piece moments, to force these obstacles that you can't just find your way around. Some of them, especially the puzzle rooms, are actually pulled off pretty well, and catch some potential of the benefits of this approach. The more action-oriented stuff that makes up the bulk of the game, on the other hand, well, in the entire series to this point, I can only think of two death traps. They're there's the acid pit in Metroid 1, and 20 years later, there's the insta-death thing in Prime 3. Yeah, I still don't get how Retro thought that was okay. But these are isolated examples from a series that spanned decades. So it's all the more egregious, because Other N is just teeming with instant game overs. The worst offender comes in the cryosphere, this ice section, and in fact, this serves as a microcosm of everything wrong with Other M's progression. I come to one of the relatively few rooms in the game with more than one exit. I take the north door, but I can't make it up this sheer cliff, so I try going left. At this point in the game, 
I've just recently gotten, no, no, I'm sorry, I've been authorized to use the Speed Booster. And yes, I was very happy to see it back, and among everything else, I love the way they implemented it. Anyway, I use it to shine spark up to these rafters above the room, then make my way through a more fall maze to find a room with a switch that I can see, but I can't find a way to shoot. Huh. At a loss, I backtrack to the room with three doors, where I get assaulted by space pirates. They activate a field that they can fire through, but I cannot, and they just wail on me for a while. It looks like they've got Samus right where they want her, when... Samus, you need a permeating shot effect to get past this. I'm authorizing you to unlock your wave beam. Adam. After 30 seconds, he actually noticed I was in trouble, and authorized the use of the wave beam. I guess I could have just stood there and died if he hadn't given me permission. Adam really does care about me. With that, guess what I have to do now? Repeat the exact same sequence I just went through, get back to the switch behind the door, and use my newly earned privilege called the Wave Beam to raise platforms so I can move on. Doing this for some reason triggers an avalanche outside, and now Samus has to be cool, be wild, and be groovy. This power suit has stood up to undersea depths, the vacuum of space, massive explosions, and even plumber uppercuts. But gee, I guess being buried in snow is just something the Chozo never accounted for. I'm not opposed to giving Samus a voice and a character. And I'm definitely not opposed to a take on Metroid that's more action-oriented. I mean, I'd never want this to be all the series was, but just like 2D Mario and 3D Mario can coexist, something like this could stand alongside the more adventure 3D Metroid games. And the truth is, I could have overlooked all of this, from the map design to the progression to even Adam Malkovich himself, if the game's focus on combat was pulled off with any sort of aplomb. On the surface level, like I said earlier, combat looks nice. Characters move well, animations are crisp and clear, Samus' weapons have their usual nice pop. On that note, I've got to admire the way that taking a hit carries real consequences. The amount of damage here is comparable to Fusion, but that game incentivized combat the same way every Metroid game has. Enemies would drop items, or sometimes parasitic clouds, and that would restore Samus' health and supplies. Other N does away with this, and instead forces combat by frequently and arbitrarily locking doors to keep you from moving on until you defeat enemies. Killing everything in a room will also mark the spot of an upgrade on your map, which is great because I don't like looking for things, and games should really just cater to my preferences. Giving players an option was so three years ago. With no enemy drops, the only way to get Samus to full health is to hit a save station. But if you're taking such heavy hits with no way to restore your health, wouldn't that make the game a little… extreme? Well, to keep this design from completely toppling over, Other M graphs two new mechanics into the mix. At any time, you can point the Wii Remote into the sky and hold the A button to re-download missiles. When you're low on health, the same movement will also restore at least one energy tank. But this significantly diminishes the triumph you'd always feel at coming across an energy tank, because you get hit so hard and can restore so little that they don't really carry much consequence. And honestly, the same thing also applies to missiles. The series has always had an abundance of missile upgrades as rewards for keeping your eyes open and solving puzzles, but in other end, there's little incentive to even bother. The amount the amount of damage that I was taking and my lack of familiarity with the game meant that early on, Other M was kind of exciting. It can be really tense to try to stay away from an enemy long enough that you can restore your energy, and rewarding when you do. But as soon as I started to get a little more powerful, or to be more accurate, a little bit better at Other M, <sighs> what made the difference was when I started leaning on one of Other M's most significant game changers, an ability called Sense Move. Tap the D-pad just before Samus takes a hit, and she'll dodge out of the way. Hold the fire button while you do this, and she'll instantly have a charge shot when she lands. The dodge has a nice rhythm, the sound effect is distinct, and it just looks cool. But I said I learned to lean on it, and that's the problem. Because while the sense move feels great in isolation, in actual combat it becomes a crutch. There's absolutely no timing required to activate it. While dodging, Samus is completely invulnerable, and there's no cooldown on it. Your direction doesn't even matter. You can sense move directly into enemy fire and come out unscathed. So instead of skillfully dodging enemy attacks and encountering them, you end up just hammering the D-pad until you get an opening. And doing so is the best, most efficient strategy. Also, as good as it looks, it's not like you're going to be staring at Samus while fighting enemies. And the way that she flips around in either situation sometimes means it's hard to discern whether you have dodged a hit or took a hit. A good dodge or parry in a game like this should feel like a turning point. It should be that crunchy moment when your skill turns the tables on an enemy. 
In this game, Synth's move is so broken that it makes every encounter effortless and unvaried, and thus it's a tremendous contributor to why the combat, which in as much as the gameplay is gonna be the focus, is supposed to be the point here, is so freaking dull. Just charge your beam, release. Charge, release. Ooh, ah, here comes an actual attack. What am I gonna do? I know, I'll just hammer the D-pad a few times until it stops happening. Video games. For the uninitiated, you might have noticed that Samus keeps twitching in place between dodges, and that's because the D-pad also controls her movement. You might wonder why something as critical as a dodge is on the same set of controls that moves the character. Shouldn't something like this have its own dedicated button? Of course it should, but it can't. Metroid Other M is played exclusively with the Wii Remote. Sakamoto was absolutely positively insistent that it needed to be this way. He cited how back in the NES era, the limitations of that controller inspired developers to come up with more creative, more intuitive solutions. And he's right, there is a lot of appeal and simplicity. But apparently at no point did he ever stop to consider that the NES didn't have a whole lot of 3D action games. Oh, but if only the Wii had come packaged with some kind of controller add-on that was specifically designed to give it functionality for more complex, more modern genres. Alas, tis but a fool's dream. In an Awada Asks interview, Sakamoto said, Instead of forcing the player to use complex button controls, we'd enable them to accomplish many things just using the Wii Remote by automating various actions in the game. Not that this will surprise anyone, but this sort of thing is one of my least favorite trends in the modern gaming industry, and this is where Other End really falls apart. The most damning result of this is in the core of your combat. When you fire the power beam, Samus automatically aims in the direction of whatever enemies she's closest to. This speaks more than just about anything else to how little respect and trust Other M is able to give its players, which is awful, because respecting the player's ability and intelligence is integral to the appeal of the Metroid franchise. Sure, the Prime games didn't require precise aiming either, but player action was at least the catalyst for what Samus was locked onto, and the focus was moved to deftly maneuvering her around her opponent in 3D space, and to knowing how to beat them. The important thing is that you weren't just spamming the dodge and fire buttons. They might have been presented differently, but skill and dexterity still played an important role, just as they always had. In any other Metroid game, when you made that tricky wall jump, when you dodged enemy fire and retaliated, when you broke that sequence, you broke that sequence! When you automate to this degree, the player's input doesn't have nearly the same impact on what actions their character is taking. So no matter how good it might look, there's not going to be any real crunch behind it. This tricky, death-defying leap looks really impressive, but this one feels so much better. It's the difference between spectacle for its own sake versus a spectacle that the game gives the player the power to create. One way they tried to spice this up was by including these little cinematic QTE sequences. Well, I say QTE, but all it really entails is just mashing the one button. Sometimes you'll be able to stun an enemy and then approach it for a glory kill. Sometimes you just have to realize that you can leap onto a foe to initiate that. Let's compare that to a later Metroid game. That, like Other M, wanted to prioritize action and combat, but actually managed to get it right. In Samus Returns, counter opportunities are communicated via distinct, consistent visual and auditory cues, and the cinematics that sometimes result from them still give you access to your full range of weapons. Other M doesn't have anything like that, so cinematic counters are instead communicated via this immersion-breaking hint text that has to come up in every encounter that requires them. But what about missiles, you whale? Missiles, those iconic Metroid upgrades that always brought a little variety to enemy encounters. You babbled earlier that you could restore them, so they must still be present to spice things up. Yeah, yeah, they're still here, but that opens up a whole nother can of worms. This is the point where Other M's control scheme crosses the line from being overly simplistic and does some things that are tangibly clunky. Point the Wii Remote toward the screen, and you'll snap into first-person view. Here, and only here, you can control what enemy Samus locks onto. Samus will only fire missiles when you're locked on from this perspective. You know, it actually isn't all that bad of an idea in theory. It'd make missile use that much more distinct. Unfortunately, like pretty much every idea Other M has, it falls apart in execution. For starters, of course, while you're in this first-person view, there aren't enough buttons left for you to be able to move the character. You can, however, still sense move, and your interface will even change color when this is an option. Though I guess such a concept was just too complicated to teach you in that tutorial. This is just something you have to notice yourself. 
Even when you do, the camera has to zoom out so we can see that fancy dodge, only to snap back into first person when Samus is done being a luchador. Aiming in the Prime Trilogy worked so well because the Wii Remote is a fantastic pointing device. Prime was a first-person game, and so you had no problem keeping yourself oriented. Even when you come out of the Morph Ball, there's this little delay as Samus brings her cannon back up to give you a small window to figure out where the pointer is. And of course, you could actually move your character if you needed a little more time. In Other M, when you snap to first-person view, there's no way to tell before you get there where exactly the center of the screen is, and so you can't reliably tell where your reticle is going to land. This isn't much of a problem when you're just using missiles to open doors, but in combat that's so fast-paced, those extra couple of moments of not being able to move can mean the difference between firing off a successful attack and taking a hit. It means that missiles in combat are way more of a liability. And so outside of the instances where I needed to have them, I just ignored them. They were too clunky. The first-person perspective is also used when the game forces you into search view, where you have to move Samus's vision around to notice something. Oh, this feels so unfair, but look at how it was handled in the Prime games. Scannable objects are clearly highlighted. In Other M, there is nothing to indicate what you're supposed to be focusing on. And while most of the time these sections are obvious enough that it's not a big deal, occasionally you're just stuck in first-person view and expected to sleuth your way out with no indication of what to look at. I spent upwards of 10 minutes standing right here, just spinning in circles. Do you see anything distinct or unusual about what I'm looking at? It's not the soldiers in front of me. It's not the truck behind me. Okay, here it is. Yes, you were expected to turn completely around and notice the green blood blending into the green grass behind you. And I'm sure this was even more of a nightmare in 480p on the original Wii hardware. Other M is a game that is forced to graph so many incredibly generous conceits in order to make a 3D action game function at all on a Wii remote that the best case scenario that Team Ninja could turn out with is exactly what this is bland, repetitive combat that's all style and no substance. Even just running around, being locked to eight directions in 3D space, reminds me of those early PlayStation and Saturn games, before analog sticks became standard. It's just awkward to move sometimes, and it gets even worse in these strange, forced, over-the-shoulder moments. On more than one occasion, Samus is supposed to be trying to catch someone who's running away from her, and instead of chasing them down, she instead opts to awkwardly hobble after them. It doesn't take long for the game to get physically uncomfortable. Spinning that tiny D-pad around to move a character in 3D just wasn't something the Wii Remote was ergonomically designed for. Now, of course, I could have mitigated the whole issue to a degree by using the Dolphin emulator to play Other M with a more traditional controller. I could have activated first-person view by holding the trigger and moving the right stick. The game wouldn't have been so uncomfortable if I'd done that, but I chose not to this time. I decided that dealing directly with the limitations brought on by the Wii Remote was inherent to understand understanding Sakamoto's intentions with this game. I had trouble finding my voice with Other M because I kept trying to approach it with the expectation that if I could just find the right angle, I would be able to come to terms with what Sakamoto was trying to do. I'd find a way to dive deep into some appreciation, or at least an understanding, about why the game is the way it is. But looking for depth here is like diving into a kiddie pool. All you're gonna do is hurt yourself. Still, there are occasional sections where I actually felt a little glimmer of the potential the other M might have had as an action game. Like, let's say, three. Three sections. And they were all boss fights. Ridley, Nightmare, and the Metroid Queen all managed to seem like legitimate threats. They all make you feel like your skills and wits are coming together to overcome them, and they'll all take you down hard if you don't stay engaged. That the team was still capable of crafting enjoyable bosses, even through all these restrictions, shows better than anything the squandered potential that Other M had. Mind you, they're hardly perfect, they're hardly as good as they could have been. I'm not saying this is some epic sequence you must experience, I'm just saying that they're the lone exceptions where I actually find some fun in Other M's combat. Also, even amid all the other gratuitous fan service, isn't it bizarre? that one of the bosses is Nightmare. I mean, he originally came from Fusion, a game that's in the future of the timeline during Other M. <laughs> what, are we supposed to assume that every Galactic Federation ship just comes standard with a gravity control AI that will inevitably develop sentience and <laughs> try to kill everyone? Because that really makes a lot of sense.
These three bosses are the lonely islands in a sea of mediocre gameplay. Most of the time, Other M's combat feels more than anything like a smartphone game, like it's some cheap spin-off of the Metroid series. Tap the screen to shoot, swipe to dodge, move your finger around and find stuff in first person, earn Galactic Federation tokens, or buy them with real money. So Adam will authorize more upgrades, even with all of this riding against it. I still don't think Other M would have quite the awful reputation it does if it weren't for the spectacular mess it makes trying to wrap itself up. Sector Zero is a place that's set up through the back half of the game as kind of the Torian equivalent, the climactic area where a bunch of Metroid encounters and the final boss will need to be taken care of. After a lengthy trek to get there, Samus encounters a small Metroid just outside the entrance. Same as the larva did back on SR388, it hovers before her, causing her to hesitate. Fortunately for her, Adam shows up to shoot that varmint down! and proceeds to lecture us all about how these Metroids were genetically engineered to be unfreezable and vicious. Well, that's nice of him. It's just too bad that he only bothered to save Samus after he did this. <laughs> Never mind what I said about Prime 1's dinky explosion knocking out Samus' upgrades. The idea that one shot from an ice beam would be enough to knock out Samus is, well, it's preposterous. It's not just that she has withstood much worse, she does withstand much worse in this same game. Of course, that's just me whining about the lore. The more pressing matter is, why in the world did Adam shoot Samus in the first place? Even Samus herself has the gumption to demand an answer. So why did you shoot me? You can't destroy these Metroids. What? Yes, she can! She was just about to shoot it with the same ice beam you did! Even within Adam's own flimsy characterization, it makes no sense! The only reasonable answer, and I think the real answer, is one that can't be explained narratively. For this scene, Sakamoto wanted Samus in a position of weakness in comparison to Adam. He did this to put over how heroic and self-sacrificing Adam was being, to emphasize how much he meant to Samus. Because after saving her life, he sacrifices his. Adam takes what would be in any other Metroid game, Samus's place. He heads down into Sector Zero, ejects it from the rest of the bottle ship, and initiates a self-destruct, killing himself along with the Metroids. This plot beat might have sounded like a good idea on paper, and it might have even worked in a game whose story was built on subtext. But how many times can I say this? It fails in execution. As a player, I was only half paying attention during what's supposed to be this big emotional scene because I just kept waiting for the game to justify why Adam would fire on Samus. And when it was over, I was irrationally frustrated at this character for not only failing to explain himself, but for taking away my agency, for taking my spot in the finale, and for not letting me go into Sector Zero and blast apart those Metroids. Because of all this, I was happy to see him go, and I do not think that was the effect Sakamoto was going for. Or was it? Given how much praise I heaped on Fusion for corrupting Super Metroid's formula, for weaving the loss of Samus's agency into its gameplay, and coming out all the more memorable for it, isn't it fair to consider Other M from the same angle? Let's get meta. Was the player meant to feel frustrated at how poorly the game handled its own protagonist? Maybe something like that could have worked if Samus redeemed herself at some point. And to be fair, there are hints of this. There's one earlier scene that got this huge smile out of me. At a point in the story where Samus thinks Adam has abandoned his post and may even be working against her, she comes to a chasm she can't jump over, and then... Any objections, Adam? And then she just activates her space jump herself. Oh man, that almost makes it worth it. Even her delivery there just nails the contempt I feel. The contempt that she should feel. Oh, and you remember that condescending jackass from the tutorial? I gave your suit of polish so you'd be at least somewhat presentable. Yeah, turns out he also took samples of Metroid DNA off of it. And that's why the Federation was able to clone Metroids in the first place. I think it's safe to say that he was supposed to rub you the wrong way. No, stop smiling at me like that! So, fair enough. Maybe some part of this was meant to make the player feel resentful about the game they were playing. 
Maybe they were supposed to relate to Samus in that way. Nonetheless, I can't at all say that Other M is some kind of subversive, misunderstood gem. Fusion intentionally corrupted Super Metroid as a means to stand on its own, outside the shadow of that masterpiece. Other M, on the other hand, fumbles every good idea it has, and so its corruption of the Metroid series as a whole comes out as a pure negative. The scene where Adam dies is the worst example, but the narrative and gameplay alike are absolutely full of moments that don't stand up to the slightest bit of scrutiny. If the Metroids were genetically modified to be unfreezable, how did Adam know he could freeze that one? Why does the bottle ship's development director look like a 14 years old girl? Why do we bother focusing so much on the Marines early on, if only one of them is ever gonna have anything resembling a personality? Most infamously, why does Samus have a panic attack at the mere sight of Ridley? a rival that she had fought and defeated so many times before. I said I prefer to focus on gameplay, so how did this moment get through playtesting? It's a Metroid Queen, which, yes, nostalgia pandering, but like I said earlier, it's also one of those few moments where the gameplay actually gets a little fun for a while. But when you have her on the ropes, she swallows Samus whole, and I guarantee that if you didn't know what to do, if someone hadn't told you beforehand, you would die here, and you'd probably do it more than once. Nothing you do seems to make a difference. So what do you do? You have to magically know that as of this moment, Samus has decided to use power bombs. There's no cut to the inventory like there has been for every single other authorization. There's no on-screen prompt telling you what's going on. You just have to know. And even if you do, you have to remember that the awful tutorial sequence from the very beginning of the game taught you how to use them. I figured it out after just dying once, but I feel like the only reason it wasn't a roadblock was because I've beaten the Metroid Queen quite a few times recently. At the time Other M came out, unless you had seen the end of the most obscure entry in the mainline series, and you happened to beat her this way, I have no idea how you were meant to put it together. But hey, with that done, it's time for the finale. No surprise, it's a nonsensical 20 minute cutscene that reveals that this woman isn't who she claimed she was, no, she's an android. And she was stealing the identity of this woman. And, and get this, this android basically is Mother Brain, accidentally recreated by the ever inept Galactic Federation. Okay, I'm not gonna detail it because I don't really care, but I will say that it's a surprisingly satisfying twist compared to all the other crap going on in the plot. Well, it's not just that I don't care, but also because by the time the twist is revealed, it's too late for it to have any ramifications. I figured that Metroid Queen fight was just the build-up, and that the real final battle would be against this reborn mother brain. I mean, that makes sense. Ah yeah, there she is! She summons vicious creatures to wage war on those that brought her into this world, and here we go? The very last bit of gameplay is a narrative segment that locks you in first person, where all you have to do is lock on to Mother Brain, at which point you're stopped before you can even fire. That's it. That's what you overcome. Same as Adam stole your Torian run, the Marines just kill Mother Brain for you. Because that's a satisfying way to conclude a video game. Despite their similar reputations, I'm not going to pretend that Other M is anywhere near as bad as something like Sonic 06. It's not a broken glitch fest, most of the time, and given the constraints of the Wii Remote, it accomplishes what it sets out to do pretty much as well as it could have. It's just that as a game critic, and even as a player, I'd much prefer an awful but interesting game to one that's so mind-numbing. Which sucks, because as nonsensical as the story progression is, I could have laughed it off if the game was fun, and I would have accepted it being fun in either direction. If there was some combination of a genuine Metroid game and a competent Team Ninja-style action game propping up all this cinematic BS, then I could excuse the narrative faults as some kind of failed experiment. And there's a lot of fun to be had in that kind of unintentionally awful storytelling. Like, I love Shin Mu, and it suffered from a lot of the same faults. A director who wasn't a native English speaker, awkward, wooden acting, and an excessively literal translation. But it can be part of the charm. On the flip side, if Other M's gameplay was a buggy, broken, offensive mess that tried way too many ambitious ideas and failed to execute any of them, then it could have stood alongside the story as part of the total package. And at least to my tastes, Other M could have been a fascinating, hilarious train wreck of a game. But the story winds up coalescing with the gameplay in a way that's a little more personal to me. Neither one really makes much of an impact on me. I care about the way that they impacted the Metroid franchise, I care about the implications of the story and find them interesting to discuss, but I just said how I'd have no issue laughing at how stupid it is either. There's just nothing here that makes me care as much as I wish I did. And knowing how I am, and particularly why I do this, that alone speaks volumes about this game. If you can believe this, 
I am not the most mechanically articulate person on YouTube. There are so many critics out there with a better eye for design and storytelling. There are people with real experience in the industry who can give you genuine insight into things that I would never notice. There are certainly people who can make videos more consistently. But what makes this show, at least I hope, worth waiting for is that I always manage to find a way to be passionate about whatever I'm covering, and I present that with sincerity. While I was playing Other M, it gave me no shortage of things to think about. The notes I took along the way dwarf any game I've played before, but the reason it's taken so long to put those thoughts together is because the experience didn't make me want to say anything about it, and I had no core drive to wrap my thoughts around. I didn't feel any particular way about this game, and I only got over that block and found my voice when I embraced that fact. This time, I had to get passionate about nothing. Finding that righteous indignation would have probably been easier if I was reviewing the game in 2010, or if I was retrospecting at any time before this happened. Other M might have sent Metroid into hibernation for way too long, but at least we know that it didn't end the series forever. At the same time I was dragging myself through the bottle ship, I was also playing a return to form for Metroid, a game that excels in some of the ways that Other M failed. And knowing that Metroid Prime 4 is over the horizon, there's no reason to be anything but optimistic about the series' future. And so there's no reason I feel to be quite so vengeful toward Other M. I don't think there's any way that Nintendo would ever make this kind of mistake again. And you know, that's kind of sad. I got comments on Prime that claimed that people like me were the reason Other M exists, as if this is what I was asking for, as if this was meant to cater to me. I got much nicer comments hoping I would just go easy on Other M, hopeful that I would find something to love about it. And yeah, despite what a slog this was, I could still adore a more action-focused 3D Metroid game, a third-person adventure that's more evocative of the tenacity of the 2D series. So I can see why a few people were either afraid or hopeful that I would love this game. But I do not love this game. I love a few of the things that it tries to be, but it undermines itself at every turn. That just doesn't mean that I wouldn't love to see those concepts get another chance. But I don't think Nintendo will ever go there again. I think as soon as they showed something with even a surface level resemblance to Other M, fans would tear the game to pieces. And so to someone with my preferences, that makes Other M even more of a resounding, frustrating failure. It's kind of bizarre. The same fanbase that once raged about a first-person 3D Metroid game would probably never be receptive now to anything but. If I ever decide to play it again, I'm gonna do kind of the same thing I did for the original Metroid and use a fan-made hack to make it a little more palatable. Other M Max. Maximum Edition attempts to fix the storyline as best it can. Most of Samus's wooden monologuing is gone, a lot of the stupid plot is cut, although the edits are very obviously fan-made. The scenes don't always flow well, and they do still come across a little hokey, though the fact that there's a lot less of it is still an improvement. But what's much better is that Samus can now fire missiles from third person, giving combat a little bit more variety. The concentration mechanic has been rebalanced and can't be used as a crutch during combat. The mod also shores up some of those ugly low-res textures and restores Samus's more realistic armor if you're into that sort of thing. I'm not. But I'll take the trade-off, since they also made the gravity suit actually look like the gravity suit. Best of all, the mod does exactly what I wish Other M had done and implements remixed music throughout the entire game. Yeah, if you're inclined to give Other M a try, get it on Dolphin, set up your favorite controller, get this mod, and play it this way. Anyway, I'm glad I could find some way to approach this. I hope you've enjoyed the result, and until next time, you keep geeking, I'll keep... Ultimately, oh my god, it's still going. It's a video game with an interactive post credit scene. Why? Why won't the rim just be over? Okay, so... Samus gets authorization to go back to the bottle ship to retrieve some kind of important artifact. <sighs> you know, I guess since the game was so linear, this was the only justifiable way you could go for 100% completion. You know me, I'm never gonna do that. But if I did, I'd unlock hard mode. Yeah, because you want to lock a higher difficulty behind a mind-numbing fetch quest that requires you to meticulously comb the entire bland map. You know, if the game's just not gonna bother ending, I guess I can throw in a coda too. As I played, I figured out a few things that could have made other M so much more palatable. Here's how they could have fixed it. For the gameplay, it's a gimme. Don't tie the development team's hands behind their backs by forcing them to cram a 3D action game around the Wii remote. I would have loved 
love to have seen what Team Ninja could do with a more robust control scheme. Or if you absolutely refuse to do that, if you just have to restrict yourself to the Wii Remote, just have gameplay happen on a 2D plane. You can still have 3D environments in the first person view and cinematic camera angles, you can still take advantage of the hardware, but locking the actual gameplay to 2D would have allowed the combat to work within these constraints. Fixing the story is not so easy. The whole thing would need to be rewritten from the ground up, but if Sakamoto really wanted to tell a story like this, then the change I'd start with is easy. Make it a prequel. Set it before every other Metroid game and tell the story that Fusion pointed to. The story of Samus's time in the Federation and the incident that caused her to leave it. If Samus is still a part of the Galactic Federation and actually is under Adam's command, then the whole authorization gimmick becomes so much more palatable. And that's hardly the only thing a prequel would have fixed. If this had been the first time that Samus had seen the monster who killed her parents since that traumatic event, then of course she might experience a bit of a breakdown. To say nothing of the way that throughout the game she's so much more unsure of herself, and the degree to which she looks up to and respects Adam. I mean the one time that Samus' voice actress actually gets to show off what she can do is in this scene which is taking place as a flashback. Adam, please, let me go. You have to trust me. Just give me a chance. And I think there's evidence that Other M might have just been a prequel early in development. Let's look again at that reveal trailer. The cinematics are almost all showcasing Samus' time in the Federation, as if that was all that was finished. The only reason I can think of to change course was because they wanted to pander to nostalgia and needed Super Metroid to have already happened. But of course, that didn't stop them from throwing in Nightmare. And if you wanted to do nostalgia pandering in a more Metroid-y way, then Adam's sacrifice would have been the perfect opportunity. The turmoil of this moment could have been used to drive Samus forward, to give greater context and meaning to all those times that we as the audience know that she's going to stand alone against the Metroids in the future. Maybe we could have ended the game with a montage of that future, seen her taking out Mother Brain for the first time, watched as she faces Ridley with unwavering confidence, and even seen her using techniques and abilities that Adam taught her as a subtle sort of echo of how he helped her grow as a warrior. Yeah, Other M really could have been something. But back in the game that we actually got, I broke through to the bridge of the bottle ship. Oh, look, it's Fantoon. You guys love Fantoon, right? Remember him from Super Metroid? Look, he's here on the bottle ship, even though that makes no sense at all. But who needs boring things like lore and consistency and quality when we have nostalgia to pander to? Yes, yes, there he is. He's, uh... Hmm. He's busting through the windows and... And destroying the bridge. <laughs> He's using familiar attacks in flashy new ways that couldn't have been done in previous generations. Oh, and now he's wailing on me with attacks, so it's a tense struggle to recover. He's whittling away at me, and I'm doing the same back to him, and holy crap, he killed me! This boss is awesome! Fantoon might not excuse the way Other M set up a Mother Brain fight and failed to deliver, but at least there is a satisfying fight at the end, no matter how little sense it makes. After that, Samus makes it through to the command deck, where she finds Adam's helmet. Look, Other M, it's far and away a lost cause. Can you please stop trying to make me care a- Huh, it's like the game heard me. It's time to drag this memento out of the bottle ship, and we'll be doing it via an epic escape scene. Daunting explosions, gripping music, holding, holding the, directional the directional pad in, in one, one direction. direction. Yeah, this whole sequence is kind of a summation of the game as a whole, and how it holds up in comparison to the rest of the series. It is an epic escape scene, but this time it's only epic because it looks epic. Other M is at its best when it's embracing the only thing it does well, being a brainless, overly accessible, but very flashy action game. Even now, if you apply any scrutiny, it all falls apart. Why does the Federation start blowing up the bottle ship when they should know Samus is still on it? Why can't Samus hold a helmet and activate her armor at the same time? How do I get past these doors? Oh, of course, you just shoot them with your pistol. Why not? But I understand why this game has its defenders. The awfulness of the gameplay probably does get overstated by fans who hold a vendetta against it for well-justified but also unrelated reasons. But if you're willing to turn your brain off and ignore the story, I can see the appeal in smashing a few buttons to guide Samus through some visually satisfying combat. I can even see it being a fun game to unwind with in small doses. Other in, in the best case scenario, is video game junk food. It's just 
I get that it was meant to appeal to more casual players, and the Wii had plenty of those, but Samus Aran just doesn't have the recognition among the mainstream of a character like Mario or Donkey Kong. If somebody relatively unfamiliar with video games saw this on store shelves, I don't think they'd know what it was. Other M was never going to win over that crowd, and a game that tried to was never going to be anything but alienating to Metroid fans. Video game junk food might be enjoyable in small doses, but it's completely antithetical to what people love about this franchise. Other M fails as a satisfying action game. It fails harder as a narrative, but above all, it fails to even remotely live up to the series itself. Other M is a failure at even being a Metroid game, and this failure did cataclysmic damage to the series' reputation among its own fans, in the wider gaming community, and within Nintendo itself. Metroid's first Dark Age was preceded by a masterpiece, but its second was brought on by a catastrophe. Samus Aran would spend seven years in exile. Thank you all for watching this ridiculous bonanza of an episode. Thank you to my patrons for making it happen. Thanks to Chad for providing the opening narration. To Kovar for the brilliant musical interlude. And thank you to my lovely girlfriend Alicia for taking the starring role of Samus Aran. This is the worst thing that ever happened to me. Despite this cataclysm of a game, I have had a lot of fun this past year, and I really do have all of you to thank for that. I'll be back with a new season in 2018, so I hope you guys enjoy your holidays, and until then, you keep geeking, I'll keep... Oh, it really is over. Crotiquin'. The last Metroid was hot garbage. The fandom was not at peace. The year 2010 of the history of the cosmos saw the coming of a game so reviled, it alone brought an abrupt end to what had been an era of opulence, and so began the second Dark Age. In the years that followed, at every Direct, every E3, every possible opportunity where Metroid's bruised and battered fandom might hear some good news, they would instead see their hopes crushed. When what seemed like Metroid's best chance at redemption and glory was ripped away by a toothy gorilla, it was thought that all was lost. For a generation, Other M struck a lethal blow through the heart of Metroid. Six years later, Nintendo was mired in the tragedy of their own Dark Age. However, a light would shine over the horizon as a project emerged that nobody could have predicted. Okay, look. Federation Force is obviously not the worst game in the world, but it suffers from the same baffling lack of awareness that doomed this project. The problem wasn't that the game happened, the problem was when it happened. It'd be like if Hunters had been the first Metroid game since Super. When it's been this long since the last mainline entry in a series, it doesn't really matter how good or bad your spin-off is, it's not what anybody wants. What the people wanted was obviously another chance to step into the power suit of Samus Aran. Another deep, intricate, isolated action adventure across an alien world. A real Metroid game. But it seemed at this point like we might never get it. What nobody could have known was that less than a year later, the return of Samus would be made manifest. In the year 2017 of the History of the Cosmos, on the 13th of June, Nintendo revealed that Metroid Prime 4 was in development. That fact alone would have been enough to satisfy most fans, but that wasn't all we got. In 2002, Metroid entered its new era with a duo of new releases, and history has a way of repeating itself. While Prime 4 was still further away than anyone even knew, the other game, a new take on the series' 2D roots, was only a few months away. And now that we know that, I have to ask, what the heck was Nintendo thinking back in 2016? They could have so effortlessly sidestepped the scorn they earned for Federation Force, and even probably drummed up enthusiasm for it, if they had just let us in on the fact that a real Metroid game was also in development. Even if it wasn't ready to show off, I think even a logo would have been enough. But hey, hindsight's 2020. 
At least we only had to wait a few months. Samus Returns was of course conceptualized years earlier. The game was developed by Nintendo EPD. No, I said EPD in collaboration with Mercury Steam, a developer whose experience seemed tailor-made to both the genre and the 3DS. So Mercury Steam put together a pitch and presented their vision to series lead Yoshio Sakamoto, a fully reimagined remake of Metroid Fusion. Sakamoto turned him down. Fusion didn't need a remake. But their pitch was impressive, and there was another, much older Metroid game that Sakamoto felt was more deserving of a revival. And he was right. Metroid 2 was a critically important piece of the series' lore, telling the story of Samus' first visit to her enemy's homeworld, establishing concepts that would become series mainstays, and setting in motion the story events that would really drive the rest of the series. It was also a 1991 release for the Game Boy, every ambition it had tarnished by time. Way more than any other Metroid game, this one needed a remake. And seven long years since the last Metroid, Nintendo went all out in making this comeback a momentous event. A special edition collector's box with a soundtrack CD and keychain, a glorious set of new amiibo, an even more glorious special edition 3DS, it was great to see them putting so much hype into Metroid again. Just a few months earlier, I was a newly minted fan of the series who had no idea how long he'd have to wait for a new game, and yep, here it was already! I kind of felt like I'd come in at the perfect time. And oh, did I ever play this one! I finished it once, and then again on hard mode, and then again on fusion mode, and then I went back and actually freaking completed it! 100%! How many times have I repeated throughout this series? I'm not a completionist! So that should tell you just how much of a blast I was having with Samus Returns. Then I put it back on the shelf, and uh, uh, kind of forgot about most of it? Yeah, this is gonna be markedly different from my earlier Metroid videos. I'm not going in blind here, but despite how much I enjoyed it in 2017, I'm not exactly confident in how much of it has stuck with me over the past three years. Samus Returns came out during my favorite year in gaming in a long time, surrounded on all sides by a supernova of new releases. I played it, I loved it, but I didn't exactly commit to it. And this far removed from the hype, it's gonna be interesting to see how much of that was, like, my fault. Does Samus Returns still live up to the hype and to the legacy of Metroid? Let's get... You know what, one sec. I don't normally do this, but because this game is so much more recent than most of what I cover, I'm gonna warn you. This is not a review. I'm going to be diving deep on every element of the entire game, so if you'd like to play it yourself first, I recommend doing that. Alright, here we go. Let's get critiquing! In the year 20XD5 of the... Cosmic Calendar? <laughs> I'll have to update my translations. Anyway, the story so far is conveyed through some pretty stunning artwork, retelling Samus' Zero mission and the events that have brought her to the Metroid homeworld. The Galactic Federation was rightly concerned about the danger posed by the Metroids, and sent a squadron of elite soldiers to... investigate. Yeah, okay. To the surprise of no one, the Federation Force's mission went about as well as the game they starred in. But having confirmed the presence of Metroids on SR388, the Federation, like Nintendo, realized their mistake. They'd sent a team of soldiers to do the job of a single bounty hunter. Samus Aran is back to exterminate the Metroids once and for all! Yep, once and for all. I can't say enough about how effective this intro is. It powerfully reintroduces the tone of the Metroid universe, and succinctly brings you up to speed on the events that led here. The 2D illustrations may look a little low res blown up like this, but they pop on the 3DS screen, <laughs> literally if you've got the slider turned up, and it all comes together playing over the iconic Super Metroid theme. The gunship makes its landing on SR388, and our heroine's adventure begins. Yeah, I've missed that sound. As Samus makes her initial descent beneath the surface of another alien world, the game is almost ethereal in its presentation. The music is this David Wiseian piece, made up mostly of the wind blowing through the caves, but with a distant melody that never quite resolves, edging up on the fringes of your subconscious, bringing forth flashes of adventures from decades past. It's as if the Metroid series itself is slowly emerging from hibernation, trying to wake up. A few on-screen control tutorials are shown, but they only ever happen once. 
having taught you how to aim, and how to fire missiles, it would have been all too easy to tell the player exactly what to do here, too. But as always, Metroid will only tell you what you can do. It allows you the pleasure of figuring out how to use what you can do. And this precedent carries forward for the rest of the game. And yet all of this is communicated so naturally. I didn't notice at first that I was in a tutorial, respecting the player's agency and intelligence, but guiding with an invisible hand so gentle and so subtle, you don't even notice it's there. That is core to the appeal of Metroid. It reeks of old school tradition, and I'm glad that Samus Returns gets that. And then, as if in response to all that, something happens that would have been impossible back in the old school. The camera pans away from Samus, tilts into a cinematic action shot, and... This right here was when I realized and appreciated exactly what the game was doing. Everything old is new again. Metroid is awake. Boom! A polygonal 3D Metroid game, offering up some of the best 3D depth the 3DS would ever see. BANG! Metroid 2 let us aim shots in different directions for the first time, and its remake has given us full 360 degree aiming via the circle pad, just as WarioWare foretold. Whip! Kick! Samus has a new melee counter, and the impact and satisfaction of nailing it has been meticulously, iteratively fine-tuned to crunchy perfection. And it better be, because you're probably going to be doing it a lot. Most, not all, but most enemies will charge Samus on sight. If you successfully counter, the enemy will be stunned and pushed back. Samus will automatically target it, and when you fire, the power of that shot is MAXIMUM! This move is now the centerpiece of Samus's arsenal, and to justify that, enemies in this game have to be more aggressive. I'm kind of of two minds about this. On the one hand, it probably diminishes the immersive believability of exploring an alien ecosystem. Most of the wildlife here, even those much smaller than you, will viciously attempt to kill you on sight, and that doesn't make a lot of sense. It means that Samus Returns comes across as a whole lot more gamey. But on the other hand, I like my games to be gamey. Combat, at least outside of boss battles, was never really the focus of 2D Metroid, but I find I'm more engaged with what I'm doing here. I'm falling into this simple rhythm that's satisfying to pull off, but easy enough that it doesn't wear on me. Most enemies home in on you, but that also means you know where they're about to be. But much as I'm liking the melee now, I think I'll revisit it later to see if it gets repetitive. If that paradigm shift didn't drive home the fact that Samus Returns ain't your father's Metroid, a little further down you'll find a brand new Chozo artifact, and so the first of several brand new abilities. When you roll into it, well, tasty. Let's see, I already said bang, boom, flip, tuck. So, uh, whoa. This is an Aeon ability, a suite of brand new upgrades for Samus. The scan pulse causes breakable parts of the environment to flash, helping you find secret rooms and tunnels. If you want to know what I think of this, well, Coincidentally, it was in my critique of the original Metroid 2 where I came to an important realization. I had always been put off by this series because I was playing it in a way that wasn't conducive to what I tend to like about video games. I'd always gone out of my way to bomb every wall, seek out every upgrade, and try to find everything because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. But by doing that, I was choosing to interrupt the momentum of combat, exploration, and discovery, the flow of the game design, and therefore preventing myself from actually enjoying it. I can see why to some players the scan pulse might make things too easy. I mean, that noise sure is ear grating. Guess it just wouldn't be Metroid 2 if there wasn't something giving you a headache, but I'd still rather the scan pulse be there. Especially because it is, after all, totally optional. You could play the whole game without firing it off once if that's more fun for you. Just like I could comb over every surface area to find secrets, but I wouldn't, because I know it'd ruin the fun for me. What I'm saying is that thanks to the scan pulse, even an impatient jackass like me can finally enjoy completing a Metroid game. Of course, it keeps progression from being a chore too. While I'd certainly prefer a game that used more natural, environmental cues to guide the player forward, I also know that's a lot easier said than done, especially since Samus Returns is required, after all, to reiterate Metroid 2's structure. The central goal of that game was to hunt down every individual Metroid. The map was separated into areas. Kill every Metroid in the area you're in, and acid would lower, letting you access the next one. This gave the game a great sense of momentum, especially early on. 
but it also carried some consequences. Metroid 2 was even more linear than Fusion was gonna be, but unlike Fusion, it didn't particularly capitalize on the strengths of that design. It eventually became repetitive and even tepid, as you'd fight the same boss battles over and over. They make it bigger, but you're always just spamming missiles. But hunting down Metroid's area by area is so fundamental to the structure of Metroid 2, there's no way you could remake the game without it. So. How do you turn that negative into a positive? Well, when I finally decided to stop rambling about everything else and get the heck down here, the first Alpha Metroid fight made it obvious. Instead of mindlessly homing in on you while you spam missiles, this Alpha is more dynamic. It hovers above Samus, exposing its weak point and dropping slow-moving projectiles forcing you to swap between dodging and aiming with the circle pad. And when it gives you that cue, WHAM! The camera pans in to emphasize the impact. It's certainly not difficult, but it puts this new paradigm to the test. For overcoming that, I got my first energy tank and the charge beam. The great first impression of Metroid 2, that awesome sense of growth and momentum right from the word go, is back and better than ever, alongside significant improvements to the game's structure. If the original was a more linear Metroid with a focus on boss fights, then to capitalize on those aspects, Samus Returns needs to be a more challenging, bombastic, innovative, and action-packed take on the formula. But it needs to balance all that without losing the thread of what a Metroid game is. Back in Metroid 2, it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out that eliminating every Metroid in an area was actually what was causing the acid to lower. But to be fair, why would that happen? The remake has an answer. In an attempt to contain the Metroids and prevent them from falling into the wrong hands, the Chozo were the ones who flooded the planet. They set up a system of locks that can only be broken by someone powerful enough to defeat the Metroids. By doing that, and uploading their DNA into these seals, the locks are broken and Samus can venture deeper. And if you get stuck, you can also upload incomplete Metroid data, and the seals will point you in the direction of another husk. It's an impressive bit of work. Mercury Steam took something odd and obtuse about the original, and turned it into a detail that feels perfectly in line with established lore, carries interesting implications, and serves the game design perfectly. While the rest of the beam upgrades stack, the Ice Beam is now a separate mode. Its utility blends nicely with the game's combat focus. And of course, Metroids themselves are vulnerable to it. A well-placed charge shot will cause a Metroid to freeze over, slowing it down and limiting it to less powerful attacks. But once again, this is still Metroid. You can do new things with it, but the Ice Beam's usual functions still apply. So you're probably quote-unquote supposed to get this upgrade with the Spider Ball later, but with a little ingenuity and skill, you can... Hang on, I can do this. Ah, you can, dang it, come on! There we go, ha, easy. You can nab this upgrade early. Nailed it. The Game Boy version was slim on backtracking. The linear map meant it was incredibly cumbersome to go back, and there was no real incentive to do so. But Samus Returns is already showing me a lot of obstacles that I'll have to come back to later. And it'll be a whole lot easier when I do, thanks to these new fast travel transports that let you warp back to any other transport you found. Taking this first set will even bring you back to a room where you can already grab a few upgrades. Something so direct would be a little out of place in most other Metroid games, but since on SR388 different areas never connect or cross over each other, if you want to give this game more longevity, this sort of thing is kind of a necessity. At last, let's tumble down into the Broken Shrine and pick up Metroid 2's infamous Spider Ball. It actually controls really well now, and the map design still gives it a lot of outside-the-box utility. Although crawling around with this thing is still a tad too slow for my liking. <laughs> but that's a real minor criticism. Samus Returns has adapted the original version's excellent early game momentum, and improved on it with a litany of new abilities and upgrades that still managed to perfectly complement how Metroid 2 was structured. But of course, in more ways than one, I barely scratched the surface. The move to 3D visuals has been a point of contention for some people. I've even seen it argued that it makes this game, and others that look like it, seem a little cheap or lifeless. While I can't say I agree in all cases, I get it. 16-bit is the color of my soul. Pixel art has this timeless quality to me. And given how prevalent it is in indie titles, I don't think many people would even consider it retro. And heck, it's not like 2D art even has to be retro. It would have been possible, and maybe even preferable, to carry the intro's 2D artwork to the rest of the game. But on the other hand, polygons are a very natural fit for the very thing the system was named for. 
Many titles late in the 3DS's life abandoned the gimmick entirely, but Samus Returns didn't. And as someone who loves that gimmick, that's to its credit. The game makes extensive and impressive use of background detail. Impossibly huge chasms with waterfalls hanging overhead, flora and fauna reacting to the environment, ancient structures that crumble apart on your second or third run through a room. This is bar none some of the best use of 3D depth the 3DS would ever see. And I wish I could capture it here, because it acts as a multiplicative effect on the scale of these caverns, selling it as a world with scope and depth that almost believably exists behind that tiny plastic screen. True, it all looks a bit low res if you scrutinize it, but I think that style has its own charm too. I just hate this notion that graphics like this are soulless by nature. I'll always love 2D art, but the rough edges I see here come down to the 3DS's underspect hardware and not the artistic direction. One thing I do find a little bit cheap, however, is something I only noticed once I got the Varia suit. Check it. Every single time you step into a hot area, without exception, you always hear the same track. A barely remixed version of the Magmore Caverns theme from Metroid Prime. Now the first time this happens, it's honestly perfect. You're just wandering around, exploring the area, and, huh, this room looks different. What could, oh god! The soundtrack, the environment, the graphical effect, everything just blasts you like you're suddenly burning up and gasping for air. But now that I've got the Varia suit, and I can stand the heat, the repetition ends up having the opposite effect. This just ends up being the theme of a hot place, and hearing these harsh chords kick up over and over just starts wearing on you. Even if you get into a Metroid fight, the boss music never kicks in. It's still more Magmore! But at least those bosses are staying interesting. One thing I didn't give the original game enough credit for was that even if the fights were kinda samey, at least the rooms you fought them in were different. Samus Returns takes that variety and runs with it. Not only are the settings changing, the Metroids themselves are showing a lot of variation. They employ different attacks, patterns, and strategies. Some of them are even textured to match the environment. It would have been easy to lean on the melee counter to turn this game's boss fights into your run-of-the-mill modern boss designs. You know the ones. You dodge their rote, cinematic pre-baked patterns until they give you an opening, hammer the attack button while they're stunned, rinse and repeat until you win. When it's done well, a boss like this can be really thrilling and cinematic, but the repetition of it would really drag down a game like this. So instead, Samus Returns fights are dynamic. If you dodge a charging Metroid and let it run into a wall, it'll stun itself. You don't just wait for an opening, you can always hurt them, but you've got to balance that with defense. And as you get later into the game, they go for melee attacks less and less frequently, making those times you do catch them with the counter all the more impactful. And speaking of impact, Area 2 also contains a single one of these. The Gamma Metroid takes all those attributes I just mentioned and cranks the volume. It's challenging enough, in fact, that it was the first time this happened. In previous titles, a game over would send you back to your previous save point, however far back that happened to be. This game instead returns you to an invisible checkpoint situated just before the room that you died in. It's a contemporary and welcome quality of life improvement that'll become a bit of a necessity later on. While Area 2 is packed with upgrades, only one of them is new to the remake. The second Aeon Power, Lightning Armor, causes Samus's power suit to emit a shield, which will absorb all incoming damage at the cost of Aeon energy. That lets you get through poison plants unscathed, and offers more leeway in these segments where Samus is infected by acidic mist, draining your energy until you can get to water. That's an interesting mechanic, and it goes kinda underexplored. Having the armor on powers up Samus's melee into a lightning counter. This hits a wider area and makes countering much easier, but it comes with a downside. A normal counter will generate Aeon energy, but a lightning counter drains it. It's a smartly designed upgrade. The armor is always useful both offensively and defensively, but using it is always a trade-off. The wave beam, as always, lets Samus' shots travel through walls and obstacles. But here I found myself appreciating it more than I ever had. Metroid games have always liked to keep Samus just off-center of the camera most of the time, but the 3DS has the screen real estate to be way more dynamic. That, plus the analog aiming, means that the wave beam has a greatly expanded utility, and it's even more useful if you're fighting something with a weak point. Area 2 is where Samus Returns stops feeling so breezy and starts putting the screws to you. This place initially seems pretty claustrophobic. Everything looks like a dead end. 
But through your own ingenuity, you'll start pushing through to new paths, leading to new abilities, leading to more paths, leading to more upgrades and bosses and discoveries and... Oh, this feels like a Metroid game and I am loving it! It was all going so well. The first thing I saw in Area 3 was a portent of things to come. This little auto-targeting robot that soaked up like a hundred missiles and knocked off a ton of health every time it sniped me. And after that I just had to jump into this pool of acid to get to the other side because I'm dumb and I forgot I had the spider ball. And then I started dying to literally every single Metroid I ran into. The counter timing on Gamma's is a lot tighter, and missing one knocks off a ton of health! Yeah, I might have checkpoints now, but that does nothing to refill your energy, so... I guess there's only one thing to do! Eh, this is nostalgic. All of this effectively gave me the feeling like I was pushing into a place that I wasn't supposed to be yet. Even the standard enemies are getting more dangerous and diverse. They're as vicious as ever, and now they're coming at me from all sides. Those difficulty spikes keep getting sharper. I hoped they'd lay off a little when I got my third Aeon power up, the Beam Burst. It soaks up energy like crazy, but it turns Samus' arm cannon into an overwhelming rapid-fire blaster. For a while here, I honestly felt a little outmatched. I worried that maybe I'd been rushing too fast, and I was even thinking about backtracking after this to find some more energy tanks. But then, it was like something clicked, and those tough Gamma Metroids that had been kicking me in the teeth were suddenly going down quick, going down hard, and it felt incredible. This is something Metroid's always done well. It upends your confidence for a while, just to make that moment that you do overcome that obstacle even more satisfying. But the upgrade wasn't what turned things around. The only thing that changed was me. It clicked for me, and that's what I've always loved about this series. The upgrades are just tools. Your skill is what makes or breaks you. Fear me, you scourge of the galaxy! Oh, you better run! Ha! Got him! Oh, here's another one. Don't get back here! Ooh, I'll cut him off again! You can run, but you can't hide! And- Okay, stop running away! Every time they do that, you have to pursue them to another nearby room. It's a cool novelty once or twice, but it's happened so many times it's just getting tedious. But at least I'm actually accomplishing something there. The most annoying, clunky thing I've encountered in this game was right here. I am trying, for several minutes, to simply swing up to this ledge. Eventually, I gave up and figured I must be missing something, but I hit dead ends in every other direction. So I came back, and after several more attempts, I figured it out. You can hit the jump button at the end of your swing, and you would think that'd be the right thing to do. But it's not. You need to just let go of the grapple beam, not hit the jump button, and this will counterintuitively get you more distance. I don't know, maybe this is just a me problem, but I think it tripped me up back in my first playthrough too. On the bright side, other than that, the grapple beam is better than it's ever been. A big part of this is just the way it controls. It'll be enabled automatically if you aim Samus' arm cannon at a grapple point. You can also fully switch to it on the touchscreen, but I never found a reason to do that. Swinging is a lot more fluid than it was in 16-bit, and you can use it to zip to grapple points, pull some obstacles, and break others. So that's yet another returning power with expanded function and utility. But with the grapple beam got, it is palpable that this game is pushing the 3DS to its limit. Multiple touchscreen buttons, touch scrolling the map, every physical button, and both the D-pad and circle pads are put to use. With the fortunate exception of Gyro, that's every single feature the 3DS offers. It works, but it requires an unusual amount of attention, and never quite becomes second nature. I think the biggest issue is that you select an Aeon power with the D-pad, but then you switch it on and off with the A button. I think this was done so you can move and use Aeon at the same time, but it would have been nice if they'd made concessions for the new 3DS. Maybe use the nub as an auto-switch for Aeon, and use the extra shoulder buttons for swapping beams? I don't know. Controllers are second nature to me. I'm one of those lucky few who never even get confused as to where the X button is. But even I get a little turned around and hand crampy here. Or at least I do when I play the game on a 3DS. My footage here, and I think it's obvious, was not captured on original hardware. 
I'm using an ingenious control scheme that lets you map touch controls to the right analog stick, and even pops up a context menu to show your selections. Thanks to Redditor B Spitz for that, and I'll leave a link in the description. Area 2 and 3 have each taken me about 2 hours apiece to get through. That means that here in my 4th playthrough of Samus Returns, I've spent almost as long on these last two sections as I did in my entire first playthrough of the Game Boy version. And it's easy to see why. Just look at these maps compared to the old ones. While the game's overall progression may still be a straight shot down, the individual areas are now like miniature Metroid maps unto themselves. There's been an excellent sense of challenge, progression, and discovery. An excellent flow as I'm breaking open these paths and figuring out how they're connected. The enemy variety has been really impressive to this point. There are crustaceans that turn away and defend when they're attacked, acidic baddies that pop out of the ground and dive bomb you with no chance for melee, little scuttling robots that disable your Aeon abilities. I've seen a handful of takes over the past few years that claim that this combat is boring or uninspired because the counter makes every encounter the same. I can see that holding some water early in the game when it's all you've got, but it's hardly Samus's only option at this point. Not to say the melee counter isn't still useful, it definitely is, but it's just one weapon in an expanding toolbox. I don't need to lean on it as much. Especially now. The spacer beam is powerful enough that I don't even need to counter weaker enemies anymore. And speaking of which, can I just say how hilarious this three-eyed door blocker is? That's something I've never really thought about. What kind of ridiculous life forms are these things? How do they poop? It's a nice touch how the caverns between areas are still tinged purple even once the acid's drained. And after a few sections where the challenge and complexity has just gotten steeper and steeper, this area is a welcome reprieve from all the tension. It's nice to breathe for a while, explore around, do a little light puzzle solving. And then, just when I was getting a little too comfortable... Oof, ominous. What in the world could have done this? Make it stop! Make it stop! <sighs> 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 Whew! I think we lost him. Nope! Nope, we did not lose him! Bomb blocks and scandalers and swinging and screaming! Boom, 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 boom! Ah! Oh! I freaking ate it! What? I'm alive! Uh-oh, I mean, uh, yep. Yes, you definitely killed me! Okay, you bought it. Explosive escape sequences are a Metroid staple, but this is something else entirely. Where those applied pressure via a fairly generous timer, this applies pressure by requiring breakneck reflexes and near-perfect execution. Because if any part of that drill pokes your oh-so-flimsy Chozo armor, that is a one-hit kill. This is one of those parts I remembered most about Samus Returns. It's a punishing, spectacular set piece that practically requires trial and error, and as much as I personally enjoy this sort of thing, well, let's just say it never would have worked in a game without checkpoints. That sequence is so intense that when the game abruptly jerks you back to quiet exploration, what was a calming reprieve is now too quiet. Working my way up this chasm, I was on edge, waiting for something to- Oh god, what's that? What is that? There is literally no answer. On the bright side, at least I got super missiles. On the not bright side, if it wasn't there before, this is probably the point where the control interface officially spills over into being too complicated. Swapping missiles works like swapping beams. You do it on the touchscreen, except now you've got to hold the R button while you poke the touchscreen, and you're equipping what is a very limited resource. It's easy to forget you have supers equipped and end up wasting them. It's equally easy to forget you don't have them equipped and have to scramble with the controls in situations where you really need them. I think swapping should have either been a button toggle, or better yet, take the fusion approach and just make supers stack over regular missiles. But at least super missiles will make the fight against another one of these Gamma Metroid pushovers a little faster. Haha, <laughs> yeah! Are you serious? We got another runner? I guess maybe this is supposed to show how the Metroids are scared of Samus now, but the thematic benefits are massively outweighed by how annoyed I am! Running is just delaying the inevitable. My skills and abilities have more than equips the meager challenge on offer here. Oh no. Well, I asked for it. The Metroids have upgraded to Zeo, uh, Zeta, and ooh, they're rowdy. 
I really like how each new stage of the life cycle is, mechanically speaking, an evolutionary leap forward. Alpha's had me dodging simple projectiles, Gamma's had beams and waves and more strategy, and now Zeta's have all that plus bullet hell projectiles and flamethrowers and GET OVER HERE! Right when you get too complacent, the game runs a dozen steps ahead of you, and after all that, the final Metroid of the area is... an Alpha. Aw, what are you doing all the way down here, buddy? Wasting this thing with Samus' upgraded armament is a testament to how far you've come, and smart design choices like this keep the game from becoming too repetitive or exhausting. I mean, the previous section had 10 Metroids. This one only had four, filling its time with more low-key obstacles and high-tension set pieces, but that tension always ebbs and flows, and Area 4 is a showcase for it. Having said that, now that I've passed the midpoint of the game, I still see no reason to backtrack. In fact, I've never backtracked to earlier areas during any playthrough, and this is why. Right from the start, you'll see sections of the map blocked off by crystals. There's no way to break them until the end, so you might as well make backtracking the very last thing you do. Because if you remember Metroid 2, you know what can break those crystals. Once you get to the end of the game and rescue the baby Metroid, you'll now have the option to adventure back through the entire map, and it will come with you. I go back and forth on this a little. The upside is, of course, that it gives the game more longevity, and strengthens the connection that Samus and the player experience with the last Metroid by giving her more to do with it. I always love when narrative relationships are realized through gameplay. The downside is that while there's a steady stream of artillery expansions throughout the game, there are very, very few occasions where you can nab an upgrade before you're quote-unquote supposed to. In fact, remember this? That was the last one I saw! And given the linear nature of Metroid 2, there's no room for sequence breaking. That was inevitable, but combined with the upgrade path being so inflexible, Samus Returns feels uncharacteristically rigid. There aren't enough of those logic-bending moments where you feel like you can outsmart the game and do something you're not supposed to. Metroid counter on the lower screen is dwindling, counting down. Metroid 2 has always been a title where you get to be acutely aware of exactly how close you are to the end, and as that finale starts to crest, there's an uneasy dread in what horror Samus might face, yet her determination holds steady. The song is tragic and heroic, triumphant and somber. It's unquestionably Metroid. Maybe that's why a flash of familiarity set in. It's been so long since I was last here that the details have faded to me, but the layout of this section, an inconceivably enormous vertical space wrapped around crisscrossing tunnels with hallways branching off to super-powered Metroids, even years later, this place is still burned in my memory. And the space jump actually works in the remake! Area 5 was enormous even on the Game Boy, and Samus Returns again expands on that layout. Unfortunately, this is where the seam started to show a little. Early on, it seemed like pushing forward in any direction was a guaranteed dead end. Now, once I found the right upgrade and started putting those pieces together, it was fine, but it still led to a lot of crisscrossing back and forth across the map. And between elevators, warps, and loading screens, it all got a bit tedious. But to be fair, Area 5 does pack a lot into a short period of time, and one of the upgrades you find, uh allows you to do exactly that. This was a few areas ago, but I remember the first time I saw this place, I was hyped. I thought Mercury Steam was gonna bring back my beloved Speed Booster! Not this time. No, instead, Samus' fourth and final Aeon ability is revealed to be... well, Time Break! Samus can slow down time for everything but herself. So I guess from the perspective of her enemies, this might as well be the speed booster. Eh, I don't really care for this one. The other Aeon powers have obstacles built for them, but they also offer utility outside of those circumstances. The phase drift, on the other hand, is really only useful in these strictly built pass-fail obstacles. And the game often does a poor job signaling that you're gonna need it before you fall through the floor, meaning that something that should save time really just wastes it. I guess it makes aiming and countering a little easier. But this late in the game, it's not like you'd need the crutch. It might have been nice if it let you get a few more shots in, but if you counter a boss, the phase drift just shuts itself off. Honestly, this was the one Aeon ability that I didn't remember at all until I got it. 
It's used so sparingly that it doesn't attract anything, but it's not interesting enough to be memorable. What makes the contrast even clearer is that the optional upgrade puzzles that I'm coming across at this point in the game really are putting the range of the rest of Samus' arsenal to great use. In other words, the phase drift might be a letdown, but at least everything else makes up for it. Given how offensive enemies are in Samus Returns, and how much damage they can sponge to this point, the plasma beam has never felt so dominant. And before the awesomeness of that could even settle in, I found the screw attack and well, the visual effect leaves a lot to be desired this time, but still, with these two upgrades combined, the idea that I'd even need to melee anything has become more of a suggestion. At one time, I could barely put up a fight against these guys. Then, I could take them down, but only with careful positioning and Aeon powers. And now, late in the game, my normal attack just rips and tears right through them! God, I love Metroid. God, I've missed Metroid. In fact, I might be a little bit too overpowered. During the production of this episode, I got tremendously sick for over a week between the last area and this one. So you'd think coming back to the game, I might be a little rusty. Instead, this was the first section in a long time where I didn't die once. The Metroids are a cakewalk. That's not a bad thing. It's exhilarating to plow through fights that used to stop me dead in my tracks. But I know it can't last. I learned my lesson earlier. Samus Returns is lifting me up buoying my spirits just so it can pull the rug out from under me. And I can't wait to see what it's got in store. Yeah, yeah. It's finally here. The final stage of Metroid Evolution. This is the Omega Metroid! Look at the rage! Look at the threat! The variability of attacks! Oh, I've got a fight on my hand! It's over. Huh. Well, I love the design of the Omega. It's an imposing presence. But Samus is just too capable at this point for it to really matter. It telegraphs every attack it does at a snail's pace. And with how much mobility the space jump gives you, dodging him is no problem. I walked into this room with barely a tank of energy left, but somehow even that didn't do me. The Omega has one of those quote-unquote attacks, where it's really just saying, Your comfort is very important to us. Why not recover some health with our suite of refreshing power-ups? I want to say though, this is still an enjoyable fight. It's fun to play and it's well designed. It's just not as difficult as I would expect it to be at this point in the game, or even as difficult as what's come before. I guess it helps that I vaguely remember how to do this. But no, that really wasn't helping me earlier in the game. But still, I guess I am coming at this from the perspective of someone who's beaten the game at the highest difficulty. And that raises one of my biggest criticisms of Samus Returns. And it's not even something within the game, which is exactly the problem? Let me explain. Nintendo is still deep in the throes of the amiibo craze in 2017, but regardless of how cool this set is to look at, well, in most games, amiibo can unlock skins, or bonuses, or like early access to something you can get anyway. Samus Returns, on the other hand, features the most useful, robust, awesome suite of amiibo functionality in any game that's not entirely based around them, and that's not really a good thing. Scanning the three Samus figures unlocks a reserve tank upgrade and access to either an art gallery or a sound test. None of that is unlockable any other way. Also, they're tied individually to these features. But you know, you could make the argument that those are really just bonuses. They're nice to have, but they're not something intrinsic to the total package. Maybe. But this little guy right here is the real problem. The Metroid can be scanned at any time during the game to mark one of his brethren on your map. <laughs> but that ain't even the half of it. The Metroid Amiibo is also, ridiculously, the only way to unlock Fusion Mode. And you know what? It was worth it to me! I love these figures, I love playing as Samus in the Fusion Suit, and I love Fusion Mode! But the fact remains that something this substantial, this necessary, is locked behind a separate physical figure. I mean, literally, the menu gives you Normal, Hard, and Amiibo, then permanently changes that to Fusion once you scan this thing. And I wouldn't mind so much if the Metroid just let you unlock the mode early, or if the Fusion mode was just cosmetic, but it's not. This really is the toughest challenge the game offers, and you can't earn it, you can't even see it, unless you track down one of these. This is inexcusable. It was inexcusable when the game came out too, but at least you could actually find the figures at retail back then. Now, if you want to play Fusion Mode, let's just see. Yep. 
like Amiibo are great and all, but I'm real glad this game didn't set a precedent. But let's move from one controversy to another. It's time for all of Samus Returns foreshadowing to pay off. This is the Diggernaut, an ancient mining robot slash Metal Gear that was left behind by the Chozo. Oh, so that's why it could pierce her armor. It's also Chozo tech. Samus accidentally woke it up much earlier in the game, and it's been crossing her ever since. Metroid is no stranger to heavy foreshadowing, but it's never been taken quite so far. But then, Metroid has never had a boss fight like this either. Bosses in 2D Metroid, including Samus Returns, tend to be damage sponges with specific weak points that you can, hypothetically, hit at any time. It's old school game design. Move correctly, aim well, do not die. But the Digger Knot is a more modern boss design that progresses through a bevy of different phases as the fight goes on. You've got to figure out how to create an opening that'll allow you to hit him where it hurts. The trickiest part of this comes right here. It seems like it's just repeating an attack pattern and offering you no obvious chance to hit back. But all throughout the game, I've been dealing with these vacuum fans that suck up morph bombs. In fact, I had just seen one in the previous room. So after a few cycles, I noticed, huh, this vacuum sucks things up the same way. The problem is a lack of conveyance. Digger not used the vacuum earlier in the fight too, and all I had to do then was dodge it. But now, it uses the exact same attack, and since you've seen it before, it's a much greater leap to realize that you need to do something other than dodge. Also, I, uh, did not remember until I was writing this that I could have just used the spider ball to keep Samus planted and made things way easier on myself. But that's sort of the point I'm getting at. Through this entire fight, hitting Diggernaut is tricky. It demands a degree of finesse and awareness of your abilities that Metroid usually saves for its puzzle rooms. But if Diggernaut should hit you while you're trying to process all that, it hits so hard and wreaks so much damage that it can fall into the trial and error style of something like Cuphead. This is not a place that Metroid usually goes, and I get why, pardon the pun, it's not everyone's cup of tea. But what can I say? Charging full speed into a brick wall over and over and over until I finally, inevitably, triumphantly break through is distinctly my cup of tea. Even though I've beaten it before, it still took me half a dozen tries to break through. But then I'm the kind of idiot who completely misses the point of getting over it and has a genuinely good time with that game. So of course I think Diggernaut lived up to the hype. The game did a phenomenal job building the danger this boss posed up to insurmountable levels, and then giving you the opportunity to claw and scrape and fight to overcome it. The game earns this, Samus earns this, and most importantly, you earn this. It's so freaking cool. With that piece of business out of the way, Samus finally takes back her power bomb. But, uh, Diggernaut's corpse is still trapping her in here. Well, went on SR388. Do as the Metroids do. The power bomb has always been the most volatile move in the old arsenal, but in this game, you can combine it with the Spider Ball to do something unexpected. We might not have gotten the Shine Spark, but that just makes me appreciate this even more. It's called the Makanko! The Makakakoka! Ah, screw it! Power Bomb Cannon! But as cool as it might be, there may be a nit to pick here. The fact that you can do this is not revealed when you get the Power Bombs, and it's not listed as an ability in the status screen. In every other instance, the game gives you the tools and leaves you to discover their function, but here Samus returns reneges on that promise. It's great to combine Samus' abilities in such a novel way, but a power bomb has never affected Samus' movement any more than a regular bomb, even in this game. So it is quite a leap of logic to expect that it might cause her to fly off like a rocket, but only if she's stuck to something. I don't think I'd have ever figured it out on my own. I mean, I had to look it up. What saves it from being more than a nitpick is that at least it's not needed for progression. You only have to use it to reach six optional upgrades. So, while I can see that being a speed bump for completionists, I don't know, I think it's neat. It reminds me of making bomb arrows in Link's Awakening, getting the Hadoken in Mega Man X, or I guess more applicably, the Crystal Flash in Super Metroid. You're unlikely to find out about it on your own, it spreads via word of mouth, and there's something kind of romantic and nostalgic about that. Games don't generally do this anymore. Aside from spider sharking around the map, well, Area 7 has another phenomenal music track, but unfortunately, all it really features beyond that is more of the same. 
Enemy Variety was never Metroid 2's strong suit, and while Samus Returns was doing pretty well earlier, it kinda takes a dive toward the end. The same couple of enemy types introduced hours ago are still all I'm running into. Oh, except now some of them have shiny variants, meaning you can't melee them. Thrilling. And most unfortunately, the Metroids have run into the same issue as the rest of the enemies. Which sucks because for almost the entire game, they were these tough, interesting, worthy challenges, fought in unique locations, their power scaling with your own, until your skill and Samus' abilities could outpace and overwhelm them. They'd go from being obstacles to overcome, to meaningful indications of how far you've come, then they would evolve and the process would start again. And it all culminates in... Three more Omegas, all fought in the exact same sort of arena as the first, all with the exact same abilities, all soaking up just as much damage without the novelty of a new fight to fall back on. In other words, it's freaking tedious to fight the same easy, prolonged boss three times in a row. The only solace is that at least it's just three fights, and then Omegas are done. But come on, the whole game's been building to this point, and I just think something could have been done to make them more killer or less filler. Maybe you fight them in different conditions, or chase them down through the central section of the area, instead of just keeping them confined to a room. Or you could even fight the last two as a pair. Between the repetitive enemies and repetitive bosses, Area 7 feels a little bit ramshackle. But hey, I guess a little downtime isn't the worst thing in the world. With the Omegas finished off, Samus's job is almost done. The last Metroid is all that's left. We all know that statement is not true. All through the game, Samus' actions have been forcing that counter lower and lower, and when it's finally down to one and she thinks it's over, the rug is pulled out from under her. What in the world could make that number go up? What could make more Metroids? The Metroid Queen. And she will put nearly every ability Samus has, and every skill you've built, to the test. Keep grounded with a spider ball, stay airborne with a space jump, knock her back with the power bomb cannon, then grapple beam her face into the dirt, switch on the lightning armor, and... <laughs> That's just the first round. It only gets harder from there. The Queen is a long, arduous fight, but it's exhausting and nerve-wracking in the best way, because when it pays off... that never gets old. This is the climax, and Samus Returns doesn't just remake it, it actualizes and enhances the feeling of it. Where a boss of this scale was a technical showcase for the Game Boy, Samus Returns amplifies that through 26 years of gaming evolution. From the moment more Metroids are revealed, the fight through the swarm, and the battle with the Queen, everything has been pitch perfect. And when the last Metroid is finally born, the moment is subtle and understated. It doesn't oversell how important this is, because the moment speaks for itself. This is the reason Metroid 2 needed to be remade. The game is too critical and too special and too important to let it remain tarnished by time. But when I look back on Metroid 2 after all this time, what I remember is not a grand struggle against the Metroid Queen, or bombastic showdowns against tough bosses. No. What I remember is what happens right before all that. A long, winding tunnel, completely devoid of anything. No enemies to fight, no upgrades to find, just you, just Samus, pressing forward, alone. In its penultimate moment, the game pauses and gives the player time to reflect. And by doing that, with so little effort, the excitement of that climax is built even higher, and the payoff becomes even sweeter. Because when Samus finally finds the last Metroid, her act of mercy is immediately followed by another winding, empty tunnel. The two of them make their way back up to the surface beneath a starry sky, together. For a game from 1991 to even recognize that it could juxtapose a lonely, reflective moment with one of quiet compassion, to recognize the value in that was a testament to how far ahead of its time Metroid 2 really was. Unconventional, forward-thinking, avant-garde, all of this would come to define the Metroid series. In Samus Returns, the tunnel before the Queen is lousy with dozens of enemies, all of which you've already fought dozens of times, so numerous that the thought of taking a breath would never even occur to you. No, there are upgrades to find, Aeon powers to use, obstacles to overcome. It's indistinguishable from the rest of the game. 
heck, it's even reusing graphics! How about that last tunnel with the baby Metroid? The environment looks perfect, the music is perfect! But for some reason, the game still can't help but dump enemies all over the map. In a moment that should be so serene and reflective, you're still fighting the same old fight. This memorable moment that carried so much significance has been turned into a section of the map so ordinary that if I'd never played Metroid 2, I wouldn't have even thought to mention it. And given what Samus Returns is about to do, that is a damn shame. This should be the most tremendous, raucous, shocking moment in Samus Returns. And if the game had let you breathe, made you put your guard down, led you to believe that the fight was over, then it would have been. But instead, the actual build-up is, you fight through yet another horde of enemies while ill-fitting victory music plays, then walk by a set of totally inauspicious recharge points, then you step out into a world not under a starry night sky, but one blanketed by gloomy emerald thunderclouds as the music turns dark and sinister. So Ridley showing up doesn't land as any kind of surprise. It's more like, oh my, could it be? It is! Vince Russo has struck again! What a swerve! This exemplifies the difference between Return of Samus and Samus Returns. The remake introduces all kinds of new gameplay mechanics and modern flourishes, and for the most part, it pulls that stuff off with aplomb. But tonally, atmospherically, fundamentally, Samus Returns does not feel like Metroid 2. I'd go so far as to say that in moments like this, it has completely missed the point, as if the remake lacks understanding our reverence for what it's even a remake of. To put that another way, Samus Returns is not another Metroid 2 remake. I wanted to put as much distance as I could between myself and AM2R before I made this episode. I haven't touched it, I haven't watched my own episode about it, I've tried not to think about it, because I knew that if I was too hasty, I wouldn't be able to help but compare this officially licensed remake to that decade-plus labor of love, and it'd be hard to judge Nintendo's effort on its own merits. But when it comes to this tunnel, this moment, this poignant epilogue, I have no choice but to compare AM2R, a remake that nailed it, to Samus Returns, a remake that did not. The dichotomy of these two completely different approaches to modernizing Metroid 2 is fascinating. My initial read on Metroid 2 was that of a swashbuckling action-adventure to take down the Metroids. My perspective was shaped by a lifelong love of games like that. It's what appealed to me about Metroid 2, so that's what I saw in it. I would be enlightened by some wonderful commenters, this one in particular, who pointed out that in all my excitement for happy fun times with video games, I had missed the tone the game was going for. Through that prism, Return of Samus was not a bombastic romp. It was a tension-filled adventure, one that wordlessly yet effectively communicated why executing this scourge seemed like such a necessity, all of which makes Samus's actions in the end all the more merciful. Of course, this is still a 1991 Game Boy game. It's open to interpretation, and I don't see anything wrong with appreciating it as both a challenging, exciting action game and a progressive example of subtextual storytelling. But AM2R seemed to strive for balance in those perspectives. It was reverential to its source material in a way that rarely rings true without the passion and devotion of fandom. While Samus Returns falls back on the same couple of repetitive enemies, AM2R incorporates so much more of the series' lore, especially elements from Fusion, for incredible fan service that fits. AM2R evolved Metroid 2 without losing sight of what made it special. Samus Returns, on the other hand, seems more in line with my initial read of the game. It is a far more action-packed and challenge-focused take on the 2D Metroid formula. While AM2R strives to represent all the best elements of what came before, Samus Returns strives for something new. And it should try something new. You remember what I said earlier? Unconventional, forward-thinking, avant-garde? Metroid games have always endeavored to be contemporary. In terms of its in-universe world-building and storytelling, in terms of mechanics and gameplay, nothing is nostalgic for its own sake. Isn't that why Metroid Prime was so revered? Retro Studios ignored conventional wisdom and mixed a perspective associated with high-octane shooters with the complexity and world-building of an adventure game. 
the result was a revolutionary title that seemed at least a generation ahead of its time. Super Metroid took the established framework of its predecessors and evolved those concepts further than perhaps any other game of its era. Fusion was willing to corrupt that formula and stand on its own. Zero Mission wasn't afraid to wonder, what if? What if the original Metroid had come out 18 years later than it actually did? The result didn't look the same, didn't feel the same, didn't play the same, was not tonally the same, but it was a worthy successor all the same. Samus Returns may be a remake, but it is not a throwback. Just like another game with Returns in the title, it is bold enough to try to make Metroid magic again. That'd be commendable in any age. Even more so when the series has been gone this long. Even more so at a time when pop culture is practically defined by nostalgia. Because here's the thing. For all I've said about how poorly Samus Returns represents the tone of the game that it's remaking, and what a disservice that does to its climactic moments and its final surprise, the actual gameplay of that fight is exceptional. If Diggernaut was a great example of a non-traditional Metroid boss fight, then Ridley, quite appropriately, is a modern take on the old school. I don't think he's ever felt so dangerous, so enraged, so unhinged. You have to be just as tenacious, dodging his attacks and returning fire, because a single misstep can wreck you. The arena itself is enormous, and given Samus's vertical maneuverability, you're both free to take to the skies to evade and fight. The battle progresses through three distinct phases, and as it goes on, Ridley's theme and his onslaught become more and more frenzied. The phases are split up with brutal, flashy cutscenes, depicting Samus getting waylaid by Ridley, only to be saved by the Metroid itself. From that point on, it starts actually helping her out in the fight, and that is such a perfect, heartwarming detail. I love this little guy more than ever, and I don't know how I'm ever going to play through Super again. Ridley's appearance even serves something of a narrative purpose, bridging the gap between his meta phase in the Prime Trilogy and his return to pure organics in Super, which, hey, finally canonizes the Prime Trilogy. Although, wait, crap, no. The power grip isn't listed in the upgrade menu. So, phooey, looks like this one's non-canon too. <laughs> For real, though. This is my favorite Ridley fight, and maybe even my favorite overall boss fight in the entire Metroid series. Samus Returns definitely doesn't capture the same atmosphere of the game it's remaking, and it even misses the point of some of its most special moments. But there is more to Metroid than ambience. Challenge, combat, tension, release, gameplay! This is where Samus Returns focuses, and this is where it excels. I'm sure it helps, of course, that all of these things have a ton of overlap with what I personally like about video games. I can appreciate the atmosphere and the storytelling and all that, but I'm always here for the gameplay. Now, Samus Returns does stumble in places even on that front. Repetitive enemies, an uneven difficulty curve, complex controls, and a melee counter that, yes, could stand to be a little more interesting. Just like the original Metroid 2, it does a lot of new things, but comes out with a few rough edges. And just like Metroid 2, a sequel in this style could shore up every last one of them and then some. And man, I hope we get a sequel. And man, I hope it's not a remake. Come on, it's been 18 years since Metroid 4. It's way past time for Metroid 5. Whether AM2R or Samus Returns is the better game is of course a matter of opinion, and while I know which way I'm leaning, it's something I'll figure out when I finally play AM2R again. But squabbling over which remake is better is quite frankly uninteresting to me. What I'm sure of is something more valuable. The worst thing Samus Returns could have been is a lesser version of the same thing. But Samus Returns is not another Metroid 2 remake, and it is not just another Metroid game. But that's exactly what has made this series what it is. It doesn't get any more Metroid than that. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. The worst thing Samus Returns could... Opal. This is the first Metroid game. The primordial form of not just one of the most revered franchises in gaming history, but of an entire genre. It's the original. Well, sort of. Metroid for the Nintendo Entertainment System, released in August of 1987, was, technically, a port of Metroid for the Famicom Disk System, released one year prior in 1986. 
the cartridge version drops the extra sound channel, loses the save system, and introduces a few random bugs, emphasis on random, but it also loses the load times and adds a password system. But to be a little more personal, this isn't just the first Metroid game. It was the first Metroid game that I ever bought for myself. Why? Because you see, by the mid-2000s, the internet and all of gaming culture was inundated with unrestrained, unchallenged, untempered nostalgia for the NES era. And, despite missing the entirety of it due to a critical existence failure, I felt like it was my duty as a real gamer to own it, nay, to love it. So on a midsummer mall trip with my friends, I peeled off to GameStop and got this cartridge. Incidentally, I also bought this poster. Yeah, being a so-called real gamer was a big part of my identity as a teenager. I mean, obviously it still is now, but it was back then too. But this was gonna prove my cred. Oh, you casuals might think you're happy with your fancy halos and your GTAs, but stuff like that's just not gonna satisfy the tastes, the standards of true, hardcore gamers like me. Eh -eh. Cause guys like us, we know true greatness comes from gameplay. True art comes from limitations. At least that's what guys a decade older than me on the internet said. Anyway, I think I played it for like 20 minutes at the most. Honestly, I wasn't even particularly surprised by that. It had happened so many times. I would hear someone online describe an NES classic as one of the greatest games ever made. Then I'd get the game, and bereft of context, I would set the controller down a few minutes later, feeling like I was missing something. This was my first Metroid video. I made it more than a decade after that day at the mall. But as much as I had grown up in that time, I was still largely missing that very same something. Perspective. I still struggled to see something older than me in the context of its own time. And maybe nobody really can do that, but that first Metroid video was teeming with early installment weirdness. While I would sort of figure it out as I went along, at this point I didn't have a solid handle on what I wanted a video on a Metroid game to even be. Because of all that, I've increasingly come to think of this episode as a bit of a blemish on my Metroid series. I made criticisms out to be worse than they really were because I pushed up against the game's intentions. I critiqued it through the lens of the time I grew up in and gave very little grace to the time it was released. I refused to take the manual suggestion of drawing a map to heart, dismissing the notion out of hand as a waste of time and a sign of how outdated the game really was. But I'm not who I used to be. Let's run this back again, the right way this time. No ROM hacks, no emulators. I'm gonna play it on this cartridge, the same one I bought at the mall all those years ago. I'm gonna be as authentic as I can be. Which, it turned out, required more boiling water than you'd think. If you know, you know. I wanna try to experience Metroid the way my mom would have when she was my age. I want to give myself that context. I want to see if I can appreciate Metroid the way those NES kids did, to try and see what they saw in it. I want to... Oh. I'm still trying to prove my cred, aren't I? Oh god. I don't know if anyone's ever noticed this, I am pretty subtle about it, but I'm real big on historical context. It is one thing to review a game, and of course that's valuable in and of itself, but a retrospective is different. I want to try to frame where Metroid fits in the tapestry of gaming history, but that is a lot harder to do when it's a history that predates me. So to give myself some context, I decided to start by playing some other games that were released in 1986. I started with Yu Suzuki's seminal arcade masterpiece, OutRun, likely the pinnacle of what was technically possible at the time. This is a title that strikes every note it hits with grace and perfection. This didn't seem fair to other games, so I switched over to the quote-unquote real Super Mario Bros. 2, and can I just say, man this game gets an undeservedly bad rep. In Japan at the time, you could literally go into a convenience store, put a rewritable disc into a kiosk, and load Super Mario 2 onto it for the equivalent of about $5. It was basically the 80s version of hard mode DLC for players who had mastered the original game. And there were a lot of Japanese players who had. 
Actually, Metroid also originally came out for the disc system, and it's just as much of an action game as it is an adventure. So wanting to focus in on that genre, I played what was an arguably Nintendo's most important release of 1986, The Legend of Zelda. This cartridge actually has a similar backstory to Metroid's. I got it because the internet made it sound like a masterpiece, but I played it and didn't initially understand why. The difference is, I came around on Zelda way back in the Wii era, but it meant a lot to finally finish the game on this cartridge. I can't believe it still holds a save. It's probably older than I am. Finally, in the spirit of experiencing 1986 through my mom's eyes, I asked her what her favorite game that year was. King's Quest III, To Air is Human. In the parlance of the 80s, this was considered to be the same genre as Zelda, an adventure game. But its mechanics, its systems, its game design philosophy is all totally different. East versus West, console versus PC. What they do share, though, is a seemingly intentional reliance on exceedingly esoteric progression. Our action games in the 80s demanded twitch reflexes, pattern recognition, and mechanical knowledge, adventure games seemed to be designed for collaboration over a long period of time, for a group of close colleagues helping each other toward a solution. The ideal way to play King's Quest was the way my mom did. After, and sometimes during work, on the IBM PCs you and your colleagues are supposed to be using for work. Just like the ideal way to experience Zelda is to play it with your friends for the entire length of one elementary school year. Between 1986 and 1989. In a world before the internet. Or at least before the web. It's easy to see why the adventure genre isn't what it used to be. Designing a game as an intricate, albeit esoteric, puzzle to be solved doesn't make a lot of sense when the player can be assumed to have all the information in the world at their fingertips. That ideal, for better or worse, is impossible to experience in the internet age. But this is the world that Metroid was meant for. So, as much as possible, I'm going to try to ensconce myself in an 80s bubble for this playthrough. All I get is the game and the manual. No online guides, no outside help, the only map I can use is the one that I give myself. Of course, I guess the experience is already kind of spoiled, it's not like I didn't beat Metroid back in 2016, but I don't retain much of it at this point. But you know, funny thing about learning. The more you work with information, the easier it is to recall. It would be easy to pull up a map and navigate through the game, but I very quickly noticed that the simple act of drawing those lines myself was a billion times more effective at helping me retain it. The other major difference I noticed early in my playthrough was also tied to that 80s authenticity. In 2016, I played Metroid on an emulator. Bright colors and crystal clear clarity rendered every pixel as flat as they could be. But on a CRT, those pixels are blended the way they were intended to be. The electron beam rendering the image isn't even firing for those pitch black backgrounds, whereas every other detail on screen is literally bursting with light. Through the display tech it was made for, a game with art as simple as Metroid's gains a shape and a texture that was frankly obliterated when you could just see it for what it was. It's far from the best looking game of its time, it is still very simple. But in an era where most games were colorful and cartoony by necessity, this is absolutely one of the most distinct. The world art is dense and varied across locations. Enemies all have unique animations and clear designs. I love how Screes, for instance, will vary their rotation, doing a little wind-up before they dive-bomb you. And then there's the Chozo statues. These things are drawn so much more intricately than everything else that they feel appropriately alien like someone or something with a higher brain pattern left them here. But there is one major issue I have with the visuals, and unfortunately you've been looking at it the whole time. The game looks so distinct for the era it was released in, and then there's Samus. With her odd proportions, giant head, and janky running animation, she's neither detailed enough nor stylized enough to look convincingly human. It's like she's a little of both, but not enough of either. To put a finer point on it, the player character is probably the worst-looking, worst-animating thing in the game. 
Which, given she's the only thing guaranteed to be on screen anytime the game is happening, isn't exactly ideal. Given the NES's limitations, maybe part of it was necessary to get unique sprites for firing and not firing in different directions. But it is still quite a mark in an otherwise very visually coherent game. So the first thing you do in Metroid is go left and get the Morph Ball. Before I ever played it, I somehow knew that, like it was passed down to me by cultural osmosis. It wasn't something I ever thought about. So let's think about it. In a world where Mario had so recently standardized the idea that if you're playing a side-scrolling action game, the goal is always to the right, to the point that you couldn't even go left if you wanted to, Metroid needed to dedicate itself to teach the player differently. So if you do try to just play it like it's Mario and head right, you'll get blocked after a few rooms and need to backtrack. And I know this seems like the most basic thing in the world now, but it's the first lesson this genre ever teaches. Progression is non-linear. Search out upgrades that let you perform new actions, which will let you keep finding things. But what I noticed when I Mind Palace myself as an 80s kid was that if that lesson didn't take, if I got the Morph Ball then just kept proceeding right whenever I saw a door, I would quickly find myself heading to Norfair way before I was supposed to be there. The music swaps from the adventurous Brinstar theme to something a lot more threatening. The enemies are suddenly so much more aggressive, and it doesn't take long before... Like Zelda, Metroid will technically let you go places before you really should. Instead of blocking you off, it just kicks your ass. Later games would tend to make these soft blocks a lot harder, but here the game doesn't push back so obviously. It gives you the freedom to fail. This makes the world feel harsh and hostile, as Samus, and therefore the player, is currently unable to overcome it. And I'm pretty sure this was the point where my initial playthrough in 2004, and probably a lot of other people's before and since, came to an end. The game is so open it's very easy to stumble into something you're not ready for. How was I supposed to know that I needed to explore Brinstar to boost Samus's power? Oh yeah, that's how. In the mid-80s, games were rapidly becoming deeper and more complex, but the hardware they were built for was so precision engineered for gameplay that most relevant information would, by necessity, be relegated to instruction manuals. This was really the beginning of a golden era for pack-ins, especially for adventure games. They weren't just a bonus, they were a necessity, and developers used them to enrich their worlds, making games with the expectation that players would want to see this. But by the time I was around, the first NES games I remember seeing for sale didn't look like this. They looked like this. And they still do, for the most part, look like this. I think this is one reason early gaming history has sometimes seemed to age worse than it really has. Even when publishers make manuals available for old games, they tend to do it via QR codes. Does anybody actually use these? It's been decades now since devs expected players to read instruction manuals, and a lot of people just don't. And honestly, even then, I'm sure a lot of people just didn't. Reading is unfortunately a chore to a lot of people. But it never was to me. So I hung around Brinstar, crisscrossed the map a few times as I charted it, and got powered up. A fun moment of recollection was when I came across the first E-Tank, and remembered what a godsend it was to happen upon it back in 2016. Speaking of, I also made sure to note the location of a few useful enemy spawners near the start point. Another similarity between Zelda and Metroid is this. When the game starts, you can't take too many hits. You can find power-ups to increase your health. If you die, your max health remains the same, but you always start back at that base level. In both cases, I think the intent was to incentivize the player to... well, to not die for one thing, but also to participate. Contrary to most games of this era, there is no live system. You have infinite chances. But that doesn't mean there aren't penalties for losing. And those penalties function within each game's design goals. Either fight enemies and get random drops, or explore to find areas where you can get an easier fill-up. And then, this is important, remember where they are. This is, of course, an egregiously antiquated philosophy, and if you've seen my 2016 episode, you'll know that I know firsthand how frustrating it can be. Games don't often punish you for failure in any significant way anymore, let alone making you restart from a weaker position. Still, this is one of the things I regret most about my original video. I died, restarted, 
And then, rather than just finding a spawner or building up my energy as I went, I chose to tediously run back and forth through a single room, and timed how long it took me to build back to max health. I refused to engage with Metroid systems as intended, made a show of playing it wrong on purpose, and then acted like that was the game's fault. This is what I'm expected to do every single time I die. Forget about not having a map, forget about a lack of conveyance, the fact that you have to do this to even have a chance to get lost in this world is the biggest problem I have with Metroid. Believe it or not, I didn't do it with ill intent, I just learned the wrong lesson. Encountering something I was so unprepared for made me trepidatious of exploring without max health, meaning I was too scared to push forward without it. I didn't need to be. Brinstar is very easy and breezy. All that being said, it would have been nice if Metroid had something comparable to the Great Fairy Fountains, an area specifically dedicated to getting a recharge. As it is, E-Tanks serve a somewhat similar function. They don't just give you an extra set of energy, they completely top you off. But they're single use. There's a tank hidden right near the starting point that requires quite a few upgrades to get, and it would be a godsend if it would top you off every time. But I hesitated to pick it up because I knew I would only be able to use it once. I suppose in a macro sense, the replay value in Metroid comes down to playing it more efficiently. It was, after all, one of the first games to ever offer multiple endings based on how fast you beat it. Getting good enough and knowledgeable enough to avoid the time sink enemy spawners, and knowing when to take an E-Tank, that all might just be intended as part of that process. Still, Zelda did this with a little more finesse. During the power-up process, I also bombed down here and got the Ice Beam. Enemies in Metroid 1 are particularly spongy, but they have hit stun, and pause when they're hurt anyway. And shooting a frozen enemy doesn't actually hurt it, it just unfreezes it. So the Ice Beam lets you use enemies as platforms, but it also makes killing everything take twice as many shots as it needs to. So I decided, you know, maybe I'm better off without it for now. I reset the game and did the whole Brinstar collection process again, skipping the Ice Beam this time. I would come to regret that. So, with the Morph Ball, bombs, two E-Tanks, two missile upgrades, and no Ice Beam in tow, well, now I've got a choice to make. I found two elevators. One goes to Norfair, which I know is intimidating from experience. The other one is actively trying to intimidate me with Kraid's big ugly visage. The goal of the game is to seek and destroy two bosses, Ridley and Kraid, which builds a bridge in the bridge room, which allows you to get to the final area. There's no wrong answer from this point. I can bomb through these blocks and try to find Kraid, I could go explore Norfair power up there and then come back for Kraid, or I could even try to make a beeline for Ridley. Most Metroid games are pretty open-ended, but they have a clear intended path for the first-time player. For Metroid 1, though, the game is so open that there's really no such thing as a sequence break. You're fully expected to chart your own path through it, and then come back and refine that path until you can get the best ending. But for this playthrough, I don't know if you've clocked this, but I'm in no hurry. So I decided to doodle on over to Norfair first, and find out if, with all these upgrades, maybe I'd have a better time. I did not have a better time. So you know how the manual makes a cute little tee-hee suggestion that you might, if you're so inclined, if you wanted to, maybe you could make your own map? Wouldn't that be fun? No. Norfair is the point where it became clear to me that they were being too nice. They needed to just replace that whole paragraph with a 72-point font screaming, you, you need, need to make, to make a, a map. map. And heck, Zelda came with a map. There was precedent for this. Metroid could have had a fold-out map in the box, with Brinstar partly filled in, and room for the player to draw everything else. Because yeah, buddy, you need a map. And I don't think I really understood why or how much until I actually had one. So many rooms in this game are copies of each other. Sometimes they're slightly different, and sometimes they're not different at all. A suspicious alcove might suggest a secret, but then you check it and find nothing. And then later, you'll come through what seems and looks and feels like the exact same place, but this time, there is something there. The effect had me darting my eyes from the screen to the map even as it was, trying to keep track of where I was. If I was just trying to make it without one, and I have, it would be absolutely confounding, 
And it is! You really can't just rely on your own sense of direction in Metroid. And I don't think this degree of that problem was really intended. Most NES games released after 1986 would include special chips inside the cartridges that would beef up the console's capabilities. But as a disk system game, Metroid could only take advantage of that add-on's capabilities. The NES hardware as designed was built with one goal in mind. To play a mean game of Donkey Kong, as Jeremy Parrish puts it. So a game as complex as Metroid was punching well above its weight. In a 2017 interview with Game Informer, Metroid frontman Yoshio Sakamoto said he was essentially strong-armed onto the team so he could save the project late in development. I realized that the release date was right around the corner, but the project had nothing there. Even with our limited resources and time, I figured out how we could leverage the existing components of the game to create variation and an exciting experience. Essentially, it sounds like part of the reason the map design becomes so much more esoteric once you get out of Brinstar is because they were crunching up against limitations, both technical and chronological. Metroid reuses and remixes map design for the same reason Mario did, for the same reason Zelda did, because it was a necessity given the limitations of the hardware. Sakamoto's team just doesn't seem to have had the time to pull it off with the finesse of Miyamoto's. Looking at Metroid through the lens of its contemporaries, this probably is my biggest critique of it. I don't mind drawing a map anymore, but doing it has laid bare how little variation there actually is with these layouts. Which means even if you do keep track of where you are, moment-to-moment -moment traversal within the same region is incredibly samey. It's less a remix of assets and more a repetition. I mean, you could know this game like the back of your hand, and you couldn't tell me for sure where I am right now. And just to measure this point, I'm not criticizing the layout of these rooms, only their repetition. The way upgrades are placed is actually... well, here's an example. I hit the ground in Norfair and, like I said, immediately had a bad time. The beefed-up enemies were still overwhelming me, and every road I scratched and clawed my way down seemed like a dead end. I just kept saying, I should have got the ice beam. I should have got the ice beam. I should have got the ice beam! I was about to begrudgingly head back to Brinstar and, you know, get the ice beam when I discovered something. Well, I'll be honest, discovered isn't really the right word. More accurately, I remembered something. A piece of forbidden knowledge that I shouldn't temporally be able to know in my simulated 1986. An image from the future flashed in my brain of a remake of Metroid 1 from the next millennium, and I realized, hey, aren't the high jump boots down there? <gasps> they are. And now that I've got them, isn't the ice beam supposed to be up that away? Unfortunately, I was blocked off from getting where I thought it was by the very fact that I didn't have it. But there's a little more tunnel up there. I was able to circumnavigate the top of the map and come out behind the Chozo statue. Finally, finally getting the ice beam that I was so sure I didn't want. There are actually two of them. If you missed the one in Brinstar, you can still find this one in Norfair. Even if its room layouts can be repetitive and a bit labyrinthian, Metroid's map design shows an impressive amount of forethought, accounting for and enhancing the game's open structure. And I found so many missile upgrades while I was scrounging around Norfair that the slowness of the ice beam doesn't seem like nearly as much of a liability now. There is a phenomenon that I've experienced so many times, and you probably have too. You get in on the ground floor of a brand new series, and you fall absolutely head over heels for it. And then a few years later, the sequel is even better, building onto that strong foundation and adding new features that you didn't even know you wanted. So you stick with the franchise over the next decade or so, you're an OG fan getting to see it grow and evolve, and then one day, you come across a much newer fan who thinks that original game that started it all, that means so much to you, that game sucks. Or maybe you've been on the other side. You fall in love with the series and delve into its back catalog, only to find the earlier games much harder to get into. I've been on either side of this so many times and with so many games. When you get into the first entry in a new series, you can't miss what's not there. You can only appreciate what's added later. But if you discover a franchise on its, like, fourth or fifth entry, it's often the exact opposite. You go back to the earlier games and you can't help but feel like something's missing. Modern day Samus can aim in 360 degrees, parry incoming attacks, freely swap her loadout, and can be kitted out with such a ridiculous range of upgrades and abilities that they'd make 80s kids' heads explode. But in Metroid 1, Samus can fire straight forward, but get ready, she can also fire straight up. 
future titles would refine and expand even this basic moveset to the point that even if you've played just one game ahead of this one, going back to it is gonna feel limiting. And of course I can't totally remove myself from all that, but let's try to consider Metroid's core design on its own merits. The interface is clean. Unlike a lot of NES games, there's not a big status bar cluttering up the space. And Samus herself is very small on the screen, making it clear that the real star is the world around her. Samus's jump arc is long, slow, and floaty, and while her movement can be a little slippery, it's easy enough to get a handle on it. Broadly speaking, game design is always trending easier, and one of the ways gaming got easier in the 16-bit era was to give the player's base abilities more capability. Your whip, your sword, your gun, your arm cannon can overcome things that they couldn't in the 8-bit days. And by the way, as a kid who started gaming in the mid-90s, this was one of my biggest barriers to getting into NES games. I started with a Mega Man who could do this, and this, and this. So it was hard not to feel like a whole lot was missing when all the old Mega Man could do was this. But what was often muddled, if not lost, in the transition was how those limitations could encourage the player to engage with the game's other mechanics. The first time I played Metroid, I wondered why in the world there were enemies too short for me to hit, and in the very first room. Why can't I jump and shoot straight down? Or aim diagonally? But it's for a lot of good reasons. In this room, I'll learn that some enemies can crawl on walls and ceilings. I learned that I can use the terrain to my advantage. And it won't be long before... How many times in any other Metroid game do you use bombs on offense when an enemy doesn't expressly demand it? How often do you duck out of enemy attacks with the Morph Ball? How often does getting the Wave Beam actually matter? I'm not saying future games are inferior to this one by any means. Just that this original slate of power-ups was tied to what Samus could do here. Seeing how they stack up in that context makes me appreciate them more than I ever did before. Especially this one! The screw attack is almost always one of the endgame upgrades, and with good reason. But the original Metroid is so open, the idea of an endgame is more of a suggestion. And I found it early. It always feels like a cheat. Like you're breaking the game in the best way, and never more so than here. It's no wonder it went on to become as literally iconic as it is. With the screw attack in tow, I decided I'd gotten all I could out of Norfair for now, so I headed back up to Brinstar to grab a few more things, most notably the Varia suit. Early on, Metroid's design is so tense and hostile, but as you build Samus' power, you start to tip the scales in the other direction. That contrast between where you started and where you can get, the difference between the first time I came into this room and how it felt to do it this time. That kind of thing has always been one of my favorite things about Metroid. Now I was feeling confident and sure-footed. I knew this world. I was charting this world. And I could overcome this world. With that, I set my sights on Kraid. Before any of this, before I started covering Metroid for this channel, before I ever bought Super on the Virtual Console, before Metroid Prime was even released, before I knew, let alone loved, almost anything else about this series, I knew and loved this song. And you know why? Hail to the Kingmaker, baby. While there's a lot about this game that benefits from my self-imposed 80s nostalgia filter, the sound design is as strong as it ever was. Hirokazu Hip Tanaka is a living legend of video game composition, but in Metroid's case, he actually wanted to push back on the trend of game music that sounded like game music. He tried to write music that matched the world within the game, rather than scoring the action of playing it. Metroid is notably far moodier than its contemporaries, as Tanaka strived to make the sound design itself, as he described it, a living creature, with no wall between music and sound effect. The pitter-patter of Samus's footsteps, the shrieks of the Zebezian wildlife, the whoosh of the missile launcher. It's all so distinct, even more so if you're playing the Famicom Disk System version, which enables a richer texture for the sound design. Tanaka had enough pull that he even insisted that some of the game's graphics be altered to fit his perspective, blending aesthetic into atmosphere. The more I learn and the more I play, 
the more I realize Zebus itself really is the main character of the original Metroid. Where Norfair pumps up the difficulty by throwing much stronger enemies at you, Kraid's lair makes them way more plentiful. Enemy spawners are no longer a means to restock, they're a hazard unto themselves. And they're placed right next to doors so often that even if you know to watch out for it, even if you're trying to be careful, you'll still get hit by things during screen transitions. Yeah, there's no way this wasn't intentional. At least I got the Varia. And if Norfair was bad about recycling rooms, Kraid is basically running his own recycling center. Look at this. I drew this one identical room seven times! Here's a tip. If you drop in and go through the first missile door you see, just stop right here. Continuing forward is a pointless waste of time, leading only to a pair of columns connected by three of those seven identical rooms. The lair seems built to confuse and confound the player, with tons of looping sections and dead ends. In fact, a cool little flourish happens here. The game gives every indication that you have found the way forward. A fake floor drops you down a long tunnel, then a well-hidden passage leads even deeper. And as you reach what seems to be the depths of the lair, you find Kraid. But guess what? It's a fake! I wonder how many players were fooled in the 80s. Fake Kraid is actually much harder to get to than the real one. From the first tunnel, just go through this door, drop down the room with the sadistic block tower, head to the left, and there you'll find Kraid. And that's all you really need to do here. There are no major upgrades, just a few E-tanks and missiles. And even those aren't too much of a detour if you know where to look. IF you know where to look. I was musing earlier, Metroid's replay value comes from how much more efficient you can be on a second, third, fourth time through. And as much time as I'm taking on this playthrough, standing still and letting the music play while I write, exploring every nook and cranny of Zebus, and putting it all on paper, I have to say, I'm kinda surprised at how much I'm looking forward to the next. The build-up to Kraid is nicely done. The fight against him is... nothing to write home about. He just scuttles back and forth launching projectiles. As someone who played Super first, I was always surprised that this much smaller, original version of Kraid also launched claws out of his stomach. I mean, that kinda makes sense when you've got all this room to work with, but it's quite a creative leap to do it like this. Hang on, roll that back. Did I just download missiles? Yep, defeating either sub-boss dumps a metric ton of missile upgrades into your inventory, which is great for you as a player, but seems like a bit of an odd concession. The dev team knew they wanted multiple endings depending on how fast you got through, but they might not have had time to balance completion time with collection time, so maybe they did this to guarantee the player would have at least enough missiles to finish. Speaking of, I decided I wanted a password before I moved on, so... It's funny. Once I complained about how long it took to get health, and now I'm noticing how long it takes to lose it. And you have to get a game over to see the password screen. Or at least I thought you did when I did this. Turns out you can also pause the game, then hit up and A on the second controller to trigger the password, which will then dump you off at the beginning of the current area. Actually, this same trick works in Zelda, and would have been nice to know there too. But like, I only have one controller plugged in right now, and you know... I don't want to risk jostling the extremely precarious NES front-loading mechanism and losing my place. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. You're not going to play on original hardware. You're going to be smart and play these games on something with save states. Or at least something without such an egregious design flaw. But no, the market crashed and video games were a fad. And so now apparently Americans will only accept game consoles that look like VCRs. <laughs> Finally! There's this lengthy section of Norfair only accessible behind the high jump boots. I visited this area long enough to get the screw attack earlier, but when I came back to see if there was anything else I missed, well, the answer was yes! A lot, actually. And yet it all feels kind of tertiary. Like it's a scratch pad where a bunch of extra ideas ended up. And to be fair, plenty about Metroid belays a scattershot approach. Very few upgrades in Metroid are really hidden with intent, the way a future Metroid fan might expect them to be. Most of them are just sort of laying in the middle of random rooms. But there's just something different about this place. It's messy, and I kind of love it, but only kind of. Here, I happened upon the first instance of something that would become a staple for the series. An obstacle, just for a room or two, that's designed to frustrate the player, to make them wonder what in the world the dev team was thinking. And then the upgrade that solves the problem, making for a nicely cathartic moment of blasting through the tedium. Unfortunately, in this first attempt, the wave beam is so disjointed that it's not quite as cathartic as it could be. 
I keep missing things I'm standing right in front of, and it overwrote my ice beam, meaning I'm gonna have to go pick that up again before I can actually fight Metroids. And because the Wave Beam's projectiles are so slow, I'm really noticing how bad Metroid chugs when there are too many sprites on screen. But this is a problem that's actually much worse in the NES version. The Famicom Disk System adds 8 kilobytes of RAM for sprite and tile data. Which doesn't sound like much unless we remind ourselves that we're still pretending it's 1986. The disc version definitely still has slowed down, but it is noticeably snappier and more responsive moment to moment. But alright, enough messing around. It's time to take Ridley down! For the first of six billion times. Ridley's Lair is designed with more consideration, intent, and polish than anything since Brinstar. Upgrades are hidden behind secrets or skill challenges, instead of being placed somewhat haphazardly. In one case, an E-Tank is even used to bait the player. The map itself is teeming with variety, and layout reuse is kept to a minimum. Enemies, especially these Meta Knight-looking dudes, seem a lot more likely to drop large health and missile pickups. It's definitely not easy, but it's not frustrating. It's a fun challenge. Most of the time, Metroid feels like a struggle against the nature of Zebus. This place harbors no ill will toward you specifically, but you are encroaching on the natural order. Ridley's Lair is different. There are claustrophobic tunnels densely packed with aggressive enemies that target you directly. And yet this is no labyrinth. It's almost inevitable that a false floor or a mistimed jump will send Samus careening down deeper into the lair. It's almost as though Ridley wants to be found. Norfair and Kray do have plenty of unique attributes themselves, but what they lacked was this level of polish, of consideration. If the whole game was as well measured as this, I think it'd be easier for post-80s kids to get into it. Even when you hold it against other games of 1986, this first Metroid is a deeply flawed gem. But in between the cracks that scar its surface is a wellspring of depth and potential just waiting to be realized. And nowhere is that potential more obvious, or more realized, than here in Ridley's lair. The very first blowout between Samus and her most iconic rival. How strange is it? How hard would it have been to imagine back then? That a sub-boss of the first game would become the series' most recurring villain. That players across the decades would be struggling against this monstrosity for generations to come. Is anyone else starting to feel like we overtrained for this? You remember that trick I mentioned earlier, where you pause and hit up and A at the same time on the second controller? I've actually got two controllers plugged in now, so I can make use of it. Instead of climbing all the way back up to Brinstar, I can reset to the start of Ridley, go up, reset again to the start of Norfair, go up, and reset one more time to wind up all the way back at the beginning of the game. It's rudimentary one-way fast travel, at the cost of all your energy. At this point I noticed something kind of funny. The game has more E-Tanks than you actually need. Samus' health maxes out with six, leaving the other two as optional single-use recharge stations. Well, now I know I shouldn't have taken that E-Tank at the start. And I'll remember that. That centers it for me. Knowing where the E-Tanks are is as much a part of the long game as knowing when to take them. I've spent this playthrough drawing maps and writing scripts, there's no way I'm gonna get the good ending. But next time, next time. As I made my way to the top of Brinstar, across the bridge, and down to Torian, the mask of 1986 started to slip, and I couldn't help but consider Metroid's place in a wider context. To consider its place within the series, and how I came into it. When I considered buying Super Metroid on the Wii Virtual Console in 2007, I was worried that I wouldn't like it. Most of my favorite games were fairly straightforward, twitchy action games, and the idea of something with so much exploration and backtracking sounded on paper like it was going to be too far out of my range. I took a chance and hoped that it would click with me. And it did click with me. It clicked with me in a way that other games in this series had not, and in a way that most games in this genre still don't. In years down the road, the series as a whole would resonate with me to a degree that I still couldn't have anticipated. There's just something different about Metroid. I didn't know what it was in 2007, and I still didn't in 2016, and I still didn't really see it until now. To see Metroid stripped down to its raw, unpolished, unprocessed fundamentals, I finally see it. My first playthrough of a 2D Metroid game is always a good time, but in the long run it's almost... incidental. 
It's about reconnaissance, discovering where things are and testing the limits of what I can do with them. I've never gotten the good ending the first time through, and I don't think I'm really supposed to. But there is always another. And another. And another. I can be stronger. I can be faster. I can be better. I can sharpen my skill. The more I play, the more I know, the better I get, the faster I can be. And this right here is one of the first games that was ever designed with this intent. It doesn't just have unending. It incentivizes and rewards you for getting there faster. This is why Metroid games, and especially 2D Metroid games, are so sticky to me. They might not seem like it on the surface, but they actually do encapsulate so much of what I love about gaming. And you know what's gonna happen next time? I'm gonna blitz through Brinstar for upgrades. Kite a waiver up here to get the Varia suit early, ignore that labyrinth and beeline for Kraid, switch to Norfair and get the high jump, then drop into Ridley's lair, track him down and put him in his place one more time, warp back to the start and top up with that E-Tank, head to Torian, blast Mother Brain to smithereens, and earn my good ending. The ideal way to experience Metroid for the first time is unobtainable. I can never play it in 1986, but I can replay it as much as I want now. I can have this. And the funny thing is, a lot of the things I've criticized about the map layout and asset reuse are basically non-factors on a replay. If you were lucky enough to play it, beat it, and love it in the 80s, I'm sure that's the experience you remember. Because I remember so many of the games that I loved in the 90s the same way. Metroid the game is Metroid the series, and therefore Metroid the genre, in its purest, most primordial form. On its release in 1986, there was simply nothing else like it. Eight years later, it would fully realize its potential. And how lucky are we to live in a world where that's true? Plenty of NES-era concepts have fallen into obscurity, never refined, remembered only by those who were there at the time. But not this one. Metroid survived, thrived, flourished, and birthed a genre unto itself. But the original Metroid is one of those games where I suspect the majority of the people who get anywhere with it nowadays are YouTubers who want to talk about the whole franchise, kind of doing it out of obligation, as I was once. I definitely wouldn't recommend it to anyone who's only dabbled in the series, let alone somebody who's never played a Metroid game before. But if you're the kind of person who has taken the plunge, if you love this series like I do, and you want a first-hand appreciation for how it all started, break out the pen and paper, keep an open mind, and it just might surprise you. I'm glad I came back here and gave myself this experience. Over the next week, I'll be releasing Reduxes on the rest of the 2D series. None of them will be nearly as prolonged as this one, for better or worse. Then on December 25th, the season concludes with an hour and a half long critique of Metroid Dread. You can see that and all those videos early by backing me on my Patreon, but till then, you keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing. Thank you for watching. On a crisp autumn morning circa 1995, a kid named Jason let me play this game for a few fleeting moments before school. It was the first Metroid game I ever played. At least I think it was, it's been a minute. In 2016, I called it an epic, tarnished by time. And in the years since, something kind of funny happened. I never replayed this original Metroid 2, but my affection for it grew. Whenever I would look back on my time with it, I'd remember all the things I'd enjoyed about it. I'd remember how much of an improvement it was over the original in terms of control and polish. The difference five years made in gaming back then was incredible. I would remember the swashbuckling tone of the Surface theme, which is to this day my favorite song in a series overflowing with amazing music. I'd remember how fun and straightforward the Metroid battles were compared to the more drawn-out remakes, and the encroaching feeling of unease as I traveled deeper under the surface. I'd remember the strange, off-kilter nature of its horror, an ambience that neither remake, official or fan-made, could replicate. Honestly, I don't think either one could have replicated it. It was so defined by the Game Boy's limitations, Gunpei Yokoi's design philosophy was lateral thinking with withered technology, and that's where Metroid 2 lives. It's like the difference between watching a scary movie on a bright, crisp modern television 
versus watching a worn down VHS with the flickering of that cathode ray tube the only thing illuminating the room. But the memory that endured more than any other was Metroid 2's finale. A long, lonely trek down a tunnel devoid of life, a fierce fight against the beastly Queen Metroid, and an ending so poignant and so beautiful and such a reprieve from all the tension that had come before that it forever altered the trajectory of the Metroid series. Having not played it in nearly seven years, I remembered all the ways that Metroid 2 was an epic. But I forgot the tarnish. I forgot how much of your time in Metroid 2 involves negotiating your way through a corridor, getting to a room at the end, killing a boss you've killed ten times before, then turning around and going right back the way you came. I forgot how easy it is to overlook, heck, to never even see a hidden path and a high ceiling in one of those boss rooms, and lose an entire hour running around in circles trying to figure out what you missed. It may be more linear, but it still requires you to circumnavigate back and forth through unnecessarily convoluted paths, to remember where pits of deadly acid used to be, and to remember which pits you've been down before in order to just make progression. But it's not like the game has changed. I just spent so long not playing it that I accidentally nostalgia bombed myself. In 2016, I played Metroid 2 on an emulator and freely consulted maps and guides if I got stuck. I wanted it to have the best chance to make the best impression that it could. But in 2023, just like with the last video, I went for authenticity. I allowed myself no outside help. I got lost. I got turned around. I completely missed both the high jump boots and the screw attack because I forgot they were even in the game, which made the Queen Metroid into an absolute nightmare that took many, many attempts to overcome. I played the game on real hardware, on a real cartridge a cartridge that once belonged to someone named Ruth. I have not suddenly become anti-emulation since 2016. Emulation is what made those original episodes possible, made my love of this series possible, and gave me the incentive to want to buy Ruth's once-owned copy of Metroid 2. I just used to be a guy who was interested in Metroid from a distance. In a sense, I guess I'd been that guy since 1995. But through that process, I became a fan. And that's definitely influencing me too. In 2016, I compared Metroid 2 primarily to its predecessor, which I had played immediately before it. But now, whether I like it or not, I can't help but compare Metroid 2 to how much I now know about the rest of the series, and more particularly to its own remakes. Two titles that are uniquely exemplary in unique ways. Whenever I got lost in the Game Boy game, I had this strange sense of uncanny familiarity. Three alternate universe versions of the same adventure overlapping on my sense of navigation. I don't think it's all that unusual for some people to pick up a game they haven't played in a long time and find that it doesn't hit the same, but it is very unusual for me. Most of my favorite games are ones that prioritize and emphasize replay value, so I never tend to go more than a year or two without replaying them. It's not often that my memory of what a game is gets so out of sync with what it actually is. But coming back to Metroid 2, my nostalgic memories of it clashed so terribly with what the game was actually like that I found myself questioning how much of that tarnish should really be blamed on time. So I decided to pause the video here, put my money where my mouth was, and re-replay Metroid 2. I played it again. My desire for authenticity had only grown stronger, so this time I decided to try and replicate the experience I might have had if Jason had let me borrow his copy that day. To that end, I played on the Super Game Boy, an official device that lets you play Game Boy games on a Super NES. In fact, the first time I ever saw Samus Aran was right here in this commercial. I also allowed myself the use of one source of outside help, a book I actually did have in elementary school, Nintendo's official player's guide for the Super Game Boy. This thing freaking rules, by the way. Maybe this is a hot take, but I did not like the original Game Boy. That DMG screen was so dark and so prone to ghosting, this was the only way I could really stand to play Game Boy games before the Pocket came out. Among lots and lots of other fun features, the Super Game Boy lets you customize the colors. There are other videos on Metroid 2 out there, but in how many can you see the Queen Metroid fight with Nintendo's official color palette? More importantly, this book gave me exactly the right amount of information. It told me which areas had which upgrades, but not exactly where those upgrades were. I still had to find them myself, but I was no longer in danger of moving on without them. Having the high jump boots especially made the extremely vertical back half of the game so much more palatable. 
I find I'm a bit torn. On the one hand, I kind of love the coarseness of the early Metroid games, how they would just let you skip upgrades like this and not even give you a clue. But on the other hand, something so critical to the map design probably shouldn't have been the sort of thing that a player could have reasonably missed. Like, it's fine if you want to give me a way to sequence break past it, but don't make it something that I could so easily miss in the course of regular progression. Metroid would eventually get better about this, but it was still very early days here. But hey, if you think you don't like a game, just replay it until you do. I was having a way better time. I was in the groove, in the zone, and it didn't seem like long before I had just one more Metroid to go before the end. So here we go. Whittling him down, tanking his attacks, and... I ran out of missiles. I... I was two missiles away from beating him and I ran out of missiles! Oh yeah, I was so mad I went back and looked at my footage and counted. In any other Metroid game, this wouldn't be a big deal. Just pop out of the room, blast a few baddies, restock your set, but no. In Metroid 2, enemies in this last area insistently do not drop missiles. And even if they did, killing an Omega Metroid takes so many that this wouldn't really be feasible. No, the fastest thing I could think of was to wander all the way back to two areas ago, climb up here to make contact with this missile battery, and then go all the way back. This detour took almost 20 minutes. Okay, hang on. I wrote this script back in June. And then I made a couple of other much more time-consuming videos, and now I'm back here recording for it, and I am having just the strangest sense of deja vu. Did I have this exact same issue in my original video seven years ago? This is too weird, I have to check. Here's the problem. There's almost nothing in this penultimate section of the game. Very few enemies to resupply with, absolutely no item upgrades, and no recharge stations. The Omega Metroids take so many hits, it's unreasonable to think that a player would be able to do this without heading all the way back to the last recharge. And that is a lengthy expedition. It took 15 minutes round trip. Oh my god. <laughs> I knew I'd forgotten the tarnish, but this is just sad. Man, that really tells you just how big of a problem this was for me. I accidentally plagiarized myself. How trendy. So, despite having a better experience on my second second go-around, I found myself coming back to the same question. How much of this tarnish is the result of time? And how much of it was always there? This is a search action game where progression isn't gated by equipment upgrades or ability unlocks. It's gated by boss fights. And that means lots and lots and lots of recycled boss fights. This is something that both of Metroid 2's remakes struggle to overcome. For what it's worth, I still think the Game Boy original handles that aspect better than either of them, making the fights themselves relatively quick and painless, rather than designing a bigger, badder boss and making the player do that over and over again. Aside from the Omegas, the challenge should be more to find the Metroids, not to repeat the same prolonged fights against them. But both remakes still manage to build a better Metroid game around that structure. And quite frankly, in spite of that structure. To tell the truth, I kind of hate that I feel this way about Metroid 2 now. I often, too often, find myself in the position of advocating for old school game design, trying to contextualize why this is the way it is, trying to relate how best to approach and hopefully even appreciate the sort of withered technology that I remember being so cutting edge. But it's funny. I used to have no problem saying a game was superannuated, breaking down why I thought someone else's childhood memories didn't hold up to scrutiny. But now it almost goes against my conception of myself to concede that sometimes a game this old really can be hard to go back to. Metroid 2 remains a fascinating experience, and it's worth experiencing. It has so many quiet parts, so many loud parts, so much texture, so much heart. And I'm sure if I replayed it again, if I could just remember where enough of those missile upgrades were, if I could get good enough at those in-game Omega fights that I wouldn't have to go back, I could look past its faults. But I don't know, I got the good ending this time anyway. Some of those faults really have gotten worse with time. Some of them were just always there. I'm sure Samus Returns and AM2R will be more palatable to most players, but the Game Boy original remains, for better and for worse, the most authentic version of itself. Super Metroid was my first Metroid game. Back in the original episode, I told the story of how I bought it on the Wii Virtual Console in 2007, and it just clicked. 
It seemed as timeless then as it must have in 1994, as it still did in 2016. But that wasn't the whole story. This wasn't actually my first Metroid game. This was my first Metroid game. One of my cousins was quite a bit older than me. He got his start during the golden age of arcades. He grew up with an NES. Him and his teenage friends would make me play Street Fighter 2 and just absolutely wipe the floor with me. I thought he was the coolest. But he was older than me enough that he was part of that group where you were still sort of expected to grow out of video games once you got into high school. And he sort of did. So one day, he let me have one of his games. My cool teenage cousin gave me, a child, his copy of Super Metroid. I was obviously way out of my depth trying to play it. I never got anywhere in it. I might not have even started my own save file. All I remember is that every once in a while, I'd load up my cousin's save, which would drop me off right here. And the one thing I figured out how to do was this. Yeah, I'd pop this cartridge in just to do that. Blasting up and down the hallway. I thought it was awesome. Yeah, I've always been like this. And now you know the rest of the story. Given this season's focus on authenticity, my plan for this replay was to finally play Super Metroid on this cartridge. But if you have strange encyclopedic knowledge of videos I made almost a decade ago, you might know that the battery in this cart is long dead. So I took it to my favorite local retro shop, Two Dudes Gaming in Elizabethton, Tennessee. I love this place, highly recommended if you're ever in the area. I told them I was gonna say that, and they told me to tell you you can use Games for Geeks to get 15% off anything on their eBay storefront. So the dudes put a fresh battery in the cartridge, and it still didn't work. The game booted, but it wouldn't save. They gave it another shot, they kept the cartridge overnight, they tried everything they could to get her to work, but still nothing. I took this as a bit of a sign. Super Metroid is probably still the game I've played more than any other in the series. I haven't played it in quite a while, but I do still know it very well. Doing it again on real hardware would be great, but the difference would be merely sentimental. Maybe the universe was pointing me in another direction. I still wanted to use this cartridge as the base, so I dumped it to my computer and patched it with a ROM hack called Super Metroid Redux. Oh yes, all those other episodes are me reduxing myself, but this one, this one is about a game called Redux. It's an improvement mod that makes all kinds of quality of life tweaks to the game. I especially like how much faster room transitions are, but it also includes a few bigger changes. Chief among them is giving it a control scheme more reminiscent of the GBA games. Ordinarily in Super Metroid, you hit L and R to aim up and down respectively, and press select to cycle through alternate weapons and abilities. But in Redux, you hit L to aim diagonally, and use the control pad to switch direction. And while select still cycles weapons, you hold R to activate them. The X-ray visor gets its own dedicated button, the X button oddly enough, and its activation is much snappier and encompasses a wider area. And because I wanted this playthrough to be different, I chose to include just one of the optional patches, Heavy Physics. Super Metroid was the last game in the series to include Samus's traditional slow, floaty jump. This patch makes the physics more like the later games. Due to how deeply grained my muscle memory tends to be, I can be a bit of a purist when it comes to play control. Early 3D cameras? That's just part of playing the game, baby! I'm great at acclimating to unusual control schemes, I often find so-called jank to be part of the fun, I think playing side-scrollers in 4x3 gives you less time to react and that's a good thing, and you can pry my low-frame wall jumping out of my cold, dead hands. I don't want Mario to slowly slide down the wall, I can react faster than that! This is so much crunchier, so much more satisfying! I'm playing this up for the sake of making a point. You should obviously play games the way that makes them the most fun for you. I'm just saying, this sort of thing really is often the most fun for me. And I've always been the same way about Super Metroid. I figured the control changes in the GBA games were compromises due to a lack of buttons, and I had no problem with the Super NES controls. I saw the floaty jump as being a little too sacred to change. And I say all this to impress upon you the significance of me saying this. I knew I was wrong before I even made it out of the first room! Even I've got to admit, Super Metroid really does feel a lot sharper this way. I shouldn't have knocked it before I tried it. Like, I gotta be real, guys, I love this game. You know I love this game. But at the same time, there are so many times I've come back to it after a break, and found I left off right around here. 
Actually, come with me for a sec. Let's take a field trip to the NSO app. And... Yep. Right where I thought it'd be. But this time, playing in Redux? Eh -eh. I wasn't running out of steam at all. I was going out of my way to look for secrets and finding things I'd never even seen before. One of the things I enjoy most about video games, to the point that it might be the key to the entire reason I love them so much, is that play control I talked about earlier. To go back to Mario 64 for a minute, when they were making this game, the very first thing they did, before they made any levels or assets or really anything else, the very first thing they did was make sure it was fun to play fun to move, leap, pivot, and exist within the 3D space. The easiest way to make sure your game sticks with me is to make sure that just being the character, just playing the game, is inherently fun. And in Super Metroid Redux, being Samus is a blast. It's actually a little too good to the point that it kind of breaks the game. Shine Spark in particular charges much, much faster. But you know me. The joy of a video game is directly and proportionally correlated to how fast the character runs. Make him speedier, and I'm gonna be happier, so it's hard to complain. That said, I wouldn't recommend the heavy physics to a first-time player. They make platforming a lot harder for starters, especially in a game where Samus does not have the power grip equipped. The room before the wrecked ship was a bit frustrating even for me. And while I don't think the physics enable you to break any sequences that can't also be broken in the vanilla game, having such tight air control does make some of them quite a bit easier. At least I think that's right. The truth is, I've been through Super Metroid so many times at this point, I don't even really know where the intended path is anymore. I don't know it like the back of my hand, but it's familiar enough, you know? The intended path is really just a suggestion, and that's one of the things I love so much about it. And through the process of actually playing the rest of the series, I found so much more to love about it. Like how connected it is to previous titles, how it revels in its lore and legacy in a way that games, especially Nintendo games, just didn't do in the 16-bit era. The first thing you do when you land on Zebus is make your way down to Torian, navigating down the same shaft that you, as a hypothetical young adult in 1994, might have climbed up as a child eight years earlier. Seeing the burnt-out husk where Mother Brain used to be, you feel the passage, the divide between those times. This was totally lost on me back then. I lacked the experience and the context to appreciate it. But today, I do appreciate it. I've always thought of Super Metroid as the most memorable Metroid game. It does the whole invisible guiding hand thing better than any other exploration-focused game I've ever played. It's always the one I pick if I want to commit to a 2D Metroid. But it's not the one I've replayed the most since that original series of videos. And I've always thought that was because it was more of a commitment. But playing this reduxed version of Super Metroid now, I have to wonder if it wasn't also because the core gameplay mechanics of those later titles were just more kinetic and polished, even if their world design didn't quite have the depth or variability of Supers. I guess what I'm saying is that, thanks to Redux, I can see myself coming back to it a lot more often. Super Metroid is still evergreen. It was an overlooked gem that became a cult classic that became a legend and its legend was critical in ensuring that the series would become legendary. Without Super Metroid, this franchise would have run the very real risk of meeting the same fate as Bloon Fight. Super Metroid is the reason Samus got into Smash Brothers, the reason this series came back after that long eight-year gap from 1994 to 2002, the reason Metroid endured, survived, and thrived. There is nothing that I or anyone else could say that would take anything away from Super Metroid. Metroid. But you know, sometimes there's nothing wrong with spruce it up in Evergreen. The year was 2016. It was a cold December night, and the Geek Critique had asked me what I thought about Metroid Fusion. At the time, I said it was an insult. Not just to the franchise's roots, not just to the fans, but to game design in general and to me personally. Oh boy, was I wrong. Hi, my name is Kovar, and in this 14-hour video essay, I'm going to explain exactly how wrong I was. To begin with... Did, what hey, the hell hey, do you think that you're back. doing, man? Don't you remember what happened last time? Give me that! Never again! Whew, sorry about that, everyone. Anyway, 
This was the game that inspired the first video I ever had that broke 1 million views, and thank you to everyone who's watched it. Kofar was right about one thing. Metroid Fusion is an insult to the franchise's roots, but that's not a bad thing. My original video was called The Corruption of a Masterpiece, and maybe some people who didn't watch it assumed I meant that as a criticism. While I've since learned that for better or worse, negativity is real good at baiting clicks, that's not at all what I was trying to do back then. I mean, as tiny as this channel was, the thought that YouTube would recommend it at all was the furthest thing from my mind. In terms of video game history, the gap between the mid-90s and the early 2000s was immeasurable. The difference between what games were and what they had become was almost unrecognizable. In 2002, when it was just eight years old, Super Metroid was already a beloved relic of a bygone era. It was already most of the way to becoming a legend. To follow up a game like that, to stake Samus's return on something that so brazenly rejected the series' conventions, shows ridiculous fortitude on the part of the developers. But enough about Metroid Prime. Seriously. The safe move would have been to make a game like Super Metroid. What we got instead is almost the anti-Super Metroid, a game that, in a lot of ways, is as far away from Super Metroid as you can get while still being Metroid. And the best part is, Fusion's game design, themes, and story all work together to reinforce and support that intention. The story of the game matches the story within it. Metroid Fusion is trying to carve out its own place in history, trying to stand up to the legend of Super Metroid. Within the game, Samus is pursued by the corrupted shadow of herself at the peak of her power, exactly as she was during Super Metroid. God, I love video games. Anyway, I don't play it much. Heck, I don't think I've played through it more than once or twice since that original video. Yeah, look, Metroid Fusion would have been the perfect first Metroid game for me. One of my biggest... I don't know if you'd call it a weakness, but... One of my biggest weaknesses as a gamer has traditionally been a lack of patience. It's easy for me to miss obvious visual indicators that are blatant for other people, and it doesn't take a whole lot for me to get bored and frustrated if I don't have a blatantly clear view of where to go and what to do. If I was presented with this image, I worry that I'd wander around for several minutes wondering where the heck this ladder was. On the flip side, slamming headlong and headfirst into skill ceilings over and over and over and over again until I finally break through does not frustrate me. No, that's one of the biggest reasons I love video games so much. The game is fun. The game is a battle. If there's no battle, where's the fun? So, a Metroid game with extremely explicit, straightforward progression that never makes the way forward too esoteric, coupled with a steep difficulty curve that punishes you hard for every misstep, would have been exactly what I needed to get into the series. If I'd played it in 2002. And hey, it was still right up my alley in 2016. Actually, I don't think I admitted this at the time, but right before I decided to make a video series on Metroid games, I played through Fusion on the 3DS Virtual Console. This was, in fact, the second Metroid game I ever finished, nine years after Super. I liked it so much and felt like I had so much to say about it, I decided I wanted to check out the rest of the series and that I needed to share that experience. And the rest is history. There might not have been a TGC Metroid season, and at this point there might not be a TGC at all, if I hadn't liked Fusion so much. Coming back to it now, though, I think there are two issues. The first is that, well, I'm not quite as impatient as I used to be. I still like Twitch action games the best, don't get me wrong, but I'm at least marginally more well-rounded now. But a big reason I improved so much in that regard was kind of because of Metroid. I know this series, I know how it operates, I know what to look for, I know how to take my time and think through where I need to go. With that skill set, playing through Fusion is still a very good time, but it's not quite as compelling as it used to be. It's noticeably, obviously, only scratching one particular part of that itch, if that makes sense. And because I've played and replayed the entire rest of the series now, Fusion's challenges don't have the same kind of pressure they used to either. Well, except for that space-jumping spider boss, that still got me. Screw you, man! I've said it before, I'll say it again, the only good spider is the one that wears sneakers. I want to give a shout out and thank you to Destroyer of Aglets, who posted on my subreddit years ago about a hack they made to essentially bypass the dialogue sequences, making for a smoother replay with fewer interruptions. 
that's actually what I played for this episode. You still have to hit the navigation rooms, but all they really do now is navigation. Except for one near the very end. This is the version I decided to go with for this reappraising retrospective. And you know, taking nothing away from Aglets, but having gone through it, I think I actually want to have the story there too. Yeah, I don't know who I am anymore either. It's just, compared to other 2D Metroid games, Fusion actually isn't as replayable. You can't change the order you get upgrades. You can't skip upgrades. And aside from that one Easter egg that doesn't actually even let you, you definitely can't break sequence. It's just a straight, linear shot through the exact same things in the exact same order. My first time through in 2016, I thought the SAX encounters were tense and terrifying, a standout example of light horror on a handheld. And I'm not saying I don't still think that, but... On a replay, you notice how rote and predictable the SAX is, how there's absolutely no room for player expression. These encounters are incredibly well paced throughout the game, and they're thrilling that first time. But once you see the trick, you see there's only one correct move. And if you deviate from it, you can't escape or fight back. The SAX just kills you. Despite that, it had been long enough since my last playthrough that those few times the game actually does go off the rails a bit trip me up worse than ever. Like right here, you need to get to that console, but the shutter is down. The flashy switch and missile upgrade caught my attention, but if you go too far that way, you can't get back without redoing an ice missile platforming course. This led to me just kind of running in circles for 10 minutes, before I finally noticed this open hatch on the other side of the corridor. How was I supposed to know I'd need to crawl through a Jeffrey's tube? No, nope, that one's not in here. Fusion has a handful of quote-unquote puzzles like this, and some of them are even more ridiculous. And like, it's not really a big deal. I just notice a slight lack of finesse as the team sort of experiments with more direct guidance. And that's fine. I still think Fusion emphasizes the best aspects allowed by that more straightforward structure. Most of my absolute favorite games prioritize replay value, but a game doesn't have to work like that for me to love it. But the next time I decide to replay Fusion, whatever that might be, the story does need to be a part of that. I guess the game just felt a little too rote without it. I definitely don't agree with 2016 Kovar. That guy, well, he was a literal caricature. We played that up on purpose and the joke didn't land. And I'll formally apologize to both you for making you endure it and Kovar for putting him through the scrutiny. Although my regret didn't stop me from making the exact same joke in my fusion notes every last time I got an upgrade. Speaking of, get your You Wouldn't Download a Missile t-shirt today at the link in the description. But I see the sentiment this exaggerated version of my sidekick was getting at now. I see the full spectrum of the appeal of Metroid, and even though it still plays to my preferences with impunity, Fusion is admittedly a weaker game to me now for how much my perspective has grown. I still enjoy it. I still absolutely respect it for being such a distinct break from the series map, and I still highly recommend playing it. But Samus isn't the same person she used to be, and neither am I. Metroid Dread. That title was first revealed to the public almost two decades ago, when IGN got a hold of a list of upcoming games for the Nintendo DS. It was teased two years later, hidden in a scan log deep within Metroid Prime 3. Metroid Project Dread is nearing completion, but something must have gone wrong. Three years after that, series director Yoshio Sakamoto gave a vague answer with major implications. He acknowledged the speculation. He didn't deny the existence of a game called Dread, but he said he hoped that he could, quote, start from scratch. And then, for a very long time, the trail ran cold. There was nothing about Dread or anything else. The critical and commercial failure of Other M seemed to deal a mortal blow to the Metroid series. Samus went on a long hiatus. And if you were first and foremost a fan of the 2D entries, it was probably even worse. The Metroid Renaissance of the 2000s was driven primarily by Prime, but it only saw the release of two 2D games. Fusion was unabashedly Metroid 4, but Zero Mission was a remake of the first game. 
They're both quality titles, but even before Other M, it had been a long time since the last original 2D Metroid. So it's easy to imagine why the idea of this project, whatever it was, would have been so compelling. Why it would have felt increasingly and desperately necessary as the 2010s rolled on with nary a sign of Samus Aran. But that's the weird thing for me. All I can really do is imagine. When I first read this article, I was a literal schoolboy who had barely even touched a Metroid game. I never had to suffer through the wilderness years. I had no expectations for other M to crush. I never had to be disappointed when E3 after E3, year after year, went by without even a cursory mention of Metroid. It is not lost on me that there are people who've been waiting their whole lives for Dread, who've hung onto this series through some high highs and some soul-crushing lows, and who never gave up on it. Again, I can only imagine how surreal, how gratifying, how vindicating this moment must have felt if you were in that position. Not that I wasn't hyped too, but what I didn't tell you back in this reveal reaction was that I honestly felt a little bit overwhelmed. It was like I discovered the series at the perfect time, and in some ways I owed my career to it. If this video series hadn't resonated with you guys, would I even be able to do this? So for Dread to actually happen, I don't know, I felt a little too lucky. It was a little too easy. I felt like I didn't deserve Metroid Dread. And man, I would love nothing more than to say, but fortune favors the bold! And then I'd show you this big beautiful box and we could just dive in and take off, but I would be doing you a disservice and I'd be doing the talented individuals who made this game a disservice if I just let this hang in the periphery throughout this entire video. Metroid Dread, like entirely too many games, is, allegedly, the product of a poor working environment. Employees tell stories that would be unbelievable if we didn't hear them so often. Punishing and isolating developers for discussing their salary with other staff, resisting all measures necessitated by the pandemic, refusing to pay workers what they were owed for telework, and then rushing to return them to the office as soon as possible. Refusing to put people in the credits if they weren't on staff for at least 25% of development. Meaning you might have given nearly a year of your life to this project, and your name wouldn't be here. Now, faint praise, but still sadly worth praising in this industry, there was no crunch. But that doesn't make the rest of this okay. On the backs of the people they treated this way, Mercury Steam, or rather the people they treated this way, has made the most critically acclaimed and financially successful video game ever developed in their home country of Spain. If you want to be a developer there, you run a very real risk of being blacklisted if you publicly criticize them. So it's understandable why these stories all come from anonymous sources. Most of this information came out about a week after Dread was released, and it kind of put me in conflict. Should I really be giving this product free promotion given the circumstances? How should I address this? Is it even my responsibility to address this? But what convinced me I had to was something that came out just a few days ago as of the time I'm writing this script. Mercury Steam CEO Enric Alvarez was interviewed by Game Reactor, and I'll quote what he said as translated by Nintendo Everything. Quote, I don't think the development was chaotic. Chaotic development doesn't end with one of the best games in the franchise. It doesn't end with a game that has sold over 3 point something million copies. It doesn't end with a game that won TGA awards. That's all I have to say about it. End quote. Nothing Mr. Alvarez could have possibly said there would have made him sound more guilty to me than this absolute moon logic about how, no, successful video games can't possibly come out of abusive, poorly managed workplace conditions. Anyone who's followed the industry for more than a second would see right through that. Unfortunately, as is so often the case in situations like this, I'm not sure what I can do to change it. But I will say this. If Nintendo partners with Mercury Steam to make another Metroid game, and these stories come out again, if nothing is changed, I won't be buying it. To coin a phrase, companies don't make video games. People do. My fandom, and whether or not I deserve this, seems immaterial compared to my conviction that the people who make the games we play deserve better. Now, 
In a second, I'm gonna take off my serious business hat, and I'll say, let's get critiquing, and I'll go back to being a fan. But as you watch this video, please remember that the only reason this game exists, the only reason we get to play it, and ultimately the only reason I get to do this, is because of the people who made it. You all deserve the credit, and for what it's worth, I thank you. Okay. I don't have any good way to transition out of that, so uh, I'll just let it be awkward. Let's get critiquing! The Galactic Federation receives an unsolicited video from an anonymous sender. Yeah, that's bad news on your best day, but it's worse news when said video reveals that the scourge of the universe, that you swore was wiped out, is somehow still living. And no, that well's wrong dry. You know, surprisingly, he's not in this game. Oh, I'll always remember you. But no. Ha! Yeah, that one! The X, biomimetic parasites that can maim and mimic any life form they touch, were seemingly wiped out back in Fusion, when Samus crash-landed the BSL station into SR-388. The X posed such an extreme danger to the galaxy that the Chozo created the Metroids to oppose them. But the Metroids are extinct, while the X have, seemingly survived, on a remote planet known as ZDR. Fortunately for the Federation, they just so happen to have a bounty hunter tailor-made for the job. Her super-powered Chozo technology, combined with the fact that her DNA was spliced with the remnants of the last Metroid, means that Samus Aran is the one person in the universe immune to the X, and with the ability and know-how to stop them. She has, quite literally, been training for this her whole life. So the Federation left her on red and sent a squad of seven super shiny AI-powered robots made out of nigh indestructible armor to investigate instead, because it just wouldn't be the Galactic Federation if they weren't constantly making the absolute worst decisions imaginable! Can you believe I used to think that bureaucratic incompetence on this level could only exist in fiction? <laughs> the follies of youth. To the surprise of absolutely no one except the bozo calling the shots, <laughs> they instantly lost contact with all seven Emmy! The Federation has once again made a bad situation unimaginably worse. And so, now they call Samus Aran to bail them out of it. As a fan, the fact that we open on the X, maybe, possibly, definitely, being back again feels a little bit forced. If you're gonna have them in, it'd be cool to make that a twist when it actually happens. But I get why they did it this way. As a direct sequel to Metroid Fusion, Dread immediately and intimately ties itself to what happened there. The story needs to establish what's going on, and what this is, and who this is, and why these are, even for players who didn't play a game that was released 20 years and two generations ago. So having this be the inciting incident makes a lot of sense for the sake of newcomers. And for us... oldcomers? It is such a treat to see these awesome scenes from Fusion rendered in high resolution. And now that everyone's up to speed, our girl, Samus Aran, decked out in a fresh set of Chozo armor, sets course for ZDR with nothing by her side. I mean, nothing except for an artificial simulation of her long-dead mentor, Adam Malkovich, whose memories were uploaded into a computer after he died, in some way we'd really rather not discuss. We are lost assets with care, lady. Yeah, screw the newcomers, there was no way to explain that one. Samus blasts onto the planetary surface for the first mainline Metroid game in almost 20 years. Here. We. Go! Yeah. That's me. I bet you're wondering how I got here. Yeah, so the game does something a little awkward here. From the shot of the ship, we smash cut to Samus, pulling herself up off of the ground, her orange armor now blue. Then we get an immediate flashback to what we skipped in the interim. Samus got off her ship, rode an elevator deep beneath the planet's surface, and got absolutely torn to shreds by a living, breathing Chozo warrior, who incidentally also destroyed her only easy way back to the surface. But he didn't kill her. He could have, but he didn't. Rather, he did... something else. The what and the why, for that matter, is not yet clear. It's also not clear why this needed to be framed as a flashback. Look, as engaging as it is, this intro is long, around seven minutes. It might have been nice to break that up with a short, playable section on the surface, followed by, and this is way more important to me, making some portion of this fight actually playable. 
Make it a fight the player can't win. You can still keep all the cinematics, I don't mind that. But you can do better than just showing me how ineffective Samus is against this guy. You can make me feel it. And if, just hypothetically, the player fights this guy again later, the experience of getting obliterated at first would make the catharsis of overcoming him even more satisfying. But while I might pick a few nits about how a cutscene brought us down here, I really dig what this setup means for Dread's structure. In almost every other planet-spanning Metroid adventure, you start at or near the gunship and make your way lower into the map. In Dread, you start at the deepest point of the map and have to navigate up. Your destination is always up there. Way, way, way up there. So, you've accessed a network station. Well done, Samus. I have reviewed your vital signs and video log from the data you uploaded. This opening section, Arteria, makes a fantastic first impression as a living ecosystem. Wildlife roams in the foreground and background. Waterfalls flow into hot springs, which, it's eventually revealed, are heated by thermal magma from the planet's core. But this is not a natural occurrence. A mysterious lost civilization, I wonder who, set up a pump system. Samus can redirect the magma, then follow its flow through the pipes in the background. It's a nice way to ease you into Metroid navigation. While it feels a bit odd to give Dread credit for improving on a concept from 19 years earlier, it is technically Metroid 5, so comparing it to Metroid 4 is fair game. For one thing, it's just nice to have a new Metroid game set on an actual planet again. A place we've never seen before, instead of a derelict space station projecting hard light holograms in lieu of actual environments. Okay, that one's not a fair comparison. In Fusion, every section of the map opened with the same awkward trifecta of a save area, a briefing room, and a recharge room, all three of which had to be run through every time. Dread is much more of a traditional Metroid game. Functions aren't all packed together like this. And while Dread does still have dedicated save rooms, one thing I really appreciate is how every type of specialized room also functions as a save area now. And technically, pretty much every room works as a checkpoint in case you die, which is nice because, oh buddy, you will be doing a lot of that. But I'll circle back to that. Metroid Dread launched alongside a brand new model of the Switch with an OLED screen, complete with white Joy-Cons to match. And with its super high contrast look and deep blacks, hot damn does this game look good on it. One of my favorite examples is the save rooms. You see those ornate statues in the background of powerful Chozo warriors holding a planet on their backs? A second set of statues frames the shot, silhouetted in the foreground. <laughs> yeah, this game is to the OLED Switch what DK94 was to the Super Game Boy. Now look, I loved Samus Returns. I still do love Samus Returns. It reinvented 2D Metroid and laid a new foundation for that branch of the series. But I never quite knew just how foundation all it really was until I tried going back to it after getting used to Dread. One of my favorite things about this medium has always been when the same team gets the opportunity to take everything they learned from their original game's development and reception and take another swing at it. A million little things about Samus's core movement, physics, and abilities. A million little things you might not have consciously noticed, feeling a little unwieldy in Samus Returns, have been overhauled, addressed, and refined. And that really is the word that comes to mind, refinement. The simple act of moving Samus around the world feels better than ever. She's got a slide that can get her through tight spaces without losing momentum, and, when you eventually get it, for the first time in 2D Metroid, a single button press pops you into the morph ball. Jumping, wall jumping, and free aiming all feel awesome. Movement is speedy and precise, without any of the stiffness that seeped into Samus Returns. That game's biggest innovation, the melee counter, was a great idea. But it was often a little too one-note and a little too powerful. It left a lot of room for improvement. And Dread takes that room and runs with it. As in, you can now melee enemies without coming to a dead stop and without breaking your stride. The way the camera shakes, that impact freeze, the pure crunch of these hits never stop satisfying. Melee counters are also used in much more variable and interesting ways than they were before. Unique enemies trigger attacks with unique timing, and the effects of those attacks are different as well, giving combat a much greater variety. The melee is still a necessary tool in Samus' arsenal, but not the only one that's necessary. And the way it feels when there are three or four enemies all on screen at once, and my brain just goes on autopilot, counter, aim, blast, boom, bam, bang! Gotta love it. 
Of course, one of the biggest upsides to being on the Switch is just naturally having a better control layout. I'm not gonna lie, even at the outset there are a lot of actions you can take in Dread, and even more moves that you'll unlock later. That kind of depth doesn't come without a learning curve, and it can take a while before all of this stuff can get grounded into your muscle memory. But, and I admit as an old school gamer who loves unique controllers, and feels both comfy and confident on this, and this, and that, and even this, I think the trade-off is more than worth it. Because, woo doggy! Are you gonna need everything you've got and more against this? The Galactic Federation's incompetence means all seven Emmy have turned rogue. The SAX in Metroid Fusion was, for nearly the entire game, a force you could not reckon with. Your only option was to hide. It was a grotesque, perverted, corrupted version of Samus at her peak. But it wasn't very dynamic. If it saw you when it wasn't supposed to, there was no recourse or escape. And when it did pursue you, it was only in highly scripted sequences that had one correct solution. Take nothing away from it, it was precisely what it needed to be for the game that Fusion was. But Sakamoto said that the idea for the Emmy came from the SAX, that it dates all the way back to those post-Fusion planning stages. And I see why he thought he could take that concept further, because that's exactly what the Emmy are. A more expressive, dynamic, expanded iteration on the SAX concept without sacrificing that cold, claustrophobic, horror-tinged atmosphere the way that Zero Mission's stealth sequence did. The Emmy are confined to their own, appropriately named, Emmy Zones, unique, clearly demarcated sections of the map. Most of the game's color drops out, the camera gets in closer, the naturalistic background noise of ZDR is swapped for an artificial hum, the sound of metal scratching metal and sound effects that I swear are torn straight from Metroid 2's claustrophobic subterranean caves. It's evocative and unsettling, as if you're seeing Samus through a surveillance camera that she doesn't know about. Speaking of which, the Emmy borrow liberally from Metal Gear's alert system, and if you're gonna copy something, might as well copy the best. By default, they patrol their space in a particular pattern, but they can hear you. This activates a caution phase, where they'll beeline for your position, but can still be avoided if you can stay out of their line of sight. And if they get their eyes on you, that activates the alert phase. The exits to the enemy zone are locked down, and they'll pursue you however they can. The only way you're getting out alive is if you can outrun them, fake them out, or find a hiding place. But these guys are smarter than you might expect. Samus makes noise with every step she takes, and they'll always check the last place they heard you. If Samus gets caught, you still have one final gambit. With timing so supernaturally precise, it's more luck than skill. You can still hit a melee counter and get another chance at escape. But the timing on this is intentionally inconsistent. It's not meant to be something you can get good at. It's more like the last beat of your heart before... Ugh. There is an incredible tension in all of this. But man, am I ever glad the game isn't like this all the time. If you look up gamey in a dictionary, you won't find it because it's not a real word. Or is it? Of meat, having the strong flavor or smell of game, especially when it is slightly tainted. Huh, today I learned. But if I had to define it, the idea that the indestructible robot death gods who only just got here are magically confined to their own distinct patrol zones within each area would be a succinct illustrative example. But like most gamey things, it is the way it is because it's better than the alternative. Most of the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay in Metroid games is about being this increasingly capable force of nature, exploring, fighting, and breaking through the limits of a vast interconnected world. If an Emmy could pursue you everywhere in an area and tell they were defeated, it wouldn't just be fatiguing, it would run the very real risk of breaking Metroid. No taking your time, no looking around and looking for solutions, you would need to be on your toes all the time. So making these clearly delineated sections where the Huntress becomes the hunted, the pros definitely outweigh the cons. The only way to take down an enemy is to find its control unit, a room deep within each zone containing… well these things are basically a big send up of mother brain aren't they? The big eyeball, the little rings, the ability to tank an entire stock of missiles and keep ticking. But taking down a central unit doesn't disable the Emmy. Instead, it puts it in a permanent pursuit mode. Fortunately, Samus can now, somehow, absorb the leftover energy, bringing online the Omega Cannon. The only thing powerful enough to take out an Emmy is the very life force that directed it. But it's still not that easy. 
The Omega Cannon has two modes, a scatter shot that can melt the protective hull around an enemy's weak spot, and a blast mode that can destroy it in one precise shot but takes time to charge. So you need to alternate between running, positioning, scattering, charging, and importantly, not throwing away your shot. On a first playthrough, it is consistently one of the most intense, heart-pounding aspects of the game. But this is not my first playthrough. And at least on this first set of Emmy, what really strikes me is how little effort I feel like I'm putting in. I mean, they're still fun and all, but I actually had to go back and cap footage of them getting me just so I could show that happening. I endeavored to put a lot of distance between myself and Dread before I critiqued it. I didn't want to be too familiar, so it's been almost two years since the last time I played it. But still, the Emmy aren't going to give you too much trouble if you know what you're doing. At least they're not yet. Technically, there are two Emmy in Artaria, but the first one was heavily damaged. It was more of a tutorial than anything else. Yeah, okay, it still totally killed me my first playthrough, jeez. But when Samus blasts this second one, she gains a new ability. The Spider Magnet. This allows her to stick to surfaces that glow neon blue, but oh no, we Connect 24 shut down ages ago! Actually, when I clambered up here and I saw this screen, I was suddenly, and uncomfortably, reminded of something. And to explain what, I'll need to rewind just a little bit earlier. There. An innocuous room that most players probably thought very little of on their first playthrough. All you need to do is shoot out the ceiling, which you will more than likely accomplish accidentally when you try to fire on the enemies crawling on it. There's a gigantic glowing window bisecting the top and bottom of the room, and an enemy fluttering above it, further reinforcing the notion that all you need to do here is fire any type of weapon into the ceiling. And this comes in addition to the tutorial hint about shooting blocks from the very beginning of the game. Not only that, but because this is still so early, Dread even confines you to a teeny tiny section of the map until you figure it out. You're not going anywhere until you get through this. The game has done everything it can to make the solution obvious, and it is so obvious that most players probably never even noticed it was something that needed a solution. But most players are not David Jaffe. Jaffe, a game developer best known for creating God of War and... Huh, twisted Metal, didn't know that. He was live-streaming Dread shortly after it came out. And instead of aiming up at the ceiling, he played like he was Mega Man and jump and shot. He wasn't stuck for too long, the chat quickly told him what he needed to do, and that probably would have been the end of it. But then he said this. Oh, come, why would I know that? Why would I ever have known to do that? That's some bull right there. You know, I'm sorry, man. This is, I'm so sick of reviewers. It's a 10, it's a nine, game of the year. You literally cannot, why would you know? Oh my God, that's bad. How does that get past people? And with that, David Jaffe unwittingly enshrined his name in Metroid Legend. As Super Metroid has the new bridge, Metroid Dread has the Jaffe room. There's still no faster way to bring the masses for your head than to be angry and wrong about something that geeks love on the internet. But as it was happening, while Twitter was tearing him to shreds, as he was doubling down and making things even worse, I gotta be honest, I couldn't help but sympathize with him. Because, while I never would have been so hostile about it, it so easily could have been me. And in fact, if I had been live streaming my first playthrough, it basically would have been me. There are aspects of games I consider myself very good at. I've got great reflexes and reaction speed, I'm great at acclimating to unique control schemes and quickly getting a handle on mechanics, my muscle memory gets set fast and is super reliable, but I'm also incredibly impatient, and I'm absolutely terrible at noticing things. You can put a giant glowing marker on screen right in front of me, and I will walk directly past it. So, I sympathize with David Jaffe because, just a day or two earlier, I climbed up here, shot this block, figured I would need to come back with the morph ball, and... got lost for 45 minutes. I remembered way back at the other side of the map, I had seen a wall that I could climb, so I reasoned that the thing to do was to backtrack over there, and when I finally got there I found... a missile upgrade. Huh. The only other way to go was a dead end through a room so cold it hurt, so I kept ambling around in circles, getting a little impatient and a little frustrated, until finally on a whim, I climbed back up here and... Well... darn. Ooh, did you guys see that? 
I didn't, I'm bad at noticing things. No, seriously, a cloaked presence stalks Samus throughout her time in Artaria, and now it's finally time to confront it. Dread doesn't just have any, it features proper boss battles too, and this is the first one. Hang on, let me pull up the Metroid wiki. Would have been cool if this game had had a guide section or something. Aha, it's called Corpius! And the name of the music that plays here is Boss... Scorpius. That's weird. One criticism thrown Dread's way, including by my boy Jay Hunter at OSW Review, was that it was too punishing. The difficulty curve is basically a series of spikes. The enemy can kill you in one hit if they catch you, and even regular enemies take huge chunks of health if they hit. Fusion set a new precedent, and Dread follows it through. Samus is a tank no more. Every mistake costs you. Corpius, the very first boss in the game, puts absolutely everything you've learned so far to the test. Spider gripping, sliding, precision aiming, skillful countering, even resource management. A reprieve this is not. And while I can of course see the argument that this kind of high-octane constant pressure might be too much for a game that's supposed to be about exploration, that juxtaposition is exactly what I want out of a Metroid game. But I'm gonna be biased. I'm bad at noticing things that are right in front of my face, but good at quickly pushing buttons in the right order. That's what I typically come to video games for, and that's one reason Metroid clicks with me so well when many games like it typically don't. So of course I'm gonna gel with these modern day 2D Metroids that put so much greater emphasis on challenge. That's why it was so easy for me to push through all the time I spent being lost, you know? I game overed my first time through Dread more than I did in every other Metroid game combined, and I loved every minute. Still, Nintendo did eventually add in difficulty options, and it would have been nice if those had been there from the start. My beta reader and sidekick Kovar might have beaten Dread back then if they had been there from the start. Being ground into the dirt until you get good isn't everybody's idea of a good time. And as much as this new paradigm is enjoyable for me, Metroid should still be enjoyable for those of you who aren't masochists as well. Busting up Corpius nets Samus the Phantom Cloak, which sounds like a poem I'd have written in an aim away message circa 2004, but it's more like setting your status to invisible. I always love when defeating a boss lets you use its power. Wait, it broke that Chozo statue at the start of the fight. Did Corpius eat the Phantom Cloak? Dread to this point has been pretty straightforward. It's taken a soft, measured approach as it's carefully taught the player the basic mechanics and rules of the game. But as I entered the second area, Cataris, I could almost feel the lurch as the training wheels came off. The same elements are there, and in fact this location feels noticeably like an extension of the last one. We're still redirecting magma to open doors, but now when I follow that line, the way forward isn't always so obvious. More and more, the game is giving me a strong indication of where I need to go, but not telling me how to get there. We're out of the opening act now, and every facet of the game is escalating. Let's start with the Emmy. Or should I say, the Emmy. The plural. Like sheep. Or Pokemon. It would have been real easy for this game to be structured, as linearly as Samus Returns was, to have Samus get to an area, overcome an enemy, fight a boss, and move on to the next. But that wouldn't have been very Metroid. So inside of half an hour, I arrived in Cataris, cautiously stealthed my way through an enemy zone, and only died three times. Rode a tram to another new area, pushed through a power outage, activated a generator, and encountered another enemy. Dread throws two new areas, a litany of new upgrades, and two new Emmy at you before you have the means to take down either one. The structure is opening up now, and there's a strong sense of momentum building. And now that I'm out of the early game, these encounters are getting a lot more compelling. The Phantom Cloak runs on Aeon Energy, making a welcome return from Samus... returns? It has no combat function whatsoever, and its only real use outside of Emmy Zones is to get through these movement-detecting doors. But inside of Emmy Zones, it's sometimes the difference between life and death. It makes you invisible, but not invincible. If an Emmy knows where you are, it's still gonna get you, and engaging it heavily limits Samus's mobility. It's not for running, it's for hiding. And once it drains your Aeon, it'll start pulling from Samus's own health. It's balanced well to be a useful and necessary tool in your arsenal without mitigating any of Dread's tension. In fact, I'd say it only enhances it. I noticed my controller pulsing whenever the Emmy got close, as if I could feel Samus's heart beating. 
But I said everything was escalating. As I set foot in Dairon, the game started throwing enemies at me where my well-worn response of stand still and wait to counter was the exact wrong move. Enemy variety is picking up. Not everything can be countered. And even the cases where it does work are getting more interesting. Like these little security robots that try to get away from Samus while charging up a high damage laser beam. You need to either close the gap for a counter, or light him up with a few well-aimed missiles of your own, and you need to make that decision fast. This is another reason I gave myself almost two years to hopefully forget about Dread before I made this episode. A Josh who was too seasoned might not have even noticed when the combat got more involved, but the way the difficulty ratcheted up here was enough for me to hit the game over screen again. But it wasn't long after that that I finally took down my third Emmy and got the Morph Ball. Never before has Samus had to wait this long to become small and round. And then I found a teleporter, or as the lore calls them, teleportals. This allowed me to skip a great deal of backtracking and put me right where I needed to be to progress with this new upgrade. This is a fairly substantial change to Metroid's design ethos. Fusion was split into mostly linear but self-contained areas, while Zero Mission gave you map markers. But Dread wants to have its cake and eat it too. It wants to present a vast interconnected map and not tell you where to go in it, but it also doesn't want you to have to backtrack across vast swaths of the game to get where you need to be. Like I said, I need all the help I can get. Even this wasn't always enough for me at first. But I can see why this might make things too obvious for seasoned explorers. Speaking of flow, it's time to redirect some more magma. Huh, maybe playing with lava was a bad idea. Who'd have thunk? This section is all build up for the Varia suit, so I guess I better say this now. Samus's basic blue design in Dread just might be my favorite look she has ever had. It's got the cool color scheme of Prime 3's Phazon suit, but it's not nearly as busy. It's a clean design, which is pretty impressive when I take into account how many different colors are actually being used here. White serves as the dominant color. Lights accent her visor, shoulders, hands, and boots. Blue streaks cross her body like a Metroid's tendrils. It's all impressively sleek and well-balanced. It complements modern Metroid gameplay and Samus's post-fusion depiction as a superhuman glass cannon. Anyway, the Varia suit isn't as good. Oh, it's fine. It's not nearly as ugly as anything Fusion cooked up. No shade to Fusion, by the way. Samus's design was very intentionally broken within Fusion's story, and now we see her coming back into her power. But still, the orange and gold just doesn't complement the white as well as the blue did. One thing that is pretty awesome about it, though, within the volcanic areas the Varia suit lets you explore, that white is tinged orange instead, making Samus closely resemble her traditional appearance. Design aside, I've got no nits to pick whatsoever with the way Samus has been depicted so far. Actually, one of my favorite examples in the whole game happens right here. Throughout this area, I keep hearing this anguished, inhuman scream coming from somewhere in the caverns. And when Samus finally finds the source of it, the smoke obscures the silhouette of a gargantuan beast. Samus tenses up, aims her cannon, and we suddenly swap to the creature's point of view before we can see what it is. But as it comes into her line of sight, Samus takes a step back and stands defiantly. Where one of the original Metroid's bosses has become the most iconic, most recurring villain in the series, the other has been a lot more scarce. In fact, this is Kraid's first chronological appearance since Super Metroid nearly 30 years earlier. And time hasn't been kind to the corpulent three-eyed monster. It's unclear how he got to ZDR, how he survived Super Metroid, or if this is even actually the same Kraid, but I like to think it is. A little later, we'll see evidence that whoever or whatever our enemy is, they're willing and able to reanimate corpses. And Kraid appears to have been subjected to some pretty horrible things. His appearance is more grotesque than ever, as he spews toxic sludge and reptilian fingers out of his various orifices. Unfortunately, Kraid is impossible to beat, so that's the end of the game. Until next time, you can- wait a minute. Damn it, Kovar! The introductory phase is simple. You just pepper him with missiles and laugh at his impotent attempts to swipe at you. But then he breaks his chains and drops you down. He's so enormous now that climbing up to his maw isn't as simple as it used to be. You've got to irritate his tender belly hole, triggering acid reflux and knocking down a spider panel, then ride it up to wail on him. 
You can also hop up there with a few well-timed jumps. Either way, though, this is one of my favorite bosses in Dread. I'm with Samus, it's just fun to see the big ugly bastard again. And when she wears him down... Defiant to the end. Now that guy's too big for Smash Brothers. One... I don't know if I'd call it a criticism necessarily, but an observation I have about Dread to this point is that its environments are erring on the side of believability. Well, okay, considering I used the word erring there, I guess it is a criticism. What I've seen so far is aesthetically fine, but it's all a bit grounded. Caves, labs, engineering, emmy zones, volcanic areas. Compare this to the otherworldly environments of Zebus, where every biome was oozing with elements that couldn't exist on Earth. This made them more distinct from each other and more memorable as a whole. But I can't complain too much, because what made me notice this was the moment I set foot in Berenia, and was struck by what an ironic breath of fresh air it was. A long-abandoned marine research base is in the process of being overtaken by the very ocean it was built to study. It helps, I guess, that the actual ocean is so alien, but this juxtaposition between a cold laboratory and a wild, thriving sea was exactly the environmental creativity I'd been missing. Hopefully Dread keeps it up. Berenia is also where you find the second Aeon ability, the Flash Shift. Samus can now zip horizontally at high speed. You can do this up to three times in a short period, alternating direction at any point. No surprise, I absolutely love this thing. It's going to be a cornerstone of both movement and especially combat from here on. And it's just satisfying. It's one of those snappy, tactile actions, like Donkey Kong's Barrel Roll or Mario's Long Jump, that makes traversal itself more inherently enjoyable. It also, and this is important, lets you get through these pressure-sensitive doors. And this is where, during that first playthrough, I got horribly, terribly, ridiculously lost AGAIN! Even worse than the first time. Yeah, I told you I'd circle back here. I gotta be honest, back in 2021, I was getting pretty frustrated at this point. It felt not unlike Metroid Prime does to me, where it was like most of my playtime was spent trudging the same ground over and over, but I wasn't even making much progress. I was four hours into the game by the time I got here, and I'd spent at least half of that just running in circles, missing the most boneheadedly obvious clues imaginable. Metroid Dread was lauded by many reviewers for not holding your hand and not directing you where to go, the way every other 2D Metroid after Super did. It was criticized by others for making things too obvious, for signboarding everything you needed to do, and always putting your next objective right on top of your previous action. The excellent YouTube channel Game Maker's Toolkit put out a video shortly after Dread's release called Why You Didn't Get Lost in Metroid Dread that explored and analyzed this very aspect of the game design. But neither Game Maker's Toolkit nor the designers at Mercury Steam could have possibly accounted for how dumb I can be. But to be fair to myself, maybe a part of the reason was because of my familiarity with Metroid's structure. Just like what happened back here, Whenever I would miss a clue so obvious most players wouldn't even see it as something to be solved, I would assume that my next move was to take the ability I'd just gotten and backtrack somewhere else for a place to use it, because that's how it had worked in previous Metroid games. But here that was never the right answer. These two factors, my inability to notice things and Dread's design not requiring that sort of backtracking, came together to pitch a perfect discordant harmony right here. I fell into this room and noticed that I could drain the water on the left side, but I did not notice this incredibly blatant Morph Ball bombable spot to the right. If I'd noticed that, I'd have probably realized that lowering the water had also lowered a platform that would let me move on. Unfortunately for me, doing just half the puzzle was enough to jump out of the water and leave. I then decided the best thing to do was to backtrack and look for more pressure doors that my new flash shift would let me get through. Oh yeah, the map lets you highlight obstacles of a similar type now, which must be nice if you're not a navigational dumbass. In fact, what happened next required me to fall through so many dumbass hoops that it took me an hour just to reconstruct how I had done what I'd done.
I rode the tram back to Dairon where I seemed to be locked in, but by firing at random ceilings I eventually unblocked the way to Cataris. I was supposed to be in Area 4. I had, against the designer's best intentions, gotten back to Area 2. From there I kept pushing in whatever direction I could find, clambered into places I wasn't meant to be yet, and eventually uncovered a teleportal that brought me to a place I'd never even remotely been before. And there? Metroid Dread gave me the Pulse Radar. An Aeon ability I wasn't supposed to get until so much later in the game. It sends out a blast that temporarily highlights hidden and breakable blocks. And I was so relieved by this! I knew something had gone horribly wrong, but it felt like the game was making a special concession just for me. Like it was saying, Oh honey, if you got so lost that you made it here now, you must really need this. And I did really need that. This was the last time I really got lost. I never had an issue making progress again after that. But man, I don't think there's a better example of how dangerous even a smidgen of freedom can be to a player as bad at basic navigation as I am. But unlike David Jaffe, I didn't blame the game for this. I blame myself. I know how pants I am at this stuff. And considering GMTK eventually conceded and threw a probably into that title, I must not be totally alone. Fortunately, it was never an issue on any subsequent playthrough, this one included. Even if I forget what to do next, I can always trust now that the answer isn't too far off the beaten path. But still, I'll never forget how strange it was to see Dread being both lauded and criticized for what was the exact opposite of my experience. At this point, I was finally able to head back to that speedy Emmy I'd seen earlier, blip into the Father Brain Room, bring the Omega Cannon back online, kite the Emmy into a position where I could unload enough sustained firepower to break its shell, then running it back into that same position again for the final blow. Yeah, the sheer speed of this one made it a little tougher. And maybe I would have seen it coming because of that, but man I wish Nintendo hadn't spoiled this next bit for me. Because of the type of gamer I am, the spoilers I care about don't tend to be narrative ones. I care about aesthetic archetypes, music, returning upgrades, and most of all, gameplay mechanics. The discovery process is paramount to me, so these are the things I want to be surprised by. And I went on the best media blackout I could for Dread, refusing to watch any of Nintendo's trailers past that first one. Unfortunately for me, the sort of things I consider spoilers aren't exactly commonly considered as such, and anything revealed in a trailer is fair game anyway. I don't blame Twitter for talking about it, but I do still wish Nintendo hadn't revealed that they were bringing back the Speed Booster. And it has never, ever been better. For the first time since Super, you get to manually activate it, firing the thrusters on the power suit. Once you get up to speed, it can now be maintained through jumps, wall jumps, slides, and even morph ball rolls. This allows you to take it to places you never could before. And when you convert that energy into a shine spark, Gotta love it! And it comes right after the game gives you the flash shift. So suddenly your movement options are so much more expressive. Samus is so much more agile than she's ever been. And like, you can hear it in my voice, right? I'm giddy just thinking about how fun this is. You know, maybe getting the pulse radar wasn't the only reason I started having a better time way back when. The path right after the speed booster is a perfect example of what I mean when I talk about Dread's structure and all the pros and cons that come with it. The path forward requires the grapple beam, which is all the way back in Arteria. Past games might have required the player to remember that there were speed blocks they couldn't break back then, and then cross huge swaths of the game world to get there. Dread has you crash through speed blocks in the section you're already in, gives you an easy way to teleport back to where you need to be, swiftly introduces you to the grapple beam, elevates you back to Dairon for a pit stop, and then elevates you again to a new area. What might have been an odyssey in past games, especially if you got lost or sidetracked, now amounts to about seven minutes of footage. And a lot of that is loading screens. The load times are pretty substantial, but I guess the whole reason Metroid had elevators to begin with was to deal with load times. It's basically an institution. But there are several parts in the game where Dread will have you crisscrossing between two or three sections. Parts like this may be indicative of some cut content. The way it shuffles you between so many areas in such a short time and gives you a major upgrade without making you fight anything for it feels more than a little patchy, especially considering it happens just before a very pivotal point in the game. Speaking of pivots, the grapple beam is so much fun I don't mind it too much. Metroid games have always made their mechanics multifunctional, it's a key tenet of the series. Bombs in the first game can be used for offense, for exploration, and for traversal. 
but Dread pushes those multi-purpose mechanics further than ever. In addition to its usual function, the grapple beam here is integrated into the spider magnet, allowing Samus to pull herself into blue walls from a distance. It can also open doors, pull boxes, and even tear the armor off of certain enemies. But alright, here's where Dread really does pivot. That second elevator brings Samus to a Chozo Sanctuary. We're approaching the game's midpoint, and until now the mystery of what happened on ZDR, who this is, and what he did to Samus, has hung in the periphery. As Samus drops down into the sanctuary, she sees a wall of Chozoian hieroglyphics. She seems to recognize one of them as her assailant. And then... Metroid has been making allusions to the Chozo since its earliest days. Their history, their presence, is felt in the lore of the series itself. We've seen their technology, their society, their brilliance, their foolishness, their wisdom, and their malice. They've been such a consistent, fundamental presence that it feels for all the world like they've always been here. So it took me a minute to even notice what a landmark this actually is. Across 35 years, the series had never given us any indication that the Chozo had survived into the present day. Until now. Until this game. That alone gives Metroid Dread a sense of finality, as everything that's been building over all these decades is being actualized. On a lighter note, I love the way Samus relaxes here. The first time Samus saw Chozo on ZDR, she got wrecked. And by this point in the game, any side of an Emmy is going to have a player frantically death gripping the controller. But when Samus calms down, it's a signal that you can relax too. A unique aspect of video game narratives that I've always found fascinating is how the player character's demeanor can inform the players. And indeed, it's time to put down the controller and listen. The Chozo gives us his name, Quiet Robe. And he gives us the name of Samus' assailant, Raven Beak. Raven Beak is a member of the Mokin, a tribe of Chozo warriors bent on ruling the galaxy with superior strength and battle intelligence. In contrast, Quiet Robe hails from the Thoha tribe, who adhered to the Chozo's ideals of peaceful exploration for the sake of knowledge. These seem to be genetic, or perhaps genetically enhanced, differences in their biology. It's a tale as old as time. Intellect and romance versus brute force and cynicism. Ironic, then, that it wasn't the Machin who created the Metroids. The Thoha used their scientific expertise to produce a species of ultimate warriors meant to wipe out the ex-parasites in the name of peace. Long ago, the two tribes worked together to contain those Metroids on SR388. But everything changed when Raven Beak attacked. Seeing the potential the Metroids had as an instrument of war, he planned to bring them to the Machin's home planet, ZDR, and develop them as a bioweapon. Ravenbeak was the catalyst for the Metroids spreading across the galaxy. He was the first warmonger to see their potential, but he wouldn't be the last. However, Ravenbeak had a trump card the space pirates never could. He kept one Thoha alive, not just for his scientific genius, but because only members of his tribe had that genetic ability to control the Metroids. That survivor was Quiet Robe. But one of Ravenbeak's soldiers turned out to be an ex in disguise. The infection spread, chaos reigned, the Machin were wiped out trying and failing to contain the ex. Yet somehow, Ravenbeak alone was able to do what his army could not. But his victory was short-lived, because while he was fighting the ex, Samus had bounty hunted her way to SR-388 and driven the Metroids to extinction. Without them, his plan was dead in the water. Or it would have been, if not for the one remaining source of Metroid DNA still alive in the galaxy. This is why Ravenbeak lured her here. The Emmy have been reprogrammed to kill Samus on sight and extract the Metroid DNA from her corpse. 
All of this exposition is communicated through full voice acting in the language of the Chozo. Fictional languages always run the risk of sounding odd or artificial, but massive credit to the scriptwriters, voice directors, and the voice actors for the verisimilitude of this scene. Mugi Garama be Eddie Slays Nido. Ilitari Nalima Megorile Shakutanga. What carries the scene just as much is the emotional range in Quiet Robe's performance. We feel his sorrow and guilt at what he's been kept alive to do, at being kept alive at all. This scene reveals so much about not only the mystery inherent in this one game, but the mysteries that have been the undercurrent of this entire series. It's an incredible example of that old adage, less is more. It's appropriate then, that as soon as Quiet Robe tells Samus about Ravenbeak's intentions, Determination and compassion in equal measure. This is Samus Aaron, and this is the one time in the entire game that Samus speaks. Less is more. Quiet Robe has disabled all remaining Emmy and opened the way forward. After spending his life as a tool of the Machin, he's putting his trust and faith in Samus. And who better to- What? What kind of coward would shoot someone in the back like- You ruthless, heartless bastard! No, I'm kidding. Quiet Robe is unceremoniously shot down by a robotic replica of a Chozo soldier, built by Ravenbeak to replace his fallen army. And I'm gonna go against every single thing you know about me and say something wildly out of character here. I said earlier that this fight should have been gameplay, to let the player relate to how outmatched Samus was. But this fight, against the automaton who just killed the one friendly Chozo that Samus has seen since childhood, this fight should have been a cutscene. The game has just dumped a metric ton of lore and exposition and emotion onto the player. And even watching it now, I feel like I need some time to ruminate on it and digest it. The fight itself is a significant step up in difficulty, practically requiring the use of the flash shift to dodge the Robo Chozo's high damage charge attack. Even if a player was in the right headspace for a fight, it's one they're pretty likely to lose on their first attempt. A cutscene where Samus takes out her aggression on Quiet Robe's murderer could have given you a hint on how to defeat them yourself, because more do show up later, and more importantly, would have provided a measure of catharsis for the player. After defeating his murderer, Samus wordlessly and briefly mourns Quiet Robe's loss, her objective and her resolve now clear. This marks the approximate halfway point of Metroid Dread, and like I said, I'm gonna need some time to digest it. I don't know about you, but I need a break. So, go to the fridge, get yourself a nice beverage, and let's kick back, relax, and decompress. This episode of the Geek Critique is sponsored by viewers like you. Support my work on Patreon via the link below to get access to a smorgasbord of tchotchkes, including early access to videos, behind the scenes content, and entry into the best damn community on the internet, the Inner Ring Discord server. Hang out with me, Kovar, and other friends and fans, talking about our favorite gaming memories, discussing the latest happenings in the industry, spinning colorful wheels, having weirdly deep 4am conversations about the time I asked Santa Claus for real magic, and even, on occasion, playing multiplayer games together. I know I'm biased, but I really do love my community, and I want to thank everyone in there for making it so special. Waffalo. I really did take a break in the production of this episode right here, so I could get some quality time with my wife before she went back to school. When I got back into the swing of it, good, something kind of funny happened. Obviously, I had completely lost the thread of where I was and what I was doing, but Dread has an answer for that. What I should have done was go into my menu logs and read up on my last directive from Adam, but I didn't think of that. Instead, I proved just how little I've learned. I followed the most obvious path forward, came to this room, looked at the map, and decided, nah, it couldn't be that simple. 
Then I spent 10 minutes wandering around and feeling very much like it was 2021 all over again. I am truly a ridiculous person. The reason I emphasized earlier how lost I got my first time was because I wasn't expecting it to happen this time. But going off path for a few minutes, I did notice something I appreciate. Past 2D Metroid games had grid-based maps. Each box comprised about one screen's worth of the game world. So if a hidden item was nearby, you'd have a real clear indication as to where. Unless, of course, the item was in a place that wasn't marked on your map, in which case you would have no idea it existed. Dread's map is more nuanced. Each room is more accurately shaped, and your path through it is more specific. And while upgrades that are visible out in the open are still marked as such, anything that's actually hidden works differently. A section of the map that's flashing white indicates there's something to find there, and the size of these sections can be variable. This strikes a nice balance compared to the indirect directedness of the old system. It tells you where to look without pinpointing it, and indicates a secret without obfuscating it. It's good stuff. Once I got back on track, it didn't take long before I encountered this massive, multi-room-spanning flower tentacle monster called Dragaiga. But despite the size of the beast, the fight itself is localized entirely in one room. And I think this would have been a cool opportunity to do something unique with the Metroid boss. Imagine dashing from area to area, adversarializing Drago... Dragaiga. Adversarializing Dragaiga across locations, flipping switches to change the state of the room its core is in, and finally delivering the final blow. Maybe it would have been a little too complicated, but I think it could have worked. Not that the fight as it is isn't cool. Samus and Dread is faster, snappier, and more acrobatic than ever, and at this point in the game, most fights are built around her many movement options. But Dragaiga's room is entirely underwater. This is the first boss, at least in the 2D series, that's fought this way without the gravity suit. Samus moves slow, she can't jump high, and her flash shift is broken in tie. Early. Dragaiga, on the other hand, has every advantage under the sea. This really is a toughie. Within the first 10 seconds, I'd been tentacle slapped twice, nearly cutting my health in half. So the goal is to fire shots into Gagaiga's noodly appendage when you can, then activate the turbines on either side of the room to drain the water. Samus might be on the back foot underwater, but Dragaiga is utterly helpless out of it. It's a little bit of a slower, slightly more puzzly fight than most of what Dread offers, and I still think it could have been better, but it definitely stands out. And in a very metal touch, the dried up remnants of Dragaiga still linger in the background after the fight. Gavoran strikes me as a place mostly untouched by, or perhaps mostly reclaimed from, the Chozo's influence. As Adam says, when he's not weirdly down bad for Ravenbeak, we're very close to the ZDRian surface now. Sunlight breaks into the cavern, flora and fauna flourish. Native wildlife is thriving and plentiful, meaning, of course, enemies are justifiably tougher. One of the absolute best is this bizarre, beautiful, whale-like creature that swims through the air. It's not directly aggressive. It seems undaunted by anything going on around it, but it casts a beam that drains any creatures below it. Bigger and healthier versions of those bioluminescent plants we saw way back near the core dot the landscape. And it's such a little thing, but I absolutely love the way this underwater section extends into a winding river as the camera pans up. It reminds me of the fancy parallax scrolling tricks 16-bit games did so well. Also, a bunch of little trees are on fire! Always the surest sign of a healthy ecosystem. Seriously, in contrast to the cold, clinical sea labs and refineries we've spent much of the game in, Gavoran feels wonderfully alive. And they do this to you on purpose, the bat. No. No. We'll get there. Of course, Gavoran also has its own Emmy zone, with that Emmy that Quiet Robe disabled just hanging out back there. This feels like sneaking around the house in the middle of the night when your bird dad's asleep. Anyway, after a short segue to get the super missiles, I took a tram ride to yet another new area called Elon. An enormous docking bay slides open to let Samus in, and she scanned again before a second, smaller panel slides open. This appears to be some sort of a Chozo prison. In a bit of misdirection so obvious I've got to believe it was intentional, your new super missiles, which open green doors, remember, do not work on this particular brand of a green door. It won't be long before Samus gets the plasma beam and you can open it, but I think that's there to make this feeling that you're somewhere you really shouldn't be just a little more convincing. 
And you really, really shouldn't have come here. Because, and this scene plays out with no surprise or fanfare, this is not a twist. The X are being held within Elon. Elon! Elon is what I said. This isn't a prison, it's a quarantine zone. And you know, if you'll allow me to step outside the game and geek out for a second, all these years after Fusion, it's just really cool to see the X again. Their movements and design and mechanics all realize so faithfully with much greater fidelity. But after circumnavigating the area, cleaning out a few upgrades, and literally curb stomping a biomimetic copy of a Chozo soldier, God, she's so cool! Samus heads back to the exit to find something she really should have seen coming. The door was reopened behind her. The plague has been set free. That's why the game makes such an impression with Gavorin and its natural beauty. So it can twist the knife immediately on your return trip. Nothing on ZDR survives. The X don't just copy their victims, they take their traits and make them stronger and far more unstable. Those sky whales are hostile now and hit way harder than they used to. In fact, just about every enemy we've seen to this point is infected by the X. Those little crawly dudes with the shells? Now they're flamethrowers. Those squishy little amoebas that launched at Samus hours ago? Now they spark with energy, can't be countered, and electrify any surface they touch. Bringing the X out now is an incredibly clever way to up the stakes. It's a minor issue with most Metroid games. As Samus gets stronger, the game, outside of boss fights, gets easier. Especially when backtracking. But now, when we travel back through areas we've already been, which we're going to be doing shortly, there's a very well-justified reason for the game to push back harder against us, to scale its challenge with Samus' abilities and the player's skill. And unfortunately, the X don't require their victims to be alive. Ugh, obviously putting the Emmy on ice was too good to last, but exifying Quiet Robe just hurts. But like I said, Dread does a fantastic job scaling up its difficulty, and the Emmy are no exception. This one has been enhanced as a genome soldier and has an ultra-long field of vision, which will actually freeze Samus as soon as she's spotted, but Samus' power scales right back. Blasting the Emmy this time gets you the ice missiles, which... I know I haven't played in a few years, but it kind of surprised me this wasn't the Ice Beam. Its absence was like a key part of fusion. Samus's newly integrated Metroid DNA made her susceptible to freezing, and her damaged power suit was incompatible with it. Until, of course, she recovered her strength by absorbing the SAX at the end. My point is, there's no lore reason she shouldn't be able to use the Ice Beam now. Is she stupid? But at least the power grip isn't in this game. It's nice to know Nintendo still cares a little bit about consistency. Damn it! Ice works a little differently now. In previous games, enemies would just stop in place and swap their palette. But now it's a little more realistic. Uh, relatively speaking. Bigger enemies take a few shots to freeze, while more powerful ones break out of it almost instantly. But at least we can finally put an end to those burning trees now. It wasn't too long after that that I finally and mercifully got what might actually be the best upgrade in the history of the series. Yeah, we're back here again. If you're not wandering in the wrong direction at every opportunity, this is where you're supposed to get the pulse radar. It was a little more compulsory in Samus Returns, because that game's progression had to be built around the structure of a 30-year-old Game Boy game. When you're designing a game from scratch, you might be able to build it in a way that makes it less necessary. Unless you're like me, of course. And thanks to the pulse radar, even someone as visually unattuned as I seem to be can actually find places like this. One thing I've really come to appreciate, not just about Dread, but about most 2D Metroid games, as I've been replaying them for this season, is how the game will reward your inquisitiveness, not just with upgrades, but with skill challenges. It's fine that sometimes a missile pack is hidden in a wall, but it's way more fun for me when there's some ridiculous Shine Spark challenge course for me to bash my head into for 15 minutes, because I love that crap. The satisfaction comes not in getting a minor upgrade, but in overcoming the obstacle. At this point, I re-entered and further explored that Chozo Sanctuary where I had first encountered Quiet Robe. I just want to say, this whole area is highly evocative of Metroid Prime 2. I really need to replay that one sometime. 
but the X are using it as their hive. And this room in particular shows an excellent foreboding decay as you drop deeper into it. Down here, you fight a sort of electrified flying beetle thing called Eskew, who's basically just a bigger, nastier version of a standard enemy. He's so unimpressive, I'm gonna denigrate him and say he's not even a boss. He's a sub-boss. Oh what, you don't like it? Well, excuse me! Man, maybe that break wasn't long enough. Eskew turns into one of those awesome ex-parasite cytoplasm things from off of Fusion, and when it's broken, it turns into a brand new upgrade, Storm Missiles. These things rule. It essentially adds both a charge and a lock-on function to the missile set, allowing you to fire a barrage, a stream of powerful shots, if you're able to position correctly and time it well. It turns robotic Chozo soldiers, which were previously the toughest recurring enemies in the game, into an absolute cakewalk. Dread ramped up the stakes with the X, but now Samus's power set has spiked even higher in response. That push and pull tension is wonderful. But actually, I haven't really said much about the Robo Chozos or the X infected Chozo soldiers up until now, have I? It's funny, I remember really enjoying these fights back when the game was new. But where major boss encounters are still giving me some resistance, my skills haven't atrophied enough in the past two years for these guys to really present a problem. They would be a lot tougher if you fought any of them without the flash shift, but if you know how to use it, it's basically just a matter of staying behind them. But as long as my critique is actually critical, I got a much bigger criticism to raise here. Just listen. I went into this project with a plan. I decided that I would not talk about the music until an original piece, a song that wasn't in any previous Metroid game, actually made an impression on me. I was optimistically expecting it to be a positive one, but this, this ain't it. Metroid Dread's sound design is excellent, but its score is mostly just there. I've heard some over-the-top criticism, acting like it's unlistenable garbage, but I don't think that's fair. It's merely serviceable. It's unremarkable. It gets the job done. Both of the credited composers I can find for Dread are pretty inexperienced, but I wouldn't say that's the issue either. The score's lack of emphasis feels too intentional. Traditionally, old-school video games use their music to stand out, to clarify the emotion of a moment, the tempo of a level, the fun of an action. Games didn't have a whole lot of tools to convey emotion to the player, so it was important to take advantage of everyone they had. Back in the day, video games couldn't be convincingly realistic. They couldn't bridge the gaps in our suspension of disbelief so readily, so their soundtracks had to be iconic, and so many old-school video game soundtracks absolutely are. Even Dread, when it wants to emphasize a critical moment, where does it turn? To the series' legacy. To the theme of Super Metroid. And without that piece of the series' iconography, this moment doesn't hit nearly as strong. Now, there was originally one whopper of a tangent here, but my sidekick Kovar, who has mountains more musical expertise than I ever will, and is himself an absolutely critical piece of why these scripts turn out as well as they do, he noticed something a whole lot more relevant while he was beta reading this script. Back in the NES Metroid Redux, I talked about an interview with Metroid's original series composer, Hip Tanaka. I'll let Kovar fill you in. Thanks. He said, Sound designers in many studios started to compete with each other by creating upbeat melodies for game music. The industry was delighted, but on the contrary, I wasn't happy with the trend, because those melodies weren't necessarily matched with the tastes and atmospheres that the games originally had. The sound design for Metroid was, therefore, intended to be the antithesis for that trend. I had a concept that the music for Metroid should be created not as game music, but as music the player feels, as if they were encountering a living creature. I wanted to create the sound without any distinctions between music and sound effects. The image I had was, anything that comes out from the game is the sound that the game makes. Hirokazu Hip Tanaka. Dread's music may have been less memorable and less traditionally musical, but I suspect that may have been intentional, as a deliberate callback to how the music was composed for the very first game in the series. In particular, a lot of it reminds me of some of the less melodic songs from the original game, like Secret Area. or Turian. Obviously, I don't know for sure what their intent was, but that's certainly the impression I got. But assuming I'm right, and this was their goal, how did they do? Well, it's hard to say. 
Tanaka's goal wasn't necessarily to be unmemorable, just to blend into the game. In that sense, I don't think Dread holds a candle to the original game. Still, the darker, more atmospheric music heard throughout the game does a pretty good job integrating with the rest of the sound design, neither hiding in the background nor taking center stage, but rather becoming part of a larger whole. To that end, it may not be everybody's cup of tea, it's sure not mine, but I do think it's fair to say that they did succeed at what they set out to do. Thank you for the insight, Kovar. Regardless of intent, in my book, or I guess to my ears, there's no area where Dread falters more than this one. Hey look! This whale is actually underwater! Actually, I guess that one looks more like a Nautilus from off of Seaman. And I guess from off of real life too, but I spent a long time thinking Seaman made them up. As I'm getting closer to the end of the game, I think those seams where content may have been cut are becoming a little more obvious. Like a while back I got a newish upgrade called a Spin Boost, which is basically like a space jump that only lets you space jump one time. That makes sense, right? A little more potential, but it doesn't let you just break the maps yet. Except that not even half an hour later, and that's with recording and taking notes and generally taking my time, I accidentally the whole space jump. That's a little weird. But when it comes to those seams, this right here has got to be the biggest culprit. Whenever Dread loads a boss room, there's a noticeable tell because the screen stays black for just a beat longer than usual. Like it's got to load for a second. And this room has got to load for a second. It's an enormous underwater arena with tons of space to maneuver. But there is no boss here. Just an unusual puzzle where you dislodge a piece of the sea lab and send it crashing through the floor. And then immediately from there, you stumble up on the gravity suit. If I were a betting man, I'd say that there was some undersea boss fight against an X here. Perhaps something inspired by Ceres. Or better yet, some sort of beefed up enemy that you wouldn't normally find underwater, who is nonetheless adept at maneuvering through it. And kicking its teeth in, that's what was going to get you the gravity suit. To be fair though, I think the reason I'm noticing these seams at all is down to the fact that I'm pretty familiar with this game, and I'm putting such an analytical eye to it. It's easy to overanalyze as a critic, you know. I never noticed these seams before, and it doesn't bother me that I did, I just think it's interesting. The gravity suit, by the way, is absolutely gorgeous. It restores more of Samus's bulk from the pre-X days, and serves as a better complement to the white than orange was. But more important than aesthetic is function, and in addition to its usual attribute, letting Samus move freely through water, the gravity suit also significantly boosts the power of her melee attack. Actually, the Varia suit did this too. The range is a little longer, the strike hits a little harder, and at this point it can even one-shot weaker enemies. It's another great example of Dread's thoughtful approach to power scaling. The gravity suit also gives Samus protection from frigid environments. And that's awfully convenient because... Maybe this is because I'm right about that cut content and post-boss dialogue was cut, but the game weirdly spoils this moment right before it happens. Adam says, you've probably already noticed that the planetary temperature is dropping since the X were unleashed. I mean, maybe Samus noticed, but I sure didn't. This section takes you all the way back to Artaria, the very first part of the game. But something is preventing the magma from being carried out of the planet's core, and this whole section is frozen over. So yeah, if the game had let us run through stone-cold versions of rooms we'd already been through, then had Adam deadpan about how we might have noticed, it would have made more sense and been pretty funny. Still, it is cool to see Artaria like this. Backtracking is rarely too painful in Metroid games, because even if you've been through a place before, your kit is totally different. But this flourish of actually changing the area itself, as expensive as I'm sure it is in terms of dev time, is something I'd selfishly like to see the series do more often. The X's ability to adapt to any environment is even showcased, as the enemies here take the cold and use it to their benefit. It's brilliant stuff. But the places you can actually access like this are noticeably limited. Doors are frozen over, lakes are solid, even the Emmy zone is snowed in. So I guess we should probably go back to Cataris and find the source of the problem. Dread has subtly been setting this up since the early game. Hours ago, we saw a presumably dead creature splayed out in the background of Dairon. Prongs were deployed that made it twitch, but gave no other indication of life. 
This is a Machin experiment, a horrible amalgamation of native life forms fused together, but seemingly incapable of life, until it was infected by the X. I do not say this with hyperbole. This right here is an endgame caliber boss fight. Samus has become an absolute wrecking ball of firepower and agility. She's never been as powerful or as capable as she is right now, and this boss puts it all to the test. Storm missiles, flash shifting, speed boosting, space jumping, flappy bird, aiming, positioning, timing, skill. I got walled here the first time I played. I actually had to sleep on it. Does anyone else ever have that experience where you slam into a tough challenge in a game again and again until your eyes are bleeding and your fingers are sore, so you acquiesce, you sleep on it? Then you come back the next day and just wreck it on your first try? This was one of those times for me. I love this fight. I always love this fight. And I played it so much that unlike most of Dread's other bosses, my skills haven't really atrophied here, at least not by much. There's actually a much faster way to take him down, where you charge a shine spark during the Flappy Bird part, Interestingly, barely visible as he tumbles into the lava, the experiment reverts into its core X cytoplasm form. Every other time you see these, you can break them apart and get a new ability, but this one burns up in the magma. I'm not foreshadowing anything here, this doesn't come up again. I wonder what power this thing could have given Samus. At this point, Dread does something pretty neat. It gives you a choice. You could take this elevator back down to Arteria and backtrack across the entire area now that the magma's flowing again. Aside from that little ice capade, it's probably been a long time since you've last been through here. There are tons of upgrades you couldn't have found yet, and this is a really good time to stock up on firepower. But if you'd rather just get on with it, the game also positions a teleportal, which it marks on the map, just past the elevator room, at the far end of a magma pit you couldn't have crossed without the gravity suit. This pops you out at the far opposite end of Arteria, right where you need to be to get the screw attack. There is no wrong answer here. The game's just giving you options. Want to take your time and explore? Go for it. Want to just get going? You do you. Dread actually has shortcuts like this all over its map, some hidden better than others. Throughout this video, I have with intention taken the main path through the game, the one I expect the developers expected most first-time players to take. I want to leave no stone unturned, clearly. But I don't want to give the impression that that's what you have to do. Despite how squared away Dread's progression might seem at first blush, this is a Metroid game through and through. Some of its rules can be bent, others can be broken. To back up a little, it is for example possible to break out of this area early and get Morph Ball bombs before you fight Kraid. And if you do that, there's a launcher hidden behind the wall that lets you take him down with a completely unique strategy. The devs did a fantastic job implementing and anticipating these sequence breaks, and to their credit, subsequent patches have only fixed game-breaking glitches that arose from the ones they didn't catch. You can still do them, you just won't softlock the game if you mess them up. They're not trying to stop players from breaking sequence because that wouldn't be very Metroid, would it? In fact, once you've found every teleportal, which is only possible if you go out of your way now at this late stage, the entire network becomes interconnected. Any portal lets you fast travel to any other, giving you a great foundation if you're going for 100% completion. The game encourages replay value by letting you set the pace of the adventure. Find a faster, more efficient route that will let you challenge yourself. Speaking of challenge, I finally made it back to Gavorin, screw attacked this bridge, and made it into this little room that I quite like because it really impresses upon me how close I am to the planet's surface at this point. But there's nothing I can actually do here except to drop back down and... Hey! It's one of those giant enemy crabs. Oh, I fought like a dozen of these things by now. Oh! Huh, look at that. It mutated into a more powerful version of the same thing but no prob. I've whacked a bunch of them too. I can... Oh. Uh-oh. This fight really lulls you into a false sense of security. After all the bombastic spectacle fights against enormous monsters you've been through till now, the idea of fighting a relatively small enemy one-on-one -on -one doesn't seem too threatening. And yet... Even here, even now, even with all these energy tanks and power-ups, the key change that Fusion implemented is still present. Samus Aran cannot tank hits. Move correctly, don't slip up, because each mistake will cost you. This fight is actually a nice pace breaker. There's a low ceiling, an enclosed space with not a lot of room to maneuver. 
It reminds me a lot of the later Metroid fights in Return of Samus, testing your ability to position yourself and hit weak points. The only way you can hit it is to get behind it, but when you do, it'll send out this little purple pulse attack that requires you to multitask dodging and attacking. And sometimes it'll just force you to clear out. Defeating it, though, gets you a new ability, or to be more correct, an upgraded take on an old one, Cross Bombs. You know how sequence breaks in Metroid games have always relied on bomb jumping? These basically canonize the concept, and they let you bounce horizontally, too. <laughs> Maybe that Korex absorbed Bomberan in a past life. Cross Bombs come so late in the game that there's not a lot of time left to explore their potential, but they're fun while they last. There really isn't long left now. This is the tram to the penultimate area of the game, Hanubia. Samus has, at long last, broken out of the depths of ZDR and onto the planet's surface. It's wild after all this time to finally, clearly see the unobstructed sky. Adam still tells me I have no chance against Ravenbeak, but I have no choice but to boldly take that next step. This is the end game. Or I'll just dip back into that mocking temple from earlier real quick and fight another Emmy. Ugh, oh, way to break the tension. That may have been the penultimate area, but this is the penultimate Emmy, and it breaks every rule you've taken for granted until now. It can see through walls, making stealth a bit of a joke. As soon as you're in the area, it knows. So the only option is to use everything you've got to stay one step ahead. On the bright side, once you find its accompanying mother brain, you get to do this. There's a reason this Emmy could see through walls. It held the wave beam, allowing Samus to shoot through them. And now all there is to do is to take the same elevator we just came down on right back up. Ha. Huh. Pushing deeper into Ravenbeak's stronghold, Samus comes across stasis pods of various native beasts. One of them breaks out and attacks. She counters instinctively, and that instinct gives way to... something else. Her hand contorts into a claw. It pulses with the same energy she felt when she witnessed the tapestry and met Quiet Robe, but she hesitates. She finally recognizes this power. She knows it, but she doesn't know if she wants it. And so she goes with a more conventional tactic. And through it all, Ravenbeak watches on. He's had her under surveillance, known exactly where she was and what she was doing ever since she arrived. Watching. Waiting. Come in. Sir Raiding. Samus has put together what's happening to her, but we're going to need to wait just a little while longer to find out. A very little while. As in, you need to advance through just one more room. Ha. Huh. So let's recap. I broke through to the planet's surface, this watershed moment Dread had built to the whole game. But I diverted from that path almost immediately, got one power up, went right back to where I was, and now I'm getting two very important cutscenes, one the tease, the other the reveal, with only a single room separating them. Toward the end of the game, Dread's progression structure exhibits some noticeable unevenness. It's nothing inexcusable, and I can't say I really picked up on it the first time, but it does feel a little fatiguing. And I guess it doesn't help that the Emmy, as tense and exciting as they were to a point, haven't really done enough to change up the formula. The Emmy zones haven't changed in terms of appearance or function. The Omega Cannon still works the same way it did in the second encounter. I don't even remember the last time I used the Phantom Cloak, and I kind of forgot it existed. I don't think Emmy encounters ever become dull exactly, but they definitely edge up against feeling perfunctory. Dread might have done well to have fewer of them, and to make the ones it kept more unique. On the bright side, there is now only one Emmy left. On the not so bright side, it has power bombs! They went to the trouble of labeling Samus's left hand just so she doesn't lose it. Samus just siphoned every drop of energy out of that Emmy just by touching it with her left hand. I was wrong. This diagram in this instruction manual that came packaged with this game, released 30 gosh darn years before Metroid Dread, wasn't just being overly specific. It was deliberate foreshadowing. It was trying to warn us. The last Metroid 
is not in captivity. The last Metroid is Samus Aran. This was Ravenbeak's intention. This is why he challenged her, pushed her, made her fight. This is why he let her live. His goal wasn't just to extract the Metroid DNA from her, but to awaken its potential within her. Suddenly, conveniently, Adam knows where Ravenbeak is. He's in a flying fortress called Iteresh, high above the surface of ZDR. Suddenly, conveniently, Adam finds a bathysphere capable of catapulting Samus to Iteresh. It's such a small thing, but I love this animation of Samus sitting in the pod, eyes forward. She knows. She knows as she works her way on board Iteresh. She knows as Adam tells her, her very existence poses too great of a threat to allow her to live. She knows, with certainty, something the player probably doesn't, and her steadfast, silent demeanor has given her no reason nor opportunity to tell us. Through every encounter, every piece of advice, every time Adam told her she was no match for Ravenbeak, ever since she arrived on ZDR, encountered Ravenbeak for the first time, and when she came to, Adam stopped calling her Lady and started calling her Samus. Samus Aran was rescued by the Chozo as an orphan. They raised her, nurtured her, trained her, and genetically enhanced her by splicing their own DNA with hers, enabling her to survive on Zebus. Two volunteers stepped forward to donate their blood to this girl. One was Grey Voice of the Thoha tribe. He taught her compassion and intellect. He raised her like a daughter. But the other was Ravenbeak of the Mokin tribe. His blood was the foundation of Samus's superhuman combat prowess, athletic ability, and killer instinct. I've spent a lot of time, and maybe a little too much time, over the course of this video picking at Dread's structure, picking at threads in a fabric that I've come to know well. There's a reason I didn't try to do this video in 2021, that I don't try to base these videos solely on my first impressions. That being said, it was three in the morning, I was alone. The living room was dark, except for the light of the TV. The wait was worth it. Whether I deserved it or not was the furthest thing from my mind. Metroid Dread had enthralled me in a way that doesn't happen often. It may have been the middle of the night, but I was wide awake. I neither knew nor cared how long I had been at this. I couldn't stop. I didn't want to. I needed to know how this story ended and Metroid Dread responded to the addiction that it had given me by putting its biggest, baddest, toughest obstacle in front of me and letting me, with bloodshot eyes and a solid grip, chip away at that challenge bit by bit, getting a little bit better, a little bit closer with each failure. God, I fucking love video games. Sleeping on it wasn't an option. Every mistake I made made me physically cringe. Every new phase was like running into another wall, but finally I overcame it. And what I saw next... All of Samus' ability and all of my skill, it's still not enough. As Ravenbeak chokes the life out of her, he reassures his so-called daughter. With the Metroid's powers awakened and the X under his thumb, he no longer needs her to live. With a mocking tone, Ravenbeak implores her to find peace.
Iterish crash lands into the planet, but Raven Beak is still alive. A core X, composed of the remnants of every major threat Samus has overcome on ZDR, fuses with him, corrupts him, steals every bit of his cunning and intellect, and turns him into a beast. But he is nothing compared to what Samus has become. Samus carries in her the conflict between the Thoha's compassion and the Machin's drive, the personification of intellect and romance versus brute force and cynicism. But she made her choice a long time ago. Metroid. This series is called Metroid. When kids in 1986 called this character Metroid, they weren't wrong, they were just early. But Samus is more than that. She's the living legacy of THE Metroid, the one that she spared, the one that sacrificed itself for her, the one whose DNA saved her life, the one whose legacy she now embodies. I replayed the entire mainline Metroid series before I replayed this one, and I did that with intent. Yoshio Sakamoto said Metroid Dread was the finale of this story. Not that there wouldn't be more stories to tell with Samus, but that Dread serves as the conclusion of this one. A story older than I am, told across five games, across 35 years, across six generations of video game history. And what I've found is that this finale recontextualizes and enriches all of them. In the end, Samus makes it back to her ship after the most epic of all epic escape sequences. But as she reaches for the controls, she's halted by what remains of Quiet Robe. If she touches her ship, her Metroid powers will drain its energy and doom her. But an infusion of Thoha DNA will repress that Metroid within her and let her live on to new adventures. The Chozo saved Samus Aran. The Infant Metroid saved Samus Aran. The SAX saved Samus Aran. And now the circle is complete, as the last Chozo has saved Samus Aran. She is their legacy. As the credits rolled that first time, I was convinced that I had just played the best Metroid game ever made. I was, of course, aware of recency bias. Familiarity and distance has dulled Dread's shine a bit. Now I can better see it for what it is. But I can better love it for what it is, too. Whatever seams I might see when I put it under a magnifying glass, whatever threads I might be able to pull, they don't take away from the fact that Dread is still one of my absolute favorite games in one of my absolute favorite series. Under the right light, Dread may even flat out be my favorite Metroid game. But as the credits rolled this time, I was hit by a familiar feeling that all I wanted to do was load up a new save file and play through it one more time. Fandom is not contingent on suffering. There is no such thing as a true fan, same as there's no such thing as a true gamer. If you say you are, then you are. Nonetheless, I was owed nothing. I didn't deserve anything. But I know every single person right here deserves my thanks. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for your creative spirit. Thank you for enduring what you endured. Thank you for making Metroid Dread. And to the rest of you, thank you for watching this episode. I hope it was also worth the wait. Until next time, keep geeking. I'll keep critiquing.